This is the man in black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In Hollywood this evening, our star is the young American actor who, within a single year, has become one of the most provocative of Hollywood's leading men, Mr. Gene Kelly. Mr. Kelly appears tonight as a gentleman named Art Kramer, a gentleman of most uncertain scruples, engaged with other gentlemen of similar disrespectability in distinctly unlawful practices. Our suspense play by Robert L. Richards is called Thieves Fall Out. And in it, in support of our star, you will hear Hans Conried as a racetrack devotee by name Canelli. And William Johnstone as Sam Gross. And so with Thieves Fall Out and with the performance of Gene Kelly as Art Kramer, we again hope to keep you in suspense. ABC Enterprises. No, he's not in. No, I don't know where you can locate him. Hey, Rita. Yes, I'll tell him you called. ABC Enterprises, ABC Enterprises. Why does he give all these guys his phone number if he wants to keep this business so quiet? Yeah, you know. Wants to do favors for people he meets in bars, brags, how he can get things for him. You know. Sure, I know. And the next day I have to give him the brush off. He's going to brag to the wrong guy someday. Hi, Yachty. Hello. Hello, Arthur. Hiya, babe. Where you been the last couple of days? Uh, ducking all the guys I owe money to. What time is Sam getting the boys together? About a half an hour. Down at the warehouse. You better start down there pretty soon. What's the difference? I won't get enough out of it to buy a round trip to Coney Island. Any calls? Yeah, Canelli called a little while ago. That punk. Another guy who wants dough I haven't got. Did you stall him? I tried, but he said he was coming up anyway. Oh, what'd you let him do that for? You know I don't want to see that guy. I couldn't help it. He knows the way he Okay, is. okay. Anything else? No. Arthur, if you're not going down right away, can I talk to you for a minute? What about? Oh, something. Joe, watch the switchboard for me, will you, while I talk to Arthur in the next room? What's he got that I haven't got? No cracks out of you. Please, Arthur? All right, but make it snappy. Now what? Oh, Arthur, what, what's the matter lately? You know what's been the matter, everything. Me too. Oh, don't start that again. Reed, it's no use. Look, you're a good kid, but it's no use. You didn't used to say that. All right. So now I owe nearly ten grand around this town. And there's some plenty tough monkeys. If I don't get it up pretty soon, it's going to be too bad. On top of that, I had a loaded truck and a trailer hijacked last week, and there goes my take for the month and more. And you want to know what's the matter. Oh, Arthur, honey, why don't you quit? Why don't you get out while you still can? Why don't I quit? What are you talking about? Oh, you used to have a decent business, Arthur. Sure, sure, and I didn't eat. Oh, what about now? It's making a wreck of you. It's, it's dangerous. You know what's going to happen. This whole black market thing's going to crack pretty soon. And when it does, you... Ah, you're... don't be silly. Yeah? Chanelli's outside to see Addy. That punk. All right, let him come in. What's one more? Okay. Uh, better let me talk to him alone, baby. All right. Think about I, what I said, will you? Sure. Oh, hi, 
Artie. I thought I might catch you. Yeah, I'll bet. Close the door. Sure. Hey, listen, Arthur. I need that dough. Well, I haven't got it. I told you that. Uh, no, 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 look. I don't want there should be no trouble. There's not going to be any trouble. Take it easy. I didn't mean that. But I took them bets from you on my own. Now my boss is after me. If I don't get that dough by Monday, I'm going to be in trouble. Well, I haven't got it, and I won't have it for another month. I... Can't you get it from Sam? No, I'm into him as far as I can be now. What do you mean? Sam must have plenty sold it down in some safe deposit vault by now. It huh? isn't in a vault. It's up at his place in Connecticut. Anyway, he won't give me any more. Connecticut, huh? I didn't know he had a place in Connecticut. Uh, near Riverside. It's a hideout, way away from everything. Oh. McPhail has one, too, about five miles away. When's he go there? He's hardly ever there. Nobody's there. What do you care? You're thinking of the days when you used to climb through second-story windows? Oh, you should not have said that, Art. I don't even know where the junk is. No, I was kidding. Anyway, listen, I'm I'm sorry about the dough, but you'll have to wait. Uh, Art, you don't know the spot I'm in. Mean. You'll get it from me when I've got it. I'm uh, leaving. Uh, Art, listen. You coming? Where are you going? Down to the warehouse to watch my share of last month's take go down the drain. <laughs> Artie. Okay. You late? Yeah, I stopped in at the office. Hi, McPhail. Hi, Mo. Uh, you uh, weren't waiting just for me to hand out the chips, were you? Yeah, right. We weren't. I just wanted you to know how it worked out. It was a good month out. Except for you. I know, I know. Come on, Sam, come on. Pass around the sugar. Let's get it over with. Well, here it is. In cash. Total take was 53 grand. 17 goes to you, McPhail. I got the figures all here if you want to see. I know you wouldn't double-cross me, Sam. I wouldn't double-cross anybody. And don't forget it. Here's your dough. Yeah. Mo, yours is six. You understand you didn't bring in as much business as McPhail. I ain't complaining. And I get 21. Part of that is paying expenses. The rest is my percentage. Don't I get anything? What? Your cut would have been nine grand. But there was that truck and trailer. Those things cost dough, you know. To say nothing of a whole load of prime meat. You have to take it all out now? I already have. I'll give you 500 to keep going on. Oh, that's fine. 500. Listen, Sam, I need dough. You always need dough and never have none. Listen, you... He's right, Art. You got to get yourself straightened out. If I give you any more, it'll just go to the bookies and gambling joints like the rest of us. Listen, Sam, I tell you, I gotta have it. The guy's after me. I think he's yellow, Sam. You keep your big mouth out of this. Yeah. I was a respectable businessman when you were running a lousy clip joint on Sands. Yeah, yeah, and you're starving. And you're still starving. Because you haven't the guts to keep a couple of mugs from hijacking your stuff. Why, you... Cut it out now. Cut it out. There's not going to be any trouble in this organization. There's plenty for everybody. Now, listen, Art. Yeah? Why don't you go up to my place in Connecticut for a few days? Take it easy. And let me talk to these guys who are looking for you. I know who they are. They don't want any more talk. Anyway, I go nuts up there in the country. Go on. Pick up my car at the station. No, thanks. Well, I'm going. I'm going out to the country and tend to my victory garden. Your victory garden? <laughs> yeah. I see you about Tuesday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, hey, Mac. Yeah? Uh, wait a minute. So long, Art. Uh, so long. Uh, say, uh, Mac, uh, I'm sorry I made any cracks. Yeah, <laughs> forget it. Uh, Mac, you uh, going up to the country? Yeah, bet your life. Going down and get on the 520 right now. Say, uh, you know, uh, I think I'll take Mac up. Uh, Mac, I, uh, well, I kind of need a rest. I, I, yeah, I think... Yeah, you'll need something. Uh, do you mind if I ride up on the train with you? Why not? Why not? It's a public train. Oh, you know, uh, Mac, I was sorry about Say, that. Say, Artie, Artie. Yeah? Don't mind me. I talk a lot. And I don't mean it. Ah, oh, forget it, Mac. I know. Say, you want to see my victory garden? Are you kidding? No, no, I got a garden. It's a view, too. Want to see it? Sure. Sure I would. I, I always like gardens. Well, well, in that case, you'll... Have to stop over at my place on your on your way to Sam's, huh? It'll be a pleasure. K, 
Come on in, Artie. I want to put this dough in the safe, and then I'll then I'll show you around. Sure. <laughs> ah, when the war is over and I'm legitimate, I'm gonna build onto it. Have a lot of lawn, gardener, real country gentleman. Uh, what's this? Your office? I do a little business here once in a while. Keep my dough in a safe there until I bank it. <laughs> Know anything about safes? No. Huh. It's good. It's good. Not that I don't trust you, Artie. Yeah. There she is. Put him up, Mac. What? You heard me. I'm not a movie. A stick up, huh? Why, you yellow little rat? You don't think you can pull this on me and live, do you? It's not a stick up, Mac. I just want you to do me a little favor, and I want to be sure you do it. Yeah? Yeah, get on that phone. This had better be a gag. It won't be unless you do exactly what I tell you. What? Call Rita in town. Ask her what Sam has lined up for Tuesday. Say you called me over at Sam's house just now and talked to me, but I didn't know. Go on, get going. Atwater 3, 5562. Five, Listen, Art. I'm no guy to kid around with. And I don't like this. Talk. Eh. Yeah. Rita, this is Mac. What's Sam got lined up for Tuesday? I just talked to Artie over at Sam's place. Yeah. Yeah, up here in the country. He said he didn't know to call you. Oh, I say. Cut it short. No, 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 never mind. Okay. All right. Now what's the game? You never were very smart, were you, Mac? Huh? That's my alibi. You just told Rita you talked to me at Sam's place. You get it? Why, you... <laughs> Neatly done, Art Kramer. Virtually a perfect alibi. And $17,000 in cold cash. There was someone else who thought he had a perfect setup, too. Canelli, the little bookie, whose former occupations were even less savory. It wasn't hard for Canelli to find where Sam's place was in Connecticut, in New York's underground of petty crime, and find out anything. And it wasn't hard to jimmy a window, and that often enough. Uh, and then to find the money. There was a wad of money here at Sam's place somewhere. Art Kramer had said so. Probably in a safe. That wouldn't be any trouble either. Not in the living room, of course. Yes, maybe this room. Yeah. An office, a desk and phone. And a safe there in the wall. And just as he thought, old-fashioned, easy to crack. <laughs> First to drill a little hole, then the soup. There'd be a quick, neat little explosion, and the safe would fall apart in his hands. Huh? But wait, what's that? A car driving up, stopping. Who? Art Kramer had said nobody ever came up here. Mm. But it was leaving now, driving away. Probably just a mistake. No, no. Steps outside. Somebody coming in. What to do? Escape cut off. Hide. Here in the office, mm. behind the door. Hide the bag of tools, quick. Mm. He's coming in here. Mm. Well, operator. I want New York City, at water 35562. Five, yeah, that's right. Hello, Rita? Sam, listen, Rita, get a hold of everybody. Artie, Mac, Moe, everybody you can. I've got a tip-off. There's going to be a raid. Yeah, cops. Tell the boys to duck. Lay low until they hear from me. Find out where they're going to be and call me right back as soon as you contact everybody. Got it? Yeah? Oh, okay. I'll get hold of Mac myself as long as he's up here. Are they too? Well, I'm calling from my place now. I don't see him anywhere. Well, he must have changed his mind. Well, I didn't look in the garage. He came by cab. He's probably around someplace, yeah. But I'll wait for your call, then. Okay, Rita. Now make it snappy now. Hey. Connelly. What are you no, doing? Listen, Sam, I just... The safe. Why are you... No, <laughs> Huh? 
Sam. Sam. Hidden too hard. Dead. Dead. Yes, hit him too hard. Murder. That's a lot different from housebreaking. Murder. The phone. Somebody calling Sam. Fear, blind, unreasoning fear. Smash it. Rip it out of the wall. So whoever was on the other end could actually hear, actually see what was in this room. Murder and a murderer. There. Why, oh, why had he done that? Foolish. Just nerves. Can't get hold of yourself. Think, think, think. What now? The money. Yes, have to have the money now. Make a getaway. Mexico, South America. Maybe Sam. Huh? Yes, the body. He to even touch him. But turn him over. There, the wallet. Empty. That's funny. Other pockets. No, no, nothing. The safe, then. Finish the job quick. Then get out. Find the drill again. Hurry. Again, somebody coming. Who? Never mind. Not going to be caught this time. Can't be a murderer. Close the door. Lock it quick. Pocket the key. Hide. Maybe whoever it is will go away. Then come back and get the money later. Here he is. Hide quickly. The kitchen. Get out the back window again if you have to. But wait, wait. He's not following. Wonder who it is. Just have a look. Through the crack of the door. Careful there. Art. Art Kramer. The suitcase must be going to stay. But wait, why not? Art wouldn't know anything. Couldn't with the office door locked. Give him a plausible story. Stay overnight and get the money when he's asleep. A chance, but have to take it. Yeah. Have to have the money now. Why not tell Art he'd come looking for Sam to borrow? Then looking through the house for him. Call him. Yes, make it look natural. He can't answer now. Call him. Sam. Sam. Hello, anybody here? Hello. Who is it? Who is it yourself? I'm looking for Mr. Gross. Sam Gross. Well. Oh. What are you doing here? Hello, Arthur. I was looking for Sam. I thought you didn't know where this place was. Oh, I found out. Yeah? Oh, what made you think Sam was going to be up here? Why... I heard a tip in town. There might be some trouble. I figured he might come up here to dock out. What kind of trouble? Cops. Yeah? I didn't hear anything. I don't know, but I'd do something. You know, I need dough the worst way. I figured Sam might let me have a little. He paid off today, didn't he? That's right. Art, did you get any? Me? Well, if you did, I don't like to keep asking you, but I need it, Art. Why, uh... Why, uh... Look, uh, Canelli. Huh? You know, I meant to get in touch with you about that. I wanted to talk to you this afternoon. You mean you got something? Uh, come on inside, I'll tell you. Oh, sure, sure. I, uh, got an idea. An idea. It came like a flash to Art Kramer. Frame Canelli for the murder of MacPhail. Plan some of MacPhail's money on him as evidence. And who would ever believe Canelli's word? A man with a criminal record against Art. Why, Rita would swear that MacPhail himself had said Art was at Sam's place. Simply denied that he'd ever seen Canelli. And Canelli would be MacPhail's murderer and Art Kramer would be safe forever. Now, uh, about that money. Yeah. Uh, As a matter of fact, I did get some. Not much, understand. Well, even a little would help. Uh, how much do I owe you all together? Nearly 4000 huh? Well, uh, suppose I gave you two. I shouldn't give you that much, the way I'm fixed. Well, it ain't what I need, but it would help. Okay, uh, here's two grand on account. Oh. You know, it uh, doesn't leave me with much. I appreciate it, Aunt, really. Say, uh, you're uh, really on a spot, huh? Yeah. How much more do you need? Oh, not a four, five, anyway. Oh, oh well, uh, you know, I just thought I know where you can get it if you work it right. You do? Yeah. You uh, know MacPhail? Oh, I know him. Not well. Well, I do. He took in plenty this month. What good does that do me? I tell you, I know the guy. Well, He's the softest touch in the world. He'd give the shirt off his back to anybody if they told him the right story. Yeah? How come you don't put the bite on it? He doesn't like me, but anyone else. <laughs> you mean, uh, I just ask you? Sure. 
You get anything you want. I'm not kidding. <laughs> if you ask for ten, even twenty, you, you'd get it if he had it. No four. Sure. He's up here in the country now, too. Right up the same back road, four and a half miles. Hey, uh, how do I recognize the place? It's a big place on the right. The only house for a mile. You can't miss it. Say, I'd, I'd run up there if I were you. Uh, maybe I will, huh? Maybe I will. A break. The kind of break Canelli had prayed for. Get the money from McPhail. Yes, quicker and safer than trying to get back in that room with a dead body on the floor. Get it from McPhail and have a good head start. Art won't find Sam's body in there for at least a day or two. The door's locked and Canelli has the key. He can be on a plane with McPhail's money and be out of the country by tomorrow. A break, the perfect break. Uh, well, thanks for the tip, Art. You sure McPhail's up there, huh? Sure, he's always there, every weekend. He's got a garden. <laughs> A victory guard. <laughs> That's a lie. Well, I guess I better get going, huh? Yeah. Look around the grounds for him first. If sure. he isn't outside, just walk right in. Uh, the door's always open. He's a simple guy. Trust anybody. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, Art. Skip it. Maybe someday you can do the same for me. Yeah. Yeah, maybe someday I can. Well, so long. So long. <laughs> And now, Art has a job to finish. Phone the cops. From here? No, better not. They might trace it. The gas station at the crossroad. Plenty of time. Canelli will be there five or ten minutes before he finds what he'll find as the cops find him. How easy he fell for it. But never mind that now. The gas station. The phone. Hello. I want the police. Uh, hurry, please. Hello, uh, Riverside Police? Uh, listen, I-, I was just driving down Nine Mile Road. I was going by the old McPhail place. You know the place I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I-, I was going slow and I heard something. It sounded like someone was being killed. Yeah, yes, a murder. There were shots and somebody screaming and more shots. A man's voice. Oh, it was terrible. You better get up there right away. Oh, never mind who I am. I don't want to get in any trouble. No, but get up there. Yes, murder. Get your call all right, sir? Yeah, thanks. ABC Enterprises. Yes, did you locate him yet? Oh, well, keep trying and call me back. Joe, I'm worried. Hey, don't worry about him. If you can't find Mo, neither can the cop. I'm not thinking about him. I'm worried about Sam and, and Arthur. Maybe they went out. Sam said he'd wait for my call. It isn't that. It's, the phone's dead. I've got to get in touch with him somehow. Can it wait? No, it can't. Not with the cops raiding the warehouse and arresting everyone in sight. Well, how about a telegram? Oh, too slow. I hate to send anyone around to the house, but... Sam will understand this time. What are you going to do? Get the telephone company to help. Hello? I want the Riverside, Connecticut traffic operator, please. Yes. You know, it's funny about that phone. It rang two or three times, and then suddenly it went dead. Oh, hello, traffic operator? Have you a phone listed under the name of Gross? Samuel Gross. Well, there's something wrong with it, and it's very important that I get in touch with Mr. Gross right away. I'm a secretary. Will you send a man up right away? Thanks. And would you tell Mr. Gross that I've been trying to reach him? Thank you. Oh, see? When Sam finds out there's something wrong with his phone, he can phone me from outside. You're a pretty smart girl sometimes, Rita. Yeah. Don't you believe me? I just wish I was smart enough to get some sense across to that guy, Art Kramer, once in a while. You kind of like him, don't you? Oh, cut it out. Eh, don't worry about Artie. He'll be all right. Sure. I suppose. I suppose he'll be all right. Mr. Gross, I'm from the telephone company. Mr. Gross isn't here. Oh. Well, we just got word from New York that his secretary's been trying to reach him, but his phone is out of order. I was sent up to look at it. Sure, go right ahead. I'm a friend of Mr. Gross. I know he'd want you to fix it. Okay. Where is it? 
First order, you're right. Well, looks like we've got more visitors. Yeah, cops. Well, I'd better get after this phone here. I'm sorry to trouble you. I wonder if we could use your phone. It's out of order, I'm afraid. There's a man here fixing it now. What's the matter, officer? Trouble? Yeah, a little killing up the road. We didn't want to handle the phone there. Might be fingerprints on it. Uh, murder? That's right. Up at the old McPhail place. Caught the guy red-handed. Murder and robbery. We even found the dough on him. Yeah? Who did it? Says his name is Canelli from New York. I wouldn't tell you all this, except it's an open shut case. Couldn't explain what he was doing there or how he got the money or anything. Well, you'll read about it in the papers tomorrow. You, uh, have him outside now? Yep. Well, we'd better be going. Hey, mister, that door you got, you got, it's locked. You got a key? Why, no. Well, what's the matter? You lost a key someplace? Well, I, I, I must have. The, the, the room with the phone in it. Oh, maybe I can help you out. I got a little gimmick here that might open it. Huh. Thanks. Yeah, we got to have things like that in this line of business, you know. Is uh, this the door? Yeah, that's it. There you are. Ah, oh, thanks. You uh, don't need me in there for anything, do you? No, sir. Well, good night. Good night. Hey, say, officer. Yeah? You better come in here a minute. Uh, wait a second, will you, Jim? Uh, sure. What's the matter? Hey, mister. You been here all day? That's right. Why? Nobody else been here all afternoon? No, sir. Oh. What's this? You find something wrong in there? You said it, mister. Put up your hands. Hey, what's the idea? You know, huh? Jim, take a look at what we got here. Yeah. Well, well. Uh... Cover him, Jim. Okay. Oh, uh, what is... Hey, let me see that. Sure. Sam. No. Robbery, too. Been through his wallet and started on the safe. Just like the other guy. Let's risk him. No. No, I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Yeah, uh, here's the dough, all right. A roll big enough to choke a horse. Look, you guys. I tell you, I didn't do this. Yeah, kind of interrupted you, didn't we? Come on. Look. I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't. I didn't do this. I did I did I did do this. And the story ends with a newspaper clipping. I'll read it to you. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Arthur Kramer and George Kennelly were executed here today within ten minutes of each other to bring to a fitting conclusion one of the strangest series of coincidences in the criminal records of this state. Both men committed the same crime, murder and robbery, within a few miles of each other on the same day and at almost the same time. Both victims were operators in the New York black market. Kramer was convicted of the murder of Samuel Gross. Canelli killed Edward McPhail. Both killers were caught on the scene of the crime, were arrested by the same officers, taken together in the same police car to the same jail. Both proclaimed their innocence, yet pleaded guilty in the face of the overwhelming evidence against them. A curious factor in the case was that though both men denied knowing the other, they tried repeatedly to attack each other in the prison yard until guards were forced to keep them out of sight of each other at all times. Police have always believed there was some connection between the two crimes, but have never been able to find out what it was. And so closes Thieves Fall Out. Starring Gene Kelly, tonight's tale of Suspense. Appearing with Gene Kelly, who is to be seen currently in Metro Golden Mayor's Technicolor musical Thousands Cheer, were Hans Conried as Kennelly and William Johnstone as Sam Gross. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when our star will be Mr. Vincent Price. Mr. Price will be heard in a suspense play by E. Jack Newman, dealing with the Gestapo and called The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear, who with Lud Gluskin and Lucian Malowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. 
Don't miss suspense when this series moves to a new day and time. The day, Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd. The time, 8 p.m. Eastern War Time and 7 p.m. Central War Time. In the Mountain and Pacific Time Zones, listeners will hear suspense on Mondays, beginning December the 6th at 9 p.m. Pacific War Time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. something wrong. Terribly wrong. I'm going to wait a few more days, and when I'm sure, I'm going to take care of you, Joe. Well, what do you mean? I'm going to kill you. Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so tonight I tell you the bewildering story of Mirage. Fred Adams is an attorney, a promising young attorney. Fred is a specialist for his practice has been limited to nightclubs and bars. In other words, Fred is what is called a mouthpiece. He steps gaily down the street tonight, unaware of the two men leaning against the black sedan parked in the shadows between the lampposts. Hi, Fred. What's your hurry? Huh? Oh, hello, Joe. What are you and Mike doing in this end of town? We're waiting for you, Fred. Thought you might like to take a little ride. Ride? Yeah, the boss wants to have a little talk with you, Fred. Well, not tonight. I'm busy. Got an appointment. The boss would like to talk with you, Fred. Get in. I told you I'm busy. I'll drop around tomorrow. What are you so busy about, Fred? <laughs> How'd you like a poke in the nose? Uh, Get in the car, Fred. Let go of me, your hood. We ain't kidding. Get in. What'd you two guys do without a gun? Get in. Okay, okay. Fifteen minutes later, Fred makes his way through the crowded tables of the Swank Tripoli Cafe toward a door marked manager. He hesitates a moment, glances at the two men beside him, and knocks. Across the room, a beautiful woman sits behind the desk, toying with a long cigarette holder. Come in, Freddy. Come in. Well, we got him, boss. And uh, where do you think he was? <laughs> Over on Park Avenue. <laughs> How fancy. Wait outside, Joe. I want to talk to Freddie. Alone. <laughs> yeah. Sit down, Fred. Well, what's wrong? You in trouble again, Gloria? Would it matter to you if I were in trouble? Of course it would. Where have you been the past week? Has it been a week since I saw you last? You know it has. And a week is too long to suit me, Freddie. Well, you know my phone number. If anything had happened, you'd have found me. Doesn't make me very happy to think I have to go out looking for you. Kind of lets me down. Oh, for the love of Pete, what happened? Nothing's happened here at the cafe. Well, what's the matter, then? It's you, Fred. It's what you've done. I haven't done anything. Why do you think I paid your way through law school? Well, because you wanted to. <laughs> and because you needed a lawyer around. Is that all? I don't know. I thought we were together in this thing for keeps. Well, yeah. I'm still your attorney... What else do you expect of me? You have the nerve to sit there and say that. You know how I feel about you. You've always known. We've always been pals, good friends. Pals? Friends? Oh, Freddie. Now, what are you trying to say? I knew for the past three weeks that you were changed. 
couldn't figure it out. But I found out this afternoon. Here it is in the paper. District attorney's daughter to wed young lawyer. Well, what about it? Are you really in love with her, Fred? Certainly. Why shouldn't I be? I don't think you are. I knew you were campaigning for the DA in this last election. I know you're ambitious. I think you've got your eyes on a job in the DA's office, more than you have on the girl. I tell you, I love Brenda Gibson, and you can think whatever you like. Is uh, she pretty? Very pretty. Young. I don't like the way you said that, Fred. I'm not so old. I didn't mean it that way. You're a very beautiful woman, Gloria. Am I? But, well, I don't know what it is. You've done everything in the world for me. No one could ask for more. And I've always cared more for you than any woman I've ever known. Until now. But there's something about Brenda. That, well, she's so different. Go on. I hate to say this to you, but I've got to make you understand. Brenda's intelligent. She comes from a fine family. She has... Well, she has culture. And I came up from the chorus. Now, Gloria, I didn't expect you to take it this way. Well, how did you expect me to take it? I didn't think you were really in love with me. It never occurred to me that you had any ideas about... about marriage. What do you think I am, a totem pole? I looked at our association more as... well, as a business arrangement. You financed me through school, and when I got up in the money, I'd... I'd pay you back. Oh, Fred, Don't say any more. I know I've been blunt. But how else can I tell you? What else can I say? There's nothing you can say. But I'll tell you something. You're getting out of your element. You don't belong there. You belong here with me. And if you marry her, you'll live to regret the day you met her. Now, look. Don't be like that. Don't be a hard loser. You'd be better off dead. You don't mean that, Gloria? No. No, Fred, I... I didn't mean that. Oh, darling, please go. Before I say any more, I, I know I haven't a chance, but I... Please go. I'm sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. Bye, Fred. I'll be seeing you. Goodbye, Gloria. <laughs> later, the papers are filled with stories and pictures of Fred and Brenda and the district attorney, and parties and dinners and teas. Read them, Gloria. Pour over them. Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Adams this, and Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Adams that. Read them, Gloria. Read them and weep. Meanwhile, on a train to Miami... And Fred, darling, after we spend a few days in Miami, we can fly over to Nassau. Father has a place there, and I know some wonderful people. We can have a great time. Fred? Hmm? Oh, what did you say? <laughs> Snap out of it, darling. We're on our honeymoon. <laughs> yes, Brenda, I'm sorry. I know we're going to have a swell time. My sister Nella's spending the summer at Nassau. Why didn't Nella come home for the wedding? She was to be your bridesmaid. I told you, dear, you can't always get transportation just when you want it these days. After all, Nella's your only sister. She could have made an extra effort, hmm? What are you thinking about? Oh, business. Business? <laughs> what business? I was thinking about my new job. Uh, how did your father happen to make a place for me in the DA's office? Mm, I suppose he thinks you're a capable young attorney. Did, uh, did you ask him to appoint me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I may have had something to do with it. Uh, oh, I wanted you to start out right. You don't mind, do you? Certainly not. What's swell of you? I only hope I can make good. You will. And who knows, maybe you'll be the district attorney yourself someday. I hope so. At least I'll break my neck trying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's forget about everything for the next two weeks, but I... Oh, I love you so very much, Brenda. Darling, I'll spend all my waking moments trying to make you happy. Thanks, dear. You'll never regret the day you met me. What did you say? I said you'd never regret the day you met me. Oh. I should say I won't. Not a chance in a million. Now the happy honeymoon is over, and Fred and Brenda are back home. Fred is in the district attorney's office and progressing nicely. But Gloria, poor Gloria, still sits in her office at the Tripoli and broods over her fate. She scans every item in the society columns, searching for news about Fred and Brenda. 
And every item, every picture nurtures her resentment. <laughs> and her resentment slowly turns to hate. And finally something snaps in her mind and she begins to harbor thoughts of revenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> revenge. Joe! Joe! Yeah? What are you yelling about, Gloria? I wasn't yelling. Close the door. Sure sounded like yelling to me. I said I wasn't yelling. Okay, okay. I apologize. Oh, sit down. Oh, look, Gloria, what's eating you? Why don't you get out of this office? Go out and visit with the customers the way you used to. Why should I? Well, they all miss you. They're all asking, where's Gloria? I run out of excuses. I didn't call you in here to talk about the business. Well, maybe not, but I thought it was time I said something. Where's the evening paper? I uh, didn't get it. Why not? Oh, look, Gloria, snap out of it, will you? Why don't you quit hunting for news about Fred? You're only driving yourself nutty. Fred was a nice guy, but he's gone. He's married. Forget him. I can't. Well, you could try. It's not as easy as that. After all, he ain't the only man walking around. There's one or two others, you know. Yeah? Well, <clears throat> there's one guy in particular who might get your mind off Fred, uh, if you'd give him a chance. Yeah? Who? Well, uh, oh, I know I'm not as good looking as Fred, and I ain't got his fancy manners. But I like you just as much as he did... Probably a lot more. Sorry, Joe. At least I wouldn't walk out on you for any other dame. If you did, I wouldn't blame you. No? No. I'd blame the other woman. She had no right to take him away from me. He belonged to me. Oh, Gloria, please, please forget no, it. No, I won't. I can't. I've made up my mind. Huh? What are you thinking? Where's your car? Outside. Where's your gun? In my pocket. Some people are giving a party at their country place tonight for Fred and his wife. But Gloria... But Fred was called out of town on business. They're giving the party anyway. And she'll be there. Friends will be there. So what? We'll wait for her. And follow her when she leaves. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Nothing doing. I ain't bumping off no woman. Sit down and shut up. You're crazy. You're going absolutely nutty. I'm getting out of here. You're driving me to that house. I won't. No? I wonder if the police will be interested in knowing who killed Lefty Hammond. Gloria... You wouldn't. <laughs> wouldn't I? Well... Okay, okay, you, you win. Better. Go get in your car. I'll go out the back way and meet you in the alley. Gloria and Joe sit in the car in the deep shadows of a spreading tree. The hours drag on, and then about 1.30 in the morning, the party breaks up and the cars begin to leave. Finally, Brenda comes through the gate, driving her own coupe. There she is. That's Brenda. Get going, Joe. Is she alone? Yes, she's alone. I sure wish you'd change your mind. Don't get too close to her. No, I ain't got nothing against her or Fred either. What good's this going to do you? You wouldn't understand. I think you've gone off your beam. Maybe you're cracked. Shut up. I'm not crazy if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. Drop back a little. They say crazy people never think they're baddie. You might feel different about this in the morning, Gloria. Maybe you ought to see a doctor. Oh. Cut it out. Cut it out. Where do you get off slapping people? Move along. You're losing her. Well, lay off that rough stuff. Or I might decide to change my mind about the whole thing. Nah, you won't change your mind. It'd be funny if something happened to you. If anything happens to me, there's a letter in my safe that tells all about you. So you better see that I get back to the AAA. Okay, okay. I was only kidding. Yeah. We're coming along to that long stretch now. No cars behind us and none coming. Step on it now. Run her off the road. Now. Run her off in that ditch. Say, what's the idea? Are you trying to wreck me? Get out of that car. What is this, a holder? Get out and shut up. I haven't anything but a couple of rings. Take a rings, Joe. Well, this is a new one. A woman bandit. Any money in your purse? A few dollars. Take the money and scatter the rest of the things around. Yeah, yeah. Now, ruffle up her hair, Joe. Muss her up. You take your hands off me. Oh, have a heart, Gloria. Okay, okay. I muss her up, but good. What <laughs> are you? Stick your hands. What's the meaning of this? Uh, God, what you want? Why don't you let me alone? I'll let you alone, Mrs. Adams. Who are you? Start walking. What? Start walking off through those trees. I won't. Oh, stop. Stop Get it. moving. <laughs> What are you going to do? See to it that you don't do any more chiseling in, Mrs. Fred Adams. Huh. I don't know what you're talking about. What? Let her have it, Joe. Now, what are you stolen for? You missed her. Give me that gun. 
Well, and that's the last of Mrs. Adams. She's... She's dead. Yeah. There's a gun. Now, let's get out of here. Oh. Well, what's the matter? What are you waiting for? I... I'm kind of dizzy. Kind of sick. I can't drive, Gloria. You better drive. <laughs> and I thought you were experienced at this business. If I hadn't seen you do it, Gloria, nobody in the world could have made me believe it. Nobody. Anything about it in this morning's paper, Joe? No. No, not a thing about it. And it was the night before last, too. I, I can't understand it. Are you... Are you sure she was dead? Of course I'm sure. Oh, well, what do you suppose could have happened? She couldn't have walked away. Say, maybe they haven't found her or the car yet, huh? Ah, it's impossible. At the main highway, hundreds of cars passed there in the course of a few hours. Oh, well, maybe they've seen the car but just thought it was a wreck. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Hey, you better lay off that stuff, Joe. You've been drinking for two days now. Yeah, but I need it. I'm jittery. I got the willies like I never had before. Say, maybe I ought to drive by that place and see if the car's gone, Okay, huh? okay. Get back as soon as possible. Yeah, 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 sure. I can't get it off my mind. I, I don't mind telling you. I, I'm scared. Go on, go on. And quit talking so much. Gloria. Gloria, I went out there. Yeah, well, I know, I know. What did you see? Nothing. Nothing. The car was gone. I looked all around for the spot. There wasn't a sign of anything. No trinkets, no blood marks, no nothing. Well, then... Then they must have found her. <laughs> but why don't they say something in the papers about it? If they just said something, I, I could stand it. It's driving me nuts. Are you going to lay off that stuff? No, no, I ain't. I, I need it. I don't need it. Yeah? I don't know what you're made of, but whatever it is, it's sure tough. I never knew a woman could be as tough. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Ah, you're a jellyfish. I can understand one guy rubbing out another one for doing something against the gang, but... I never thought I'd see a woman do a thing like that. And for no good reason. There was a reason. And shut up. I couldn't have done a thing like that. You could have turned me in first. There she was. Me in there, covered with... Shut up! It's funny, this stuff. Don't seem to have any effect on me. It's just like some water. Get hold of yourself. Poor kid. <laughs> I never felt so miserable in all my life. Did you get the late papers? Yeah. Here you are. Well, anything in it? No. No? Not a word. Hey, maybe. Maybe we didn't do it, Gloria. Maybe it was just a nightmare. No, we did it all right. And proper. If I don't hear something soon, I'll go crazy. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What is, what is it? Did they find her? No. Well, what do you know about that? Well, what is it? What is it? Look at this picture. Holy smoke. It's her. It's her. Her and Fred. Mr. and Mrs. Fred Adams attend the races. When? When? Yesterday. It isn't possible. But it's her. I know it's her, Gloria. How could she? She's dead. Hey. Hey. What's the matter? Maybe. Maybe it's her. Her ghost? Don't be silly. I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving town. Look. You're in the other paper. Huh? The day before yesterday. Fred Adams and wife attend tennis match. And another picture. What could this mean? What did they say something about it? You see? You see, Gloria, it's getting you down, too. Oh, please, please, Gloria, let's pull out. It's not canny. I can't believe it. If it's in the papers, you've got to believe it. Did you double-cross me, Joe? Oh, what do you mean? Did you have blanks in that gun? Blanks? I'd certainly hate to get hit with what I had in that gun. She's dead, I tell you. Well, she better be. What'll we do? We'll wait. That's all, just wait. Okay. But I don't think I can stand it, Gloria. I'm going to pieces. <laughs> But they did wait. They waited for two more days, and Joe, fortified with his bottle, was able to hang on. <laughs> then Gloria began to crack under the strain of waiting. Joe, I... I can't stand it any longer. I've got to do it. Do what? I'm going to call Fred's apartment to see if she's there. I wouldn't. Hello? Is this the Adams apartment? Is Mrs. Adams there? Uh, an old friend from out of town. 
Yeah. Thank you. She's there. Holy gee. She she answered. Oh. I heard her. You lied to me, Joe. I didn't lie. I didn't. I had bullets in that gun. I saw her and she was dead. There's something wrong. Terribly wrong. I'm going to wait a few more days. I'll check again. And when I'm sure, I'm going to take care of you, Joe. What do you mean? I'm going to kill you. That's crazy. I don't think it would be safe to have you walking around and talking. Gloria, listen, listen. Come on, we're going to my apartment and wait. The story's bound to break sooner or later. I, I'd rather get out of town. You're coming with me in my apartment. Get moving. <laughs> Then three more days of sleepless waiting. The tenseness grows and grows. The suspense is almost stifling. Poor Joe can neither sleep nor eat. And Gloria becomes pale and drawn. Then Joe finally emerges and goes on a little scouting tour about town to see what he can learn. Then on the next night, a knock at Gloria's apartment door. Who? Who is it? It's me, Fred. Fred, wait a minute. Hello, Gloria. What do you want, Fred? May I come in? I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, of course. Come in. It's rather late, but, well, I had to talk to you. What about? <laughs> I never expected to see you around here again. Well, I was lonely. I had to talk to someone. Lonely? Well, sit down, Fred. Thanks. You look kind of tired, Gloria. What's wrong? Well, since you mentioned it, you, you look a bit weary yourself. What's wrong with you? Oh, nothing much. I sent you a check clearing up what I owed you. Did you get it? Yeah. There's something wrong, Fred. What is it? Oh, little trouble, that's all. What sort of trouble? Domestic. Domestic? What do you mean, I... But that isn't... Is isn't possible? Is that what you're going to say? Uh, y- yes, I... I thought you were quite happy with your wife. Well, things can develop suddenly. I certainly found that out. Well, what happened? Or do you want to tell me? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. I guess that's why I came here. You're always so darn understanding. You always knew the answers to things. But what happened? Well, I guess I really didn't belong in the upper crust. You had it figured out about right. Everything was all right until Brenda started to shape my career. Shape your career? Yes. She had everything all planned out for me. She and her father had it all figured out. I wanted to go into the DA's office and move up on my own initiative. They didn't want it that way. They wanted me to start out as a big shot. Did she leave you? Well, yes, yes. We just agreed to disagree. Oh. Well, where is she now? Her father's place, I suppose. But when did she leave? Yesterday. Yesterday. Are you sure it was yesterday? Of course. Why do you ask that? Well, no reason, I suppose. I, I just can't believe it. it. Seems a shame. Well, I'm very sorry for you, Fred. Believe me. I know how you feel. I was let down with a dull thud once. Were you? You should know. Oh, Gloria, I was such a fool. You were right. I should have listened to you. You could see what was coming, and I was too dumb to realize it. Have you forgiven me? Yeah. Yeah, Fred. I'd have to forgive you. I love you so much. I've never been able to forget you for one single moment. I'm sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. Fred, I... I've got a strange feeling. I don't know what it is, but... I've got a feeling you're not telling me the truth. What? You mean you don't believe me? There is something you haven't told me. What is it? Why, why, nothing. I've told you everything. I don't believe you, Fred. All right. Gloria, I, I'm... Well, I'm in a tough spot. Brenda hasn't gone away. She, She's dead. Dead? What on earth do you mean? Yeah, she was found dead beside a car a number of days ago. The day after we had a nasty argument, but I didn't do it. There have been many threats against the district attorney and member of his family. It, it may have been any one of a number of persons. Nothing's been said about it in the paper. I know that. I know it. They purposely kept it quiet, 
hoping the real killer would show his hand. <laughs> That's silly. Why should he? I don't know. Oh, darling, it's all a mess. I'm completely worn out over it. I know they suspect me. I don't know what to do about it. Gloria! Gloria! I seen her. I seen her. Who? She was standing under the lamppost at the corner. She spoke to me. She said, Hello, Joe. Oh, how's Gloria? Shut up, you're drunk. No, 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 it was her. It was Brenda. I ran for the elevator, and as the doors closed, she was coming into the lobby. She was terrible. Oh, pale and awful looking. You're simple, and you got the snakes. No, no, it was her. And she's coming up here. It's her. It's her. I, I don't want to see her. I can't look at her. I, I can't stand it. Joe, turn on the lights. I won't, I won't. Turn on those lights. Never mind the lights. Who? I can see you. All three of you. Brenda. What? What do you want? So you, Gloria. Yes. Yes, I met you for the first time not many nights ago. On a deserted highway. Joe, it is her. <laughs> Come out of the corner, Joe. I can see you. <laughs> Joe, the man who pulled the trigger. I didn't. I didn't. What do you want? So, Fred, you were in on the plan, too. You wanted me out of the way because of Gloria. You were back of the whole thing. No, Brenda, no, no. I had nothing to do with it. You decided you'd made a mistake, that you wanted Gloria. I didn't. I swear I didn't. Tell him, Joe. Tell him how you shot me down. You had the gun. Tell him or I'll... No, no, no. Get away from me. Don't touch me. I'll tell him. I'll tell him. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. She did it. Gloria did it. I couldn't... I didn't have the nerve. He's lying. I didn't do it. Go ahead, Joe. Spill it. I ain't going to take the rap for this. Gloria went off her beam when you married Brenda. She went crazy with jealousy. She knew about that party. And she made me drive her out there. We followed Brenda and then ran her off the road. She tried to make me do it, but I, I couldn't. I fired wild and Gloria grabbed the gun from me and, and let her have it. He's lying. How could she make you do it? She threatened me. She's got something. Shut up, shut up. I don't care. She can tell what she knows about me, but I can prove that she killed Brenda. How can you prove it, Joe? I wore gloves. And I still have the gun and the only fingerprints on it are glorious. You did it! I figured she might try to double-cross me. What about it, Gloria? All right. All right, I did it. I did it. I shot her. I couldn't stand it any longer. Turn on the lights, Joe. <laughs> she ain't dead. It's her. It's her. Brenda ain't dead. Good Lord. Oh, yes. Brenda's dead, all right. Quite dead. And what is she... You'll find out, Gloria. What a strange quirk of fate. It was your money that caused all this. It was you who put me through law school so that I could defend you. But now, I'm sorry to say I'll be forced to be your prosecutor. Sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. <laughs> well, Gloria, you've come to the end of your rope. Things didn't work out as you'd planned. You really killed Brenda that night. But Fred got a brilliant idea. He had Nella, Brenda's twin sister, come up from Nassau and pose as his wife. That's how all the pictures appeared in the papers. And it was Nella who just walked in on you and got a confession. And how did Fred know you were the one? Well, there were several suspects. But you, Gloria, made the mistake of phoning for Brenda too many times. And the police traced your calls. <laughs> Too bad, Gloria. Jealousy is a terrible thing. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production is composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, Sunday at 9.15... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you the strange story... Out of the fog. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The American Broadcasting Company presents Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak for Hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco. Because if you ever tried to practice the Ten Commandments down here, they'd steal nine of them and frame you with the other. So I rent boats and do whatever else comes in handy to make a buck change pockets. Sometimes the hustle pays off. Sometimes you get lunch instead. Last week it was neither of these. I hung around my place at Pier 19 day after day and nothing turned up at all. Just when I began to wonder if people had forgotten how to phone, a babe gives me a jingle. She sounds nervous and talks about trouble. Ask me to come up and hold her hand. I end up at a joint on the marina slant of Webster Street. It was probably important stuff once in the way of gold-plated living. Now it's just a tired wooden boarding house with about 30 people filling up space designed for a dozen. The paint was peeling off the walls. The garden had been on its own so long it was beginning to look like a jungle. When I rang the doorbell, I'd have given even odds a zombie would open it. I was nearly right at that. It was Hellman, a detective from City Homicide with a disposition made up of equal parts of hating people and confusion. Right then, though, he wasn't himself. His fat face was wrapped in smiles. He looked like a cat who'd learned to open the icebox. Sorry, Novak, we don't want any fish today. You're being glad. Somebody must have broken their neck. You're wrong. Again, and as usual. Somebody had some sort of bad luck. As bad as you can get. Dead, huh? You're too late this time, Novak. The killer's already in the bag. And you got the drawstring. I'm not complaining. Now scamper off somewhere and find another sucker. Put the brush away, Hellman. If you got the killer, it's even money. It turns out to be four other people. I don't know. The department managed before you dragged into town. We stumbled, but we got by. You can say that about a wine bomb. I can make it fit you. Stumble on out of here, Novak. Yeah, yeah. But first, who done it? The landlady. She evicted a guy named Burke, the hardware. He didn't live here. He rented a room for some kind of an office. He was a freelance bookkeeper. She said he made too much noise working his machines at night. Did she confess? It's open and shut, Novak. No room for your chisel. Well, if she confessed, maybe you can pin it on her. What do you mean, pin it on her? The way you work, you couldn't prove Warren's governor. That's not my department, but keep on being smart and see if I can prove you'll fit in one of our cells down in Kearney Street. Don't strain your head, Hellman. I don't want any part of anything you're near, including this place. I'll buy that, too, and I'll breeze out of here. When the press shows up, don't worry about giving him your best profile. Either way, you'll look like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> Either way, you'll look like a sack of potatoes. Gee, that's good, Novak. Before you tell Hellman that, you better go somewhere and grow a little. Look, Novak, how'd you like a tip on a horse? I got a hot one in the fifth at Del Mar tomorrow. I got a tip for you. Get out of my hair before I have to comb you out. Gee, Novak, that's no way to talk. I could be your friend. The guy was small, even for a midget. Since the rooming house was so full of interesting people, I decided I didn't want to go away after all. So I went back up the steps. Was just going to try my luck when the door opens from inside. The guy with a welcome is either middle-aged or he's done a lot of careful living. His face is as smooth and as neat as a barrel full of apples. You notice it because he acts like he forgot his face when he went into his act. The rest of them is as mysterious as an attic in a B-horror picture. I didn't need any puzzles right then, so I started to brush him off. Especially when I noticed the suit. It was so ragged it looked like he was made up to put the bum on the town. But then I decided to play it for the last. How would you like to make some heavy money in a hurry? I quit buying oil wells. I'm not fooling, would you? Who are you? Name is Jack Lansom. I'm Burke's assistant, who used to be. Yeah. He looks like quick, easy money for an undertaker. For you, too. Sure. Why not? And how? Burke has some papers in his home safe that I don't want poured over by any flatfoot snooper. They're my papers. Burke just kept them there for me. I want you to get them. I don't see any splints on your legs. I can walk, but I can't leave. Hellman's going to question all the tenants. So what do I do? Go to this address. It's on Knob Hill. Here are the keys. It's a wall safe, not a combination. 
Just two locks you have to open at the same time. The papers are in a sealed envelope marked Lansom Private. Get it and bring it here. I don't know. When a guy dies, the feds move in. They'll want to list his stuff for taxes. These aren't financial papers. They're just some private letters and things. I don't like flirting with the FBI. How would you like to flirt with 1,000 bucks? If the stuff's worth that much, it must be hot. I need those papers. Do you get them for me or do I phone somebody else? I could change my mind. Here's a hundred dollars. There's 900 more when the stuff's in my hands. You had me fooled there. You don't dress to fit this kind of dough. So I save my money. Are you going or not? Give me the keys. Lots of luck, Novak. Hey, hey, Novak, wait a minute. About that horse. Go I... get a glass of water and drown yourself. <laughs> It looked like a cinch. I flagged the cab up to the place on Knob Hill. It turned out to be one of those society page joints, all glass, brick, and snobby's doorman. Getting up to Burke's floor was as easy as walking up six flights of back stairs. The hall was empty and the key fitted. It was all so easy I began to get nervous. And you would, too, if you walked in on her that way. She was a toy-sized brunette with a perfect kind of face that could mean anything from nice people to quick death. She was smooth and beautiful. I you could say that about a whirlpool. If my breaking in bothered her, you'd never guess it from looking. Oh, hello. Toss your hat on a chair. I've been working the wrong districts. I'm glad you're here. Why, for instance? Hmm, girl gets lonely in a place like this. A uh, Berkey's out, and I don't know when he'll get back. You forgot something there. Folks call me Blanche. What's your name, friend? Pat Novak. Uh, do you go with the lease? I'm uh, in and out. Berkey doesn't like me to tell it, though, but everybody knows it, so uh, what kind of a secret's that? Didn't I surprise you when I walked in like that? Mm -mm. Berkey has a lot of friends. They come and go. I'm used to it. For a bookkeeper, Berkey does all right. He's uh, good at figures, don't you think? If he had my account, I'd be nervous. Mm, Don't you know? He just came into a lot of money. Oh, that does a comfort to his clients. Oh, to me, too. Have a cigarette. There's some in the box there on the coffee table. Mm. These are cigars. Oh, Oh, yeah, well, uh, I have some in my purse. Never mind. I'll settle for a drink. Okay. Well, let be. What do you got? Mm, that's kind of hard to say offhand. Uh, let's look in the kitchen and see. Mm-hmm. Hmm, it ought to be up here. But it isn't. I knew a girl that way once. <laughs> Berkey must have moved the bottles. Uh, look around. Uh, try those cabinets. Oh, I'll get there. Hey, wait a minute. Take it easy. What's the matter? Jumpy. Good evening, miss. Is Mr. Novak in? Yeah, I'm in. You and your horse are both out. But Mr. Novak, it's a good horse. You always come and cry? That's Pinky. He's been on my tail all night. Aren't you curious about why I'm here? Mm -mm. You must be a friend of Burke's. Would it matter? What do you mean? When you get tired of playing with those doors, let's admit you don't know where Burke keeps his booze. You don't know where he keeps his cigarettes. You don't know anything about the place because this is the first time you've been here. You're acting like a detective. Put it down, I'm just curious. And you can still fill in my question. Why not say I, uh, wandered into the wrong apartment? You don't seem anxious to get out. Maybe I like the company here. Come on in the living room. He probably has the liquor in there. That isn't what you were after. Why don't we settle for my being lonely? The town's full of lonely babes. None of them look like you. I know a cure. You? Let me guess. Well, I guess when you can be sure. Like this. Now I know. Fill me in on the rest of your visit. Huh. I'm busy. Or, uh, I could be. All right, let's close the post office. Did you get the papers? I could soak. Men don't usually treat me that way. They'd live longer if they did. Look, baby. I'm not swinging any bats until I know who's pitching. Do you give with where you fit in, or do I have to bend it out of you? <laughs> you know, I think I get like you. I think I'm getting tired of men she can twist around her fingers. Yeah, sure. I'm fascinating. Give. Don't flex your muscles. I'll tell you. Denver Red sent me. You're sure it wasn't Pittsburgh Pete or Chicago Clark? Uh-uh. He's real. If you aren't too particular about what you call a man. He owns a nightclub called the Knife and Fork out on Geary Street. Mm, then what? He sent me to get some papers Burke has hidden around the place. A small envelope. Did you find it? Sure. 
Here it is. If you want it. You give up easy. I don't have to do this sort of thing to get along. I told Red that. What else are you going to tell him? I'll tell him you took the papers away from me. Why, you got a better idea. Put down your flaps, sister. What if I didn't go back to him? What if I went with you? Uh-uh. I don't like your recommendations. Don't worry. I won't pretend I wouldn't drop you as soon as I found a better man. What do you want? Eternity? I haven't got time for that. All right, sucker. So, I'll go back to Red. He tears telephone books in half and things like that, so uh, watch him. I'll try to manage. Ah, here's the booze. Let's drink to something or other. Why not? You sure you won't change your mind about anything? Why don't you leave me your phone number? I got a better idea. Sucker. She timed it, but nice. I hardly started to get my hand up before she hit me with a bottle. The room began to spin, and I tried to stand up, but my knees gave way. I could hear her footsteps a long distance away, running. Then the door closed. I shook my head, and some of the cobwebs went away, but not enough for me to get started. By the time they did, I knew it was too late. I looked around, and the package of papers was gone. Yeah, the more I thought of how easily I'd been done in by that dame, the matter I got... Then I remembered no one was supposed to know about the papers except Lansom. Decided I'd better check on the play. I got on the phone and talked my way through a flock of bars until I ran down an alcoholic friend of mine named Jocko Madigan. He's an old-timer around San Francisco who knows more about the town than the city planning commission. He sounded good over the phone, which must have meant they were watering his drinks. Patsy, my boy, how are you? Curious. I'm sitting in on a racket that's beginning to develop too many curves. You sound like you're in a Girl Scout camp. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you nasty, immoral and Put down the horn for a minute. I want you to do me a favor. If I had a daughter and you were even in the neighborhood, I'd lock her in the cellar. I can't imagine what those Boy Scout leaders are thinking about. Well, they were Girl Scouts a minute ago. What did they do, pull a switch? Anyway, Boy Scouts don't camp, they hike. Look, I just got sapped by a dame who stole some papers. Uh, they, uh, up Mount Tam- Tamil Pius, they hiked. That's Her name's Blanche. She's tied in with a guy named Denver Wren. He runs the Knife and Fork Club out on Geary. Oh, those poor kids. And that mountain's almost straight up, too. She man. just left here. She ought to be heading for Denver Red's place. What are the papers? I know you don't own them. You, you can't read. They have some stuff in them that'll put the heat on a guy named Jack Lansom. He likes it cool. A thousand dollars worth. Oh, uh, speaking of money, there's a friend of yours here. Hello, Patsy. This is Pinky. Imagine me talking to you on the telephone. Imagine I've gone deaf. Hey, Jocko, if you can hear this, pull that punk off the line. Okay, he's gone. He said he had a horse for you. Look, dummy up to that guy. He's been floating around all night. And I'd be floating, too, if you'd be nice to him. I'll grab a cab and go out to the Knife and Fork Club. When Blanche shows up, see if you can find out what she does with the papers. Are you buying the drinks and the cab fare? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you going to do? I'm going back and see Lansom. This was supposed to be a closed deal. And will you hurry? The dame will be there and gone. Don't worry about me. You couldn't keep me away from the place. I'm growing wind. Yeah? Why the sudden lather? Well, if you're buying the drinks, there's no use my scrimping. I'm suddenly developing an awful longing for some good, well-aged scotch. So long, lover. <laughs> I ducked out of the place and started along the street looking for a cab. It was growing foggy and I couldn't see very well. In fact, I could see so little I didn't notice the car drive up. But I could hear the driver all right. All right, Bob, inside the car. You must not like arguments. Don't think it won't shoot either. Get in. You're a Patsy Novak, ain't you? You can say Patsy twice. Don't sulk. I'm doing you a favor. Yeah, thanks for the ride. I'm Reynolds. Gong Reynolds. Ever hear of me? Yeah. You sell pipe dreams. If you know that much, you know that shoveling the snow ain't no job for a preacher. So you're tough. Then what? And you give me Burke's little envelope. What is this, a mass meeting? Do you pass it over or do we have to go out in the country and get it twisted out of you? You're wrong twice. I haven't got it. You must think I'm fooling. Someone beat me to it. Who, Murphy? Murphy. Yeah, the bookie. Did he get it? A dame. She said she was working for Denver Red. Out of the knife and fork? Well, that sounds all right. Hey, what's up? You don't know? Uh-uh. I was hired to pick it up. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, I believe that. Take it or leave it, but let me out of here. Don't get nervous. Wait till we hit a quiet street. I'm broad-minded. Let me off anywhere. I said a quiet street. Before you go, I'm going to search you. How do I know you ain't lying? I'm beginning to wonder myself. (laughs) Reynolds was a nice guy for an opium peddler. No bumps, no scars. He even dropped me near a car line. Pretty soon I began to breathe regularly again and headed back to the place on Webster Street. The house was dark except for a light in one of the upstairs windows. Just as I was leaning on the bell, I hear someone coming up the steps behind me. I wish you'd stay put, Mr. Novak. Now about that horse. He's a beautiful animal. Affectionate. Look, I'm tired of this shadow act. What's your pitch? Straight over the plate, Novak. I'm doing you a favor. Someday I may need one from you. I'm far-sighted. Well, I'm near-sighted. Tell me. Hey, hey, hey. Light up and be somebody. What's your racket? Oh, put me down, Novak. I, I got connections. You, you, you can't scare me. Yeah, I can try. Going in for kidnapping midgets, Novak? Put him down and come on in. I don't want to draw a crowd. Make this the last time I see you, Pinky, or I'll fix it so you wish you had. Who was that? I don't know. I'm beginning to get curious. Forget it. You got the envelope? No. Don't sound so cheerful. Why not? Somebody changed my mind. Too much competition. Keep it understandable. What do you mean? Every tough monkey in town is after those papers, and Denver Red has the inside track. Who else? Tell me about the others. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know about them. Uh, I know how you feel. I didn't know a lot of things either, but I'm beginning to learn. Start talking. Burke used to keep books for a lot of guys around town. That's where he really got his money, covering up the racket profits from the revenue boys. Don't stop there. That's all I know. It's not enough. All right, all right. I don't know... But I can guess. Burke must have photostats of some of the records and use them to blackmail the gangsters. So it's a free-for-all with me in the middle. I didn't know about it. Honest, I didn't. You didn't know, but I get slapped, sapped, and held up. Good for me. You say Denver Red got the papers? And he can have them. I'm bowing out. Your hundred dollars is nothing, don't you see? Get the papers and we'll both be rich. Richer than anyone in town. No dice. You want them, you get them. I'll give you... I'll give you five thousand dollars. How much down? Here's the rest of the thousand I promised you. Is that fair? Fair enough. We're going to be rich, you hear? Rich. Yeah. The richest men in the cemetery. Lansom must have thought I was the biggest sucker in the city. I was through with the papers as soon as I discovered how hot they were. I could have told him, but when I saw how anxious he was, I figured I might as well use his shakes to get the rest of the thousand dollars. I headed out to the knife and fork, but my only plan was to get Jocko off the hook. After that, I wanted a lot of time in the country until things cooled off. The joint was out near Golden Gate Park, one of those community center places where you get everything that'll go in a stomach, including bicarbonate. The brunette doll was nowhere in sight, but I saw Jocko over at the bar wrestling with a double-sized highball, eased over beside him. Well, if it isn't the Boy Scout, Patsy Novak. That stuff's beginning to eat into your head, Jocko. Don't you worry. My lobes are functioning smooth as ice in a glass. What can I do for you uh, after you pay the bill? Did the Dame Blanche show up here? Yeah, about a half hour ago. What kept you? She's pretty. Uh, So's a tiger. Where is he? She and your friend Denver Red went upstairs. He has an apartment up there. Now, that's the way to live. If he bored a hole in the floor and ran a pipe down to the bar... Did you see the papers? No, and do you know a guy named Reynolds, Gong Reynolds? We've met. He was in here. He looked around and ducked out. Did he go upstairs? I don't know. You're running in big company. Reynolds and Denver Red are two of the most powerful gangsters in town. If they've got anything to do with this, you better cash in your chips and get out of the game. Yeah, don't worry. I'm all washed up with this. I heard something else, too. This guy Lanson is no country boy, either. Measure him for me. The grapevine has it. He used to be a member of Murder Incorporated, the Brooklyn outfit. He got out before they grew into big-time operators. Three of a kind. What do you know about Murphy? Don't tell me Murphy's in on this. Murphy's got the horse wires sewed up. He sewed it up with bullets. Let's get out of here. Yeah, I will in a minute. How do you get to Denver Red Shack? The entrance is outside, but what do you care? Let's get out of here. In a minute. Patsy, they're hotter than summer in Panama. Leave them alone. I'd kind of like to see that envelope. Try the post office. It's full of envelopes. Yeah, not this one. You coming with me? No, Patsy. If you've lost your mind, you've lost it alone. I'm beginning to wonder about that. Well, so long, lover. (laughs) 
I worked out of the place without causing any fuss. Eased into the apartment entrance. The place was quiet. It was so quiet you could hear me breathing as I worked my way up the stairs. There was a carpet in the halls, but even then I was careful. I listened at the door and there wasn't a sound inside. After a while, I tried the knob. The door opened. With the fog outside, you could barely make out anything in the place. Something told me to back out and forget it. There was something I wanted to know. I held my breath and listened. All I could hear was the jukebox faintly from the cafe below. And I felt for the light switch. Don't move. You're covered. What are you waiting for, Helman? The payoff? You, baby. Keep your hands up. Where's the gun? I ate it. I guess it wasn't much good at that. You didn't have any bullets left. You counted them? I counted the bullets in the body. Six bullets, one load. Who got it? Or do I have to guess? Denver Red and his dame. Name's Blanche. Know her? Yeah, I know her. She used to row stroke oar in my lifeboat. She looks the type. You want to tell me about it, or do we go downtown first? I didn't kill him, Helen. Who made those holes in him? Termites? If they did, you better keep your hat on. They might get hungry again. You got all the brains, Novak. You better shake them up. You're going to need them. You ought to get a refund on that crystal ball, Helen. That's not a bad idea. Or maybe I can swap it for a television set. I'd like to see you on those San Quentin broadcasts. You saw me come in, you fathead. You can't pin this one on me. It's pinned, Novak, but good. In fact, it's a hat pin. Try making sense. Try making this not fit your head. This is my hat. Now all you got to do is get rid of the five people who saw you wearing it earlier this evening at the boarding house. And you're clear. <laughs> We were halfway down to the Hall of Justice before I could talk Hellman into giving me another chance. Murphy was really the one who sensed it. I picked him up by phone at one of his bookie joints with Hellman listening in on an extension. Yeah, it was short and sweet. Novak? Yeah, I've heard the name. What's it in you? This may not be my business, but I got a good reason for wanting to know. Spread it out, Novak. I got work to do. Did you get a phone call tonight about an envelope with some photostatic copies of a bunch of records? What's it to you, Novak? Yeah, you did then. Yeah, some nut, I guess. Didn't give his name. Town's full of them these days. He wouldn't be a nut if Burke had something on you. Hey, what is this? Burke's got nothing on me. I pay my taxes. What is this, Novak? Some new form of shakedown? Yeah, Murphy. But you're not up the tree. Thanks a lot. Hey, it could fit. I get a chance to prove it? I can't let you go, Novak. But what if I should bend over for a minute to pick up this pencil and the door open and all? Try it and see, Helmer. Just once. <laughs> After that, I began to figure my bad luck had run out for the day. I jumped a cab and went down to the waterfront, but not to my pier. There was a guy at Pier 23 who was a friend of mine. He had a gun and a rowboat, and I borrowed both of them. I pushed off without being too careful, because between the wind and the cross chop, nobody was going to be hearing anything. Even with everything on my side, it was a long, hard row. When I hit the bottom of the ladder at the end of Pier 19, I had to sit in the boat to let my heart slow down. It was blacker the inside of Hellman's dress shoes. I took my time edging down the pier. I was just about to slide into my boathouse when I tripped the booby trap. I did a Brody, and somewhere along the line, I lost my gun, which put me even up with Lawson. He turned on the lights. Novak, you have to sneak up in your own office. You ought to pay the rent regular. I see the gags. You fix up this welcome? I was all alone and didn't like the idea of being caught from behind. Uh, what would you do about a frontal attack? I've got this gun. But since it's only you, I don't have to worry. I wouldn't say that. I think you've got all kinds of worries. Everybody has got something. And you've got Reynolds. Where is he? Take it easy. I just saw him earlier tonight and he mentioned your name. Let's keep that for the society column. I'll take the envelope. I didn't get it for the simple reason that there isn't any envelope. That fall on the head make it soft? You told me you saw it. Nothing important. Just some regular business letters. Nothing to stand up in court. I still don't understand this. You don't make sense. And I don't make dough either. I don't have the envelope. Or do you want to search me? I'm not getting that close to you. You've gone off on some tangent that I don't understand. So we'll just sit and wait till you get ready. Or until Reynolds gets here. That's supposed to scare me? Look at it this way. You don't mind if I talk? I can listen. No, you sit there. With your back to the door... That's right. Now I'll just warm the place up by closing the door. 
Now, you were saying... Suppose that the envelope was a phony. After I am on my way, you call up all the big-time hoods in town and tip them off. Now, tell me why. The boys start pouring out of the woodwork to give me the business. The ones who chase me are the boys on Burke's list. Then you could pick up where he left off. I'm not boring you, am I? Not at all. Go on. Everything was as cozy as an upper berth until Denver Red gets his girl into Burke's place before I make it. You're everything but consistent. Now you'll be trying to tag me with the stiffs down at the knife and fork. Thanks for the cue. You knew that if Denver Red spotted the envelope for a phony, the news would be all over town and your racket would be kaput, so you killed him. Nice figuring. You should have been a bookkeeper, too. You even told me to come down here so you could kill me if that planted hat didn't frame for the cops. I hate to disappoint you. So, since you know everything else... You might as well know the caliber of this gun. See? I've looked into things like that before. Everything has to end sometimes, so... Don't touch that phone. I ordered that call, just in case. I said don't touch it. You'll be hearing worse bells than that if you don't let me answer it. Okay, but watch your language. Novak speaking. How many of I thought you was out? You're the hottest man to get hold of. But I guess it's because you're a busy guy. Well, say something. That's right, Reynolds. Huh? This is Pinky, Mr. Novak, remember? Pinky Punk. What a name. That's up to you, Reynolds. What's he saying? You want to talk to him? You still am, Mr. Novak? I'm Mr. Novak. Give me that phone. Now, look, Reynolds. I'm not taking any talk off you. You'll pay up or else... You dropped something, Mr. Novak? Yeah. How about that horse? You want to get onto him? I think I can toss a sawbuck into his feed bag. Oh, gee, Mr. Novak, you'll never regret it. Okay, Pinky. Who's the goat? Pinky, I said, what's his name? Gee, Mr. Novak. What do you know? I forgot. <laughs> Pinky might have forgotten, but Lansom's memory was good. I handcuffed him to the chair and told him Reynolds would be down in a half an hour. Then gave him Hellman's phone number. He confessed to everything after sitting alone in my office for a while. I know how he felt. When the feds got the news, they moved in with a fine tooth comb, but they never did turn up anything. Nobody ever did. I'm pretty sure of that. But now and then I get the idea maybe I'm wrong. So I start nosing around for those papers. I never find the things. I usually find Reynolds instead. He's beginning to get gray. Who killed the bookkeeper? That was a landlady. Yeah. Hellman got her a room, too. Heard on tonight's presentation were Ben Morris as Novak, John Galbraith as Inspector Hellman, Jack Lewis as Jocko, and Mary Milford as Blanche, with Herb Ellis, Jerry Zinneman, Kurt Martell, and Dick Ellers. Special music by Otto Clare. Listen again next week at this same time when over most of these stations, the American Broadcasting Company presents Pat Novak for Hire. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company invites you to Showcase. NBC, in cooperation with the British Broadcasting Corporation, brings you another in its transcribed series of half-hour programs titled Showcase. In answer to your many requests, we present another of England's top-rated programs. Today on Showcase, we will hear a play from the 30-minute theater, Velvet Johnny, by Peter Cheney. Hello, Benson here. Who? Uh, Yes, he's with me now, sir. Yes, sir, I'll tell him. Chief Inspector Gringle is urgently in need of Detective Sergeant Hone. Wants me at once, does he? He does. I expect he started another of his surveys of unsolved crime during the last 20 years. It wouldn't surprise me. Taking all the notebooks and files with you? You'll probably need them. I keep those little details in my head. What a head. That's quite enough flannel from you.
Come in. Ah, Hone. Come in and shut the door. You know what today is, don't you? It's the 2nd of February, sir. Precisely. And what happened on the 2nd of February, six years ago? An old boy called Cranley was murdered over in South East District, sir. How much do you remember about the case? Cranley was reputed to be a man with money. Someone broke into the house and tried to blow the safe. They made a mess of it. The theory was that Cranley came down in the middle of it and the burglar hit him over the head with an iron bar, probably a crowbar. That was six years ago? Yes, sir. You gave the case to me to make the usual inquiries and nothing's happened up to date, sir. Are you still doing anything about it or have you forgotten it? No, I haven't forgotten it, sir. I carry the date forward from year to year, but it's just one of those cases. There's no evidence, not a thing. I tried every lead, everything I could do. But unfortunately, I'm not psychic. I never thought you were. You remember my original idea? Yes, sir. You thought that Whaley, the boy they called The Voice, had a hand in it. You wanted me to check up on what he was doing that night. And did you? Well, I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him for the very good reason he wasn't in this country. He'd gone to Australia. Nobody knew where. He came back nine months later, so I went to see him, sir. He's living over at Brixton. He's still living there. Don't you live there, too? Yes, I do, sir. Ever see him? He comes into my local occasionally. What did he say when you first asked what he was doing on the night of the 2nd of February? He said he didn't know. I thought that was pretty reasonable. Uh, easily satisfied, weren't you? Well, sir, he put it to me that if you asked 99 men out of 100, they couldn't tell you what they were doing on a night nine months before. And he couldn't. You believed him? What does it matter whether I believed him or not, sir? We know Whaley's a crook, but we've got nothing on him. He's a clever egg, that one. We had nothing else to tie him in with the murder? Nothing. Incidentally, it struck me that he was telling the truth. If I asked you, suddenly out of the blue, nine months after a murder, what you were doing on the night, I think it reasonable that you couldn't tell me. Mm, there's a certain amount in what you say. But don't let's forget that Cranley case. Remember Velvet Johnny? Oh, I do. Velvet's coming out next week. There was another clever guy. But he slipped up once the last time. That insurance office in Longacre. A very nice job. Got away with a couple of thousand that night. He's coming out next Tuesday. You know... When I went down to that place of Cranley's, all the technique looked like Velvet Johnny. The way the front door was open, the back doors wedged, the windows and the curtains fixed. All right, sir. So it looked like Velvet Johnny. I suppose I didn't think about that. There was nothing to connect him with the murder. He had an alibi for that night. What was his alibi? He was with his girlfriend, Lily Malone. Did anybody see him with her? No. You might think she was telling a lie, but the jury wouldn't. Nobody's got anything against Lily Malone, and Velvet's a good cracksman, but I don't think he's a murderer. They've all got to start sometime. Look, Mr. Gringle, are you telling me to reopen this thing? If so, where do I start and what do I do? I'm not telling you to do anything, Hone. But don't forget the case. Old Cranley was murdered six years ago, and because we haven't been able to do anything about it, there's no reason why we should forget it. How do I not forget it, sir? Do I go and see Whaley again and ask him what he was doing that night and listen to him telling me he can't remember? No, don't get cross. As long as you forget nothing, something might turn up. Don't worry about it, Holmes. Just don't forget. That's all. Nothing else you wanted to see me about, sir? Not unless it's the anniversary of another of our unsolved cases. <laughs> no, sir. Not for another four and a half months, sir. <laughs> as long as that. Oh, uh, well, maybe we're not so inefficient after all. No, maybe not, sir. <laughs> Two modern bitters, please. Two modern bitters, sir, pints? Uh, yes, and a gin. A large one, sir? No, a small one with a drop of lemon. Right you are, sir. Much obliged. Half a mild and a brown ale, please, miss. Half a mild and a brown ale. Why, good evening, Mr. Whaley. Good evening, Ethel. Did you have a good time last night? Uh, smashing. Did you go up west, like you said? We did. Went to one of those real smart dance places. Oh, proper evening it was last night. There was a Yankee girl, part of the floor show. Oh, she was a smasher. She got hold of me, pulled me up onto a little stage, and made me sing Cry with her. Oh, well, I never, <laughs> Mr. Whaley. Yeah, it was a real good birthday party. You always like some notice to be taken at your birthday, don't you? You bet I do, and yesterday was the best one I've had so far. Well... How about some service, Ethel? Run right away, Mr. Whaley. Your usual? You bet your life. Make it a double. Have one yourself? Thanks a lot, Mr. Whaley. Many happy returns of yesterday, Whaley. What? Hello, Mr. Hum. How long have you been standing there? Some time. Fancy that, and I never saw you. Must be going blind or something. Well, how's Scotland Yard? It's still there. Could I have a little talk with you? Sure. Have a drink? No, not just now, thanks. I've got a glass here. Here you are, Mr. 
Mr. Whaley. Thanks a million, Ethel. Well, here's to everybody. Here's to you, Mr. Whaley. There's an empty table in that corner, Whaley. Can we move over there? Sure. You want to? It's okay by me. Ah, this is better. I suppose the cop is always glad to take the weight off his feet. What's this little talk going to be about? Yesterday was the anniversary of the Cranley murder, six years ago. Remember? Of course I remember. We've talked about that before, Mr. Owen, haven't we? Yes, and I'm talking about it again. Remember that nine months after the murder, I came to see you? I'm not likely to forget it. Chief Inspector Gringle, who was in charge of the case, had an idea the job looked like Velvet Johnny. He knew you and Velvet Johnny had done plenty of jobs together. To see a man nine months after a job isn't fair to him or me, I know, but I wanted to know what you were doing on the night of the murder, not because I thought you'd committed it. Very kind of you, I'm sure. Because I thought it'd be the best way of getting a line on Velvet Johnny. Hmm. I wondered why you wanted a line on him. I thought he had an alibi. He had. And you weren't able to tell me what you were doing on that night because you couldn't remember. That's right. I couldn't. Circumstances alter cases. See what I mean? No, I don't. I know something now that I didn't know then. Something I learned ten minutes ago. What, for instance? The night the murder was committed was your birthday. It might have been nine months after the job when I saw you. I couldn't see you before. You were abroad somewhere, Australia, I think. But don't tell me you couldn't remember what you'd been doing on your previous birthday. You're pretty keen about celebrating birthdays, it seems, just like kids and old women of 80. So what? So it occurs to me that you did know who committed the murder. Oh? Now, if you'd told me where you were on that night, I might have been able to get to the murderer somehow through that. Perhaps you're being loyal to somebody, Whaley. You thought it best to say you didn't remember what you were doing. You didn't think I'd ever discover it was your birthday on the 2nd of February. Wouldn't you like to do some talking? Look, I'm no mug, Mr. Elm. Six years since that murder. You got on to me nine months afterwards, and I told you I didn't know what had happened. Now you're back again, so I'm thinking... What are you thinking, Whaley? Maybe it's no good being loyal to your pals. Maybe you only get yourself in bad with the police, and I wouldn't like to do that. Look, Mr. Owen, I'd like to... to think this out a bit more. Not because I had anything to do with that job, because I hadn't, but... I hate to... Do the dirty on a pal. You do all the thinking you want. When would you like to talk to me? Know where I live? Yeah. Come around to my place. Tomorrow evening about seven o'clock. That'll suit you. That'll be there. Maybe I'll have something to tell you. I'll be there. Well, now I must be on my way. I promised I'd be home half an hour ago. Oh, can't have coppers getting into trouble, even if it's only domestic. See you tomorrow evening. Good night. Good night, Ethel. Good night. Mr. Whaley, sitting there all on your own with an empty glass. That's not like you at all. I don't want no more, thank you, Ethel. Well, you do surprise me, Mr. Whaley. Not a bit like yourself tonight, are you? Oh, shut your trap. Well, I know. Hello, Lily. Hello. What's cooking? Plenty. I'd like to talk to you, baby. Come in. Would you like a drink? Yeah, I would. Sit yourself down and have a fag. Hmm. You look worried. What's up? Look, Lily, sit down and listen to me. Something wrong? You listen to me and ask yourself. You remember that Cranley case six years ago? I remember. Just about the time you went to Australia. Yeah. Landed me back two days before the blue inks were onto me. Detective Sergeant Hone and all his palaver. Tonight he got onto me again. Why? What for? Got wise to the fact that the murder was committed on my birthday, see? Now he wants to know why I couldn't remember what I was doing that evening. Coming to see me tomorrow. Looks as if I'll have to do some talking. What you gonna say? I'm going to tell him Velvet Johnny croaked old Cranley. But I alibied him. He was with me. You told him he'd been with you that night, but you didn't tell them 
It been with you all that night, did you? Keep talking, Bill Wiley. Johnny and I always worked together, see? They knew it was us all right, but they've never been able to prove anything. Weren't you clever? We were as clever all right, and we had a system of working, Velvet and me. Hmm? He used to case the joint, first of all, and then... <laughs> do you know what he did? He used to sit at that old typewriter of his and work it all out on paper. Yeah. Time the job was to be done, just what he was going to do, just what I was going to do. I used to take care of the safe. Johnny was bad at that. Was he? Mm, he was. That's why he had to do old Cranley in. Meaning what? Meaning, because I wasn't with him, he did on his own. Tried to get the safe open. But he woke Cranley and the old boy came down. Well, there was only one thing for Johnny to do. He did it. He did Cranley. It's a nice story. Hmm... I've always wondered why I've been stuck on you. I've always wondered why it was. After they got him and put him inside, I walked out on Johnny for you. Look, we'll leave the soft stuff out of it. Johnny's coming out next week. How do you think he's going to feel when he finds you've ditched him and come over to me? Maybe he's not going to feel so good about it. Maybe called Velvet Johnny's, but he's got a temper. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't try and... I know. Maybe he'll try to do me in. I wouldn't like that. Maybe you won't have to worry. I reckon they'll be waiting for him when he comes out. If you've still got that typewritten note about the Cranley job, I suppose you think that's going to hang him. But you're not going to tell me he used to sign those things. He wasn't such a mug. He never signed them, but it's, but it's easy to tell if they come from him. Oh. He always used that sm old portable typewriter with a small T worn away and the... O key broken off. He used to use the question mark for the O. Now, anybody who sees that note would know it was written on Johnny's typewriter. Just as good as a signature, see? If they had the typewriter. If you've got that note, if you gave it to home tomorrow night, they'd pull Johnny in for this with no argument. More especially if I told them I'd made a mistake. And Johnny wasn't with me that night. Right, baby. And Johnny wasn't with you that night. Do you know how I know? You tell me. Because I was with you. See? I'll see. You listen to me, Lily. You know I've never been inside. I've been what they call successful in my profession. Velvet Johnny used to spend his money like dirt. I didn't. When I went to Australia just after that murder, I sorted some very nice stowaway. I'm worth... Seven thousand pounds in Australia, Lily. Hmm. I'm thinking of settling there. What's all this leading up to? Just this. I thought it might be a good idea if you and me got married. Before next week. Before Johnny comes out, see? And when he does come out, he won't be able to get annoyed with you, baby, because they'll pinch him at once. Then you and I go to Australia where the sun's always shining. So you're going to give home the note, are you? Well, I... I'd like to, baby, but I haven't got it. I guessed you hadn't. Silly about that note. When I rang up Johnny to tell him I wasn't going to do the job, I tore up the note into little pieces and threw him into the fire. See what I mean? I see. What you mean is, if you had the typewriter that Johnny wrote the note on, the typewriter with half the T and the O missing, you could write the note again yourself. You could write it on an old sheet of paper. Maybe an old sheet you got from the time you and Johnny were working together. That's right, isn't it? That's right, Lily. How much did you say you'd got in Australia? Seven thousand quid. But that's not all. I've got two and a half thousand here. Light me a cigarette, Bill. Okay, love. Listen, you bring me two thousand quid of that two and a half thousand here tomorrow morning. If you do that, you know what I'll do? You tell me, sweetheart. I'll go and get Johnny's old typewriter. I know where it is. He pawned it a week before I went inside. Found the ticket in one of his old suits. I'll get it out. See? Good girl. You can have your talk with Detective Sergeant down tomorrow night. And when all this is over, you and me will go to Australia. I think I'd like it, though. Oh, there's just one thing, baby. It may be Owen's going to get around to you before Johnny comes out next week. Maybe he's going to ask you some questions. What if he does? Well, don't forget that you spent that night, the whole night, 
with me, see? You couldn't forget it because it was my birthday. Yeah. You'd got fed up with Johnny. You'd had a row be because he was going to do a job and you didn't like it. I know what to say. Yeah. I guess you do, sweetheart. Well, I'll be going. Must you? I'll be around at 12 o'clock tomorrow and I'll bring the dough with me. Take me a little time to get it together. You come around at 12 o'clock and, and I'll have the typewriter. You've got something, kid. Yes. I've got something. I've got the typewriter. Southampton Central, Winchester and Basingstoke is now arriving at Platform 7. You sure they'll be Johnny be on this train? It was only when he left Southampton. It stopped twice since then. I still think he'll come walking through this barrier in a moment or two. Well, we can't miss him if he does. At least you can't. I've never laid eyes on him. Well, you can do that now if you want to. There he is, coming towards us. What? That fair-haired, nice-looking bloke? That's him. Doesn't look like a murderer, does he? <laughs> Do they ever? He hasn't seen you yet. No. You get back to the car and wait. I'll pick him up alone. Right you are. But don't be too long. Hello, Johnny. Well, well, Mr. Holmes. I didn't expect a reception committee. I'm hardly a committee. How are you? How are they doing at that funny academy of yours? A bit too well. I want to talk to you. Ah, for the love of Mike. I've just come out and a copper wants to talk to me. Don't tell me I pulled a job while I was inside. No, it's worse than that. Is it? Tell me what it is. It's murder. The Cranley job. Now, look, I had nothing to do with now that. Now, let's not talk here. Let's go and have a cup of tea in the refreshment room. Okay, if you insist. I wonder what they've put in this tea. Better than the stuff I've been drinking for the last two years. But not much. Look, I don't want to seem too curious, Here's but... the story. I'll give it to you straight. When I talked to you about this Cranley job, you had an alibi. You were supposed to have been with Lily Malone, the girl who was going to marry you when you came out. What do you mean, supposed? And what do you mean, was going to marry me? That's how it is. She's gone back on her alibi. You wouldn't kid me, would you? I'm not kidding you, Johnny. She's been talking. Saying what? That you weren't with her that night. She went over to see Whaley. Whaley? Yes, Whaley. The little tramp. She never went near him that night. So while I've been inside, she's gone over to him, and now she's trying to plant this on me. Drink your tea. Tell me something. What? Is it true that you planned to have a go at that Cranley say? Yeah. Is it true that you cased the job? and sat down at that little old typewriter of yours and typed out a scheme for doing it. That used to be a way of working, didn't it? It was. Put it down to the overconfidence of youth. And when you met Whaley and handed it to him, he told you he wasn't going to play because he didn't like it. Now, well, that's true enough. But I never went near Cranley's place that night. When Whaley wouldn't play, I chucked it. You went round and saw your girlfriend, Lily Malone, instead. That's just what I did. She says you didn't. She's lying. She's prepared to go into the box and say it. And Whaley's produced the typewritten note you gave him. You know something about evidence, don't you, Johnny? There's enough there to hang you. Ah, this is a swell homecoming. All the while I was in that train this afternoon, I was thinking about seeing Lily, making plans for the future. And I walk into a murder rap. One that looks pretty hard to beat. Uh, where do we go from here? Where do you think? What is it? The old story of the police car outside? And Cannon Row, would I like to make a statement? Listen, Johnny, the police car is outside. Well, I guess that... But before I take you along to Cannon Row, let's visit some old friends. Old friends? Old friends of yours. Lily Malone and Whaley. I happen to know he's around at her place. There's no reason why you shouldn't hear what they've got to say before I charge you. Well, if that's the way you want it, let's go. Let's get it over with.
Benson, you stick around outside. Right, you are. Be ready to catch Johnny if he tries to make a getaway. Nice, trustful guys. How about the back entrance? His flats have no back entrance, and well, you know it. Come on. Why? Mr. Holmes. Afternoon, Whaley. What do you bring Velvet here for? Lily and I have got nothing to say to him. I may have something to say to you, brother. You won't mind if we come in, Whaley? We're not going to be threatened by blokes like Velvet. I'm going to do the talking, not Johnny. Okay. If you must, I suppose you must. In here. Lily, we've got visitors. Yes, I have. Good afternoon, Miss Malone. Good afternoon. Hello, Velvet. I suppose it'd be silly of me to say I'm glad to see you. What do you think? I'm sorry it had to be like this, I'm sure. You know what I think you are. Let's leave it at that. I've got something to say to you people, something important. And to anyone who feels they'd like to leave this happy little gathering in a hurry, let me remind you there's a police officer at the foot of the stairs. Yeah, come off it. Who are you threatening? He means Velvet, you fool, not you. Oh. I've explained the position to Johnny, and I've got something here that I wanted to show him in front of you too. You recognize this piece of paper, Whaley? Sure I do. I gave it to you the other day. Johnny, this is the typewritten note he had from you after you had inspected Cranley's house. Take a look at it. You can save yourself a lot of trouble, Johnny, by telling the truth. Was that written on your typewriter? You want me to put a rope on my own neck? I want the truth. I'll take a chance on you. Yeah. It was written on my typewriter. Do you recognize it as the one you handed to Whaley? Well, I, I guess it's the one. Look at it carefully. Yeah, just what are you trying to do, copper? Yeah, what is all this palaver about? That's the note he wrote, all right. Haven't I had it tucked away for the last six years? Have you, Whaley? Yes, I have. Of course Johnny wrote it. He's admitted it was written on his typewriter. What do you think, Johnny? Did you write it? Six years is a long time. It looks like the one I wrote. Well, there's, there's just one thing, though. What's that, Johnny? The address. Did Cranley live at 14 Welland Street? Well, somehow it doesn't seem to click. <laughs> you must be losing your memory, Johnny. Of course, that was Cranley's address. You seem very sure, Whaley. Been down there to refresh your memory? No. No, of course I haven't. Why the hell should I? Because Johnny did not write that note. You did. You typed it within the last few days. Oh, Bill, whatever's going to happen? Shut up, Lily. Mr. Rowan, you must be off your rocker to make such accusations. I'd like to see you prove it. I can. What? You look scared, brother. Whaley, you threw away the original note that Johnny gave you and made a deal with Lily Malone. Oh, I tell you, I had nothing to do with it. You must have. You knew where Johnny's typewriter was. She loaned it to you, Whaley, and you typed this note. You sat down at that machine and tried to remember exactly what was in Velvet Johnny's original note. You remembered most of it, but the one thing you couldn't remember, you couldn't remember the address of old Cranley's house. So you did what you thought was the wisest thing. You went round there and checked on it. And what did you write? Here it is. You wrote 14 Wellin Street. And I'll tell you, that's the ass. It's a pity you forgot they changed the names of lots of Blitz streets in London just after the war. All right. All oh, right. yes, Whaley, that was the house all right. But the name of the street was changed six months after the murder was committed. When the crime took place, it was 14 Maberley Street. And you was bragging about being so successful, Bill Whaley. I'm getting out of here. They'll get him all right. Benson? Yes? Have you got him? Oh, you've got him all right. Well, hold him. You'll be charged with murder. Lillianna Malone, I'm known to you as a police officer, and I'm arresting you on a charge of being an accessory after the fact. All right, Anson. You win. I'll come quietly. If I ran down those stairs, I might hurt my legs. And I've got lovely legs. Haven't I, Johnny? What's the matter with you? Cat got your tongue? I've got nothing to say to you. Oh, well. And I'd have sent you such a beautiful wreath if they'd hanged you. Hello, Benson here. Who? Yes, he's with me now, sir. I'll tell him. Chief Inspector Gringle. Wants me at once, I suppose? He does. 
I wonder which unsolved crime he's got in his mind this morning. I wonder. Could it be somebody else's birthday, do you think? Birthday? What are you talking about? It doesn't matter. It's not important. He must be potty. You have just heard Velvet Johnny, a play from the 30-minute theater by Peter Cheney, produced and transcribed by Charles Lefer. Each week at this time, Showcase presents a half hour of the best entertainment from the BBC, as selected by our listeners in a recent mail poll. In answer to your many requests, our next program will be Mr. Ledbetter's Vacation, an unusual tale by H.G. Wells. This is Gene Hamilton inviting you to hear Mr. Ledbetter's Vacation. Start today to ensure your child's education. Buy United States savings bonds on the payroll savings plan. General Mills, makers of Cheerios, the oat cereal ready to eat, and Wheaties, breakfast of champions, presents... The Silver Eagle! A cry of the wild, a trail of danger, a scarlet rider of the Northwest Mounted serving justice with the swiftness of an arrow... The Silver Eagle. The untamed north. Frontier of adventure and peril. The lone, mysterious north. Where one man, dedicated to the motto of the Canadian Northwest Mounted Police, faces danger and death to bring in the lawless and maintain the right. The most famous Monty of them all. The Silver Eagle. The transcribed record and events dealing with our Silver Eagle case after this message. Jenny is ten and is she good? She skip rope champ of the neighborhood. She's so quick because she knows she's got go power from Cheerios. Yes, she's got go power. There she goes. She's feeling her Cheerios. Cheerios! Cheerios! That makes sense. Try Cheerios, the wonderful oat cereal that's shaped like a little letter O. And you'll agree. You'll like that delicious toasted oat flavor. And Cheerios is ready to eat. Just pour out a big bowlful, add good fresh milk, dig in, and start getting your go power. Because a Cheerios breakfast is full of vitamins, proteins, and minerals. And those are the good things you need to help build red blood, healthy bodies, and strong muscles. So enjoy your breakfast every day with delicious Cheerios and milk and get that good go power. Then folks will say... She's feeling her Cheerios. <laughs> And now, our Silver Eagle adventure, Trouble Trail. With the hoods of their parkas pushed back, two men are crouched beside a campfire just finishing their noon meal. One of them, a grizzled veteran of the snows, is a freight sled driver. The other is a young man named Dan McPhee. How much farther to Bear's Paw? Oh, ten mile or so. We'll get there before dark. What kind of a place is it? Not much. Trading post, few shacks. About all. It'll be quite a change from Montreal. Is that where you come from? Yes. I've been working in one of the big fur auction houses there. Now I'm out here in the Northwest Territory to learn the other end of the business. Oh, I see. You're going to try your hand at trapping, huh? No, I'm going to work at the company trading post. You mean you're going to work for old Levi Haggard? Oh, not exactly. Levi Haggard is the factor in charge of the post. My family owns the company. What? Folks up this way don't care for the Wilderness Trading Company. Why not? Levi Haggard. He's the most hated man in the whole Northwest. There ain't a trapper or an engine in these parts who wouldn't like to cut his throat. But why? What's he done? It'll take an hour to answer that one. But 
Well, it's been a bad year for trappers. Famine year, you might call it. Pelts have been mighty scarce. Oh, I know that. Haggard scrubstake most of the boys, so they're all in debt to the company. That means he's got them over a barrel. He won't hand out any more credit, and when they bring in a few skins, he pays them half of what they're worth. They have to take it and like it, or they starve. <laughs> Later that same day, Sergeant Jim West, the Silver Eagle, drove his team into Bear's Paw and drew up in front of the company trading post. An old friend of his, Doc Carter, ran out to meet him. Oh, oh now, you huskies! Jim West! <laughs> I come to Bear's Paw once in five years and who do I bump into you? <laughs> Good to see you, Doc. Are you heading for the trading post? Yeah, I run out of coffee. Just passing through, so I thought I'd better replenish my grub box. You can go inside. Yes, I have to see Levi Haggard. He sent word to Fort Smith asking for a mobby. Let's go in and see what's on his mind. Sure, come on. Wonder if he's changed any. <laughs> Stingiest man I ever knew. Here till he squeezes mosquitoes just to get the towel out in their hide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Silver Eagle, huh? Hello, Levi. You took your time about getting here. I just got your message the day before yesterday. By the way, this is my friend, Doc Carter. Oh, we've met before. Yeah, Haggard and me have met. You're looking haggard today, Haggard. Uh, keep your <laughs> opinions to yourself. I don't intend to pay for them, Dr. Carter. Why did you ask for the services of the Northwest Mounted? I was robbed about a week ago. A holdup? Bet all he got was dirty hands. A sneaking polecat broke into the post at night when I was sleeping. Noise woke me up. I got out of bed just in time to see him run out the door. I traded shots with him. One of his bullets creased my scalp, knocked me unconscious. I didn't wake up till the freight driver pulled in until after midnight. He found me lying on the floor. How much was stolen? Close to $1,100 in cash. Did he crack your safe? Yes, uh, safe's out of order. The dial mechanism won't work. I had the money hidden in a box under the counter. Did you see the robber? No, it was too dark, but I know who it was. Uh, there was a fresh snow that night. I saw his tracks outside. He had a patch on the sole of his left mucklock. And it happens I saw tracks like that the day before. They were made by a trapper who came to the post, a man named Abel Newton. I doubt that that evidence would stand up in court unless the money were found in his possession. There's more than that to convict him. Before he creased my scalp, one of my bullets winged him in the shoulder. He'll still be nursing that shoulder. Son, this is Bear's Paw. Just the way you described it. That's the fur post over there. Will you be stopping here overnight? No, I'm going on up to Fort Smith. Cover a few more miles and camp on the trail. Uh, howdy, boys. I'll take my luggage off your sled. Who's the stranger? His name's Dan McPhee. Meet the boys, Dan. How do you do? My name's Jeb Finley. Well, I'm glad to know you, Jeb, but, but before you shake my hand, maybe you'd better know something about me. What's that? Well, I've come to work at the trading post. My family owns the Wilderness Trading Company. Am I hearing right? I've always wanted to know what a human bloodsucker looked like. <laughs> I'll take that this time, because I know you don't understand that I want to be friendly. But... Friendly? <laughs> you sure got a nerve using that word after the way your outfit operates. When it's a good year, you get rich on the furs we bring in. When it's a bad year, we start. I don't make company policy. No, you let old man Haggard do the dirty work while you and your kind sit back and rake in the profits. If I felt that way, I wouldn't be coming out here to learn about things firsthand. You were asking for trouble. I'm not asking for trouble, but I'm ready for it if it comes. That sounds like you're daring me. Now, take it easy, Jeb. No man told you to me. I'll wipe up the ground. I said take it easy, Jeb. No, Jeb. Fear, Bill. I think I can handle this. No, I right, try this. Oh. <laughs> Keep your guard up, son. Right home and tell your family about this. You started this. I'm going to finish it. All right, bring it up, you two. Huh? I said bring it up. Here. All right, all right. Let me go. Now, what's this all about? We sort of lost our tempers, I guess. How did it start, Bill? I just brought this young fellow to the village and, well, Jeb picked an argument with him. What's your name, mister? Dan McPhee. McPhee? Are you connected with the trading company? My family owns it. Oh, and that explains it. You started the brawl, eh, Jeb? He was asking for it. You mind telling me your name? I'm Sergeant Jim West. This is my friend, Doc Carter. Well, glad to know you. Glad you came along, Doc. It's good to know there's police in these parts. I'm not stationed here. The trading post was robbed last week. I'm going out now to arrest the man who did it. In the meantime, there'd better be no more trouble. If anyone starts anything, I'll put him in irons as soon as I get back. Do you mind if I chase along with you, Jim? No, come along, Doc. Ah, 
Howdy. Are you Abel Newton? That's right. I'm Sergeant West, Northwest Mounted Police. What can I do for you? We'll step inside if you don't mind. Yeah, it's kind of cold out here. What's this all about? That bulge inside your shirt. Is that caused by a bandage? Why, why, yeah. Bullet wound? Uh Uh-huh, I, uh... I accidentally shot myself in the shoulder when I was taking my gun down from over the fireplace. Where are your mucklucks? Over there in the corner. Why? Go take a look at them, will you, Doc? Yeah, sure. This pair over here? That's them. How about it? That old man Haggard is right. He's got a patch on the sole of the left one. Abel Newton, I arrest you in the name of the Queen for the robbery of the Wilderness Company trading post. Have you anything to say for yourself? What's the use? I don't know how you got wise to me, but you did, so... Where's the money? Money? What do you mean? I never took any money. You've just confessed to the robbery. I broke into the post. I traded shots with old man Haggard. I admit that. But I wasn't after money. Reminds me I didn't get my coffee. What were you after? Rubbing ammunition. It was broke and Haggard wouldn't give me credit. He knew I would have paid him back. According to Haggard, at least $1,100 was taken from a box under the counter. He's lying. Or else he took it himself. I don't know about you, Jim, but I think this lad's giving it to us straight. We'll look for the money before we decide that. Keep him covered, Doc, while I go... Reach, Manny! You too, Gramps. Gramps? I yeah. just dragged you out of a fist fight. Are you coming around here looking for some more trouble? You're not sending my pal to prison, not for robbing that crummy fur company. Old man Haggard told him I stole a pile of cash. I heard what they said. I was listening outside the door. It's a lie, Jim. Haggard's trying to frame me. I'll take your word for it. Don't you believe me? What's the difference? Quit your blabbing and clear out. Clear out? If you're innocent, why be sent up for a crime you didn't commit? Now make a run for it. Now's your chance. But what about you? I'll hold them here till tomorrow morning. That ought to give you time enough. All right, but first I gotta get my park and my gun. I'll prove he framed me. How did you happen to trail us here, Jeb? I heard what you said back in town about going out to arrest the man who robbed the post. You knew Abel Newton was the man? Sure. He came to my cabin the night it happened. He was wounded. Passed out and I patched him up. Practice in medicine without a license. Did you hear him, Jim? All right, I'm ready to go. Good luck to you, Abel. I won't forget this, Jeb. So long. All right, you two. We've got a long night ahead of us, so I reckon you may as well sit down. But I warn you, no false move. Back to our thrilling Silver Eagle adventure in just a few seconds. But first, listen to this. Diving Doris is 13, and she is a diving queen. She can do a flip because she knows she's got go power from Cheerios. Yes, she's got go power. There she goes. She's feeling her Cheerios, Cheerios, Cheerios. That's a mighty good idea for you. Just make sure you eat a big bowl of Cheerios and milk every breakfast, and you'll get go power, too. Because a Cheerios breakfast is loaded with proteins, vitamins, and minerals, the very things that help build healthy bodies, strong bones, good red blood, and muscles. Why, they'd be the sort of breakfast you'd go for even if they didn't taste so good. And they do taste delicious. Cheerios are a real oat cereal already cooked with a delicious toasted oat flavor. So that's for you. Swell-tasting Cheerios and milk for Go Power. Eat them every morning, and you'll hear... She's feeling her Cheerios. Now back to the Silver Eagle, Sergeant Jim West of the Mounties, and his stirring adventure, Trouble Trail. When young Dan McPhee arrived in Bear's Paw to take over the management of his father's trading post, he was quick to sense the high tension existing between the traders and the company. This situation was brought about by a poor trapping season and Levi Haggard's refusal to extend any more credit to the Indians or the white men who dealt with the company. No, they've come whining to you, have they? You know what happened when I arrived here, the fight I got into? That's pretty clear evidence of how they feel toward you and the company. I'm running a fur post, not a charity bazaar. My job is to make a profit for the directors. But don't you see, in the long run, we'll lose. We need friends. Without them, we can't hope to stay in business and prosper. We always have prospered. You may have a lot of newfangled ideas, but you're here to serve an apprenticeship. As long as I'm in charge of this post, we'll have the... (gasps) Abel Newton. Surprised to see me, Haggard? Why are you pointing that gun at us? You shut up and you won't get hurt. It's this old buzzard right here that I'm after. We've got a little score to settle. <laughs> now, how many times I've heard the trappers say they'd like to have you in their sights. Now that's right where I've got you. Hi. 
How long do you think you can hold us here, Jeb? Until tomorrow morning. You know, Jeb, this doesn't make sense. It does to me. Why should you hang for murder? Hang for murder? That's what I said. Why should you hang for murder just to save your friend from being convicted of robbery? I haven't killed anyone. You're going to have to to keep me from leaving this cabin. Hey, take it easy. Where do you think you're going? I'm going out that door. Hey, Jim. I'm warning you, Silver Eagle. Sit down on that chair. Sorry, Jeb, but I'm leaving. And you'd better keep your eye on me because the second you look away, I'll draw. I'll shoot if I have to. Go ahead if you want to hang, but I think you... Take him, Doc. Wait, what? Oh, take that. Oh, you don't. Hey, let me go. Oh. I got him, Jim. Got his sweater pulled over his head. Now I twist it around tighter like this. You tickled me. Push him in that chair, Doc. Sit down. Good work, Doc. Thanks. What do you want to do with him now, Jim? We'll tie him to that chair and manacle him. You mean you're going to leave me here while you go after Abel? That's right. But you can't do that. You've interfered with the law. You're under arrest. But you may be gone all night, maybe a couple of days. You don't know where Abel went. Won't take that long to run him down. In any case, we can't take you with us. Come on, talk. Let's get busy. Night had long since fallen, but a full moon and the flashing northern lights made it easy to follow Abel's tracks in the snow. His trail led to the company trading post at Bear's Paw. Oh, oh, now you huskies. Still can't figure why Abel would come back to the fur post. For revenge, Doc. Remember, he claims Haggard framed him. Well, let's go inside and see if my services are needed. Oh, well, I'd like to collect a fee from old Haggard for a doctor. Hope he isn't dead. So do I. Come on, we'll soon find out. Jim, look, that ain't Haggard. It's Dan McPhee. Take it easy. We'll have you untied in a few seconds. You better stop gobbling like a turkey or you're going to choke on that gag. There you are. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Do you have a knife with you, Doc? A scalpel? Sure. Hold still while I cut these ropes. What happened? Oh, the man you were going to arrest came here. He tied me up and took Levi Haggard away with him. He forced him to go at the point of a gun. Did he say where he was taking him? No, I... I couldn't figure it out. He accused Levi of framing him. I think he was going to kill him. Hurry up with those robes, Doc. One more incision in it. There. You're free, man. Oh, thanks. Come on, Doc. There's no time to lose. Oh, wait till I get my parka. I'm going with you. According to Dan, Abel Newton had about a half hour's start on the Silver Eagle. But Jim West figured that half hour could spell the difference between life or death for Levi Haggard. He knew that Abel Newton was desperately trying to prove his innocence and might resort to violence to force a confession from Levi Haggard. Finally, the Silver Eagle and Dan came in sight of Haggard and Abel Newton on the banks of the frozen slave river. There they are! Up with your hands, Newton! You will take me! Oh, oh, what a shot! Right out of his hand! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Levi's dead! He's killed him! He's not dead, he just fainted. Take a look at him, Doc. See if he's still breathing. Yeah, sure. How about it? He's still alive. I'll rub some snow on his face. That'll bring him around. He got so scared when I gave him a count of three, he passed out. No. No, I, I don't know Stop where... Stop struggling, Levi. You're all right. Tell us what happened. Uh-huh. Oh, you. It's you, Sergeant West. Now, that crazy fool Newton, he was trying to make me confess I took the money myself. He was threatening to kill me. I was just trying to scare him into talking. Do you still think Levi was trying to frame you? I don't know what to think now. Thought he was. Now I'm not so sure. If he had the money, I reckon he would have told me. Haggard has had plenty of chances to cheat the company, but he never has. We've always found him honest to a fault. Levi, do you still think Newton is guilty? Blamed if I know. If he is, he was sure putting on a good act. Don't seem like he could be guilty the way he was trying to make me confess. Search Newton, Doc. Hold still, Newt. We searched his cabin. No money there. He hasn't any cash on him, Jim. Where does that leave us? The money certainly didn't vanish into thin air, but... Wait a second, Levi, you said the freight driver found you unconscious? Mm, that's right. Was that Bill Dorcas, the driver who brought Dan up here? Yep, that's the one. He was on his way to Chapuin at the time. That's where he picked me up. He could have taken it before Levi regained consciousness. That's right, he could have. We'd better go after him. He'll be camped for the night somewhere on the trail. Well, you don't expect to find the money on him now, do you? The robbery happened a week ago. Why not? His cabin's up at Fort Smith. It's not likely he'd hide the money at Chapuin. He couldn't have. I met him when he arrived at Chapuin, and I was with him until we left, an hour later. All right, you two go back to the post and take Newton with you. Levi, I want you to see that he doesn't escape. Leave it to me. I'll watch him like a hawk. Dan, go to Newton's cabin. Levi, I'll give you directions. There's a man there named Jeb Finley. He's tied and handcuffed. What do you want me to do? Here's the keys to the handcuffs. Turn them loose and keep a gun on them and hold them there until I get back. Sure thing, Sergeant. All right, Doc, let's hit the trail. (laughs) 
It was about two o'clock in the morning when we found the freight driver's camp. His dogs were staked out between two trees, and Bill himself was rolled in his sleeping bag. Wake up, Bill. Huh. Hey, what's going on here? Take it easy, Bill. I'm Jim West. Silver Eagle? What in blazes are you doing here? Crawl out of your sleeping bag. I'll have to search him. Search me? For what? Eleven hundred dollars in stolen cash. Once again, we drew a blank. The money wasn't on Bill's sled or his person. Yes, me, I think you're both plumb out of your mind. Eleven hundred's a lot of pills these days, Bill. You can't blame a silver eagle for Wait searching, a minute. For searching everyone. To, uh, there is someone else who could have taken the money. Who, Jeb? Jeb Finley. Jeb Finley? I'll explain later. Come on, let's go back to Bear's Paw and check up on him. Once again, we headed back to Bear's Paw. Jeb's cabin was located about a quarter of a mile from the trading post. When we got there, we went inside, lit the oil lamp, and began a thorough search. What you climbing up there for? Looking for a loose stone. What's more, I think I found it. The stone or the money? The money. There's a big wad of it. Suffering MDs look at big enough wad to get you to South America. There's at least a thousand dollars here. What made you suspect Jeb Finley? He wasn't at the post when the robbery happened. No, but Abel came here immediately after the shooting to have his wound bandaged. He passed out. During the time he was unconscious, Jeb must have gone to the post. He knew that Levi had been shot, but he was unconscious, maybe dead. It was a perfect chance. And by luck, he found all this money under the counter. Don't know. Either. Jeb Finley. Jeb Finley it is, gents. With a loaded gun and a reason to use it this time. It was mighty smart work finding the money here, Silver Eagle. What did you do to Dan McPhee? <laughs> he fell asleep. So I took his gun and walked out. I had a hunch you'd wind up here sooner or later. A little too late, it seems. Just one thing I don't understand. You mean why I pulled that stunt of keeping you from arresting Abel? That's right. You arrested him, he might have proved his innocence. After all, he didn't have the money. You might have come around to suspecting me, just like you did. But if he made a getaway, I was safe. Even so, you were risking a prison sentence. As an accessory? <laughs> I doubt it. I don't think any jury would have sent me up when I gave him that sob story about Abel once saving my life. I see. And now what happens? I'd never be safe with a silver eagle hunting for me, so I reckon this is where you cash in your chips. Drop that gun, Jeb McQueen! Willie. Willie, pull through, Sergeant. Yes, Dan. It wasn't a bad wound. Oh, sorry I let you down. I woke up just in time to follow him. I'd have been there sooner, but I had to go to the post to get a gun. It was my mistake for letting him take off his handcuffs. There's a favor I'd like to ask, Sergeant. What is it? I wish you'd let Abel Newton go free. I won't press charges against him for breaking into the post, and I've persuaded Levi to forget the rest of it. And that'll have to be up to the inspector. From now on, there's going to be a new company policy for both the white trappers and the Indians. And Levi Haggart will toe the line... Or else. You see, the family has put me in charge. A good decision. When I left Montreal, I never thought I'd have to go through so much excitement and danger just to get to be manager of the post. Hey, you should complain. Look what I went through. All I came to get was a sack of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever hear of a cereal box that sings? Well, I'm going to tell you about a special Wheaties box that practically does just that. Here, listen to a few seconds of this record. Pony boy, pony boy, won't you be my pony boy? Don't say no, here we go. Now, wasn't that record sharp and clear? But here's an amazing thing about it. It came from the front of a special Wheaties box. That's right, there's an actual five-inch plastic record sealed right on the front of this special Wheaties box I'm talking about. All you do is take a pair of scissors and cut the record out, easy as pie. Then play it on any 78 RPM manually controlled record player. And listen, Pony Boy is just one of the tunes you can get. There's also On Top of Old Smokey, Glow Worm, Blue Tail Fly, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and many others. So go down to your grocer right now and pick up the special Wheaties record box. Remember, these records are absolutely free of extra cost. A real bargain in fun. Today's story of the Great Northwest was written by James Lawrence. Jim Amici stars in the part of Jim West. Joe Bideau is played by Jacques Lister. 
The Silver Eagle is a copyrighted transcribed feature of Jewel Radio and Television Productions. Recording director, Robert Wilson. This is Bill O'Connor. Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Chester Morris and Glenda Farrell in The Man from Medicine Bow, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you on behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware International Sterling, world famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel greeting you from the stage of the Silver Theater in Hollywood and bringing you the 28th in our new series of dramatic productions. Before the curtain rises on today's performance, we'd like to announce that for the next two weeks, Silver Theater will star Robert Montgomery. And among the other brilliant personalities whose names grace our guest book for future dates are Joan Crawford, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Helen Hayes. The house lights dim. And the silver curtain is about to rise on the first act of The Man from Medicine Bow, a comedy by Paul Franklin, starring Chester Morris and Glenda Farrell as Dave Sheridan and Connie Bannister. The scene, the Lazy Bee Ranch, one of the finest outfits in Wyoming. Dave Sheridan, young owner of Lazy Bee, is just riding up to the ranch house. Hello, Judge Ellsworth. Be right with you. All right, Dave. Where do you want us to put these yearlings, Dave? Back in the North Corral, Tags. Whoa, there, boy. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Judge. Why, not at all, David. I suppose you know why I'm here. Well, sure, I got an idea. Mm, yes. <clears throat> uh, David, according to the terms of your father's will, of which my bank is the trustee, we are authorized to turn over to you today the proceeds of the entire estate. And whereas... Well, never mind the whereas is. Where's the check? The check? Why, you... You mean you're not going to let us reinvest the funds? Or well, maybe after I get back, Judge. You see, I'm finally taking that trip to New York. New York? Yes, but... but now, nah, I... don't you give me that, Judge. It was bad enough that Dad hated New York and fixed that will just to keep me from going there. But today, the provisions of that will have been carried out, so I'm on my own. Well, why, why should you go east? After all, the West's mighty fine country, Dave. Oh, the West, yeah. Where men are men. Nothing ever happens anymore. Back there, it's different. Look, Judge, do you realize what goes on in New York? The kind of people that live there, the things they do? Well, I'll bet you don't even listen to Walter Winchell. Huh? Why, well, I... I well, well, I do, I... I do, and what's more, I've read every story, every column written about Broadway for the last ten years. Maybe I've never been out of Wyoming, but I know New York almost as well as Slapsy O'Connor himself. Slapsy O'Connor? Sure, the head of the poultry racket. You mean you've never heard of him, Judge? Ah, oh, don't you see? There's no use talking when it comes to Manhattan. We speak a different language. Well, perhaps we do, but the fact remains that you will have a good deal of money and you don't know anyone back there. Oh, don't worry about that either, Judge. There is one person in New York that even Dad admitted was a square shooter. Roomed with him at college. A banker named Bannister. And I always promised that if I did go east, I'd look him up. Well, I, I wish you'd reconsider, David, but I... I suppose you will. Oh, not a chance. I wired Mr. Bannister this morning, and as soon as he gives me the come on, I'm coming on. Uh, yes, sir? Miss Bannister is expecting us, Miss Dillon and Mr. Van Ostrand. Oh, yes, Mr. Van Ostrand. Miss Bannister is in the library. Thank you. 
Say, Teddy, we've just got to talk Connie into going with us this weekend. Leave it to me. Oh, Connie. Hello, Kay and Teddy. Oh, you're just in time. This is wonderful. What's happened? Me. I've just inherited the Lone Ranger. I owe silver. You, you what? Say, Teddy, does she look all right to you? Never can tell about the Bannister family, I always say. All right, you can clown, but look at this. This telegram that just came for Dad. Yeah? Naturally, I couldn't get it to him. He's on the Normandy. So I opened it. And listen. Dear Mr. Bannister, always promised Dad would look you up if I came New York. Stop. Anxious, leave Medicine Bow at once and fly east. Stop. Would it be convenient for you to show me some of the towns? Stop. Particularly anxious to meet any gangsters you may know. Stop. Please wire a reply. Gratefully yours, David Sheridan. <laughs> oh, Connie, I don't believe it. It's a gag. It's not a gag. The man actually believes we hobnob with racketeers and mobsters. Well, who says we don't? Teddy, can't you help Connie out? Haven't you got a thug friend or two left over from Prohibition days? What do you mean, friend? What's the matter? Who is this guy, Sheridan? And if he's coming here to try to muscle in on our territory, I'll rub him <laughs> out. That's what I'll do. I'll <laughs> rub him out. Sheepers, how you gonna do it, killer, honey? Oh, this may be funny to you, but look, I've got to... Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Wait a minute. What, Connie? Look, do you suppose... Now, this Dave Sheridan has never seen any of these gangsters, has he? So what's to stop you from providing them for him? Hmm? Us? Yes, you. Kidding it just like you were doing now. Oh, Connie, the guy will never fall for that. <laughs> the fellow who wrote that telegram will fall for anything. And besides, if he's any kind of a person at all, he'll only laugh himself when he gets wise. Oh, let's try it. First, I'll wire him to come on. And then we'll have to get in touch with Babs and Clark Palmer. After all, just you two won't be enough. Then, then a night or two after he arrives, I'll make reservations at one of the clubs. You, Teddy, can be Slapsy O'Connor, and Clark can be Bub's Halstead, and you two girls will be their mars. <laughs> oh, then somehow Dave Sheridan and I will just happen to bump into you. Then we'll give him a taste of it. You know, I still can't believe it. You know that, don't you, Mr. David Sheridan? Oh, you mean I should have worn chaps and carried six shooters? Well, hardly that. But I was all prepared the other day for boots and a ten-gallon hat. And then you stepped off that plane dressed just like a page out of Esquire. <laughs> yeah, and what then, Connie? Well, I... I was surprised. Disappointed? No, surprised. Oh, gee, Connie, it, it's really been swell of you to bother with me like this. Meeting me, showing me the town, having me to dinner. Oh, by the way, more coffee? Oh, no, thanks. Say, uh, Connie. Yes? I've been meaning to mention this. I... I'll bet you think I'm an awful hick. I mean, that wire I sent about, well, about all the things I wanted to see. Gangsters and what have you. Well, I must admit, until I saw you, I, I did have a different picture. Well, I'd like to have you understand how I feel about that, Connie. You see, I came from a part of the country where, well, the so-called bad men used to operate. Why, my granddad led the posse that chased Bat Masterson out of the territory. Really? And now, all the men like Masterson and Billy the Kid and Wyatt Earp, I mean, they're kind of men. They're not out west anymore. They're back here, in New York, in Chicago. Maybe it's crazy, but I, well, I'd like to see some of them face to face, just to see if they're anything like my idea of them. You're still determined to meet gangsters, Dave? Yeah, if it's all the same to you, but, oh, maybe you don't know any. Oh, I, I know some, all right. Ever hear of Slapsy O'Connor and Bugs Halstead? O'Connor and Halstead, have I? <laughs> you know them? Yeah, yes, Dave. Uh, we'll probably see them tonight. You see, I, uh, I made reservations at the Club Alamo. Club Alamo? Yes, that's where O'Connor and Halstead hang out. At the Alamo? Ah, oh, Connie, the Alamo belongs to Mushmouth Davis. Everybody knows that. You don't tell me. Why, sure. Halstead and O'Connor own the 43 Club. Well, of course, I wouldn't know. I've only lived in New York all my life. Well, you don't have to take my word for it. Here, look at these. You believe Winchell, don't you? Clippings. Why, your wallet's stuffed with them. <laughs> sure, I've been saving every word written about Broadway for the past ten years. Of course, if you, if you want to go to the Alamo... Oh, no, no. You want to see the town, right? We'll go to the 43. <laughs> Connie. Huh? 
What's wrong? Is it is it my dancing? The dancing? Oh, if you're a sample of medicine goes dancing, then a lot of the men I know should go to Wyoming. Well, then if it isn't that, it's something else. You know, you've been quiet ever since we got here. Well, it's just that... Well, well, look, Dave. Don't you think we ought to skip this gangster business? But why? Dave, do you realize that that type of... of... Huh? Oh, nothing. Let's dance. Sure. Dave. Yeah? What is it? Dave, over there. At that table in the corner. That's them. Who? That's Halstead and Slapsy O'Connor. They're sitting there with their two malls. No! Connie, are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. Shall we, um... Shall we go over there so I can introduce you? Oh, come on. Oh, what a break. Sadie, do, do you really know them? No. I went to school with them. Oh, great. Well, here we are. <laughs> Hello, Mr. O'Connor and Mr. Halstead. Oh, How are you? Game. How's tricks, girlie? Oh, fine. This, um... This is my friend, Mr. Sheridan, from Wyoming. Oh, an honest goodness cowboy. Hiya, Buck. Did he bring his horse and guitar? All right, quiet, you dames. Miss Bannister and Mr. Sheridan, Miss LaRue, and Miss LaJoy. Just call me Margie, big boy. And my pal, Bugs Halstead. Yeah, please, Hey, won't you drag up a chair and join us? Well, sure. That is, if Miss Bannister... Oh, why uh... not? Oh, gee. I wish that music had stopped. Don't you like music, Miss LaRue? Huh. Every time this mob of bugs pulls a job, I gotta sit in a car with the radio on. Boy, do I hate music. Say, talking about jobs. <laughs> we put away a neat one yesterday. Uh, three guys get their throat slit, and the cops ain't got any idea who pulled it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three men had the... You mean you? No, uh, uh... not us. We just run the mob. A couple of Brooklyn boys who take care of the finger work. Oh, uh, what's the matter? Don't you like knife jobs, Bunny? Who, me? Oh, sure. Nothing like a shiv, is there? A uh, what? A shiv, a knife. Isn't that what you call them? Oh, yeah, sure, a shiv, sure. Say, uh, you seem to know what the score is around here, don't you? Well, I try to keep up on things. Out west, they seem to keep ahead of things. Sure. Talking about, um, shivs, uh, you ever handle one? Well, no, not really, but... I've done a little work with a rod. That's a gun. Yeah? Say, you know, that gives me an idea. Hey, look, buddy. We're figuring on pulling a big stick up, see? Over 200 G's in it cash. Everything's set, except we ain't got a, a, a dynamite. Oh, you mean a soup man. Yeah, someone to blow it up. Nah, I mean a guy what's handy with a gun. Oh, I, I thought you called them torpedoes. That was last year. Now we call them dynamiters. I'll try to remember that. Yes, by all means, Dave. It'd be a shame to go back home with last year's vocabulary. Look, honey, do you mind clamming up? Oh, We're God. talking business. I'm sorry. Pardon me. Okay. Now, here's the office on the job. These New York bulls don't know you. You handle a Tommy gun and we cut you in for a third. How about it? Well, I don't know. I I hadn't oh, quite... You wouldn't have to dump many guys. Just two, three watchmen. Just two or th Now, look here. I don't mean I don't like you fellas, but, well, you see, I'm not very good with a Tommy gun. Yeah? Well, you know too much now for us to deal you out. You feel that? Yeah. Uh, what is it? At the 45, I got my puck. Now, how about it? Well, look here, now, I... Now, wait a minute, boys. Boys, he's right. You can't expect him to make up his mind without thinking it over. You've got to give him time. Yeah, so he can run to the cops and squeal. Oh, now, Bug, Slapsy, please, give him a chance. Don't force him into it. Not in dawn. Well, give him till tomorrow. Now, look, you can all come to my apartment for cocktails. Say, um, say about three o'clock. He'll be there. I promise you he'll be there, and he'll give you his answer then. Well, okay. But, sister, if this hillbilly crosses us, it's lights out. Remember that, Wyoming. Lights out. Yeah. I'll try to remember that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before the curtain rises on Act Two of tonight's Silver Theater performance, I'd like to say just a few words about important occasions. Because so often it takes an important occasion to make people realize how inadequate their silverware is. Let's say you're giving a wedding breakfast for your daughter, or a very special dinner party for your husband's client. Naturally, you want everything to go off particularly well. 
But if your silverware is a, a miscellaneous collection of two or three different kinds, then you're not going to be as happy about that important occasion as you should be. So why not do this? Now, accept the invitation of John Conti. Ladies and gentlemen, why not visit your silverware dealer tomorrow, Monday, and see the beautiful 62-piece service of gleaming silver plate, which 1847 Rogers Brothers now offers you at a saving of more than $14 over open stock price. It's created in the pierced pattern Love Lace, a pattern of wedding ring orange blossom inspiration whose sterling-like detail gives it a rich and unusual beauty. And on every graceful piece is that proud year mark, 1847, to assure you that here is silver plate made by America's foremost designers, a house of more than 92 years' supremacy in silver plate design and craftsmanship. See this lovely service tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, and find out on what surprisingly easy terms you can own the aristocrat of silver plate. 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate. Again, the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain rises on the concluding act of The Man from Medicine Bow, starring Glenda Farrell and Chester Morris. It's late the following morning. It's been a fitful, restless night for Dave Sheridan, tossing and turning. Still unaware that his meeting with Slapsy O'Connor and Bugs Halstead at the Club 43 has been only a hoax. He is still sleeping when a few blocks away. Come on, let's get out of here. All right, step on it. Eastern National Bank robbed at 200,000. Hello. Are you sure Miss Bannister's not there? Well, has she heard about the robbery? House and O'Connor. Yeah, they did it. They got a father's bank. Huh? Oh, never mind. Listen. They're supposed to come to her apartment at 3 o'clock. If they, sh they show up, don't let them in. Meanwhile, I'll try to head them off at their nightclub. Yeah, thanks. Hey, what do you want? O'Connor and Halstead. Where are they? What's that to you? Never mind. Just tell them it's Dave Sheridan from Medicine Bowl. Medicine Bowl? And I want to see him about that Eastern National Bank robbery. What? You see, I know who pulled that job. You do, eh? Okay. Just stay where you are. We got to do something about... The... What do you want? Don't you know we're busy? Slapsy, Bugs. There's a guy out here who says he knows who's pulled that job this morning. What's that? He does, huh? Some stoolie looking for a cut. Ditch that bag. Check. Okay, let him in. Get out in the street and keep your eyes and ears open. Maybe he didn't come alone. Right. Hey, you. Yeah? Go on in. Sure. Thanks. Now look here, you men. You... Hey. Wait a minute. Yeah, What? Well, there's some mistake. I, I want to see O'Connor and Halstead. I'm O'Connor and he's Halstead. What about it? Oh, now, don't kid me. Look, I know Halstead and O'Connor. Miss Bannister and I had dinner with them and their malls. Uh, their friends here last night. Eh? Yeah? Yeah, you was here last night. I remember now. I seen you with that Park Avenue bunch. Park Avenue bunch? What? Wait a minute. Oh, that Park Avenue bunch, eh? <laughs> I get it now. Yeah. I'm sorry, my mistake. You see, I'm a stranger in town, and I'm just learning my way around. So I'll be running along. I wouldn't hurry. Well, I've got an appointment at 3 o'clock. Maybe it can wait. That bank job today, you know something about it? A bank job? Oh, no. I was just talking. <laughs> Didn't mean a thing. So long. There we are. Now, wait a minute, boys. I don't know who you are, but you played a bum card this time. Bugs frisk him. Right. I don't think you'd better try that. No. Well, turn around. Huh? Sure. Like this. Dick hey, Bugs, look out. He's going to throw you over his head. Get clear of him so I can shoot. Bugs, hear you fool. Break away from him. Oh, Connor. Oh, Connor, the gun. All the right. Gun. Back against the wall, both of you. Move. Now, look here, fella. Now, I want you to do as I say and move fast. Where's that money? We haven't got... No? If that money wasn't here, you wouldn't be. Better make up your mind, O'Connor. Hey. hey, he means it, Slapsy. It... It's in there, bud. Here? Yeah? <laughs> Thanks. 
Look, you don't think you're going to get away with this. Get smart, make a split, and we'll call it square. Sorry, I've got other plans, O'Connor, and I'll need this money. I, uh, I hope you won't mind waiting in here till I get underway. <laughs> so long, and thanks for saving me a lot of trouble. Well, how do you like... Hey! Hey, open up! Hey, you! Shut up. Huh? Come on. <laughs> But why tip him off now, Connie? Why, sure, the way he fell for the gag last night, we could carry it on forever. Yes, Connie, what's happened to you? Don't tell me you've gone soft for Mr. Wide Open Spaces. Well, well, suppose we went to Wyoming. We'd be pretty green ourselves, and we wouldn't expect the people that we... Well, that is, we wouldn't expect our friends to try to make fools of us. Hear, hear, Connie, defender of the downtrodden. Downtrodden, Dave Sheridan? Huh. Say, I'd hate to have him really sore at me, but... You know, maybe Connie's right. Suppose we just use the gag again when he first gets here and then let him in on it. <laughs> I want to see his face when Connie tells him. Oh, and that reminds me. There's not going to be an... Oh. Dave. Well, hello. Hi, Connie. Hope I'm not late. Hello, Slapseen, Bugs. Hiya, Miss LaJoy. How are you today, handsome? <laughs> I'm all right. Uh, glad you showed, Wyoming. Thought you might have gotten cold feet. Now, that's very funny coming from you. Dave. What's wrong with you? Wrong? Why, nothing. They uh, just give me a laugh, that's all. Who? Your friends. The smartest racketeers in New York. And huh? who says we ain't, buddy? Who says we ain't? You gonna rub them out, slaps them? Oh, stop it, you two. Dave, what are you talking about? This. Read it. Huge loss in bank holdup. That's right. A $200,000 job. Mighty nice of Slapsy and Bugs here to tip me off on We it. tip you... Uh, we tipped you off. Sure. So I pulled it without you. Dave... Dave, you didn't rob that bank yourself. No. But you couldn't. That's crazy. You're not a crook. I'm not, huh? Open that bag. Why, I... Door's your toe. Look, it's money. There's thousands here. Yeah, exactly 200,000. That's what the paper said. I haven't bothered to count it yet. Thought I'd wait till now. You see, since you boys gave me the steer, well, I... I want to cut you in. C cut us in? Oh, wait a minute, Sheridan. You boys going sort of soft all of a sudden, aren't you? Oh, Dave, listen to me. You didn't really do this thing. You couldn't. Why, that bank belongs to my father. Talk to your friends. It was their idea. Oh, Dave, what's the matter with you? You can't be such a fool. This whole thing was just a gag. Now, you can't take it seriously. No, why can't I? Because you'll get caught, Dave. You'll be in a terrible jam. I suppose I am. What's that to you? It's a lot to her, if you want to know. Okay. After you left us last night, she said she wondered where Wyoming had been all her life. Did you say that, Connie? I suppose I did. Come here. Well? Oh, Dave, please. I'm, I'm sorry. Really, I am. I didn't really mean to... Dave. Come on, girls. Line forms at the right. Well, that settles that. Connie, you're coming with me. And what? You're coming with me. Gangstering's a waste of time unless you got a mall to hang the diamonds on. And you'll do. Now get the money and let's go. Why, you... You big, overgrown moron. If you think I'd go away with you and with my own father's money... Well, I could steal somebody else's money. Oh, will you get out of here? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Toss me that bag. Huh? Oh, oh, here. Too bad, too, Connie. You know, we'd have looked swell together in the tabloids. Well, a guy can't have everything. Go on. Well, can you be having nightmares and still have your eyes open? Honey, what's happened to that guy? Oh, is that all you're going to do? Ask questions? We've got to stop him. We started this. Well, we're going to finish it, too. Connie, who are you calling? The police. I'm going to... All right, put down that phone and quick. Who are you? How dare you break in here? Maybe she wants us to come in the front way and send up our names. Shut up. All right, lady, where is he? Just tell us quick and there'll be no trouble. Where is who? Connie, these men must be detectives looking for Sheridan. Detectives? Hey, did you get that, Slapsy? Slapsy? He's Slapsy O'Connor. Slapsy O'Connor. Oh. Oh. oh, this is wonderful. Don't you get it now, all of you? Don't we get what? Now, look here, miss. Oh, this whole thing, it's a joke. Why, he's simply trying to pull our gag, pull the same gag Why, on sure, us. Why, sure, Connie, you're right. Oh, and as for these men... Oh, that's wonderful. And to think we fell for it. 
All right now, Mr. Whatever your name is, relax. You both did a grand job. Lady, I'm warning you. Oh, don't be stubborn. Uh, he hit her. Connie, look out. He is Slapsy O'Connor. I've seen his picture. Your friend's right, miss, and there's none of us doing any more laughing. Now, where's that cowboy? Come on, we saw him come in here. You, I said, where is the guy? He's right here, O'Connor. Dave. Now, drop those guns and put them up, both of you. Yeah? Yeah. Dave, look out! Oh, Dave, that was a honey. Are you all right? Sure. Hey, what goes on here? All right, all right. Where is that guy? Come on in, boys. Hey, who's this fellow showered it was up for the police? I am, officer. You'll find that Eastern National Bank money over there in that bag. The money from... Hey, is this on the level? Well, it should be. That's Slapsy O'Connor, and the other one is Bugs Halsted. Well, I'll be an Irish cop. What about the rest of these people? Why, I'm... Uh, I can't tell you much about the men, officer. But I'll be glad to swear in court that this girl told me she was Slapsy O'Connor's mall. Dave, don't tell him that. He'll believe... And this one boasts she runs around with Bugs Halsted. Why, officer, that's a lie. My father's As the owner... As for the other... Dave, Dave, you win. Now we admit it. Please, officer, I'm Connie Bannister, and these people are all my friends. You've got the men you want. Yeah? Well, I'll take your word for it. For now. Come along, you two. Come on out here. Oh, Mr. Yeah, Sheridan, on, you were marvelous. Yes, old man, I'll have to admit uh, that... Maybe we'd uh, better be going. Yeah. Come on, everybody. Of course, we might have tried to say goodbye. Who would have cared if we did? Well, why don't you say something? Why don't you? Well, Dave, I, I want, want you, you to, to know, but the... what, what I, I really mean is say... <laughs> my turn. Your turn. Well, look, you uh, you said you wondered where Wyoming had been all your life. You did say that, didn't you? Uh huh. So how about it? You mean you and me? You and me. Well, you I see, know it's Dave, pretty I... quick. My turn. <laughs> your turn. Yes, Dave. I've, I've got an idea. I'm going to know where Wyoming is for the rest of my life. <laughs> In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, our stars, Glenda Farrell and Chester Morris, will come back to give you their personal Easter greeting. But before they do... Would you permit me to make a friendly suggestion to all you spring brides-to-be? Many of you have already chosen your new home, and in the weeks to come, you'll be busy selecting the furnishings for that home. And since then, too, is the time you'll select your silver, may I suggest sterling silver? Believe me, you'll find it the most richly satisfying investment you've ever made. But sterling silver is genuine, solid silver. It will remain a treasured possession as long as you live. What will please you even more, there are several practical ways whereby you can purchase sterling silver, international sterling silver, on even a limited budget. For example, International Sterling's layaway plan, ladies and gentlemen, makes it possible for you to buy a complete service of solid silver and make payments when and as convenient. Or you can buy single place settings, one or two at a time, as low as $16.75 apiece. And every international sterling pattern is breathtakingly lovely. Particularly irresistible to 1939 brides is the new Prelude pattern, a solid silver design whose purity of line and captivating rose motif possess ageless charm. A pattern whose craftsmanship is so exquisite it will go proudly with backgrounds of any period. Be sure to visit your silverware dealer tomorrow, Monday, and ask about Prelude Sterling. Before you own it, you'll say, I never knew sterling silver cost so little. After you own it, you'll say, I never dreamed sterling silver could be such a thrill to own. And now, back to Conrad Nagel. Thank you, John. As is customary at this time, ladies and gentlemen, we draw aside our silver curtain and ask our stars, Glenda Farrell and Chester Morris, to meet you in person. Thank you, Glenda and Chester, for a pair of swell performances. Oh, the Thank pleasure's you, all mine, Conrad. Conrad. You see, I... <laughs> My turn? Your turn. Take a card, any card. Uh, uh, mysterious Morris. This is where I came in at rehearsal three days ago. No, oh, Glenda, come on, now, Chester, take a card. We, we, we'd love to see a card trick, but really, we haven't time today. All right. Look, Chester, what do you consider your best quick trick? My best quick trick? 
Well, frankly, I like this one. <laughs> well, he's disappeared. Yes, I know. At lunch the other day, he did the same thing when the waiter brought the check. Well, I suppose... <laughs> I suppose we'd better try to carry on. Well, I'm afraid I can't, you see. He took my script with him. Well, you can add lib something, can't you? <laughs> I never was a great hand in an emergency, but how about this? It's been grand working with you, and I think the new solid silver pattern prelude is lovely beyond words. I made it a point to see it the very first time I heard John Conti describe it. Well, thank you very much, Glenda. Good night and come back soon. By the way, folks, I, uh, I left in such a hurry, I didn't get a chance to thank you for inviting me to appear on Silver Theater. Say, Conrad, the voice of Mysterious Morris. Hey, Chester, where are you? I'm over at the RKO lot, where I'm working in a new aviation picture called Five Came Back. <laughs> well, thank you, Chester Morris. We're still at Silver Theater, where we're already beginning work on next week's drama, which will star your friend Robert Montgomery. Be sure to listen in next Sunday at this same time. The Man for Medicine Bow was written for Silver Theater by Paul Franklin and was adapted by True Borton. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Felix Mills. All names and designations of persons and of business or social organizations used in the course of this broadcast are entirely fictitious and no actual business or social organization and no living person is thereby actually referred to or designated. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. you'll hear James Stewart as the Six Shooter, just one of many fine programs brought to you each week on NBC. Tomorrow night, there's top comedy entertainment with the Bob Hope Show, the Phil Harris, Alice Faye Show, and Can You Top This with Senator Ford. Bob Hope delivers rapid-fire comedy routines, while Phil Harris and Alice Faye bring both mirth and music. It's a great Friday night lineup of comedy programs, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as the sick shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both the sick shooter. NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. didn't look like I was going to get much sleep that night. The Prospect Hotel was right in the middle of town, and from my room, I could hear just about everything went on outside. Hold up, George. And there wasn't much I could do about the noise, either. It was too doggone hot to shut the window. The sun had been down for a couple of hours, but there wasn't any breeze, and my room being on the second floor, well, it, it, the heat just seemed to sort of hang there. Whew. Boy. Well... Along about 10 o'clock, I finally managed to doze off. I, I wasn't exactly sound asleep, you understand. It was just sort of in between, you might say. What the Sam Hill is... Uh, huh. For a second, I thought maybe I'd dreamt that shot. And then I, I heard somebody come running out of the front door of the hotel and jump on a horse. And by the time I got across the room to the window, whoever it was had ridden out of sight. Well, I pulled on my pants. I headed downstairs. I was the first person to reach the lobby. 
Sid Tucker. He, he was the fellow who owned the hotel. Sid was standing behind the registration desk, hanging on with both hands. Hey, what happened, Sid? He opened his mouth to give me an answer, but the words just didn't come out. And he started to teeter a little bit from side to side, and then he toppled over. And when I got around behind the desk where he was lying, I saw the pink stain across the front of his shirt. It was getting redder every second. Anything wrong here? I thought I heard a shot. Red? Well, it's Sid Tucker. You better get Doc Prince quick. Well, sure, sure. Now, you get the sheriff, too, if you can find him, will you? to carry Sid into the dining room and laid him out on the table. I figured the doc might have to do some probing for that bullet in Sid's belly. And if Sid was in a good hard surface, he'd have a little e- easier time handling him. By this time, everybody in the hotel was crowding around seeing what was wrong. Sid was still breathing, but there was a kind of a raspy noise with every breath he took, and the bleeding was worse than ever. He was, he was bad off, all right, no doubt about that. Well, it was about ten minutes before Doc Prince got there. It seemed a lot longer, of course, but it was just about that time. Now, now, just go on back to bed, everybody. Go on now. There's nothing you can do here. You'd just be in my way. Please, go, go on now. You stick around, Britt, if you don't mind. Why? Well, I might need somebody to help hold him down. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Sid's going to be all right, ain't he, Doc? Well, I haven't even had a chance to examine him yet. Oh, now, come on, folks. Outside, please, outside. I'll let you know what his prospects are as soon as I find out myself. I'm afraid that's not much of a bandage, Doc, but it's the best I could do under the circumstances. Sure, sure, sure Britt. Uh, looks like the bullet may have hit a kidney. Now, I told you folks... To... Oh, hello, Sheriff. Howdy, Doc. Britt. Oh, Sam. How is he? Uh, not good, Sam. Not good at all. He's lost a lot of blood and he's hemorrhaging pretty bad. Mm-hmm. You around when it happened, Britt? No, I heard a shot and I came downstairs as fast as I could, but he was alone when I got <laughs> here. <laughs> Stop it. Well, got, got I'm not going to be able to do any digging for that bullet now. It's in too deep. Uh, listen, it sounds like he's coming, too. Yeah, yeah. Doc, is it all right for me to try and talk to him? Yeah, well, I reckon it won't make much difference one way or the other. Now, Sid. I got an awful pain in my belly. What? What? Here, now, you just lie there easy, Sid. Don't do no moving around. Hurts bad, Doc. Awful bad. Yeah, now, you, you've been shot, Sid. Shot? You remember anything about it? No, Sheriff. I'm afraid I don't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I recollect. Uh, yeah? He, he told me to give him the box. The tin box with the money the folks asked me to keep for him. You know who it was? Your money, Britt. Your cash is in that box. Fifty. No, no. Don't worry yourself about that. <laughs> Did you recognize him, Sid? What? The fellow who shot you. Did you get a look at him? John. John Springer. Huh? Must have been him. At least ways he sure sure resembled that fellow on the wanted posters on the wall here. See? He's not gonna answer no more questions, Sam. Yeah. You uh you think it was Stringer, Sam? Well, could have been. I didn't know he was in these parts, but it's a kind of hold-up murder he's pulled before. Yeah? Guess there's only one way to find out for certain. Let's go, Britt. Why? Pick up his trail if we can. Yeah, but, uh... You'll come with me, won't you? Well, uh, sure, Sam, if you think you need me, but there are plenty of local residents and make up a posse without I'm not money. taking a posse, Britt. Might be morning before I could get one together, and by then his trail would be cold. Stringer rides alone, usually. I reckon the two of us can handle him. Your horse in the stable? Yeah. Sure. Well? All right, Sam. I'll get the car and meet you out in front, huh? I'd heard about Johnny Stringer. He'd killed his first man when he was only 14 years old, and they said he'd managed at least one more every year since. He's still young, though, 21, 22. Supposed to be a handsome boy with black curly hair and brown eyes and a little scar on the side of his neck from a gunfight somewhere near Salt Lake City. 
I'd never met up with him in person. As a matter of fact, this was further south, and he usually strayed. That is, if it was Stringer who'd killed Sid Tucker. Well, we got our horses, Sam and I, and started looking for the trail. The fellow I'd heard ride off just after the shooting had been heading east toward the Furnace Hill, so we rode out that way. There was a lot of moon, and after milling around 15, 20 minutes, we spotted some fresh tracks along the creek the edge of town. Of course, we still had no reason to be certain that this was the right trail. Hold on a minute, Sam. Whoa, whoa, Scar, whoa. What's the matter, Britt? Who, uh, who? Look, I... Over there beside that cactus. What's that look like to you? I don't see any... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy, boy. Easy. That's the tin box Sid was talking about? Yeah. Yeah, the kid must have shot the lock open. Empty, huh? Yeah? yeah. Probably got tired carrying it. Mm-hmm. Hotel should have had a safe. Been telling Sid Tucker that for years. Yeah, well, this box always served the same purpose. Up till now. Yeah, yeah, up till now. Sid said he was keeping some of your money for you. Yeah, a couple of months' pay. That's too bad. Oh, well, I'll get over it. Sid won't. Well, there's no point hanging on to this anymore, I guess. Yeah. At least we know we're on the right track, Britt. Yeah, that's something. All right, Scott, let's go. Well, he had an hour's head start, maybe more. And we had to take it pretty slow to be sure we wouldn't lose the trail. So it didn't seem like we had much chance catching up to him. Not very soon, anyhow. But then just about dawn, when the eastern sky started to show a few slivers of orange and yellow, those tracks we were following took on a different look. Brit? Ah. Uh-huh. See now, something must have happened to his horse. Yeah. Feels like maybe he went lame. Yeah, sure does, doesn't it? You see here, Britt, you see? Oh, boy, oh, oh. Must have stopped the rest for a spell. Mm-hmm. Come on, boy. Don't seem like it did much good, though. Horse was lamer than ever when they started up again. Uh, he couldn't have been making very much time here on, that's for sure. Yeah. Better keep our eyes open. Might be running into him any minute. We're in the Furnace Mountains now, and the sun was coming up hot. Oh, this is going to be another scorcher, all right. You could feel everything start to warm up already. The trail we were following showed more and more signs that the horse was in pretty bad shape. And the places where he'd stopped to rest were getting closer and closer together until finally we saw the fellow on the saddle had just given up trying to ride and started moving out ahead on foot. Oh, oh, oh. Easy, easy, Scott. Easy. <laughs> Might as well leave the horses here, Brit. He can't be much further now. Yeah. yeah. Sam. Hmm? Hey, uh, over there in the, the cabin on the side of the ravine there. Uh-huh. Know whose it is? No, I ain't never been on this slope before. Well, somebody's living there. Uh, from the looks of that smoke, I'd say they're cooking breakfast. Let's close in. We started up the side of the ravine, moving slow, keeping the rocks for cover. It wasn't until we were about 20 yards away that I noticed the barn. Sitting in front of a clump of trees across a little clearing, we swung a little to our left. If we could just get over to the barn without anybody seeing us, then we could move into the cabin itself. But we were we were still in a place, and we, we, we had to get past that clearing first. He, he ain't spotted us, Brit. I guess not. If he's really here. Look at those tracks leading into the barn. Same horse we've been following. I'd stake my life on it. Yeah, yeah, they do look kind of familiar. Best thing we can do now is rush the back door to the cabin. If it's unlocked, we can be inside before he even knows what's happened. If it ain't, we'll, we'll have to shoot our way in. All right, Sam. You're calling the turn. It was about... 30, 40 feet from the barn to the cabin itself. 
Sam rocked back on his heels and he gave a lunge forward. He was a big man. But he sure could move pretty fast. All I could do to keep up with him. The back door was unlocked, all right, and we charged inside like a couple of Texas steers. Get your hands up. Get him up quick. Damn it. Well, uh, who are you? Who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, Why'd you break in like this? Uh, well, now, uh, I, uh, we don't mean any trouble, miss. Then why do you come? Uh, well... You we... think to rob me, no? Well, I have nothing to steal. <laughs> you have picked the wrong cavern, senor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sort of looks like maybe we have. We'll return to James Stewart as the sick shooter in just a moment. Not all careless drivers have accidents, but many such careless drivers cause accidents. A woman driver who drives slowly down Main Street while doing a little window shopping is a menace. So is the man who insists on telling the people in the back seat of his car about his poker game last week. It's no wonder that ordinarily cautious drivers start to lose their tempers and take dangerous chances to pass these careless drivers. When an accident results... The person who caused the accident probably won't even be touched. So the National Safety Council says if you want a window shop, get out and walk. If you are too busy describing one of your sterling feats to pay any attention to traffic, get out and walk. The driver's license you have does not give you the right to endanger the lives of your passengers or other human beings. Driving can be dangerous. Keep your mind on what you're doing or walk. of The Sick Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponsett. Well, she was a real pretty girl. About 20, jet black hair and black eyes that sort of flash sparks when she talked. At least they were flashing sparks at us for a while. But finally we managed to get her quieted down. We explained that we weren't trying to rob her. We would just looking for an outlaw somewhere in these parts. No. No. I have seen no one. Mm, you sure about that? See, there has been nobody. Last night, last week, nobody. You live here all alone? <sighs> this cabinet belongs to my father, Alfredo Mendez. He's dead now. Six months. I live alone. Mm, I must be kind of lonely, a young girl like you. I'm busy. I take care of cars. I plant seeds. There will be food for winter. Yeah. Well, I think I'll take a look around outside. The barn, maybe. Well, you look there. I tell you, there's no one. Yeah, yeah, that's what you told us. Hmm. Want me to go with you, Sam? No, no. You might check the rest of the cabin, though, Britt. Sure. You think I lie? You think I would protect this bandido you tell me about? I am Maria Gonzalez Mendez. I do not lie. All right, all right. Now, don't get excited, Maria. If he should be in this neighborhood and you didn't know about it, well, it'd be for your own good if we turned him up, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? See? Si? Yeah, I guess so. But your friend, he does not trust me. Well, Sam's a sheriff. He can't afford to take chances. Uh, you mind showing me the rest of the place here? If you like. This is the men room. You call it the parlor. Uh-huh. Here is where I sleep. Uh, what's that door over there? The, the bedroom of my father. Oh. Okay. It, uh, it is still as it was when he... It, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're satisfied? I'm satisfied Stringer isn't in the cabin, Maria. Mm. You're like your friend. You do not trust me either. Why would I hide this man if he's what you say he is? I sure don't know. He killed someone last night? That's right. You did not see him do it. Mm -hmm. No, but the man he shot, well, he recognized Stringer. Stringer? <laughs> it is a funny name. Yeah. I never heard of him. Well, he's pretty well known. This isn't his only killing by a whole lot. Mm. Has nothing to do with me. Well, he's not in here, Sam. Yeah. Well, he's not in the barn either. But his horse is. What? No, Senor, no. It is my horse, the one you saw. I suppose you've been riding him all night, huh? I do not know what you mean. Well, somebody's sure been giving him a workout. 
They even wrote him after he went lame, too. Now, why don't you start telling us the truth for a change? How about it? It does no matter. He has gone. I get to him another pony and he rides away. Long before you get here, he is gone. Well, now I'll be... You will never catch him now. That is why I pretend I think you want to rob me when you come. Eh, uh, mine are no. But he has killed no one. And his name, it is no stringer. It is Johnny Davis. He tells me that you will look for him and that you will blame him for things he does not do. Sure, that's what he told you. And you had to believe him, didn't you? He would not lie to me. Ah, uh, well, I guess you ain't the first senior that got taken in by Johnny Stringer. Even his wife. He's talked her into putting up with him on and off for the last five years, and she's supposed to be a pretty decent girl. His... His wife? That's right, Maria. Johnny's married. Has been since he was, all oh, 18 or so. It is not my concern, this Johnny Stringer. It is, huh? Your friend Davis, has he got black hair, curly black hair? Many men have black hair. Mm Mm-hmm. And many men don't have a scar on their neck right here. A scar? We're just wasting time, Britt. We've got a trail to pick up. Yeah, yeah. Wait. You lied to me about this scar. You tried to make me think that my Juanito is the same man you look for. You lie about him. I told you the truth, Maria. But he could not be married. No, it is not so. He's promised to marry me. How long has Stringer been staying here? No, Stringer. He's not Stringer. His name is Davis. Johnny Davis. How long has he been here? Two weeks. He stays in my father's room two weeks. I find him with a bullet in his leg. He's hurt. I make him well. He says he loves me. Yeah. He goes yesterday to arrange for the wedding. He couldn't marry you, Maria. If he did, it wouldn't be a real marriage. No, senor. No, he says he loves me. It is so I feel it in my heart. If he does not have love for me, I would know. Brit. Yeah? He's got a fresh horse. We'd better get moving. Yeah, sure. Come on. He, he is the horse, senor. What? The man with his car. He has no horse. Where is he, Maria? You tried to fool me that he's married, that he has a wife. You make this up to fool me. Where is he? The barn. But I already... The loft of the barn, that is where he hides, the loft. Now I have told you the truth. You must... Yeah? You you must tell me the truth about John. There's no reason to fool me any longer. You must tell me the truth. But it is the truth, Maria. All of it. And I'm sorry. (laughs) You ready, Britt? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. We walked outside. We didn't draw our guns. We just strode along as though we were going to go right past the barn. And when we got even with the door, Sam nodded and we took a couple of quick steps and pressed flat against the building. Stringer? We know you're in there. Stringer! Sam waited a minute or so and then we started inching toward the open door. I took my cue from him and I started moving in the opposite direction. Well, uh, he was up there all right. And he was in a good position to cover that door, too, if either one of us so much as got near it. We ain't no hurry, Stringer. We can wait. You wait a long time, mister. Sam? Yeah. Is there any other way of getting inside, around the back, maybe? There's a window, but it's too small to crawl through. Isn't that he's using up a lot of bullets? Trouble is, we don't know how many loads he's carrying. Yeah. Guess we'll just have to try smoking him out. Ain't no breeze. Ought to be safe enough. What about the horse? He's just inside the door. He ain't tied up or nothing. He'll come out before it gets too bad. Okay. I'll go around and back. I managed to get to the rear of the barn by hugging the sides of the building and keep out of range. Every once in a while, I could hear Stringer get off another shot. But he was still aiming towards Sam, trying to make sure that we didn't rush him. I found some dry brush and pushed it up against the barn. And then I broke through the window with the butt of my gun. And that told Stringer where I was, and he sure didn't like it. I, I flattened down, and I stayed that way until I got a handful of brush burning. 
then I raised up a couple of inches and then threw it inside. I didn't know whether it would catch or not. So I stayed there where I was so, so I could be sure. Yeah, I must have been lucky. It hit some rags and papers. Anyway, a good steady stream of smoke was pouring out the broken window. And Stringer would have to start moving out pretty soon. He wasn't doing any shooting, so I made my way around the front again. The smoke would start to come out the door, and the whole inside of the barn was filled up with it. You never know about a horse during a fire. Some of them would just stand right in the middle of it and not make a move to save themselves. There was only one direction Maria's pony could head, and that was outside, so he finally put his nose down the counter and galloped him past him. About a minute later, Stringer followed his example. He was holding a bandana over his mouth with one hand, and the other hand was stuck up in the air. We were both covering him, Sam and me, but it didn't look like we had anything to worry about. And then I saw a flicker of metal behind that bandana. But before I could do anything about it... She ran in front of us and threw herself in his arm. I figured you wouldn't let me down, honey. He pulled her tight against him, and the bandana fell away from the revolver he was holding. All right, Jess, drop him. I said drop him, unless you want to shoot her in the back. Johnny. Drop him, I said. And I ain't going to wait much longer. Okay, Stringer. You too, mister. Now, honey, just stay close to me. We're getting out of here. Will you take me, Johnny? What's the difference? You take me to get married like you promised? Remember, Johnny, you promised me this would be our Sure, wedding. sure, I remember, but we got other things to think about now. Where'd they leave their horses, Maria? Did they tell you? I got out my mother's white dress. The dress she was married. Yeah, in. yeah. I dressed it nice. The lace. I look very pretty, oh, Johnny. Oh, shut up. What about their horses? Why don't you tell her you won't marry her, Stringer? That you can't, even if you wanted to. I wouldn't do a lot of talking if I was you, mister. Tell her about your wife in Utah. And some of the other girls have helped you over a tight spot. You're not the first, Maria, not by a long shot. I warned you, mister. I told you. says, why do you care, Johnny? They are not true. But they are true. Aren't they, Johnny? I never said they was true. You don't have to say. I know. In my mother's white dress with the lace, I will not wear it today. What if I am married? That doesn't mean that we can't. Maria. For a second, I didn't realize what had happened. Stringer was staring at Maria like he'd never seen her before, and then he started to raise the revolver he was holding, his finger on the trigger, but he never finished squeezing it. He slid out of Maria's arms and fell face down on the dirt. It was a small knife with a fancy silver handle buried deep in his back right between his shoulder blades. You will want to take me with you now. Not Juanito. But I would like to change my dress first. I... I think I would like to wear the white one with the lace. After all. Well, we waited around till we were sure the fire was out, and then we took Maria back to Prospect. I don't know whether what she'd done was murder or not. I Stringer was holding a gun on us. Maybe she saved her lives. And he sure had it coming to him. I wasn't much doubt about that. I uh, gave Judge Ricker a statement, and then I, I left Prospect. I, I, I guess if there was a trial, Maria must have come out of it all right. At least I hope so. The word research has become pretty familiar to all of us in the last ten years or so, but have you ever stopped to think what research, especially medical research, means to you personally. Without research, we would have no penicillin or any of the other wonder drugs. Research is also the most important weapon in the fight against mental illness. And mental illness today afflicts more than 9 million people. Already, research has opened up leads for preventing many mental illnesses, 
And research has shown us speedier and more effective ways of helping mentally sick people to get well. Research scientists say we can be hopeful, but they need help from us. They need money to carry on research. If we help science, science can give us a much better chance to escape mental illness and to cure mental illness if it should strike. If you'd like to help, give to the Mental Health Fund in care of your local postmaster. Just address Mental Health Fund in care of your local postmaster. Don't wait. This worthwhile cause needs your support now. transcribed NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt and is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Others in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Harley Bear, Joel Cranston, and Barney Phillips. Special music for this program was by Basil Adlam, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Well, by the way, you'll be interested in knowing that the sick shooter has been chosen for broadcast to our men overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Services. This is John Wall speaking. Here an address by President Eisenhower, next on the NBC Radio Network. Suspense, which is heard on Thursday nights at this hour, is taking its customary summer holiday. Suspense returns to the air three weeks from now on Thursday, August 31st. Ladies and gentlemen, a $5,000 reward will be offered each week on the program immediately following this announcement. You out there, you who think you've committed the perfect crime, the perfect murder, that there are no clues, no witnesses, that your identity is unknown, listen. Somebody knows. Yes, you, wherever you may be, no matter where you're hiding, somewhere, sometime, someone listening to this program is going to bring you to justice. Yes. Somebody knows. Columbia Broadcasting System presents Somebody Knows, a program conceived in the public interest dedicated to aiding the forces of law and order in the solution of this nation's unsolved crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to recreate for you tonight all the known facts in an actual unsolved murder. Somewhere, someone among you's had contact with a killer or killers. Someone whose identity need never be known has seen evidence or possesses information that can lead to the solution of this crime. In the public interest, the Columbia Broadcasting System offers a $5,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer in this unsolved murder. We ask you then to please listen carefully, for you may be the one to win this reward. Somebody knows. It may be you. And now we open the files on one of this nation's unsolved murders. It's homicide file number HF12342 of the Boston, Massachusetts Police Department. The unsolved murder of Samuel I. Paris. It is approximately 3.30 p.m. Saturday, April 3rd, 1948. At 54 Jones Avenue in the Dorchester District of Boston, Massachusetts, Samuel I. Paris, a taxi driver, is preparing to leave home to go to work. 
Don't forget a clean handkerchief, Sammy. Okay, honey, okay. You're feeling happy today, aren't you, Sammy? <laughs> Can you give me a good, for instance, why I shouldn't with you around? <laughs> I wouldn't even try. Now, look, Sammy, be sure and have a good dinner. Yeah, sure, sure. You sure. work a long shift, and I want you to eat well. All right. And be sure to wear your heavy jacket. You can't tell about these spring nights, and I don't want you catching cold. <laughs> okay, honey, okay. You know, I thought we only had three kids, but as far as you're concerned, I guess I'm the fourth. <laughs> Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Sammy. Take care of yourself. Ah, uh, don't worry. Oh, kiss the kids for me, huh? And, uh, Mrs. Paris, you know something? Better save a couple for me when I get home. Oh, Sammy. <laughs> so long, honey. The time is approximately 10.45 p.m. Saturday, April 3rd, 1948. Cab number 702 of the Independent Taxi Cab Operators Association is speeding along quiet residential Norfolk Avenue in the Roxbury District of Boston, Massachusetts. Suddenly it swerves toward the curb, smashes into the rear of a parked car, and comes to a stop on the sidewalk. At the same moment, in the home of Fred Lutfi, 177 Norfolk Avenue in Roxbury, a game of whist is in progress. The players are Mr. Lutfi, his wife, Jean, his mother, and his sister, Mrs. Barbara Darian of 12 Rutland Street, South End, who is visiting him. <laughs> oh, Fred, now you should have known better than that. Oh, well, I always say this game is more luck than skill, Barbara. <laughs> oh, now, Fred. Oh, he's only jealous, Jean. Maybe someday he... Hey. Now, what was that? Oh, sounds like a couple of women drivers tangling bumpers somewhere. Mm. <laughs> Whose deal is it? Oh, mine, I guess. Oh. Though I don't mind telling you, young man, that I consider your remarks about women drivers as being highly... Huh. Now, I wonder... What, Barbara? My car is parked out in front. Do you think it's possible that... Maybe I better look out the window. Why, it is my car. It is? Your car, Barbara. Yes. That, that taxi cab must have hit it. Look, the cab's still on the sidewalk with its lights on. Yes. And, and the driver is somebody. He's running away down the street. How do you like that? A hit and run. Hey, look, let's get out there, huh? Now, be careful, Fred. Don't get into any trouble. Look. Oh, he's practically ruined the rear end of my car. Shoved it way down the street. Don't worry, Barbara. The cab company will take care of it. Oh. They... Hey, wait a minute. Uh, it wasn't the driver who... Look at him. Sleeping at the wheel. Must be drunk or something. Now, look, Mac, what was the idea of driving like a lunatic? Don't you know that you... That... What is it, Fred? What's the... This man. The driver, I, I think he's... Jenny! Jenny, you better call the police! It is approximately 10.50 p.m. Saturday, April 3rd, 1948. At the dispatcher's desk on the seventh floor of police headquarters in Boston, Massachusetts. Dispatcher. I, I want to report some trouble. What kind of trouble, ma'am? A cab. It ran into my sister's car and then onto the sidewalk in the front of our place. It's there now. Something's wrong with the driver. What's the address, please? It's uh, 177 Norfolk Avenue in Roxbury. 177 Near Norfolk. Street, yes. And your name? All right, Mrs. Lefty. Thanks for your notifying us. We'll have some men right over there. The dispatcher takes a quick look at the lighted control board in front of him, notes the disposition of cars in the Roxbury district, and picks up his hand microphone set. W-R-A-S. Calling car 9-O. Calling car 9-O. 9-O. Taxi cab has jumped curb on Norfolk Avenue near Shirley Street. Investigate. 9-O. On our way. W-R-A-S, 1055. Within a minute or two, car 9-O arrives at the scene of the crash. The police officers make a quick check of the driver, who is still slumped over the wheel. Then they put in a call for an ambulance. While waiting for it to arrive, they talk with Mr. Lutfi and Mrs. Darien. You didn't touch the driver. He was like that when you first saw him, huh? Yeah, that's right, officer. He slumped over the wheel just like that. You know, at first we... 
Well, we thought he might be drunk or something, and then well, my wife called you. There's a tab of dollar sixty on the meter. It's still running. You must have had a fare. Uh, was anyone else in that cab? No. No, there wasn't anyone else in that. Oh, wait a minute. I did see someone running down the street. Yeah? It was just as I looked out the window. I saw him turn down Shirley Street. Could you identify him? Oh, no. No, I don't think so. Yeah. All I could tell was that he seemed young, had dark clothes on. No, I'm sure I could ambulance. Yeah. Did you get the driver's name for the identification card? It's Paris. Samuel I. Paris, 54 Jones Avenue, Dorchester. Okay, be sure to give it to him, huh? All right, folks. Stand back now, will you? Stand back, please. Let the ambulance just roll up the lane. The ambulance rushes the cab driver to the Boston City Hospital, where he's examined immediately upon arrival. Dead. Probably cardiac failure. Natural causes. Better remove him to the morgue. The body of Samuel I. Paris is then removed to the Southern Mortuary, an annex of Boston City Hospital. His widow, Mrs. Rachel Paris, and his three children are informed of the tragedy. Then, some twelve hours later, the autopsy is required by law, is performed by Dr. Richard Ford, Associate Medical Examiner of Suffolk County. Too bad the law makes you waste your time this way, Dr. Ford. Well, investigating the causes of death or life is never a waste of time. Mm. You'd better learn that before you complete your internship. <laughs> I know how you feel about that, Dr. Ford. What's to be learned about causes of death in a routine autopsy like this one, for instance? You never can tell. It's always possible to... Ah, there. Ah, it's always possible to uncover a murder. Murder? But... Dr. Ford. Yes. It's a small caliber bullet. Penetrated under the right ear and lodged beneath the left ear after piercing the brain. We'd better notify the superintendent of police. In just a moment, we'll continue with homicide file number HF12342 of the Boston, Massachusetts Police Department. The unsolved murder of Samuel I. Paris. Do you have something around the house that needs fixing, or are you planning to take on a new employee? Contact your local state employment office and ask for a physically handicapped worker. Through your state rehabilitation agency and the Veterans Administration, men and women who have physical impairments have been trained in new and special skills. It's good business to hire physically handicapped workers. They'll do a good job for you. Now back to Somebody Knows and a true case history of an actual murder. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue with the rest of the factual information concerning file number HF12342 from the records of the Boston, Massachusetts Police Department. The unsolved murder of Samuel I. Paris. Remember, $5,000 will be paid for information leading to the arrest and conviction of his killer. With the disclosure that the death of Samuel I. Paris was caused by the firing of a bullet into his head, Superintendent of Police Edward W. Fallon orders an immediate all-out effort to apprehend his killer. A detail of patrolmen makes a house-to-house -house canvas of the Norfolk Avenue, Shirley Street area, questioning residents seeking clues to the slayer. Thomas Del Tolfo of 164 Norfolk Avenue tells them... When I heard the crash, I looked out of my window. I saw a man get out of the rear of the cab. Well, he was wearing a sweater, or maybe a short coat. I think he had a gray soft hat. Well, he looked young to me. I thought at first the cab he had a blowout and the fare was leaving. Bus driver James Spillane of 22 Bigson Street, Dorchester, tells the police. It was about 10 to 11 Saturday night. That was uh, April 3rd. And I pick up this passenger at Shirley Street in Massachusetts Avenue. I remember him pretty clear. He's about... 19 years old, he's maybe 5 foot 8, he's got blonde hair and he was built kind of thin. He was wearing a gabardine coat, no hat. He got off at the Northampton Elevated Station, it's about 11.05. Police ballistician Edward J. Culkin reports. 
The bullet that killed Paris was twenty-two caliber from a short shell fired from a target p- pistol or an old or foreign gun. The murder weapon will be easily identifiable once we have it in our possession. Out of the welter of reports finding their way to Superintendent Fallon's desk, a number of pertinent facts come to light. Facts that enable the police to reconstruct the last hour and 45 minutes of Samuel Paris's life. Now this is their reconstruction of the crime. Please listen carefully. It is 9 p.m. Saturday, August 3rd, 1948. Cab 702 with driver Samuel Paris at the wheel is parked at the stand on Tremont Street in front of the Parker House. A man and a woman enter the cab and give him an address. Okay, sir. Somewhere in the vicinity of North Station, his two passengers leave the cab, and Samuel Paris heads back in a southwesterly direction. Then at approximately 10 o'clock, he parks at the cab stand at Washington and Neyland Streets, and almost immediately picks up a sailor and a girl as passengers, and drives them downtown. Then at 10.15 p.m., he's returning from this trip when he stops for a signal light on Tremont Street at Park. And another cab driven by Harry Pitchell of 53 Ellington Street, Dorchester, pulls up alongside. Hi, Sammy. Hey, Harry. <laughs> How goes it? Same as usual. What about you? Eh, uh, could be better, could be worse. I ain't kicking. <laughs> that Sammy Paris, all right. Don't you ever kick? <laughs> What's the kick? Got my health, I'm working, they still need cabs in Boston, I'm happy. <laughs> okay, pal, I won't argue. See you, eh? Yeah, sure thing, Harry. As the lights change, Samuel Paris drives back toward the cab stand at Washington and Neyland Streets. It is approximately 10.20 as he pulls in and stops. Then, at about 10.25, the door of his cab opens and a man gets in. Hey, yeah, sure thing, mister. <laughs> Samuel Paris drives south on Neyland to Albany Street, then turns west in the direction of Roxbury. When he finally reaches Hampton Street, he turns again, and then onto Norfolk Avenue. Somewhere along the way, he suddenly feels the cold muzzle of a gun pressing against his neck below his right ear. All right, Hanky, that's a gun you feel. What? What is this, Mac? A sticker? What else? Look, I got no dough on me. You should have better sense than picking a Hanky who's out. But I'm telling you, Shut I got... Up. Okay, Mac, okay. What am I supposed to do now? Just keep driving, I'll tell you what. Just keep driving. Okay, you're the boss. Samuel Paris keeps driving down Norfolk Avenue. He's calm, alert. He slips his wristwatch far up his left sleeve, hoping it might go unnoticed. He tries to figure some way out. Then an idea comes to him. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Maybe I'm in a hurry to get this over with. Slow down! Slow down in here, I'll blow your lousy brains out. Now, slow down! Okay, Mac. Okay! Damn! What are you doing, you white shot? Now the day following the murder of Samuel I. Paris. A car is speeding down a highway in Dedham near the Westwood town line. Four youths are inside. The driver is weaving recklessly in and out of traffic. A dozen times accidents are only narrowly averted. Finally, a pursuing police car forces them over to the curb. All right, step out. Keep your hands up. Come on. Get a move on. Out. All of you. Out. Better frisk him. Between hit and run and a stolen car, anything's liable to show up. Stand still, you. Just keep those hands up. Hey, something did show up. This. Yeah. Looks like 22 caliber. It is. Isn't that the caliber that got the cabbie over in Roxbury last night? Yeah. And that's why this car was reported stolen. Got a hunch the boys at Roxbury are going to be pretty happy to see these four punks. The 
four youths are turned over to the police at the Roxbury Division. They're questioned thoroughly. The 22 caliber pistol found on one of them is given to ballistics for checking. Then some time later, the police issue a statement. Ballistics reports that the 22 caliber pistol is not the one used in the Paris murder. Our questioning has convinced us that these four youths have no connection with that case. The investigation into the murder of Samuel Paris continues unabated as the entire city of Boston is aroused. Voices of anger and protest are raised in the city council, in veterans' organizations. The cab drivers of Boston have their own way of showing their feelings about this case. Thanks for the tip, mister. It's going to the widow and kids of Sammy Paris. The search for the slim, blonde youth seen boarding the bus at Massachusetts and Shirley goes on unrelentingly. In his identification now seems to lie the one possible hope for solution of the killing. It is now April 7th, 1948. In police station 9 in Roxbury, the desk sergeant is checking reports from several patrolmen out in the field when the door opens. Then steps approach the desk and halt. I'd like to talk to someone, please. Sure. What's it? Standing before the desk is a young man about 19 years of age. He's about 5 foot 8. Thin. He has blonde hair. I, uh... I'm the man who got on that bus at Massachusetts, and surely I understand you're looking for me. The man is interviewed, questioned thoroughly. His statements checked and rechecked. The result? We are satisfied that this man has no connection with the death of Samuel Paris. Then, five months later... What seems to be the first major break in the case suddenly occurs. It's 2 a.m. on the morning of September 12, 1948. A cab driven by Joseph Murad of 29 Upton Street, South End, is driving through Andrews Square. Hey, cab! Taxi! Hey, taxi! See you in 6th Street, South Boston. Then, as the cab approaches the destination, Murad suddenly feels something cold and hard pressed against his neck. Okay, cabbie, this is a stick-up. The man orders Murad to throw his money on the floor, and the driver does so. Then he's ordered to stop the cab. He's forced out, and the man drives the cab away. Twenty minutes later, cab driver Isidore Klein of 122 Howland Street in Roxbury picks up a man on Washington Street near Bennett. The same procedure is followed as with Joseph Murad. Klein is forced to throw his money on the floor. He's ordered out of his cab, and the man drives off in it. Meanwhile, a special service squad containing Sergeant Thomas O'Keefe, Detectives Frank Mulvey and John Preston has been alerted to the Murad holdup. They're cruising on Dorchester Avenue near Columbia when... Look, there's a cab being hailed up ahead there. Yeah, see it. Man getting in along. Think I better talk to him. All right, mister, you better get out and keep your hands up. I think they want to talk to you at headquarters. The suspect is identified at police headquarters by drivers Murad and Klein. He's questioned exhaustively by special officers Leo Devlin and Arthur O'Shea, who've been working on the Paris case. Then, this statement is issued. We are satisfied that this man has no connection with the death of Samuel Paris. It is now September 20th, 1948. 
Judge Samuel Eisenstadt of the Roxbury Court makes a report on the inquest into the death of Samuel I. Paris, an inquest that's been held open since April 3rd. The deceased was a man of excellent reputation, good father and a good husband who had no known enemies. There was no motive for anyone to wish to take his life unless the motive were robbery. I advocate that the case be held open in the event that the assailant should be apprehended. Despite the fact that this court is unable to recommend prosecution or the issuance of complaints against this unknown person. Unknown person? No. The killer of Samuel I. Paris is not unknown. Somewhere, in whatever town or city this man is hiding, someone of you has seen him today, has spoken to him, eaten lunch and dinner with him, knows the location of the gun that he fired on that night two and a half years ago. No, the cold-blooded, brutal killer who took the life of Samuel I. Paris is not unknown. Somebody knows. Now listen carefully, please. Listen, all of you, wherever you may be. We're going to give you a recapitulation of pertinent facts in the unsolved murder of Samuel I. Paris. Better make a note of them. And remember, by following the instructions we shall give you in a moment, you may be the one to earn a $5,000 reward. Now here are the actual facts in the case. Samuel I. Paris, 39 years of age, a cab driver, was shot to death in his cab in the vicinity of 177 Norfolk Avenue in the Roxbury District of Boston, Massachusetts. The time, approximately 10.45 p.m., Saturday, April 3rd, 1948. The murder weapon was twenty two caliber. It is believed to be either a target pistol or an old or foreign gun. A young man, slight build, wearing either a sweater or a short coat and a soft gray hat, was witnessed running from the scene of the crime. This man is definitely wanted by the police as a suspect in the murder of Samuel I. Paris. Ladies and gentlemen, if any of you possesses information that may have a bearing on the unsolved murder of Samuel I. Paris, and please don't send guesses or hunches, but only actual authentic information... Follow these instructions so that your name and identity need never be made known unless you wish. Now listen carefully. Write your information on a plain sheet of paper. Do not sign your name. Instead, sign it with six numbers. Any arrangement of any six numbers. And then tear off a blank corner of that paper with a ragged edge. Write the same six numbers on that corner and keep it. Mail the rest of the paper with the information to Somebody Knows, Hollywood, California. You need tell no one what you've done. Mail your letter to Somebody Knows, Hollywood, California. And if the information you've supplied leads to the arrest and conviction of the killer of Samuel I. Paris, we'll announce your signature number on this program. Then, if you don't want your name to be known, go to your lawyer or doctor, your priest, minister, or rabbi, and have him present the torn corner of the paper to any CBS station. In this way, you do not need to appear in person. If the torn corner matches the original paper containing the information, the $5,000 reward will be yours. Remember, you, wherever you are, you whose name need never be known, may win a reward of Next week at the same time, we'll present another true case history of unsolved murder. It's homicide file number 3867 from the records of the Detroit, Michigan Police Department. The unsolved murder of Mrs. Jean Long. You out there. You who have murdered in cold blood and think you've gotten away with it. Listen. You cannot escape. There is no perfect crime. Remember, you are not unknown. Somebody knows. Tonight's case was written by Sidney Marshall from information in the files of the Boston, Massachusetts Police Department. 
Research was by Maurice Zim. Music was composed and played by Milton Charles. Somebody Knows is a James L. Safier production in association with CBS by arrangement with the Chicago Sun-Times and is based on a copyright owned by W.L. Finstad. It was narrated and directed by Jack Johnstone. In order to be eligible for the reward, letters containing actual authentic information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer or killers of Samuel I. Paris must be addressed to Somebody Knows... Hollywood, California, and must be postmarked not later than midnight, August 30th, 1950. Arrest of the guilty person or persons must occur within 90 days of that date, and conviction must be within one year of tonight's broadcast. If more than one person gives the information leading to conviction, our judges will divide the $5,000 reward among them in proportion to the importance the judges attach to the facts implied. And in this, the decision of our judges will be final. Until next Thursday at the same time, this is Don Baker saying good night. And remember, somebody knows. When Casey, CBS crime photographer, goes on the trail of a Wagnerian theme in The Love Death Tonight, you're invited to listen in. In fact, stay tuned for it right now, for Casey, crime photographer, follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you'll find Arthur Godfrey's daytime program every Monday through Friday on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston presents... Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have been locked in a building by two criminals who have blocked their only means of escape by pouring sodium-potassium alloy on the stairs. The liquid metal has burst into flame on contact with the air. Commander, the heat's terrible. We're going to face something worse than heat when the automatic fire extinguishing system starts to work. But, sir, the water will put the fire out and we can escape. Not with this alloy, Happy. It burns in air, but when water hits it, it explodes. What? The second that spray starts working, this whole building will be blown to bits. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Lady from Venus. Space Patroller Dick Tufel Gang speaking to you from an atomic power plant on Mars. They're having trouble getting power, but I think I've found the trouble. Now, listen to this main power generator. Sounds pretty weak, doesn't it? My guess is this. They've been using ordinary fuel. So let's see what happens when I put in this super fuel. Wow, listen to that power now. Supercharging, does it? And gang, when you roll out of bed in the morning, you're just like this generator. You need fuel because you haven't had any for about 12 hours. But listen, don't settle for ordinary fuel. Get supercharged like Buzz Corey does with a good breakfast. Eat the super cereals in the checkerboard packages. Now, rice checks and wheat checks are the super cereals with that modern bite-sized design for super easy eating. Rice Chex is bite-sized shredded rice, triple toasted. And Wheat Chex, Wheat Chex is bite-sized shredded wheat, baked crisper than a cracker, super power in every bite. Now remember, pulling up to the breakfast table is like pulling into a filling station. So get supercharged every morning. Pick up your cereal bowl and say, Fill out, Mom, Wheat Chex. Fill out, Mom, Rice Chex. <laughs> In Commander Corey's central office on Terra, a tall, middle-aged man anxiously paces the floor while Cadet Happy checks the Space Patrol search mission reports. There are some magazines on the table, Mr. Stratton. Hmm? Beg pardon? I said if you want to read, there are some magazines. Oh, no, no, thank you, Cadet. Is that clock correct? 
Yes, it is, Mr. Stratton. Are you sure? It's a uranium clock, sir. It gives the correct universal star time within a millionth of a second. Commander Corey did say 10.30, didn't he? Yes, sir. Oh, it's 10.40 now. Oh, here's the commander now. Well, sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Stratton. Oh, well, that's all right, Commander. The Secretary General and the staff have gone over your application and reports of the commission. Oh, yes? It's been approved. You can go ahead with that atomic power plant. Oh, splendid, splendid. These papers authorize you to obtain fissionable materials for your atomic breeder reactor. Mm, thank you. I suppose you're blasting off to Venus right away and get your plan into operation. Oh, I have a few matters to clear up first in my terror office. Goodbye, Commander. And, uh, Cadet, thank you for your courtesy. Well, that's all right, Mr. Stratton. Goodbye. Congratulations, Mr. Stratton. Oh, uh, what can I do for you? Why, Mr. Stratton, you don't recognize me. Why, Miss Bennett, forgive me, but uh, you look so different. Uh, don't tell me I've aged that much in five years. Oh, no, no, it's not that. It's a... I'm a blonde now instead of a brunette. Oh, yes, that's it. Of course, your hair. And I dress more expensively than I did when I worked for you. I always thought you dressed very nicely, Miss Bennett. Why so formal, Edward? On Mars, you used to call me Elspeth, the lady from Venus. Uh, what are you doing now, Elspeth? Oh, that's better. Well, right now, I'm in the manufacturing business on my own. Well, we're competitors, eh? No, no, not entirely, Edward. In fact, I'm actually interested in becoming one of your customers. Oh, splendid. We parted on very unpleasant terms, as I recall. I'm glad you're willing to let bygones be bygones. Yes, and I was delighted to hear that the Secretary General gave you the go-ahead for your reactor on Venus. Why, I just came from Space Patrol headquarters myself. How did you know about it so soon? Oh, I know a lot of things about you, Edward. I was one of the people questioned by the Space Patrol security agents. Oh, evidently, your replies were favorable. Thank you. How soon will your plant be in operation? Oh, it'll take three weeks to get into active production. Oh, then I can count on you for a shipment of plutonium in less than a month. <laughs> oh, I'm not joking, Edward. I'm ready to pay you a fair amount of credits for a small percentage of your plutonium output. You have a United Planets authorization to buy it? Oh, no. That's why I have to get it from you. But I can't sell it to you. I can sell you power, but not plutonium or other fissionable materials. It's illegal. Stratton, how long do you think you'd be permitted to operate that plant if I should go to Space Patrol with certain evidence? Evidence of those shady deals on Mars five years ago? You know I had nothing to do with those. You engineered them behind my back. Yes, but the evidence I have still points to you, not to me. I've been keeping it, Edward, for just such an opportunity as this. You no, know I've got to account for every ounce of plutonium. Surely you can find some way to get around the regulations. You want to keep that plant, don't you? That's blackmail, Elspeth. Blackmail? When I'm paying you for the plutonium? Well, that's unfair. I never thought you'd stoop to anything like this. You'll send the plutonium to the Elbin Company on Mars. There's a fake company I've organized to receive certain illegal materials. So you're operating on Mars, no? No, no. I just want to be sure the plutonium's hard to trace. For your protection as well as mine, I'm still the lady from Venus. So I'll see you in a month. Remember, I'll be expecting my shipment in a month. Goodbye for now, Ed. You know what I'm going to do when we get to Lake Azure, Commander? What, Happy? I'm going to go for a swim, and then I'm going to the club and have a steak that thick. And oh, Wait a go... minute, Happy. There's one thing I forgot to tell you when we blasted off from Terra. What's that, sir? Officially, this is a pleasure trip. Unofficially, we're on official duty. Huh? I'm all confused. You remember the man Stratton who was in my office about a month ago, the fellow who was authorized to operate an atomic reactor plant on Venus? Oh, yes, sir. I remember Mr. Stratton. He ought to be producing by now. He's in some sort of trouble. We're going to Lake Azure and see if we can clear it up. What kind of trouble? Well, he's afraid to tell me by space of phone, so I arranged to visit him at his cottage in the north shore of the lake. Oh, then the swim and the stake are out. And until after we talk to Mr. Stratton, then we'll see about the swim and stakes. Because in the long run, I want to be sure that everybody thinks we're visiting Venus for pleasure. Just a minute. Oh, oh, Elspeth. Yes, Edward. I heard you were resting here at Lake Azure after getting your plant into operation, so I thought I'd pay you a visit. I... Well, aren't you going to ask us in? Mr. Stratton, this is my assistant, Ivan Almond. How do you do? Hello. Well, shake hands with him, Edward, or Ivan will think you don't like him. He's very sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> shake, huh? <laughs> oh, easy, Ivan. 
Mr. Stratton will probably need his right hand to correct a little mistake he made. A mistake? Yes. One of our representatives inside your plan informed us that you shipped a crate to the Elven Company on Mars yesterday. Well, that's right. I, I did. I, I followed your instructions. Yeah, except you didn't put plutonium in the crate. What a waste of time and money it would be for us to pick up that crate of worthless metal and haul it back to Venus. Oh, worthless metal? Yes. So I brought Ivan with me to persuade you to correct this oversight. You like me to work him over, Miss Banner? Well, that's up to Mr. Stratton. Yes, I'll, I'll correct the oversight. Good. But the next time you make a mistake, Ivan will uh, work you over, as he calls it. And I'll turn my evidence over to the Space Patrol. It won't happen again. See that it doesn't. Come on, Ivan. All right, Miss Banner. All right, Ivan. Let's get back to their water cruiser. Miss Bennett, look. There is another water cruiser pulling up to Stratton's wharf. Yes, men in uniform. Quick, get over behind those bushes before they see us. They look like space patrol men. It's exactly what they are. It's lucky we beached our cruiser down at the cove. What are they coming here for? We're going to find out. Get in the bushes. We can watch from here. Hadn't we better get to the cruiser and shove off? Wait, Ivan. The tall one's Commander Corey. Yeah. I heard at the hotel that he was due in today for a rest. That space patrol high breast has it pretty soft. If he's here for a rest, why would he come directly to see Stratton... It looks very suspicious to me. If he's double-crossed... They us, are on the wharf now. Let's get going. No. Wait till they get in the house. Then we'll slip up and see if we can hear what's going on. Oh, Mr. Stratton, we didn't see anybody. And there was no boat at the wharf. Well, they must have come here in a surface car, then. They could have, all right, along the Lakeshore Road. Who were these people? Elspeth Bennett and a man named Ivan Armand. They're the reason I asked you to come here. They're trying to force me to sell them plutonium illegally. I see. One of their spies in my plant found out about a fake shipment I tried to trick them with, so they came here to threaten me. Threaten you? With violence, you mean? Yes. And... Look, Commander, I I'm going to tell you the whole story. It may mean that the government might take my license away, but I'll not be blackmailed into committing a crime. Blackmail? How could they? Your record's clean. Uh, well, let me give you the facts. This uh, Elspeth Bennett worked for me five years ago on Mars. Without my knowledge, she put over several very dishonest deals. Here's exactly what she did. In order to make it look as though I were responsible, she faked a series of orders. Fool, he's blabbing the whole story. Uh, maybe Corey will not believe him, huh? The Space Patrol will investigate us, and we can't afford that. At any rate, we can't get any plutonium from Stratton now. Let's get out of here before Corey comes out. If Corey finds our plant, we're finished. Ivan, we've got to take care of Corey, the cadet, and Stratton. I can't handle all three of them. They are armed. I'll fix it so you can take the space patrol in by surprise. You wait in the bushes near the lake shore. I'll pretend to be in trouble. While they're rescuing me, you can jump out and overpower them. You know, Commander, somehow I think Mr. Stratton was telling the truth about being framed. Oh, so do I, Happy. If he weren't thoroughly honest, he could have sold radioactive materials illegally. Yet he's willing to risk losing his plant. Help! Help! Commander, listen. It's a woman. She's fallen into the lake. Come on, Help! Happy. Save me. I can't swim. We're coming, lady. Here, I'll, I'll jump in, sir. Now, wait, Happy. She isn't far out. Grab the end of this stick. Uh, that's it. Get a good grip. You're going to be all right. Just hang on. We'll pull you in. Oh, thank goodness you heard me call her. I've got her, sir. Yeah, watch the edge of the bank, Happy. It's not very solid. That's, that's how I fell in. Here, I'll give you a hand, Happy. We'll have you out in just a second. Oh, I, I didn't realize the water was so deep, so close to the shore. There. There you are. Now, don't try to get up for a while. Just rest. And you rest too, Kobe! Hey, what's the big idea? I got them both, Miss Bennett, just like you said. Well, there's no time for gloating, Ivan. Go in the house, get Stratton, and bring him out here. Well, maybe I'd better finish Cody and the cadet now. Hmm. Huh? Give Stratton a chance to get away? No. Somebody's going to find three bodies here by the lake. Corey, the cadet, and Stratton. And they'll find the evidence against Stratton in Corey's pocket. Yeah, but the evidence is fake. Well, of course it is, but no one will suspect it. It'll be obvious to everyone that Stratton did away with him to keep from being exposed. How are you going to explain Stratton? Why, Corey wounded him in the fight. Now, get Stratton. Uh, suppose the cadet come to while I'm gone. 
either one of them moves, this heavy stick will take care of them. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, gang, what do you need for a good, good morning and a good, good start? A nourishing breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks. That's what. The super cereals that help to supercharge you. Uh Uh-oh, here's a chance to show you exactly what I mean. Some of the fellas here in the neighborhood are having a race. They're running right in this direction, and way out in front is Jim Bridwell, a boy that makes it a rule to eat a good breakfast with the super cereals. Listen, here they come. And let me tell you, Jim is going to win because he's supercharged. I won! There, Jim did win, which just goes to show you that to be a winner, you have to eat a winner's breakfast. So latch on quick, gang, to rice checks and wheat checks, the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. Hi, Space Patroller. Hi, Jim. Nice job of running you did there. Supercharged, that's me. That's what I was telling the gang, that you eat the super cereals. Sure do. Rice checks and wheat checks. You just can't find another cereal like them. Right you are, because they're the only modern bite-sized cereal anywhere. And talk about delicious. Mmm, boy. Get them today, Space Patrollers. Rice checks, wheat checks. Edward Stratton, operator of an atomic reactor plant on Venus, is being blackmailed by a former employee, Elspeth Bennett, into selling plutonium illegally. Buzz and Happy went to Lake Azure on Venus to get Stratton's report and were knocked unconscious by Elspeth's assistant, the burly Ivan Amund. Now, while Ivan goes to bring Stratton out of his lakeside cottage, Buzz and Happy regain consciousness to find Elspeth standing over them with a heavy club. Don't get any ideas about rushing me. I've got you covered. Commander, look. She's holding the same stick we used to pull her out of the water. If you think I won't use it, just make a move to get up. Oh, Cadet, what are you looking so pop-eyed about? Look, right over your head. There's a snake hanging from that tree limb. Oh, now, really? Don't try any childish tricks on me. He's right, Miss Bennett. And it's a poisonous snake. Oh, who do you think you're fooling? We're not fooling. You'd better move, Miss Bennett. And you'd better not, Commander. It's ready to strike. And so am I. L- look out, Commander. I <laughs> warned you, Commander. <laughs> Let go of that stick. I was hoping Let you'd go. swing at me. Now, give me that towel. I don't want to hurt you. There. You... If you hadn't ducked, I'd have fixed you good. Yeah, and if the commander hadn't yanked you forward, something would have fixed you for good. Look what's on that branch. What? It is a snake. Oh. I've got her hat. Uh, one minute she's swinging a club at us, and the next she faints dead away. Mm, women are sure temperamental. At least this one is. You know, Commander, if that snake had bitten Miss Bennett, I'm afraid it would have been one sick snake. Uh, this is uh, no time for jokes, Happy. We've got to save Stratton. Come on. I hope we're in time. Commander. Stratton, are you all right? Yes, I, I'm all right. Where's Ivan? Oh, he saw you coming, he hit me, and then ran out the back door. Stratton, Miss Bennett is out by the lake. Watch her till we get back. Come on, Happy, let's see if we can pick up Ivan's trail. Wait, Ivan. Miss Ben. I thought they captured you. I saw Corey and the cadet run toward the cottage. No. Corey struck me and thought I was unconscious. Ivan, did you finish Stratton? No. I didn't have a chance. Corey and the cadet arrived too soon. Miss Bennett, we better get in the boat and shove off. Corey may have trailed me through the brush. All right, let's get across the lake to our spaceship. Help me into the boat. This brush sure is thick. Yes. Some of these small branches are broken. Ivan's heading for the lake. Do you think he'll try to swim it, sir? He might. He might have had a boat beached along here. Commander, look at these footprints. They lead right out to the water. There's two sets, a man's and a woman's. Uh, Miss Bennett must have come out of her faint. Hey, look out there, halfway across the lake. A water cruiser with two people in it. They're going at full speed. By the time we got to our boat at the wharf, they'd be out of sight. Get back to Stratton's cottage and space a phone alarm. I'm sorry that Bennett woman got away. When I got to the lake shore, she was gone. Don't worry, Mr. Stratton. The commander's alerting the lake patrol. She won't get very far. I don't think she was planning to destroy us all in cold blood. Elspeth's always been a determined woman. 
But I had no idea she was so utterly ruthless. I just talked to the manager of the Lake Azure Hotel. Neither Ivan nor Miss Bennett were registered there. But the manager recognized their descriptions. They've been hanging around there the last couple of days. They must have been picking up information. I've alerted the Lake Patrol and Venus City Headquarters. Mr. Stratton, do you have any idea where Miss Bennett's factory is? No. Other than she hinted it somewhere here on Venus. So what's the name of it? I don't even know that. I was supposed to ship the plutonium to the Elbin Company on Mars. It's a fake outfit she uses just to acquire illegal materials. The Elbin Company. Chances are she must do quite a bit of business under that name. I'll have Space Patrol units contact all spaceports and shipping centers to see if there's any freight on hand for the Elbin Company. Mr. Stratton, you'd better come with us to Venus City. Until we capture Elspeth Bennett and Ivan, your life is in danger. Miss Bennett, the plants are in the other direction. You are way off Vector. We're not going to the plant right now. We're going to Venus City to pick up some freight. What for? There's an electromagnetic pump waiting to be picked up, and it's got the Elbin Company name on it. Sooner or later, Corey's going to trace us through the Elbin Company. But, Miss Bennett, we can't get a magnetic pump in this ship. It's too small. We'll hire a surface truck from the warehouse and drive to the plant. There's another ship there. We'll pick up some documents I need and then blast off for Jupiter. Corey will never find us there. We're about two minutes out of Venus City, sir. Shall I contact Space Control? I'll handle it, Hatch. Space Patrol Headquarters, Venus City. Calling Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead. Uh, Commander, we've already got a development on that Elvin Company checkup. Good. Let's have it. Warehouse number three has had a large piece of machinery on hand assigned to the Elvin Company. An electromagnetic pump was picked up just a few minutes ago. Does anybody at the warehouse know where the Elvin Company is located? Uh, not exactly, but from other dealings, they think it's southeast of Venus City, out toward the Topaz River. A man and a woman rented a big Atomo surface truck from the warehouse. Get the Atomo truck registration number. Alert all highway patrol units to watch for it. And not to stop it, just report its location and direction. Yes, Commander. Corey out. Well, we won't land at Venus City, Happy. We'll cruise around till we get a report on that truck. I've got the Atomo truck in the view scope, sir. It's the only vehicle on the highway for miles. Yeah, that must be it, then. Check that chart of the Topaz River region. Yes, sir. What manufacturing concerns are marked there? Well, there's only one, sir, but it doesn't say what it is. Well, when the truck arrives, we'll be there. You know, Miss Bennett, I've got to admit I didn't think much of this planet first. But we sure got Corey off of our trail now. With that electromagnetic pump out of the warehouse, there's nothing on Venus to give him a hint where our plant is. Uh, what about the spaceship we left at the freight yard? The false registration will throw Corey even further off the trail. Do you want to go to the administration building first and get those papers? No, stop here, by the reactor equipment building. What for? Just stop the truck. I'm going to leave orders for my men to get rid of all equipment which might connect this plant with illegal radioactivity work. We'll go in here and take a quick inventory. Oh, I can tell you what is in there. A container of sodium potassium coolant, heat exchanger, a receiving Yes, tank. yes, I know, but I don't want any slip-ups. Come on, get out. It's going to be a job to dispose of all that, and a real shame to destroy it. It'll just be hidden. A few months from now, I'll set up a plant on another planet. Nobody's going to stop the lady from Venus. I can promise you that. Now, come on. All right, Miss Bennett. Ivan, stay where you are. Corey! Quick, into the building. Stop! Quick, open the door. Uh, Up the stairs. We can cross to the next building with a catwalk. There they go, sir. Up the stairs. Come on, let's get them. Ivan, open the door of the catwalk. It's dark. We're coming up the steps. Stop. You're cornered. Better come down. Ivan, those thick containers. Roll them down the stairs. Okay. Uh, Better get off the stairs. Watch it, Commander. Don't have Shall I roll this one now? Ivan, wait. Don't roll it. Open the valve and let it pour down the stairs. Huh? Tip it over and point the valve toward them. Hurry! Commander, what do you suppose she's up to? I don't know. Corey, this drum contains sodium potassium coolant. It's used in atomic breeder reactors to carry off heat from the reactor core. When it's exposed to air, it will burst into flames. Turn the valve, Ivan. There it goes. Stand back, Happy. Now, let's see you come up those stairs. <laughs> 
Commander, the heat, it's awful. All right, Evan, get that door open. Yes, Miss Bennett. Happy, we can't get up through that flaming liquid, and they can't get down. We'll go outside. Sorry, Commander, you won't be leaving. She's closed the door. The electronic control switch is up here. Oh, it's no use, Cadet. You can't open that door. I got this one open, Miss Bennett. We're leaving you now, Commander. Oh, by the way, there's an automatic fire extinguishing system in here. In a minute or two, water will be sprayed all over that sodium-potassium alloy. And that's your life. Come on, Ivan, we haven't got much time. Hey, did you hear that, Commander? The sprinkling system will, will, will put the fire out. And if it works if quickly... the sprinkling system starts, we're finished. Huh? The coolant has to be kept in a closed airtight system. It burns in there, but when water hits it, it explodes violently. All these containers will blow up. But Commander, we've got to get out of here. Now look, there's an electronic hoist. A chain runs up to that pulley, fastened to the beam. That hoist will lift us high enough. We can swing over to the balcony and get out the way they did. Grab the hook. I'll throw the switch. Yes, sir. Get a good grip. And I'll hold the chain and kick the switch with my foot. Hey, it's working, sir. We're going out. Start swinging. When we're level with the balcony, jump. Yes, sir. Hey, the sprinkling system. It started to work. Let's hope the water doesn't hit that coolant until we get out of here. Jump, Happy. <clears throat> Quickly, out the door across the catwalk. There it goes. Three whole buildings blown to bits. Yes, and Commander Corey along with them. Now, come on, let's get to the ship. Let's use my ship. It's close. Corey! Hold it, Ivan. Corey, you couldn't have escaped. Uh, but we did, which is something that's never going to happen to a certain lady from Venus. Yes, sir, Commander. When she teamed up with Ivan Amon, it sure was an evil omen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be back with an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story in just a moment. Jumpin' Jupiter, gang, here's a five-star bulletin from Buzz Corey. It's coming over the teletype here in the newsroom of Terra's biggest newspaper, the Outer Space Dispatch. Here, I'll read it to you hot off the news tape. It says, Gang, don't take a chance those cold winter mornings. Get a start for the day that keeps you moving. Eat a breakfast that whips you into action. A good breakfast with good hot Ralston, the hot super cereal that helps to supercharge you. That's instant Ralston, the delicious wheat cereal. Remember, I can't take a chance. I have to get supercharged every day. That's why I eat a good breakfast with instant Ralston, a breakfast that supercharges me. You can't take a chance either, boys and girls. So my advice to you is this. Get supercharged every day. That's it, gang. That's Buzz Corey's message to you. So do what your commander says. Eat a good breakfast with good hot Ralston and get supercharged. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy are in the lower shaft of a secret mine on Saturn's sixth moon. As they wade through the water of the partly flooded shaft, the sound filters down through the mine. Happy, listen. Yeah, sounds like a motor of some kind. It must be back outside the opening. The mine's pump engine. Pump? Oh, automatic, I guess, yeah. When the water reaches a certain level, it cuts on. Hey, wait a minute. Look at the water level against the wall of a shaft. Watch it. It looks like it's rising. Oh, that pipe... It isn't drawing water out, it's forcing it in. Happy, somebody at the mine opening reversed the pumps. They're trying to drown us. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Last Voyage of Lonesome Lena, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again brings you Space Patrol! And now, a message from Commander Buzz Corey. Boys and girls, to donate blood, you have to be at least 18 years of age. But to be a Space Patrol blood booster, well, age doesn't matter. I need all of you, and all of you can join. Our job is to get more people to donate blood to the Red Cross. It's a swell way to help your country, and we have a lot of fun doing it. So, how about it? How about joining my Space Patrol blood boosters today? Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. 
Other players were Baylor Kovach, Ken Mayer, Virginia Hewitt, and David Duval. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. All right now, ladies and gentlemen, if you just keep together, thank you. Now, here, if you follow me, is the corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. And at this very corner, in a dirty little barber shop such as you or me would be ashamed to set foot in, it was so dirty, the notorious Sweeney Todd lived and breathed and had his being. What was Sweeney Todd famous for, Guy? He was notorious, lady. He was notorious for being a murderer. <gasps> a murderer? A notorious bloody murderer, he was. But this isn't a corner at all. I thought you said it was a corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. All done away with, sir. All done away with years back. But underneath these here stones, listen to the hollow sound of Disney Memento of the 18th century, underneath these stones was the very vault where Sweeney Todd used to burn his victims and make them into veal pies. Oh. They need veal for that oh. guy. And that's what they had, sir. Human veal and human bow. Oh. Sweeney Todd used to murder his victims with a barber chair, he did. And at this very corner, in sight of St. Dunstan's Church, he had his notorious barber shop. Now, if you just get in a bit more close, we'll penetrate into the very scene where Sweeney Todd raised his grisly hand in murder. <laughs> Stage 47. Item 16. Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. An early Victorian melodrama written in 1842 by George Dibden Pitt. Adapted for radio by Ronald Hambleton. Starring Maver Moore as Sweeney Todd. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen with an original musical score composed and conducted by Lucio Agostini. A melodrama of a London before the days of gaslight and handsome cab. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Hear that? St. Dunstan's bell, just like it used to ring 200 years ago, ringing over these same streets and over streets that have gone long since. Streets covered with mud and filth. No street lamps in them days, mind you. Just a perfect breeding ground for thievery and murder. It was that very bell what brought Sweeney Todd down to his shop of a morning, watching his miserable little apprentice putting up the shutters, and then waiting in his shop like a spider lurking in his web. Boy. Yes, Mr. Todd? A little more activity won't hurt you, Tobias Rag. Come here. Yes, Mr. Todd? I would have you remember that you are my apprentice, Tobias. That you have of me board, lodging, and washing. Except that you take your meals at home, that you don't sleep here, and that your mother gets up your linen. Now are you not a fortunate, happy dog? Oh, yes, please, sir. How old are you, boy? Fifteen, please, Mr. Thorpe. Old enough to have a memory, eh? I think so, sir. And remember this. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear if you repeat one word of what passes in this shop. Or dare to make any supposition or draw any conclusion from anything you may see or hear, or fancy you may see or hear. Do you understand me? Oh, I won't say anything, Mr. Todd. And for lesser misdemeanors, there's a place for you at Jonas Fogg's madhouse in Peckham. If I say anything, sir, may I be made into veal pies at Mrs. Lovett's in Bell Yard. Oh, dare you mention veal pies in my presence? Do you suspect? Hmm, do you want to lose this nice job, boy? And on your first day? Oh, sir, I don't suspect. Indeed, I don't. I meant no harm. Very good. I'm satisfied. Quite satisfied. And mark me, the shop, and the shop only, is your place. Yes, sir. And if any customer gives you a penny, you can keep it. So that if you get enough of them, you will become a rich man. Only I'll take care of them, and when I think you require any, you can come to me. Understand? We need not. All right, boy. Into the back room with you. Well, good morning, Mr. Smith. How's the chair working, Mr. Todd? It seems to have picked up a bit of a rasp, 
somewhere. Come over here and have a listen. Don't see why you should complain, Mr. Sweeney. Todd thing it's not yet paid for. What, would you have me pay for a chair that doesn't give satisfaction? Listen to it, Mr. Smith. <coughs> a trifle squeaky, Mr. Smith. Perhaps something foreign has gotten into the works. Blood, perhaps, Mr. Todd. Blood. What the devil do you mean? After all, even the most careful barber's hand slips a little, Mr. Todd. True. It's a delicately balanced piece of mechanism. Barber chairs aren't made as a rule to tip down into the cellar, Sweeney Todd. Never mind what's the rule. Your job is to see it works properly. I have my customers to think about, Mr. Smith. Tip it again, Mr. Todd. <coughs> ah, here's rust in one or two spots. And oil, I think. And then oil it, man, and get about your business. But, Mr. Todd. I've brought with me... You are surely not going to bring up again that little consideration owing to you in respect of this mechanical tire? Yes, Mr. Todd. I have with me an account for seven pounds, eighteen shillings and ninepence halfpenny. And what may the ninepence halfpenny be for, Mr. Smith? For one pound of ten-inch nails, Mr. Todd. And has it occurred to you, Mr. Smith, that some parties might consider ninepence halfpenny a little excessive for a pound of ten-inch nails? It has occurred to me that I do not like your manner of haggling, Mr. Todd. Come a little nearer, Mr. Smith. What would you say to a guinea and a half? Certainly not. I want my... And perhaps a free shave, too? A really close shave afterwards? I would say you are a rogue, Mr. Todd. I will make it 30 shillings. Let us say 30 shillings, Mr. Smith. Has it occurred to you that certain parties not very far up this street, certain legal parties, as you might phrase it, might gain a good deal of profit and instruction from a perusal of some of the items and specifications on this little account of mine. You mean about the chair, you dog? I mean the chair and I mean the old Bailey too, Mr. Todd. I think the amount we mentioned was seven, eighteen, nine and a half, Mr. Todd. Hmm, I was speaking of a free shave, Mr. Smith. I discern a roughness about the region of your lower lip and a hairiness about your throat that makes my razor long to be at it. Pray come in and take a seat, Mr. Smith. I'll go now, you scoundrel, but I shall be back. Yes, yes, come back next week. I shall be back before next week, Mr. Todd. Considerably before next week. Ah, he was wicked with Sweeney Todd. Glib as a sparrow and thieving as a jackdaw. Why'd as soon twist a young lad's arm as do an honest London tradesman out of his wages. But look, here's a first-rate sample of how Sweeney Todd used to do business. In fact, this is the little piece of work that finally brought him to the gallows. Too bad they didn't have electric chairs in them days. An electric barber chair would have been the thing for him. Now, young Tobias Rag was sweeping out the shop one evening. It was cold and drizzly, a regular sloppy day. And into the shop walks a chap what had sailor writ all over him. Is this barber shop open, my boy? Yes, indeed, sir. Come in. And tell your master I would use his services. Uh, but wait a minute. Do you live about here? I live over by St. Duncan's Church, sir. Do you know Miss Joanna Oakley? Oh, yes, indeed. She's a very kind-hearted lady. What you say is no surprise to me, though naturally I am delighted to hear it. Are you related to her, sir? She is my sweetheart. I've just come back from a voyage to India. I intend to marry her. Oh, that's what I should like to do. What, marry Miss Oakley? Oh, no. I mean, I should like to sail the ocean, too. The sea has its perils and its chances, my boy. I've been away for five years, not knowing when I would ever see my sweetheart again. But now I am home again, bringing her a pearl necklace for a wedding gift. Ah, oh, Tobias, my dear boy. Oh? What a time you have been. What has detained you, my darling boy? Sir, Mr. Todd, I... Has Captain Pearson's peruke been sent home, my dear? I don't know, sir. I thought I gave you instructions never to speak to any person who went out of eh? You may have done, sir. Take a Oh! And remember for the future what it was for. Now go into the shop and attend to your business. The next time you disobey me, I'll cut your throat. From ear to ear. Your pardon, sir. I am to blame. I asked him about a particular old friend. We got into conversation. Your apologies, I beg. Boys will be boys, and a little mild chastisement from time to time does them no harm. Perhaps you're right. But I must protest always against unnecessary severity towards young persons. But, though you are hasty, you are no doubt possessed of a generous heart. And hang me if I don't patronize you this very moment. 
I'm going to meet my sweetheart presently, and I think a clean face will become so important an occasion. Happy to be of service to you, young gentleman. Is it a shave you need? What am I here for but to give you a shave? To give you a closer shave than you have ever had before. Thank you, Barbara. Take the father chair, please. It's the chair I keep for special customers. <laughs> and special occasions, eh? And special occasions. Head back when I took in the cloth, sir. I always like to leave the throat clear. That's better. You've been to sea, sir? I've only lately come up the river from an Indian boy. Yeah. You carry some treasure, I presume? Am I in the brush? Among others, this small casket. Uh, this here. Eh? Exquisite workmanship. It is not the box, but its contents that must cause you wonder. For I must, in confidence, mind, tell you it contains a string of veritable pearls of the value of twelve thousand pounds. Twelve thousand pounds? <laughs> <laughs> what the devil noise was that? Only me. I laugh. Laugh? You call that a laugh? I suppose you caught it to somebody who died. That is your way of laughing. I beg you won't do it anymore. You will find me all attention to your orders, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ingestray. Mark Ingestray. Mr. Ingestray. It's well you came here. For though I say it, there isn't a barber in the city of London that thinks of polishing a customer off as I do. Fact, I assure you. Shut <laughs> <laughs> up, ah, ah, I, I tell you what it is, Master Barber. If you come that laugh again, I'll get up and go. Well, very good, sir. It won't occur again, if I may make so bold. Uh, who are you? Where did you come from? And where are you going? You seem fond of asking questions, my friend. Perhaps before I answer them, you'll reply to me. Do you know Mr. Oakley, who lives somewhere hereabouts? He's a spectacle maker. Oh, yes. Yes, to be sure I do. Jasper Oakley in 4th Street. He has a daughter called Joanna that the young bloods call... Head back a little farther, sir. The flower of 4th Street. She is respected, I hope. Oh, of course, of course. Now, bless me, where can I have laid Miss Strupp? I had it this minute. Ah, I recollect. I took it into the parlor. Sit still, sir. I shan't be a minute. You can amuse yourself with the newspaper. The chair moved before I could touch the lever. What's happened is it's a trick. The chair must have life of its own. No, no. Courage, Sweeney. It must have slipped. Smith must have put too much oil on it. And remember the pearls. The pearls. <sighs> when I was a boy, the thirst for avarice was first awakened by the fair gift of a farthing. And that farthing soon became a pound, a pound a hundred, and so to a thousand, till I said to myself, I will possess an hundred thousand. This string of pearls will complete the sum. Who's there? Quick, speak up. Hmm? Tobias, you dog, how long have you been peeping in the door? Peeping, sir? Yes, peeping, don't repeat me words. See, sir, I wasn't peeping at all. You didn't see the chair tilt back? I didn't know it could tilt back, sir. It doesn't. Did I say it did? No, sir, but I thought... Never mind what you thought. <laughs> Who's there? Somebody else skulking about? I'll soon fetch him out. Well, what do you want? It's only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be saved, sir. Only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be shaved, eh? You know quite a bit, Tobias. No, sir. Tell this black servant that his master is not here. Tell him to seek elsewhere. I will, sir. Gosh, I should have remembered about industry servant. But no matter. The pearls have come to me. And Mark Ingestry has gone to Mrs. Lovett, the pie maker. <laughs> Sweeney Todd was sitting on top of the world. Twelve thousand pounds worth of pearls at one sitting, as you might say. But not an easy thing to turn into cold cash. That's not something he could do by killing, though he would have if he could have. But he bided his time until the right man came along. Good evening, neighbor. I would have you shave me. Your servant, Mr. Parmine. I think you'll find this chair comfortable. Uh, thank you. You uh, deal in precious stones? I do, neighbor. To be sure. Everyone knows John Parmine, the lapidary and the jeweler. It's rather late for a bargain. Do you want to buy or sell? Head forward while I pin the cloth, sir. 
to sell. The only orders I get are for pearls, and they're not in the market nowadays. I have nothing but pearls to sell. I mean to keep all my diamonds, garnets, and rubies. The deuce you do. Will you look at the pearls I have? Where are they? Here. Hmm. Real, by heaven. All real. I know they are real. Will you deal with me or not? I'm not sure they are real, you know. Let me look at them again. Hmm. I thought so. Counterfeit. But so well done that just for the curiosity of the thing, I will give you uh, 50 pounds. Yes. Hey, Paul, is this a joke? I will give you a hundred. Hark ye, friend Parmine. It neither suits me inclination nor my time to stand haggling with you. I know the value of pearls, and as a matter of ordinary business, I will sell them to you so you may get a handsome profit. Well, since you know more than I gave you credit for, and this is to be a downright uh, business transaction, I think I can find a customer who will uh, pay 11,000 pounds for them. Ah, that's better. Let me have the money tomorrow. Uh, stop a bit. You must know that a string of pearls is not to be bought and sold like a few ounces of old silver. And you must give me satisfaction as to how you came by them. So, sure, man, who will question you? You're in the trade. That's all very fine, but I don't see why I should give you the full value of an article without evidence to prove your title to it. In other words, you don't care how I came by the property involved so long as I sell it to you at a thief. Price. Mr. Todd, I am a respectable trader. And on the other hand, if I want the real value, you mean to be particular. I suspect you have no right to sell the pearls. And to satisfy myself, I shall insist on your coming with me to a magistrate. Respectable tradesman, you'll go all right, but by the road I choose, this chair will carry you, Mr. Parmine. Ah. Off you go, Mr. Parmine. Goodbye. Goodbye! Goodbye! <laughs> Sweeney Todd. <gasps> Ezekiel Smith. You! Not goodbye, surely, Mr. Todd, but how do you do? Dear Mr. Todd. So, you know the secret of the pearls now. It is enough. Your bill is paid. But it has to be receipted yet, Mr. Todd. Where is Mark Ingestry? It was you who sent him down to the vault, wasn't it? But I didn't cut his throat, Mr. Todd. You are a little too clever, Mr. Smith. I do not like to have such a clever mechanic in my confidence. It doesn't altogether suit. How do you like this little tire? <gasps> a pistol? Mr. Todd, it's not loaded. Not as big as a chair, Mr. Smith, but it works better. <laughs> Mr. Clever Smith, you won't do much thinking now with that bleeding head. You can take all your cleverness down below now. You can have a ride in this particular chair of yours. It ought to work well now its master is riding in it. <laughs> Ah, ah, the secret is mine again. That's how Sweeney Todd went about his notorious bloody business. Lured him into his devilish barber chair, touched a lever, and down they went into the grisly vaults below Fleet Street. All he wanted was the smell of a bit of money, and he was after it like a ferret. Just one close shave, and he was cock of the walk, he thought. And all he had to worry about was doing poor old Mrs. Lovett out of her share of the swag. She was the lady that kept the pie shop next door. She was a fat, comfortable old girl, buried five husbands and looked forward to five more. Why, here is Mr. Lupin, to be sure. Just fancy coming to see little me in all this rhyme. <laughs> Do give me your umbrella this minute, Mr. Lupin, and sit down and talk something warm or you'll die of cold. Yea, dear sister, I bear this misfortune like all others with fortitude, believing that our sufferings here will in the future world be changed to peace and happiness. Certainly, to be sure. Therefore, I beg you to take a little drop of tea. Dear sister, you are indeed an angel. Oh, Mr. Lupin, won't you draw your chair a little closer? Verily, I will. And is it true, dear sister, that thou hast gathered unto thyself much of the mammon of unrighteousness by the sale of those same pieces of manner, which the ungodly call, though, wrapped around the flesh of the petty calf? What a lovely way of saying, dear sister. There is much of the mammon of unrighteousness in what thou callest, by 
Thou has what the wicked call a stocking. Oh, brother, let us not talk of pays. Remember that all day and all night I think of nothing but pays. And sometimes pays aren't my dreams. Remember that all day I smell pays. And I might dow the pays. And I'd like something for pays. Verily, sister, it is a delicious text. Lo, the smell of gravy haunteth me nostrils and me so quivers with delight. Then would you like a pie, brother? Me so fighteth me so crieth out, oh, me sister, oh, me beloved. Then take one, brother. Oh. Think the time they did only again. Why, sister, of a surety, this is not the top of the pie. No, Mr. Lupin, this is a very special pie, such as I keep for callers and friends. And uh, tell me, sister, there is great profit in the top of the pie. Must I put in a penny worth of the set of the car? No, Mr. Lupin, how do you imagine I'll live? I'll put in a farthing's worth, no more. Verily a magnificent pie. Of a truth, thou art a woman in a thousand. And how much flour puttest thou in a tuppenny pie? A uh, heaper, Lupin. And whence cometh thy flour, my beloved? A bird from Miller Brown. And Miller Brown hath nearby his mill certain cavities in the earth containing chalk. Is he not, sister? Chalk? Miller Brown is a respectable merchant, Mr. Lupin. Oi, tis, oi, did I say or tell? Oh, sister, what a pie, what a pie was that. <laughs> Behold, my heart yearneth after thy beauty. Behold, a great love will is up in me soul. Who is thou take me end? It is the stocking thou sayest. Hark, I will whisper. Is it near thy bed? Oh, brother, brother, thou... You mustn't. Mr. Lupin, you are a naughty man. Ist, the beloved, which call me Lupin now. Oh, not now. Not yet. So, there are yet certain ministrations of the spirit I must attend to ere time for pleasure come in. You are such a godly man, brother. Yea, even today I was able to save a wandering soul from sorrow, even an unfortunate black whose master had left him alone in this teeming city. Uh, black, a gentleman's black servant. Verily, even the heathen, dear sister, is... What did he say about his master, I mean? Verily, I am gratified, highly gratified to find studies of mercy in thee, sister. Wilt come with me to Joanna Oakley, who is suffering from a great depression of the soul, too. Joanna Oakley, a gentleman's back servant. We are undone. Undone, my beloved. Oh, Mr. Lupin, leave me at once. But, my beloved, this excessive pity for the unfortunate one seems to be a trifle, shall I say, excessive? What did you do with this back servant? I kindly took charge of a certain sum of money for him, lest he lose it, sister. What is he now? Swallowed up, indeed. It till this team in city. Ah. The work of the Lord calleth his servant, and I must be gone. I will bear to Joanna out the expressions of your solicitude. Yes. Tell her, tell her that I weep for her sorrow. Verily a gracious sentiment. And I shall add, my dear sister, that in your eyes every tear is a pearl. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett, rather late for a call, my dear. Can I do anything for you? My mind is disturbed, Pud. The wicked manner of our lives darkens every hour and colors all my dreams with blood. Can we not reform our ways and live good, righteous lives? What drivel is this woman? You sound like that ranting parson Lupin. Lupin, I know. Lupin, oh yes. Don't talk. Twist me arm like that. Me. I'll do more than that. Now tell me exactly what are you talking about? William Grant died last night. And who may William Grant be? He was my baker, Mr. T. But, my dear Mrs. L., your baker's name was Jones. But he got discontented, Mr. Todd. Surely he remember. So many of them, one gets confused. But never mind. Dry those tears, <laughs> little crybaby. Mr. T., the pie shop in Bell Yard must be closed. Closed, Mrs. Lovett. The conscience is aroused. I dreamt last night that I was being hanged with a rope of pearls. My heart goes out in sympathy to you, Mrs. Lovett. You must be tired of standing. Let me implore you to take a seat. Take this chair, Mrs. Lovett. In that chair? Do you think I'm such a fool, Mr. T? Well, why not? It's a perfectly good chair. You and I have profited well enough by it in the past. It's a wicked chair, Todd. 
<laughs> it works very well. A trifle squeaky, eh? But then all old friends squeak a little bit, Mrs. Lovett. Eh, Mrs. Lovett? Let me go, Todd. Please, please, Todd, my dear. The management of women is much like the management of horses. Horse judiciously applied. What are they going to do, Todd? People are beginning to suspect. Oh, do you know of anyone, Mrs. Lovett? What about that gentleman with the pearl? He'll never suspect not anymore. But what about his servants? It will speak to him. He might go to the magistrate. Now that, Mrs. Lovett, sounds very like an idea of your own. We're in it together. Remember that? Uh, remember? Come, my dear. Let us sit down and talk like old friends. You know, you don't mean to do anything, do you? Pray look at me, Anne. It's crushing it. I have always been noted for Miss Drink. I want to go out. I must breathe the clean air. Let me go, let Why me go. Why, this hurry to be out at this time of day, Mrs. Lovett? No, no. We shall sit here quietly and talk of your troubles. <laughs> you were speaking of the unexpected demise of this, let me see, what was his name? Not Jones, what was it? I've forgotten, Todd. You are not thinking of going, Mrs. Lovett? No. Too late now. Why, then, let me hold your hand. And we will sit here, holding hands like... Like lovers. Now, while Sweeney Todd and his female accomplice were sitting in his barber shop, warm in their hands, so to speak, because there was only one candle in the old room in place, Dr. Aminadab Lupin was on his errand of mercy to see Joanna Oakley. She'd pretty near cried her eyes out for Mark Ingestry by this time, and her ma and pa just didn't know what to do with her. How is this child that you look so pale? I must speak positively about you to Mr. Lupin. Lupin may be all very well in his way as a parson, but I really don't know what he can have to do with Joanna looking pale. Tush, Mr. Oakley. I'm all right, Mama. Really, I am. Lupin has been kicked out of more people's houses than anybody else from here to Aldgate. If the sainted man has been kicked, Mr. Oakley, he glories in it. Mr. Lupin likes to suffer for the faith. And if he were made a martyr, it would give him much pleasure. Not half the pleasure it would give me, Mrs. Oakley. Joanna, I, I think I feel my old complaint coming on again. Your, your father's brutality always produces it. I, I must compose my nerves with the little cherry brandy. Let me help you, Mama. No, no. I, I will suffer alone, Joanna. Well... I suppose I must offer her crumbs of comfort, as Lupin would say. Damn, Mr. Aminadab Lupin! Ah, oh, Miss Oakley, did I hear your parents retire? Yes, Mr. Lupin. I shall call them back. Uh, dear is Joanna. I come here at the bidding of my conscience to consort with you in your dire need. You will allow me free passage from the room, Mr. Lupin. Thou art disrespectful, but I will not snub thee, virgin. Thou knowest not me mission here. I don't want your comfort, sir. What if I were to pour into your ears the knowledge that I have? If I whisper pearls in a black servant? <gasps> oh, servant, not Mr. Ingestry. Ah, I have touched a chord in thy bosom. Thou hast heeded the tongues of rumor that have been a wagging. I do not listen to rumor, sir. Only by rumor do we learn of iniquity, virgin. It hath made a man of me and me carcass, which was as lank as an erring once, is now round and comely to look at. Oh, where is Mr. Ingestry? Have you heard from him? Oh, how long have I waited for news? I made in them news incarnate. Though I speak with the mouths of babes and settlings, I shall offer me news. If you know anything, speak, I pray you. For a consideration. Oh, anything, anything, Mr. Lupin. Then, maiden, listen. I have held converse with a certain black, for whom I was able to perform a small service. He had lost his master. He was as a ship without a rudder, as a principality without a prince. He told me of hours of waiting outside a certain shop on Fleet Street. A shop, mark you, from which his master never emerged. Where was it? I must go to him. Precipitation virgin is unwise. For next to this certain shop lives a lady for whom I hold a certain regard, and with whom, in fact, I have supped and drank. 
When I spoke certain words to her, she blushed and then looked pale. All I wonder is this, did she blush from a lovely excitement of the pulse at the sight of me, or did she thus reveal a guilty secret? Then how will we know? What will we do? I know an unmannerly youth who might, for a consideration, ingratiate himself within this certain lady's shop. Stop riddling, Mr. Lupin. Who's shop? Who is the lady? The shop virgin is Sweeney Todd's, and the lady is Mrs. Lovett, the pie maker. Do you think them guilty? Verily, I believe this man Sweeney to be a man of sin. I myself have a mind to test his wickedness and to introduce this youth within Mrs. Lovett's shop. Then do so, Mr. Lupin, and let me find ways to thank you. Why, you can thank me with the aforementioned consideration. What is it, then? Briefly, let me take thee unto my bosom even as a wedded wife. <gasps> Absurd! Have you been drinking? The fire of love rages. It consumeth me very vital. Oh, come no dearer, sir. An adventure I may extinguish the flame of my passion by the moisture of those ruby lips. Sir, are you insane? Maiden, I am resolved. Oh, hand me a weapon. Oh, repent. Moderation, sir. maiden, one oh. off. You lady. Oh. Why, it's the hypocrite parson. Oh. There's a better correction for you, Lupin. Help! Silly, I am a steel robber. Fire! Help! Now, what was all that a confabulation with Lupin, Johanna? Oh, Papa, I'm afraid for Mr. Ingersoll. Ingersoll? Is he back again? That is why I kept it my secret, Papa. I thought you might still refuse your consent. It was because of you that he went to sea. And where he might, the wastrel. But now he has returned, rich from India, Papa. Rich from India? Then why doesn't he show himself like a man? He, he has met with some misfortune here in London. Mr. Lupin believes him dead, I think. Where was this? He was last seen at Sweeney Todd shop in Fleet Street. And his, his black servant... Oh, buck up, Black. Dry your eyes. If Mark Ingestry is alive, we'll find him. And if Sweeney Todd is responsible for those tears of yours, he'll pay for it. And that's how the you and cry started against Sweeney Todd, the notorious bloody murderer. Of course, it wasn't the you and cry at first, because he was a slippery devil, but matters were coming to an end. Jasper Oakley was plotting to comfort his daughter, and as for Mr. Lupin, why he thought he might lie in his pocket. It is well that the children of the Lord should partake of the ill-gotten gains of the wicked and strip the villain of his... So while he figured out a way to blackmail Sweeney Todd, he sent his unmannerly youth, Jarvis Williams, to worm his way into Mrs. Lovett's confidence. Go away, my good fellow. We never give anything to beggars. I ain't no beggar, Mum. But a young chap was trying to look out for a situation. Jarvis Williams is the name. I've seen better days, Mum. I kept the be Italy. A be Italy? Yes. You never seen such a barrow of greens and taters as I used to turn out. But Monopoly made me a bankrupt. The big shops ruins the little shops and stars out the cost of monks. Blow chai, mind it. I dare say when you get into better days, you'll have quite sufficient influence to make you intolerable. Are you, uh, from this bar? No, Mum. Night's with. Better picking. You are unknown about the air? Even old Bailey hasn't heard of me, Mum. Very well. You ask me for employment, and I will give it to you. Follow me. Where to? To the White House, where I will show you what you have to do. You must promise never to leave it on any pretense. Never to leave it? Never, unless you leave it for good and all. As Shakespeare says, my poverty and not my will consent. Help me with this back door. We'll be working in the bowels of the earth. Shut <coughs> boy, it's only our vault. Coo, it's a dismal old. By this petted young Jarvis, we must descend to the furnace in oven. Well, I will show you how to manufacture the pot. Leave the files and make yourself generally useful. And that's it, I hope. I suppose I'm going to someone assist me in this situation. One pair of ends would never do the work in such a place. Are you not content? Yes. Only you spoke of having a man. I had a man, Jarvis. He's born to his friend. He's gone to Timothy Dale, 
friends who will be glad to see you. Yeah, Nero, don't like the sound of that. Have you any scruples? No scruples, Mum, but one objection. And that is? I should like to leave when I please. <laughs> yeah, Mum, I come I'm easy on that score. I never keep anyone many hours after they begin to feel dissatisfied. But now, I must leave you for a time. What, down here? Yes, Jarvis. As long as you're industrious, you will get on very well. But as soon as you begin to get idle and neglect the orders, you will receive a piece of information. What is it, Mum? I'm an inquiring young fella. You may as well give it me now. Now. I seldom find any occasion for that at first. But I'll keep time when you get well fed. If it is sure to want it. Everyone who relinquishes the situation goes to his old friends. Friends he's not seen for many years. I shall return for none. manner of talking that respectable female is. There seems to be something singular in everything she says. And what a singular looking place too. Nothing visible but darkness. It will be quite unbearable but for the delicious smell of pie. Yeah, what's that? A rattlesnake? It rattles anyway. You look at the field. Bones. Skull. Ribs. I must have stumbled into a surgery. Because these are human bones. Wish I could find a funny bone. I feel a bit poorly. She was a nice looking old ma too. Strikes me that Lupin and her would make a nice pair. Why have this bag of bones is a fellow who's gone to his oldest friend. Might be it's more industry, the sailor. Now he's dead. Oh, what's that? Oh, ma. Here's one of the murdered girls come to extra his body. Maybe it's been made into veal pie. Please, it wasn't me, Sir Ghost. I was only I ten minutes ago. Silence, my friend. Are you in league with these fiends? I hope, Mr. Ghost, they aren't going to murder me as they did you before me. Whose ghost are you? My name is Mark Ingestry. <gasps> Merciful heavens, it's the sailor. Him that was murdered for his pearl. You know about that. You must be in league with the villain. Indeed, I am not. His wages is too high for an honest man. As Shakespeare says, mine only vice is honesty. Will you help me to bring Swingy Todd to the hands of justice? Right you are, sir. But what are you stopping down here for? I don't know how it happened, but I suddenly fell into space. It was while I was being shaved. And I was knocked senseless on this stone floor. And when you come to? I suspected treachery. Since then, I've explored these vaults from end to end, seeking proof of the villain's guilt. How do we get out of here? Have you a stout heart? Me heart's stout enough, but my blood's running a trifle thin. What's your name? Jarvis Williams, sir. Do you know Joanna Oakley? Only by year, sir. You know where she lives? In 4th Street, I think. Then go to her. No, no, that won't do. Go to her father. Tell him I'm alive and request him to communicate that intelligence to Miss Oakley. Let her know that there is yet hope. Are you going on living here? Yes, for the present. I must gather evidence and proof that Sweeney Todd is the malefactor I believe him to be. Can you keep a secret, Jarvis? Well enough, I suppose. And come with me through this passage. What more, Gorios? Follow me. Up these stairs is a door that connects these vaults with Sweeney Todd's shop. This way. Right into the lion's mouth. There I will station myself, and there you will bring Mr. Oakley so that we may apprehend the villain. Quietly now. This must be Sweeney Todd's back room, sir. It is. And what of these walls not seen, Jarvis? Look through the door. It's Lupin. He's getting himself shy. Quiet, we may gather some clue. Listen to what they say. Ray, Mr. Todd, not so hard. Not so hard. What do you say? You lather me too hard. It's such a while since I had the pleasure of shaving you, Mr. Lupin. I wanted to make a good job of it. Mr. Todd, remember what a bountiful collection we had at church meeting yesterday evening. What of it? Oh, the man of God can well afford that gracious offering known to the unrighteous as a tip. A tip, eh? Dear me, perhaps you are worth polishing off. <laughs> 
What did you say, Mr. Todd? Nothing, Parson. I shaved me carefully, Mr. Todd, for I am to wear a wealthy heiress. I would fain make the wife of me booze. A wealthy heiress? And what's her name, may I ask? Mrs. Lovett, I'll wait you. Silence. Would you ruin everything? Of a surety, she is not unknown to you. This Mrs. Lovett who owns the pie shop in Bell Yard, oh, that the Lord hath blessed with a trade both bountiful and ever flowing. What do you say, Mrs. Lovett? Then you are going to be polished off. Remain seated, sir. Lupin, sit down! <coughs> ah, uh, no, you don't catch me so easily, Mr. Todd. I have always been suspicious of your doings, and I prefer to stand. I should have suspected the chair. Come here, Mr. Lupin. Mm. Oh, indeed. And now that I know how you manage it, and a sinful cunning trick it is, you'll pay blood money for it, Mr. Todd. Come back, Lupin. As you see, Mr. Todd, I am not right for killing yet. Oh! Yes, you are, Mr. Lupin. Very ripe. Very ripe indeed. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. When they sit in Sweeney's chair, off they go to heaven knows where. Mrs. Lovett surely knows where they go to all the hemorrhoid goes. Where they go to all the hemorrhoid goes. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young or old ones, come and die. I'm off, Mr. Todd, we'll talk like you. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear when I catch you. Coast clear, Mr. Ingester. What unparalleled horrors. I can't say I'm sorry to see old Lupin doing a bit of honest running for a change. See, Jarvis, this is the very chair in which I sat. And... Here's the chain the assassin pulls to tilt the chair and drop the victim into the depths below. And then into the furnaces where the bodies are incinerated. Fetch Mr. Oakley and the police officers. I will return to the vaults, for Sweeney Todd thinks me dead. And as long as he thinks so, he has an adversary he does not suspect. <laughs> That ranting parson has escaped me, but I fear no man of his kidney. A little money, an offering, he would call it, blackmail, I should say, merely a temporary disbursement to be returned along with all the other effects of the leg at all. <laughs> a pretty jest, the leg at all. And when he's been polished off, I'll deal with the rest of them. I have too many enemies to be really safe. My first step must be to get rid of Tobias Rag. I think he thinks. I need not take his life, but a close confinement of the boy in the lunatic asylum of Jonas Fogg will effectually silence him. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett too grows dissatisfied and scrupulous. I've had my eye on her for some time, and I fear she intends mischief. A little poison skillfully administered may remove any unpleasantness in that quarter. <laughs> So we need Todd. Spying, Mrs. Lovett. You may call it so, and since I discover that you intend treachery, I shall on the instant demand my share of the booty. Aye, an equal share of the fruits of our mutual bloodshed. Well, so you shall. I will balance accounts with you. What is the reckoning? I find it to be 12,000 pounds to a fraction. That is just... Six thousand pounds each, sir, being two of it. But, Mistress Lovett, you will have to pay me for your support, lodging, and clothes. Clothes, Mr. Todd? I repeat the word, clothes. Why, I haven't had a new dress for these six months. Besides, am I to have nothing for your education? In killing, I mean, Mrs. Lovett. Oh, I have profited by that. To a degree, Mrs. Lovett, yes. For some years past, you have been totally provided for by me. And after deducting that and the expenses of 
erecting furnaces, purchasing flour for your delicious veal pies, we got the flour cheap because of the truck in it, and sundry other outlays, I find it leaves a balance of 16 shillings, fourpence, three farthings in my favor. In your favor? And I don't intend you to budge an inch until it is paid. You want to rob me, but you shall find to your sorrow I will have my due. You have instructed me in killing your side. Very well, Sweeney Todd. Tis you who purchased this knife. Don't be a fool, woman. Put your name to a deed consigning the owl of the wealth blood has purchased all you perish. Idiot. You should have known Sweeney Todd better than that. I calculate my chances. I have also purchased this pistol. Don, Throw down the knife. Todd, what are you going to do? Throw down the knife, woman. There it is, Todd. No, say your prayers. Your last hour has come. Spare my life, for the love of heaven, as I spared yours. Well, that's good, as you spared mine. <laughs> well, it's kind of the art to kill me. I'll stop before you spill my blood. I've been showed to you upon my guilty soul. Take your hands off me, woman. What about Lupin? It was in our interest. Stop that I led him on. Sir, take your hands from about my neck. I don't like things crawling over me. Oh, Todd, a good lady told me of a home where I could end my days in solitude and peace. Let me go to it again and beg her on my knees to show you the same mercy and compassion. Let us never see each other anymore. Let us lead better lives and forget we ever lived except in prayer. Will you lose your hold? It is never too late to repent, Todd. Never. It is too late. Are you? Perdition. Mrs. Lovett is dead, and there is blood upon me. Now Sweeney is alone. Now let the chair work, and let the furnaces consume the body, and destroy all evidence of my guilt in this, as it has in my manifold deeds of blood. With Mrs. Lovett dead, Sweeney Todd had to do all his dirty work by himself. He lays her in the chair, tips it down into the vault, then hurries down the back stairs and through the dark passage to finish the job off. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Lovett. Somebody shot you. Tell me who did it. Tell Sweeney, and he'll cut their throats from ear to ear. Little crybaby, it's too bad you missed getting your share, isn't it? But don't worry, I'll revenge you. Hm, all right. Footsteps on the stair. No, in the passage. In the passage? Oh, but only Mrs. Lovett and that is if your Smith knows about that passage, and they are dead. Go away! Your trade was a paying one, Mr. Cobb. Sailor! I'm back, Mr. Todd. Go away, Mr. Sailor. You're dead. I denounce you, thief and murderer. I have caught you in the act of disposing of one of your unhappy victims. Wait a minute, Mr. Sailor. Would you like to go the way she went? I have lots of bullets left in this pistol, and Sweeney Todd has never been known to me. I do not fear you face to face, murderer. Come not a step closer and so die! Sweeney Todd. Curse you! There. This pistol is too dangerous for you to handle. Now, Mr. Todd, with my own hands I shall drag you to the gallows and behead you so richly deserved. Oh, Mr. Sailor, the fortunes of war, eh? One false move and I'll shoot you as I would a mad dog. That's a bargain indeed. But, Sailor, what? Behind you! What? Well, ah! How is that for a bargain, eh? <laughs> You want a weakling. So, Mr. Sailor, you see, I am still master about here. Now, up those stairs, through the trap door into Mrs. Lovett's pie shop, and one lever locks all the doors. <laughs> <laughs> You're lost now, Mr. Sailor. You'll never get out of this alive, and pretty soon you'll have company. <laughs> <laughs> The 
verily I have no wish to be included in this pursuit, Mr. Oakley. Lo, the roaring lion is abroad, and no folk shall remain of a piece. But, uh, Mr. Lupin, our plan includes you, eh, Jarvis? We've got a place for Mr. Lupin, all right. My proper place is on guard, exhorting, keeping watch and ward. Let me be the encourager, Mr. Oakley. Uh, no, Mr. Lupin, you are to be the bait. <laughs> the bait? You are to go to Sweeney Todd's shop. Now, listen carefully. Engage him in conversation. You can do that well enough. Provoke him to some damaging admission. Yes, yes. Then, when he is about to plunge his razor into your throat to silence you forever... <gasps> as late as that! It would not trick him otherwise. Then we will burst in, overpower him, and win the day! Hurrah! St. George for England! Verily, it does not appear to be so much like an holiday. It will make a man of you, Lupin. <laughs> However weary he is, I'd everybody. I never did see such a man for distraction of the mind. It's the sailor! <laughs> Mark Ingastry, my dear boy. Have you caught the murderer? At last I have the proof of his guilt. I've seen the murderer at work. What poor soul was it this time? He has done away with his accomplice, Mrs. Lovett. <gasps> what Sempronia gone? Woe to England and woe to Lupin. She was an ice hole, Mark, too. She was round as the full moon and as fleshy as the goat that wanted on the delectable mountains. And now perished. Gone like the flower of the field. He thinks me locked in his vaults, but I escaped by a secret tunnel. He made a great mistake in not killing you, Mr. Ingastry. Uh, for his own good, I mean. It is an error he will bitterly repent. Uh, Mark. Uh, I may call my future son-in-law Mark, I believe. Bully for you, Mr. Oakley. I may have dealt a pretty servile toward you in the past, but uh, all that's forgot, eh? Of course, sir. Then let us call Johanna that you may greet your sweetheart before we take this murderer. Bully for you, Mr. Oakley. This young man is like the black bird. He has but one song. I'll call her. Uh, Mrs. Oakley, bring Johanna at once. There is a good old friend of hers here. Now just watch her face when she sees you, Mark. What is this, Mr. Oakley? Why do you thus disturb my after-dinner rest? Calling for Joanna with a voice like the bull of Bashan. A pious phrase, good Mrs. Oakley. Uh, what's this, Mrs. O? Is Joanna not here? Well, how can she be here when she's with this gentleman? With me, madam? With you, indeed, Mark Ingersby. And I must say, too, that it is not the proper thing to do either. Sending a young woman notes like she was a trollop <laughs> instead of an honest. Girl, tenderly nurtured. I sent Joanna no letter, Mrs. Oakley. You have no call to lie about it, Mr. Ingastry. Where is this letter? Here. Naturally, I took it from her, but she would go. What devil's work is this? This is not my hand. Not your... <gasps> then she has been abducted. I got it. Yes. Only one man could be responsible for this subterfuge. And that man is... Sweet Sweet <gasps> Thank you, the mind has given way. Leave her where she lies. There's man's work to be done to the rescue. Once more unto the breach, as Shakespeare says. Sweeney Todd is doomed. But is there time to save Joanna Oakley? He is like a lion at bay now, enraged and unscrupulous. <laughs> <laughs> this enticed maiden shall be my surety of escape. What do you think, Miss Oakley? Do your worst, you ruffian. Though my dear parents and Mr. Ingestry hold me dear, they will never let the reflection sway them in the performance of their duty. Have I not a singular grace in writing love letters? Oh, you do ill to taunt someone who is in your power, Mr. Todd. You would not dare do it if Mr. Ingestry were here. But he is here, my dear. And you shall see him in a little while. You shall join your lover in the vault below. But first... Just don't be frightened. I'm not going to harm you yet. <laughs> I just want you to be a witness. I'll be no witness to your doings, Sweeney Todd. I have a young apprentice who has shown distressing signs of madness lately. Fancy, I caught him yesterday stealing away to denounce me to the magistrate. Is that not an undoubted form of madness? I think he did well. Look, we'll have him in. It's near time for the keepers to arrive anyway, and you can judge his madness for yourself. I keep him in this room. Hello, Tobias Rag. I won't enjoy it. I won't be knocked about in this way. You won't, eh? 
Ah. You are a designing, cruel, and cold-blooded murderer. There, you see, Miss Oakley, these are genuine ravings. Miss Oakley, have you lured her into your den, too? Now, don't you wish you'd been loyal to me, you dog, when we do such a brisk business? Have no fear, Tobias. Help will come. <laughs> Tobias will be far from help, and very soon. We are safe! <laughs> Come in, Jonas Fogg. Now, Tobias, my boy, do you consider yourself saved? We need to all if my memory don't deceive me. You are right. I'm not easily forgotten, I believe. You have brought the water. They are outside in the carriage. Good. Now, Jonas Fogg, I have another apprentice here who has shown such symptoms of insanity that it becomes, I regret to say, necessary to place him under your care. Indeed, does he rave? He says I am a murderer. A murderer? <laughs> yes, isn't it? Could anything be more absurd? I that have the milk of human kindness flowing in me every vein. For how long, Miss Carl, do you think this malady will continue? I will pay for twelve months. But I do not think between you and I that the case will last anything like so long. I think he will die like young Simpkins suddenly. I shouldn't wonder if he did. It is decidedly the best way. It prevents expense. We make no remarks and we ask no questions. Those are the principles on which we have conducted our establishment for so long. Those are the principles upon which we shall continue to conduct it into merit, we hope, the patronage of the public. Unquestionably. Uh, but which is the patient, I perceive you have two of them. Pay no attention to the girl. This boy is the one. Quite. Young. Pity, isn't it? And, of course, we deeply lament his condition. Of course. But see, he raises his eyes. He will speak directly. Rave, I should say. Sweeney Todd is a murderer, and I denounce him. There, you see him? Man, indeed. Save me from him. It is my life he seeks because I know he is a murderer. Miss Oakley, add your voice to mine. Mr. Fogg, if you have any sympathy or justice in you, you will help. This seems to be communicable insanity in its most terrible form. I shall be upon the necessity of putting him in a straight whiskey. Mr. Todd, let me have both of them. No, the girl is a, shall I say, a deposit left for my safekeeping. But there, Jonas Fogg, why shouldn't you have both of them? Why shouldn't I deposit her with you? <laughs> Valuable security should always be banked, Mr. Todd. Hmm. A pleasant little jest to Jonas Fogg. <laughs> <laughs> Take them both! A good day's business. Convey them to one of the dark, damp cells. As too much light encourages their delirium. Villain, do your worst. I shall always aver that Sweeney Todd is an assassin. It is true. Take him away. I will die before I submit to you or your vile Myrmidon. Why, then you'll die, for no power can aid you. Yes, there is one. Where? There is heaven, which fails not to succor the helpless and persecuted. Cushers! I am undone. Quick, bolt the door, Jonas Fogg. Too late, Sweeney Todd. Much too late, Mr. Todd. Mark! Stand off, you cowardly rascals, and I'll put the kibosh on the old corn song. The kibosh? Yes, it's a word of Greek expression meaning the hopset of the hapelcon. You'll hang now, Sweeney Todd. And Mark Ingestry, you? Yes, Sweeney Todd. Mark Ingestry, who, preserved from death by a miracle, returns to confound the guilty and to protect the innocent. <laughs> And that's how Sweeney Todd, the notorious bloody murderer of Fleet Street, was brought to justice and finally hanged at Tyburn. Mark Ingestry recovered his pearls, laid them at his sweetheart's feet, and gained her parents' consent. And what do you think Mark Ingestry did besides? Tobias Rag, do you still want to follow the sea? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Ingersley. Then I shall buy you a commission in His Britannic Majesty's Navy. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersley. And furthermore... Rah! Mr. Lupin, if you are agreeable, you shall perform the rites at our wedding. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersley. And furthermore... Rah! Jarvis Williams, I'm going to buy you the biggest cart in London and outfit it with the best greens and taters money can buy. 
That seems to have silenced the youth. Uh, let me say it. A verily bully for thee, Mark Industry. And furthermore... Hurrah! Throughout our married life, Joanna, my dear... Yes, Mark? I will never ask you to make a veal pie. Hurrah! Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street first produced at the Britannia Theatre, Hoxton, in 1842, was written by George Dibden Pitt, and here adapted by Ronald Hamilton as item 16 of stage 47. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen, with an original musical score composed with tongue-in-cheek and conducted by Lucio Agostini. Starred as Sweeney Todd, Maver Moore, with Lister Sinclair as the guide, John Draney as Tobias, Bud Knapp as Mr. Smith, Lloyd Bochner as Mark Ingestry, Frank Wade as Parmine, Jane Mallet as Mrs. Lovett, Tommy Tweed as Parson Lupin, Kathleen Kidd as Mrs. Oakley, Glenn Burns as Mr. Oakley, Arden Kay as Joanna, Bernard Braden as Jarvis Williams, and Alan King as Jonas Fogg. Fred Tudor made all the sinister sounds, and Bruce Armstrong... Stories to Remember. Stories of people, stories of human dignity and decency, told by some of America's outstanding storytellers. We present Ralph Bellamy in A Story to Remember, The Outcasts, by B.J. Chute. Here you are, Wallace. Thanks for the lift, John. It makes it easier for Helen when I let her have the car. Oh, sure. Well, thanks again. Bye. You stand there for a minute before the entrance to your home. It's the peak of rose time. The rich scent comes at you like a wave. You look at your house, surrounded with roses and delphiniums and the smooth rug of green lawn. You stand still for a moment and look at the rich sunset bronzing the windows of your house. Your bright white house with green shutters. Your house and your land, your piece of earth. With deep contentment, you walk up that neat little path to your home. Daddy! Daddy! Hey! Huh, that was a fine tackle. Hey! You're home in half an hour early, yeah, Mr. Daddy. Newhouse gave me a lift. Oh, him. He's fat. Mother's fixing the dinner, and Via's upstairs putting her face on. She got a big date tonight with Jim. Jim? Who's he? James, uh, Bradford Hotchins. Don't you know him? Oh, yes. Yes. You walk into your house thinking about your daughter, V, and her new boyfriend, Hutchins. Yes, that's a familiar name. V, who at 17 is any man's dream of spring, as beautiful as her mother... You walk into your living room, and there's Helen, self-possessed and beautiful. You look at her, and you're proud that she's your wife. Darling, you look as cool as a cucumber. You're home early today. Yes, John Newhouse was good enough to give me a lift. Oh, his wife, Catherine, called me this afternoon. Did she? Must be arranging another one of her bridge parties. No, it wasn't that. It's something rather important. I'd like to talk to you about it. About what, darling? Wait for me on the veranda. It's cooler. I'll be there in a minute, dear. You sound very mysterious. By the way, who's James Bradford Hutchins, known to our daughter as Jim? Why, he's Clifford Hutchins' son. One of our very good families. Oh, Jim's a fine, good-looking boy. Cliff Hutchins, hmm. Seems to be a nice fellow. Yes. Oh, Ollie, it's so nice to know our children are meeting the right people. And I love it here. But, uh, I do want to talk to you about something important. I'll meet you on the veranda as soon as I see what the new cook's doing with dinner. You sit in the wicker chair on the veranda. It's that magical moment, neither night nor day. You sit and your thoughts are like gusts of soft wind that come from nowhere. Life is full and kind to you, and you wish that all men everywhere could have this same security and peace. You're not asleep, darling, are you? No, just relaxing, Helen. Catherine called to talk to me about Mr. Benson, the real estate agent. He's had an offer on the Stiles place. That's fine. It'd be nice to have someone living there. It 
would be nice, but these people who made the offer wouldn't do. Why? Can't they finance it? No, that has nothing to do with it. Well, why wouldn't they do? They're... They're undesirable. What? Oh, I see. Well, Mr. Benson told Catherine that it's hard to move such big properties, and he wanted to make sure it was the wish of our community to keep them out. So Catherine thought that all the leading members of the community ought to get together and... Well, actually what she said was that she thought our house would be a good place to hold such a meeting. Why our house? Because we just recently moved into the neighborhood and the new house is like us and... Well, they, they know we think the same way they do. Do you know anything else about these people? Not a thing. Do you know their name? No, I don't. I told Catherine she could ask whoever she wanted to. It won't be too much fuss. We'll just serve cocktails. Anyway, I well, I do think it's a good thing to have the leading people of the community at our house. I suppose so. It's unfortunate, of course, dear, but it's like zoning a residential district against, <laughs> well, against nightclubs or something. People aren't nightclubs or something. Of course they aren't, but you know what I mean. It isn't just these people. It's it's what it starts. They bring their friends and they, oh, they're pushing. When are we going to have this cocktail party? Day after tomorrow, Saturday. Will Arthur Hearn be coming? I hope so, but I think he and Mrs. Hearn are still in Canada. Anyway, we know how they feel. This whole community was part of the Hearn estate. There's no question about them. No, I guess there's no question about them. I think dinner's about ready, dear. Shall we go in? All through dinner, you think about Mr. Hearn, the unquestioned leader of the community, the man of great wealth and power. He set the tone and pattern of the neighborhood without caring whether he set the pattern or not. What was good for Hearn was good for everybody else. You thought of Mr. Hearn and those nameless people who wanted to buy the Stiles place. The unseen nameless people. And you wonder how it feels to be shut out because someone thinks you're undesirable. How it feels to have a door slammed in your face. And what, you say to yourself, what if it were you and Helen? What about that? Wally, dear. Wally. Oh, what is it, darling? Is anything wrong at the office, dear? Are you having trouble with that Edgeworth contract? No, no trouble. Everything's going fine, just fine. You were frowning, darling. You smile again. The whole thing really is straightforward and very simple. It had always been understood that the district was a restricted development. Restricted and exclusive. People ought to realize that. You aren't being anti-anybody. Anti Looking at this on a business basis, you're protecting your investments. On a human basis, you're safeguarding your family. From what? You ask yourself again, from what? Are you ready with those drinks, dear? Yes, Helen, just about. You can take some in with you. How many guests do we have now? Oh, it turns out to be quite a meeting. The Hutchins are here, the Brents, Don Atkinson and his wife, and Mayor Tennessee. Oh, Lucy Carroll and her husband just came in. The very best people in the neighborhood are here, all of them. You pick up the tray of drinks and walk into the living room. It's a gay party, and your guests seem to be having a good time. John Newhouse has arrived. You see him standing at the fireplace with an elbow on the mantelpiece, standing where he can dominate the room. Helen is talking to him eagerly with a drink in her hand. She sees you and beckons you to come over. Darling, here's John Newhouse. Hello, John. Oh, glad to see you, Wally. Hope you don't mind if we hold up the meeting another minute or so. There's a chance Arthur Hearn will be down. Really? I thought he was in Canada. Flew back on a chartered plane this afternoon. Oh, that's wonderful. I do hope he gets here. He's a very busy man. I spoke to him and he said he'd try to be here. Hmm. It's later than I thought. Perhaps we ought to get on with the meeting. It's all right with me. Friends. Friends. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. We've been hoping that our good neighbor, Arthur Hearn, could be with us. However, I don't think we should wait any longer. We all know that he'd feel as we do about this. I don't think this meeting will take much time. You all know why we're here. And you all know Benson, the real estate agent, had an offer on the Stiles place. The people involved don't seem to be suitable. I think we're all agreed on that. You sit and listen to him. If you have anything to say, now's the time to say it. 
but you just sit and listen. It all seems rather formal, but we must establish a clear precedent so that this matter will never come up again. All of us here are property owners, and we chose our section for its neighbors as well as for its beauty. Naturally, we want to maintain it the way it is. Now, it is my proposal that we set up a committee of three to see the real estate agent and make our wishes known to him. And I can think of no better man to be chairman of this committee than our host, Wallace Adams. This is the moment you were afraid of. You look at your wife, and she looks back at you, proud and eager of this proof of your position in the community. Everyone in the room looks at you. Now you must declare yourself. You can no longer be an innocent bystander. How about it, Wallace? Ah, uh, I can't. Oh, I know you're a busy man, but you and Helen have our interest so much at heart, I'm sure you can find I, time. I just don't feel that I want to do this. I don't understand. Aren't you with us? Well? No. No, I'm not. Well, this is a surprise. I thought we could depend on you, I assume. I'm sorry, John, but your assumption was wrong. So it seems. I'll propose another chairman. John, I'm sure Wally didn't mean what he said. I only meant that we ought to know more about these people. You only meant that our wishes and yours are not the same. The welfare of our community doesn't interest you, and I don't think we need trouble you for any other explanation. As for knowing about Benson's clients... Why don't you say it? You've been avoiding saying it since you started to speak. Why don't you say they're Jews? I don't think it's necessary to discuss that. We're here by agreement. We all agreed. All right, I agreed to it too, but I don't want to agree any longer. If they're undesirable, that's reasonable. But not if they're undesirable just because they're Jews. I'm only being realistic. These people may be very nice, but it's what follows... They bring their friends, relatives. I bring my friends, my relatives. What's a home for? There are other homes for these people to buy. Let them live in their own communities. We don't ask to come into their lives. Oh, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get on. I withdraw Wallace Adams' name for the chairmanship. All of us, except Wallace, are agreed. I'd like to say something, John. Well, sure. Go ahead, Madge. I'm for letting these people buy the place. I don't really see why Jews shouldn't live as neighbors with... What is that old-fashioned term? Christians? Better count me with Wallace. Are there any others who disagree besides Wallace and Madge Hennessy? Two is hardly a majority. I believe the rest of us are in agreement. Meeting's not over yet, I hope. Sorry I couldn't get here any earlier. Hello, Mr. Hearn. It was really good of you to come. Oh, Mr. Hearn, I I didn't hear you come in. The door was open, so I just walked through. How's the meeting going, John? Fine, uh, Arthur. Uh, We were just choosing a committee chairman. Oh, committee for what? We're forming a committee to see Benson, the real estate agent. He has some undesirable clients who want to buy the Stiles place. We're organizing formally to see that undesirable people are kept out of the community. Oh, naturally. Of course, we'd be delighted if you took the committee chairmanship yourself, Arthur. Certainly, be glad to. You look at the people in the room. The approval of the great Mr. Hearn has settled everything. There's no use in your fighting it. You did what you could, your conscience is clear. Helen has just caught your eye. She's bitter, even hostile. No need to fight this any longer. The majority rules. But you can't let it go. It's wrong. You want to choose your own committee, Arthur? Mr. Hearn, I don't think you know all the facts. Well, the facts are quite simple, it seems to me. We're opposed to undesirable neighbors. How do you know they're undesirable, Mr. Hearn? All we know about these people is that they're Jews. We don't know anything else. Is that right, John? Well, yes, of course. Now, let me get this clear. Do these people have enough money to finance a property as big as the Stiles place? Yes, but that's beside the point. Not to me, it isn't. I don't want to see that house bouncing back in the market again. Looks bad for the neighborhood. It will look worse if we... uh... If we let Jews in? That depends on the Jews. I know a lot of Jews I'd be glad to have as neighbors. What we need to know about these people is what they're like. That's what the committee ought to be finding out. Mr. Adams, if you'd care to serve with me on this committee, I think we can do right by the community. I'd be glad to serve on that basis. What other basis is there? If there's anyone else in this room who thinks there is another basis for exclusion, let's hear them now. You look at these people, your neighbors and your guests. Many of them look relieved, glad that they don't have to go along with Newhouse. And suddenly it's clear to you that the majority didn't like this business of discrimination any more than you do. For these neighbors are like yourself. They've been stampeded by people like Newhouse. You look at Newhouse. 
He's staring straight ahead at nothing. Sullen, unyielding. And he's alone now, completely alone, like an outcast. And they know. The lost are not the outcasts. The lost are those who cast them out. Ralph Bellamy was starred in today's story, The Outcasts, by B.J. Chute. It was published in Collier's Magazine and was adapted for radio by Sigmund Miller, directed by Earl McGill, and produced by Harold Franklin. Listen in again next week at this same time for another Story to Remember, a Lest We Forget production of the Institute for Democratic Education. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman, in his search for the missing Lois Lane, finds himself confused and baffled by a mystery with frighteningly ominous overtones. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's only once in a thousand years that someone comes along with such exciting prizes as those comic buttons Kellogg's Pep has been putting out. And uh, now that you've got a brand new series of 18 new buttons to collect, boy, that multiplies your fun over and over. Because it's such a swell surprise finding a button every time that you open a package of pet. And there's such swell prizes. Why, these new comic buttons, all 18 of them, are colored up bright as anything. They really show up when you pin them on your, your jacket or your dresser cap. And they're true-to-life pictures, too. The little Moose and Spud and, and Corky and Superman look just as real as they do in the funny papers. Yes, sir, you'll get a kick out of collecting this brand new series of pet comic buttons. And you don't have to spend any of your allowance to do it. No, sir, you don't even have to send in a box stop. You just ask Mom to keep stocked up with plenty of Kellogg's Pep. That's right. You can't buy these new comic buttons, but you get one as a prize in each package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. The whole wheat flakes that taste so good and sunny that, well, you come a-running to breakfast. So be sure to remind Mom to get you some P-E-P, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. When Editor Perry White assigned three consecutive out-of-town correspondents to cover what appeared to be a simple story of an unusual drought in Freeville, and three times his assignment was rejected with no explanation, he hit the ceiling. After listening briefly to his furious rantings, Lois Lane requested the assignment. Editor White refused, told her this was apparently a man's job, and ordered her to get hold of Kent, who was at that time visiting in the hospital with Jim Olson. But ignoring his protests, the girl reporter dashed out of the office after saying, Have no fears, Chief. I'll find out what's cooking in Freeville and bring you back a bang-up story. The following day, White received the first of a series of telegrams from Lois. This one, which he read with satisfaction, said, No rainfall here in 26 days. Extremely unusual situation for Freeville area at this time of year. Native farmers panicky. Reaction to drought from members of newly established veteran farm community is high. Facts should make sensational story. More later. Lois. Now, now we're getting someplace. But a short while later the same day, three more telegrams arrived from Lois in rapid succession, each one more cryptic and disturbing than the other. As our story continues now, 
Clark Kent has just rushed into White's office in response to an urgent summons from the editor. Listen. What's the matter, Chief? What's up? I don't know, Kent. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. Well, give me some idea of what's biting you, and maybe I can help straighten you out. And these telegrams from Lois. That's what's biting me. Yeah, I noticed she wasn't in the office. Where is she? In Freeville. What's she doing there? Covering a story, of course. Well, what else would she be doing there? Wait a minute. There? We don't have to snap my head off. I just oh, asked... Oh, I'm where... sorry, Kent. I'm sorry. I, I'm upset. I I had a feeling I shouldn't let her go, but she talked me out of sending you... She and, did, eh? ...and dashed off before I could do anything to stop her. And now I'm afraid... Well, now, wait a uh, minute. Wait a minute, Chief. Let's start from the beginning so I can have some idea what this is all about. Well, it's these blasted telegrams, oh, you All right, forget them for the moment. What's going on in Freeville? No, oh, I wish I knew. Well, what story did she go out there to cover? Well, here's the story, Kent. A few days ago, I noticed a small item in our wire service reports about what appeared to be an unprecedented drought in the Freeville area. Well, what's so sensational about that? Uh, it's very unusual out there. Hasn't happened in heaven knows how many years, and particularly at this time of year. I see. And what makes it even more important is the new Veterans Farm Community Project that's just been established out there. Oh? Uh-huh. Vets, just set up on farmland, facing ruin in their very first seasonal operation. Oh, what a tough break. Yes, it sure is. Well, I wanted a feature on that, so I assigned a correspondent near Freeville to cover it for us. And the next day, he turned the job down. What? That's not all. I gave the assignment successively to two other out-of-town correspondents. Each of them accepted, and then, within 24 hours, they turned it down. But why? I don't know why. But Lois was here when I received the third turn down and hit the ceiling. Where was I? At the hospital, visiting with Jim. Oh. I told her to get you, but she took the bull by the horns and hightailed it out of here before I could stop her. That's just like her. Well, this morning I get a wire from her indicating that she's on the trail of a good yarn. Mm -hmm. And I thought everything was okay until a few hours after that I was handed the first of these three wires, all of them arriving within two hours. Let me see them. Oh, here, here. See if you can make any sense out of them. There's the first one. Mm -hmm. Sent out at 11.15 this morning. Believe necessary to remain here longer than first anticipated. Lois, well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Except I didn't want her to take time enough to write a book. All I wanted was a Sunday feature story. I know, but it takes time to collect Okay, facts. okay. I was willing to accept that. Until I read the second one. Second one? That's the one wired at 1210? Yeah, that's right. Read it. Awaiting orders to leave Freeville at once. Now, what in blazes does that mean? <laughs> First, she asks for more time, then she wants orders to leave. This is confusing. Uh, well, that's an understatement. But if that baffles you, read the third and last wire I've received so far. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's see. This one was dispatched at 1.10 this afternoon. It's an hour after the second one. That's right. It says, urgent and imperative, you wire me to return home at once. Great Scott. Yeah, how do you like that, huh? Well, I don't get it. It doesn't sound like Lois at all. No, it certainly doesn't. And maybe the run-in she had with that Zara character affected her head. Oh, no, Chief. It sounds mighty like there's something very fishy going on in Freeville. I think I'd better hop out there and see now, what's you going on. you wait a minute, Kent. But, Chief, no, I'm just... not going to have my two best reporters out on one story that even, uh, well, even Jim Collins could cover. Jim Olson, you mean? Uh, Jimmy Olson, yes. Olson. Well, what, what about I Lois? Collins? Yes, you said Collins. I'm so excited. Well, what about Lois? She may be in Well, trouble. she's a big girl and she can take care of herself. Besides, going out there was all her own idea, so she can work it out herself, and that's final. Okay, you're the boss, but I can't help feeling a little worried about it. Oh, forget it, forget it. Now get going on that Sunday feature story about phony steers and fortune tellers. <laughs> just saw Beanie bringing you this telegram. It's important, so I took it from him yeah, and brought it in. Say, maybe it's from Lois. Well, uh, it's date marked Freeville, but I don't see it. Yeah, let me have it. All right, here. Now, don't get excited, Chief. What do you mean? What do you mean? What's the, what's the to get excited about? Yeah, you'll see. Good, good Godfrey. Look what this says. Yeah, I know. You know. Oh, I, I mean, I, I can guess. No, no, you can't. Read it. All right. Warn you to order Lois Lane out of Freeville immediately. Signed, a friend. Great Caesar's ghost. Now, what in the world is going on in Freeville? I don't know, Chief, but I don't like the sound of it. Neither do I, but there's only one way to find out, and that's just what I'm going to do. Now, wait, Kent, wait. Where are you? I'm going to zip out to Freeville. You'll hear from me later. So long. Rushing from Perry White's office, Clark Kent dashes into an empty storeroom where, behind the locked door, he quickly slips down to the red and blue costume of Superman. A moment later, he opens a window. Up, up, and away! Zooming up into the sky, the Man of Steel takes a bearing from the sun, then speaks westward with the speed of light toward Freeville. At the same moment, Lois Lane, unaware of her friend's concern for her safety, is in the telegraph office in Freeville, where she is unsuccessfully trying to draw out the taciturn telegrapher, the stooped elderly man with a white walrus mustache. 
Now, look here, Mr. Sykes. I'm sure if you wanted to, you could tell me a lot of interesting things about what's happening here in Freeville. Couldn't you? Don't know nothing. Oh, that's what you've been saying for the past ten minutes. But I could make it very much worth your while. I mean, I, I'm quite willing to pay for any information. Don't you... know nothing. Oh, well, I guess it's... Except in one thing. Yes? Eastbound Express due to go through here about 3.45. So what? Good flagger down to stop for you. No, thanks. I'm here to get a story, and I'm sticking until I get it. Train's a streamliner. Get you back home fast. Sorry, not interested. You're making a mistake, miss. Why? What's behind all the feeling that's so high in this town? Why does everyone refuse to talk? Why do they change the subject every time I mention the drought? In short, what's going on here? Don't know nothing. Except taint healthy here. Why? Is there some fatal disease in Freeville? Maybe. Oh, rubbish. Just the same, I warn you. Taint healthy here. Especially for strangers. It's all got to say. Momentarily shaken by the aged telegrapher's ominous warning, Lois Lane stares at him open-mouthed. Then, turning on her heel, she strides out of his office and into the street. Will Superman arrive before Lois, disregarding the warning, walks into trouble? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the startling climax of today's story. So stand by. Yes, sir, the mothers of all the gang are sure being rushed for lots of Kellogg's Pet these days. Because, of course, it's such a sunny, golden toasted whole wheat flake cereal. And because it's the prize package where you get those exciting comic buttons in Pep's brand new series. Real true-to-life pictures of your favorite funny sheet characters. A brand new series of 18 different buttons. Like uh, the Little Moose and uh, Judy and Corky. And four from Dick Tracy. And, and, and Vitamin Flintheart. And Superman, of course. And you know, it's no end of fun to compare notes with your friends and see who's got the most different buttons. And to trade duplicates, too. And these pep comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to look for your comic button inside each package of Kellogg's Pep. And look for some mighty swell eating at breakfast, too. Because Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's doggone sunny tasting and delicious. And it's good for you. It gives you vitamin B1 and energy vitamin and that important sunshine vitamin D that mom knows that, that you need so much. So tell mom that you'll eat lots of P-E-P, -E the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As our story continues, Superman has arrived in Freeville and, resuming the guise and garb of mild-mannered Clark Kent, talks with the desk clerk at the Central Hotel. Can you tell me what room Lois Lane is in? Why, uh, she's, uh... Lois Lane? Yes, the Metropolis Daily Planet reporter. Uh, oh, oh yeah, yes, yes, Miss Lois Lane. Why, uh, <clears throat> uh, Miss Lane's not in her room, uh, that is, uh... Yes? Well, she's, uh, she left here. Left? Uh, th that's right, sir, about, uh, ten minutes ago. You mean she checked out? Uh, excuse me, sir, I'm very... Oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I wonder what's wrong with him. Taxi, mister. Well, that depends. Tell me, did you by any chance pick up a young lady from the Central Hotel? Well, uh, I don't know. She's dark, rather pretty, and... Oh, you mean that newspaper gal from Metropolis? That's right. Nope, said she'd rather walk this time. I see. Any idea where she went? Mentioned something about going down the telegraph office at the depot. Want me to take you there? Yes, sir. Good. Right. And make it snappy, please. Right. Hang on. Say you haven't seen Miss Lane, Mr. Sykes? Not for over an hour. Well, that's odd. The cab driver said she started walking over here about ten minutes ago. Certainly she should have been here by this time. Might have stopped somewhere on the way. Oh, no, I'd have seen her. How's that, mister? Uh, oh, um, never mind. The point is she isn't here, nor any place between here and the hotel, and she couldn't have just vanished into thin air. Could be. Could be? Are you kidding? Nope. Stranger things than that have happened in this town. Well, great Scott, what in the world is going on here? Completely baffled by the strange and mysterious attitudes of the Freeville natives, Clark Kent is stunned into momentary immobility. What is going on in Freeville? Why do the natives refuse to discuss the drought? And who is behind the mysterious telegrams suggesting that Lois Lane be recalled from her assignment? 
And what is even more important, has Superman arrived on the scene too late to keep the girl reporter from plunging into trouble? This is just the beginning of a new and thrilling story, gang. So stay with us. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow to learn of more startling angles uncovered by Superman. Don't forget, tomorrow, join us again at this same time on this same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, what do you have, gang? Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Pep, or one of your other favorite Kellogg's cereals? Well, you can take your pick every morning at breakfast when Mom sets out Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red package with ten individual packages, each with one serving just for you. One day you'll choose a, a shredded cereal, next day one that's popped, next day a flaked cereal made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a treat because it's a favorite Kellogg cereal. It's a grand variety to make breakfast a picnic of fun because it's Kellogg's Variety. Remind Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents the Adventures of Superman. <laughs> much to do with Lois Lane's disappearance and the strangely tense attitude of the people in that area. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's just like having pictures of your favorite friends collecting those nifty comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. Because every single one of those 18 different buttons has a picture of a favorite comic strip character straight from the funny papers. Boy, will you be proud of your collection. And is it fun collecting these pep comic buttons? There's the exciting moment every time Mom opens a new package of pep to see which button's inside. And if it happens to be a duplicate, why, that's even more fun because then you can trade with your pals. Like uh, swapping the little moose for uh, Cindy, maybe, or, or say a Chief Brandon for Superman. So hop to it, gang. Get busy on your collection. Ask Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pet. Yes, sir. That's all there is to it. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons. You just look for one inside your package of Pet. That's Kellogg's Pep, you know. The sunshine cereal loaded with sunny gold and toasted flavor. And Pep's got something else, too. It's got extra amounts of energy vitamin B1 and that important sunshine vitamin D. So there's lots of reasons why Mom's glad to get you some P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. When Lois Lane dashed over to cover what appeared to be a routine on-the-scene investigation for a story of an unusual drought in the Freeville area, she found herself with more than she had bargained for. And soon after arriving at Freeville, center of the newly established Veteran Farm Community Project, she was convinced that there was more going on than just an unusual dry spell. Meanwhile, in Metropolis, Editor Perry White and Clark Kent were worried about a series of three mysteriously cryptic telegrams seemingly sent by Lois. But then they became really alarmed at the receipt of a fourth message which said, Warn you, order Lois Lane to quit Freeville at once or suffer consequences. Signed, a friend. <laughs> Assuming his identity of Superman, Clark Kent rocketed out to Freeville, where he discovered that Lois was last seen going toward the telegraph office. Again in his guise of the mild-mannered reporter, Kent questioned Abner Sykes, the aged telegrapher, who said, Sorry, ain't seen Miss Lane for over an hour. No one seems to have seen her after she left the hotel on her way here. Doesn't that seem odd? Nope. What do you mean? She couldn't have vanished. Could be. Could be. Are you kidding? Nope. 
All kinds of strange things happen in this town. Now, look here, Mr. Sykes. Just what do you mean by that? Nothing, maybe. Sometimes I just talk too much. Now, this is one time you're not talking enough. I've got a hunch Miss Lane's in some kind of trouble, possibly something that even endangers her life. Maybe. Well, then, if you know something I should know to help her, for the love of heaven, tell me what it is. Don't know nothing, I told you. You're just not talking, you mean. Healthier that way. Look, what's going on here in Freeville? What's everyone so frightened of? Don't know, mister. Okay, okay, we'll skip that for a minute. Just tell me this. Who sent the telegrams, signed Lois Lane, asking Perry White of the Metropolis Daily Planet to order her home? Who signed them? They, they were signed, Lois Lane. And right, she but... must have sent them. Not on your life. That's not like Lois, or someone else must have done it. Now think, who else sent wires to Perry White at the Daily Planet in Metropolis? Don't know. Send lots of messages. Can't expect to remember all of them. Uh, especially when it's more convenient to forget, huh? Hmm. I don't suppose you'd remember who sent the wire warning Perry White to take Miss Lane out of Freeville and signed it a friend, would you? Was a friend, maybe. Like who, for instance? Me. You sent that telegram? Yep. Why? She wouldn't pay no attention to my warning to get out of Freeville. Well, why did you want her to leave? Liked her. That's why. Oh. Didn't want to see her get mixed up with... With what? Don't know what exactly. Oh, what's going on, Mr. Sykes? Who'd want to harm Miss Lane? Don't know. Oh, this is driving me batty and getting me nowhere fast. Look, isn't there someone else in this crazy town I could talk to and get better sense out of? Might try Fred Leonard. Who's he? Fred runs the Freeville Gazette. The Gazette? Of course. I should have thought of that myself. A newspaper man will certainly want to help. Fred's more than a newspaper man, Mr. Huh? What do you mean? Nothing. Sometimes I just talk too much. Oh, this is where I came in. Look, where can I find Fred Leonard now? At the Gazette office. Two blocks north, turn left. Okay, Mr. Sykes, and thanks for nothing. That's the whole story so far, Mr. Leonard, and frankly, I'm worried. Well, I wouldn't worry too much if I were you, Mr. Kent. How can I help it when Miss Lane seems to have disappeared and I can't seem to find out how or why yeah, or we'll when? We'll find her, never you fear. After all, Freeville's not big enough to get lost in, you know. Well, the point is, I don't think she's simply lost. Now, really, Mr. Kent, what else could have happened to her? I don't know, but I have a feeling it's something pretty serious. Oh? Why do you say that? Because there's something mighty peculiar going on here in Freeville. People look frightened. They they act furtive. They refuse to talk. Well, that's only because we're all worried about the drought, I guess. Well, maybe. After all, I'm sure you can appreciate the importance of rain in a farm community such as ours. Certainly I can, but... Well, then? But I feel there's something that goes deeper than that. A peculiar unrest, a tension among the veterans who've been settled on the government farm project. Oh, come now, Mr. Kent. Aren't you just exercising a vivid, creative imagination? Thanks for the compliment, Mr. Leonard. But I can't help wondering why that telegrapher, old Abner Sykes, wanted Lois to leave Freeville so badly that he resorted to sending us warning telegrams. Well, to understand that, you ought to know more about poor old Abner. Like what? Well, I... I don't like to say this, Mr. Kent. Matter of fact, I don't know how to tell you, but, um... Yes? Well, old Abner's a very lovable and harmless man who's been the telegrapher in this town for nearly 40 years. Afraid I don't follow you. Uh, it's just that, well, he he sort of has a reputation around town for what's politely referred to as uh, imagining things. You see? Oh? Yes. And so if I were you, I wouldn't put much stock in what the old man says. But he hasn't imagined Miss Lane's disappearance. That must be prima facie even to you. Hey, right, George. Why didn't I think of this before? Think of what? My one and only roving reporter, Steve Larson, always knows the whereabouts of everyone in town, natives as well as strangers. Now, I bet if I locate him, he'd give us a line on Miss Lane that would remove all the mystery of her so-called disappearance. Where can you reach him? Well, let's see. Chances are he's at the... Uh, hello, Madge. Look, see if you can locate Steve Larson for me, will you? Uh, try the Hotel Central. Yeah, I'll hang on. Two to one, your troubles are over right now, Ken. I certainly hope so, at least where Miss Lane's concerned. <laughs> what else have you got to worry about? I still want to get at the bottom of this drought situation here. Nothing to it, just a quirk of... Na uh, hello, is that you, Steve? Mr. Clark Kent of the Metropolis Daily Planet's over here at the office. He's trying to locate that other planet reporter, Lois Lane, who's... Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Hey, see you this afternoon any time? That's so. When? Uh-huh. Okay, Steve, thanks. Got anything new to report? I see. No, no, no need to come in yet. Okay, so long. 
Well, did he have well, any... Well, your troubles are over, Mr. Kent. And like I told you, there was nothing to worry about. Larson knows where Lois is? Yeah, she's on the eastbound limit at en route to Metropolis. What? Uh-huh. Added flag for a stop and got on board at 3.45 this afternoon. Satisfied? No, not quite. But look here. There's still something fishy going on. Why? Because Lois Lane would never leave until she got her story. She did get her story, Ken. What do you mean? She found out there's no story here except that we're suffering an unprecedented drought, so she packed up and left. Uh Uh-uh. No, Mr. Leonard, I won't buy that. Because Lois would know as surely as I do that there's something more than that going on in Freeville. Are you insinuating... Please don't misunderstand. I'm insinuating nothing. Now, you say she boarded the train at 3.45? That's right. Well, it's 4.10 now. I'd better hurry. Hey, wait. Where are you going? To see if Lois Lane is on that train. But how are you going to do that? You'd be surprised. So long. I'll see you again. Soon. Leaving the Freeville Gazette's editor, Clark Kent ducks around behind the one-story newspaper building. There, out of sight, he changes swiftly to the colorful garb of Superman. And a moment later, he leaps into the air. Up, up, and away! Streaking to the railroad station, the man of steel veers sharply. Then, following the gleaming double ribbon of steel rails, rockets eastward in pursuit of the flyer. Will he find Lois Lane aboard? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's story. So, stand by! Say, I happened to pass the schoolyard the other day when uh, some of the fellows and girls were swapping duplicate comic buttons. You know, from the new series that now come in packages of Kellogg's Pet. Well, the conversations they were carrying on would sound mighty funny to anybody who didn't know about those swell pet comic buttons. Like uh, one fellow would say, trade you Goofy for Pat Patton. And then another would come in and say, uh, I'll take that, and I have two Superman. Uh, who wants to trade? And then another would say, uh, uh, what do you offer for the little moose? Well, now, maybe that sounds like a, well, a good deal of double talk to you, but it means a lot to you fellows and girls who are collecting those exciting pet comic buttons. Sure, because you're all mighty anxious to collect all 18 buttons in this new series. And these pet comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. Fact is, you can't buy them anywhere. But every time Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your comic button inside, and it's your exclusive prize. And Pep's on the exclusive side, too, when it comes to good eating. You can't find another dish with that sunny golden toasted flavor. So remember, gang, ask Mom to get you lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> A moment ago, Clark Kent was informed by Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the Freeville Gazette, that Lois Lane boarded the eastbound flyer for Metropolis at 3.45. Now, 30 minutes later, as Superman, he has overtaken the fast express train, and hovering over it, his X-ray vision pierces each passenger car as he searches for the girl reporter. Don't see Lois anywhere on this train. Just to give Leonard the benefit of any doubt, I'll double-check by asking the conductor... Down to the observation platform. Go! You're sure you have no Lois Lane on this train, Conductor? I have no one by that name, but a young lady did get aboard at Freeville. Oh? Only one, too. Had his flag to stop for. I see. Well, could you help me locate her? Why, yeah, sure. If you went right into the diner, chances are she's still there. Come on, follow me. There she is, young fellow. Lady with a green hat, third table on your right. I see. That the gal you're looking for? No, that's not Lois Lane. Sorry. Your friend just isn't on this train, I guess. Not really surprised, but momentarily shocked nonetheless. Clark Kent realizes more fully than ever now that the mysterious goings-on in Freeville are responsible for Lois Lane's disappearance. And for the moment, even Superman feels helpless to find her. What has happened to the girl reporter? What is behind the mystery that hangs like a heavy pall over Freeville? Tomorrow's episode is tense with drama and excitement, so don't miss a minute of it. 
Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, it's more fun than a picnic gang to open up your own individual package of your favorite Kellogg cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the famous Kell Bowl Pack in Kellogg's Variety. It saves washing dishes for mom, and she likes Kellogg's Variety because it's got those nutritious Kellogg cereals that are so good for you. Ten individual packages in all, different Kellogg cereals like Pep, Rice Krispies, Corn Flakes, in a handy white, green, and red package. Just be sure it's Kellogg's, Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent, anxious and worried about the mystery of Lois Lane's whereabouts, traces a last certain possibility on a tip from the Freeville Gazette's editor. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, one of the girls in the gang told me just the other day that she can't decide which is the most fun, adding a new comic button to her collection when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep or getting a duplicate so that she can trade with her friends for a different button. Well, either way, of course, you're getting a new button for your collection, and it's bound to be a beauty. Every single one of these 18 buttons in the new series is colorful and it's bright and it's nifty looking. Like that uh, picture of Brenda Starr with her long, soft red hair. Or Spud with his red suspenders and, and that battered old top hat. Or Superman himself, complete to flying red cape and Superman insignia. What's more, it's easy as anything to collect these pep comic buttons. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box top. And you can't buy them anywhere, but you'll find a comic button in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And you'll find yourself a load of good eating in a package of Pep, too. A bowl of these crisp toasted whole wheat flakes is just the thing to wake up your appetite on a chilly morning. Pep is sunny and golden toasted, rich in a full wheat flavor that's doggone satisfying. So get Hep to Kellogg's Pep. Ask Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. After three local correspondents had mysteriously refused to cover what appeared to be a routine story of a dry spell in the Freeville area, Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, flew to the scene. The next day, a telegram signed a friend, urging Editor White to order Lois home, sent Clark Kent as Superman streaking 2,000 miles to Freeville, where he discovered that Lois had disappeared. Old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, admitted sending the telegram, but refused to say any more. He denied knowing what had happened to the girl reporter, but suggested that Kent call on Fred Leonard, publisher and editor of the local newspaper. Leonard made a phone call, then told Kent that Lois was on a train bound for Metropolis. As Superman, Kent overtook the train, but Lois was not aboard. As we continue now, he has rocketed back to Freeville, where, once more in the guise and garb of Clark Kent, he faces Fred Leonard in the latter's office. Listen. Give me a bump steer, Mr. Leonard. What? What do you mean? 
Miss Lane isn't on the eastbound flyer. She isn't? No. Nope. What's more, she was not on it when it left Freeville this afternoon. But but she must have been, Mr. Kent. I tell you, she wasn't and isn't. I just left the conductor of the train, and he told you me... You just left the conductor? What? What are you talking about? Oh, the... Well, I, I mean, I just talked to him. How he said could that... you talk to him? The flyer left here at 345. I know, but... Must be more than 50 miles away Well, by never now. mind how I managed. The point is, I talked to him. He assures me that Miss Lane did not board the train in Freeville. Now, why did you tell me she did? Why, why, because Steve Larson, my my reporter, he told me so. He did, eh? Yes, you were right here when I called him a few minutes before. You heard me. He told you Miss Lane was on the eastbound flyer? That's right. I can't understand this. Steve usually knows what he's talking about. I don't understand it either yet, but I will before I leave here. Any idea where Steve Larson is now, Mr. Leonard? Why, let's see. It's just 4.30. He usually drops into the lunch wagon about this time. Lunch wagon? Where's that? Oh, just down the street. Most of us drop in there for coffee and a little gossip along about this time. Come on, I'll go over there with you. Fine. Let's go, Mr. Leonard. Just call me Steve. Everybody does. Okay, Steve. What made you say Miss Lane left here on the flyer? Because she did. Wait a minute. That's not true. What? You see, Steve, Kent talked to the conductor on the flyer by radio telephone, I guess. And the conductor said Miss Lane didn't board the train here in Freeville. Oh, that's funny. She told me herself she was taking that train out of here at 345. Miss Lane told you that? Sure, on the phone. When was this? Let's see. It's been around 3.30 this afternoon. How did you happen to contact her? Well, I went over to the hotel around noon when I heard she was in town because, well, Fred and I thought an interview with a big city reporter might make a nice little story. Right, Fred? Right. Did you talk with her then? Oh, well, Miss Lane wasn't there, so I left a message asking her to call me when she got in. Called about 3.30. Said she was sorry she couldn't see me, but she just about had time to catch 3.45. Well, that's about the time the flyer goes through here, Kent. Uh-huh. Go on, Steve. Well, that's all. Fred here called me up a little while ago and said you were looking for Miss Lane. I said to tell you she was on the train on account of that's what she told me. That's strange. It sure is. Look, Kent, you sure she isn't on that train? Positive. Are you sure it was Miss Lane you spoke to? Well, the girl I talked to said she was Miss Lane. Of course, never talked to her before. Then it may not have been Lois. Who else could it be? Exactly. What are you driving at, Kent? Simply that someone else may have called Steve and said she was Miss Lane in order to confuse us in the time of her disappearance. Disappearance? You mean... Yeah, Miss Lane seems to have disappeared, Steve. And this little bird... Go on. She didn't board the flyer at 3.45 today. She must be around down someplace. No, she's not in Freeville. What's more, she isn't anywhere within 25 miles of Freeman. What? How do you know that, Kent? Just take my word. But how it. can I... you know? You've only been here an hour or so. Look, Mr. Leonard, all I can tell you is I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Big city reporters must carry a set of wings, eh, Fred? <laughs> sure must. Look, gentlemen, let's not waste time making jokes. Who represents the law in this town? Well, Sheriff Cleary, but he's over to the state capitol this weekend. Oh, well, then we'll have to get along without him. Will you two help me find Miss Lane? You bet. Anything we can do for a fellow newspaper man, Kent? Thanks. Well, this is the premise I'm working on. There's something very strange going on around here, and I think Miss Lane's disappearance is tied up with us. Something strange? What do you mean? Before Miss Lane came here, three local correspondents turned down a simple assignment to cover the drought you're suffering here. Now, they I think did, that Miss... Eh? Yes. You say uh, three correspondents turned down that assignment. That's right. Do you know anything about that? Not a thing. It's a funny one, isn't it, Fred? It sure is. But it gives me an idea. What's that? Miss Lane might have stumbled onto another story out here. Another story? Yep. And if she did, it might account for her disappearance. Uh Uh-oh. Look, Mr. Leonard, if you know anything... I know quite a bit, Kent. But I don't want to talk about it here. Too many people around. Oh? I'll tell you what. Back in my office with me. I might be able to help you find Miss Lane. See you later, Steve. Right. All right, Mr. Leonard. Suppose you tell me everything you know that might help us find Miss Lane. Okay, Kent. You're telling me about those three correspondents who turned down the assignment gave me an idea. And here it is. What? I suppose you've heard of the Veterans Farm Project in this county, haven't you? You mean the veteran homesteaders? Yep. Mm -hmm. 300 war veterans drawn by lot were given anywhere from 60 to 150 acres of reclaimed land in this county. Yes, I've heard of that, and it's a fine thing, but what's it got to do with Miss Lane? Just this. We've been having a little trouble with those veterans, Kent. At least with some of them. Really? What kind of trouble? Well, we've been having a bit of a dry spell, as you know... 
Except for a little fiddle and sprinkle now and then. We haven't had any rain for 29, no, 30 days now. I know, but now, please let me finish. I'm sorry. Now, if this drought keeps up much longer, the veterans' first crops will die on the ground. And that means most of the veterans will be ruined, even before they ever get a chance to get started. That would be a shame. And I don't want you to think I'm unsympathetic, Mr. Leonard, but my first problem is to find Miss Lane. I'm She's getting missing. to Miss Lane. But I've got to give you the rest of this first, much as I hate to. I'm sorry. Incidentally, I'm telling you this in strict confidence, Kent. Well, I'll respect your confidence. Go ahead. Okay. Well, as I said, most of these homesteading veterans are facing ruin. And, well, some of them, the hotter heads among them, haven't been able to take it. What do you mean? Well, to put it frankly, and mind you, this isn't confidence, Kent. I understand. These uh, hotheads, we'll say, have been pillaging and robbing the native farmers and businessmen of the community. What? That's right. Farm equipment and livestock have been stolen. Village stores have been broken and entered. There have even been two cases where a farmer and a storekeeper in Freeville were badly beaten when they attempted to protect their property. Wait, Scott, you mean to say the men who committed these acts of veterans? I sure hate to say so. Well, are you sure they are? Practically certain. Now, we've tried to ignore it. Ignore it? Yes, because we know what the veterans are up against. And a lot of us around here had boys in the war, too. We know what they went through and that the war will upset their nerves temporarily. So we've just tried to sit tight, realizing their futures are at stake in their respective farms, and open the reins and come and make everything all right. I see. I've even played these acts down in my paper, saying the culprits couldn't be identified. Although we're pretty sure who they are. That's very decent of you, Mr. Leonard, and I want to talk to you some more, some more about it, but again, I ask just what has all this to do with the disappearance of Miss Lane? You mean you don't see, Ken? Oh, no, frankly, I don't. Why, it's as plain as the nose on your face. First... Three correspondents refused to cover the story of the drought for your fate. Well, yes, And but... then Miss Lane, who's probably got more spunk than those other correspondents, comes on here and she disappears. Now do you get it? Puzzled, Clark Kent shakes his head. What does Fred Leonard mean? We'll return in a moment to find out, so stand by... Say, gang, if Mom's going shopping tomorrow for her weekend groceries, you better remind her to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pep. Because you like to eat it for breakfast, of course, and also because you'll be getting another comic button for your collection. Maybe one of those in the new series that you haven't found yet. You know, like maybe, say, a Test True Heart or, or Pat Patton or Superman himself. Or maybe it'll be a duplicate so that you can have even more fun swapping with your pals. Whichever way it is, you'll have a new bright-colored pet comic button to wear on your jacket or your dresser cap. A real eye-catcher, believe me. And you know, the best part is these pet comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't send in a single penny, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But inside every package of Kellogg's Pep you open, there's your exclusive prize. And inside every package of Pep, there's a whale of a lot of good eating for you, too. Bowls of crisp golden toasted whole wheat flakes that sure do hit the spot for breakfast and for snacks, too. Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's famous for sunny golden flavor that keeps your spoon coming right back for more and more. So remind Mom right now to get you some P-E-P, the Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. A moment ago in the small editorial office of the Freeville Gazette, Fred Leonard, editor, told Kent that Lois's disappearance is tied up with the deep unrest among local veteran homesteaders. Puzzled, Kent shakes his head and says, Maybe I'm stupid, Mr. Leonard, but I don't get it. You don't? No, I can't see how trouble in the Veterans Farm Project can have anything to do with our correspondence quitting and Miss Lane's disappearance. Now look, if a big newspaper like the Metropolis Daily Plan has published the stories of what's going on down here, how long do you think it would take the Veterans Administration and Congress to take steps against our vet homesteaders? Oh, I think I get it now. Well, sure. Probably take their land away from them. Of course, and you think Miss Lane learned about what was going on here and is being held by the veterans to prevent her from wiring the stories to the Daily Planet. Well, I certainly hate to think but so. But you do think so. Well, yes. Oh, I can't believe it. I read about this project and about the one in Oregon, and I understand that the, the veterans are very carefully screened before they can apply for homesteads. They must have excellent characters and reputations. And... That's true. But hungry and desperate men... Particularly those who've been through a war, Kent, can easily be driven to do desperate things. Yes, I see what you mean. And if you're right, Miss Lane is in serious danger because she won't back down under threats. She'll defy them. I've got to get right out to the Veterans Project. Now, wait, Kent. I'll drive you out there. Good. Let's go. 
Rushing out of the one-story Freeville Gazette building, Clark Kent steps into the country editor's car and is on his way to the Veterans Farm Project area. The first step in what he hopes will be a successful search for Lois Lane. But the situation is not as simple as Fred Leonard would have Kent believe. And complications are now in motion that will make things difficult even for Superman. There's a startling surprise in tomorrow's exciting episode, so don't miss it. Yes, be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is the copywriter teacher appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, just think of the circus of fun you can have when Mom sets Kellogg's variety out on the table at breakfast. There's the business of picking out your own favorite Kellogg's cereal from this handy white, green, and red package with the ten individual packages. You'll take Kellogg's Corn Flakes or Pep or Rice Krispies or one of your other Kellogg favorites, and you'll have your own private box of cereal to open yourself. Then for sister, there's the cutout doll on the bottom of the tray to dress up and to play all sorts of games with. Don't miss out. Ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents The Adventures of Superman. <laughs> Today, though Superman despairingly faces a blank wall in his search for Lois Lane, he is little prepared for the shock dealt by the girl reporter herself. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, I know a young fellow who's mighty handy with a pencil and crayons. And you should see the drawings he's made, copies of the pictures of funny paper characters on those comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out. So every time he gets a new comic button, why, he has a new picture to draw. Now, I thought that maybe you'd like to try it, too. You can color them right in red and, and black and blue and yellow, just like the Pep comic buttons. And those pictures are really easy to copy because the outlines are clear and sharp and the details are all there. Like the picture of uh, Brenda Starr, for instance, or Tess Trueheart, or Superman himself. Now, if you don't want to let your friends get ahead of you, you better get busy. All you do is to ask Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pet. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. But there's one, a prize for you in every package of Pep you open. And you'll go for Pep for another reason, too. Because it just plain tastes delicious. Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. Sure, it's loaded with sunny, golden toasted flavor. A deep-down goodness that makes every bite taste better than the last. So ask Mom to keep you stocked up with P-E-P, the Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. When three correspondents mysteriously refused to cover a simple story of a drought in the Freeville area, Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, flew to the scene and disappeared. As Superman, Clark Kent streaked 2,000 miles to Freeville, where Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the little local paper, told him of homesteading war veterans who, facing ruin because of the drought, were committing acts of burglary and vandalism. Leonard hinted that Lois might have stumbled onto these stories and been seized by the veterans in order to prevent her from reporting them to the Daily Planet. As we continue now, Kent and Leonard have arrived at one of the veteran farm projects 20 miles from Freeville. They are approaching a husky, black-haired young man who is feeding a flock of chickens. Listen. That fellow feeding the chickens is Jerry Bart. He was an Air Force captain during the war, and he's now the head of the veterans' post out here, Kent. Ah, he's the man I want to see, Mr. Leonard. These fellows are responsible for Miss Lane's disappearance, as you think. Uh, hold it. Hello, Barton. 
What do you want, Leonard? Uh, Barton, I want you to meet Clark Kent. He's a reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet. How do you do? You a friend of this so-called newspaper editor, Mr. Kent? Why, he is. Uh, of course he is. Then excuse me for not shaking hands. Any friend of Fred Leonard's is no friend of mine. So state your business and then get off of my land. Oh, that's being painfully blunt. Those are my sentiments. People around here will get just as much hospitality as they showed me and the other veterans on this project when we first came here. And that was just exactly zero. So I'm telling you again, state your business now, and... Look, you've got the wrong idea about the people of Freeville, Barton. We've done everything we could to help you and make you welcome. Are you kidding? Now, wait a minute, I no, just... No, ma- I'm absolutely sincere. I know that this drought and what this drought means to you fellas, but it isn't our fault, you know. I wouldn't even swear to that. Be careful, Barton. Now, listen, please, both of you. I'm not afraid of you, Leonard. And I'm not what you and your dirty gang call a foreigner. So I can tell you exactly what I think. Which is what I aim to do right now. Please, Mr. Barton, let's try to get You stay out of this, Kent. Look here, I want to find out. I've been waiting for a chance to tell Mr. Editor Man here just what I think of him. And nobody's going to stop me now. I warn you, Barton, don't say anything you'll be sorry for. Don't worry, mister. Nobody could say anything he'd be sorry for to a polecat like you. Why, you... I said polecat and I mean it. Who else would try to keep a bunch of veterans... Men who fought for their country and for you from settling down on the land here and trying to make a living. I didn't try to stop you. I simply pointed out in my paper... And to the legislature. Yes, and to the legislature, too. That this land wasn't suitable for intensive farming. That's a lot of baloney, and you know it. Look, if you fellas don't stop this, I'm... Now, wait, Kent. Everyone knows this is reclaimed land and some of the best in the country. But we know that you and the honorable Uncle Ed Clayton didn't want us here. Because you knew you couldn't bully us or honey suck a lesson to voting the way you want us to. And particularly at this time, because there's a special election coming up for Senator. What's that? That's a lie. And you didn't want us here because some of my buddies part their hair different from you natives. Some of us go to a different church. Or our skin happens to be a different color. That's so a you're... serious accusation, yes, Mr. Barton. Yes, and what's more, it's not true. The heck it isn't. What's more, you and your boss, the Honorable Uncle Ed, have got the backwoods natives stole in the poisonous belief that anyone who goes to a different church or whose skin is a different color is a foreigner. And so he's an enemy. I say that's a lie, and I Wait a minute, Mr. Leonard. Wait a minute. Calm down, both of you, and be sensible. You know this kind of argument never gets you anywhere. Kent, I, uh, I think we'd better be going. It's obvious we won't get anywhere with this man. Just a moment. I came out here for a reason, and I don't intend to lose any more time. Barton? Yes? A fellow reporter for the Daily Planet, a girl named Lois Lane, disappeared in Freeville a few hours ago. Disappeared? That's right. You know anything about it? Me? Shucks, no. Why should I? Well, let's put it this way. I, uh, I've heard of certain acts of vandalism committed by the veterans on this project. Oh. Oh, now I... And it's occurred to... Well, occurred to me that if a big paper like the Daily Planet published the stories, it might make things rather, well, uncomfortable for you fellows. It could even mean the end of your homestead rights, you know. Go on, Mr. King. What are you driving at? Just this, Barton. If Miss Lane ran across those stories and prepared to publish them, some veterans might just see fit to try to prevent her. Why, of all the... Look, did Fred Leonard here put that idea in your head? Well... Don't try to get out of it. I know he did. I've heard these stories going around about fellas from this project stealing and pillaging and all that rot. Is it rot, Barton? It is, and you know it's rot. If it wasn't, why didn't you have the sheriff arrest the men you accused? Well, because we realized how hard-pressed you chaps were, and that the culprits were, well, just hotheads. You mean foreigners, don't you? I said hotheads. I didn't want to condemn all of you because a few irresponsible... Oh, go on. You would have jumped at a chance to arrest one of us, but you knew we were innocent. This is just another plan of yours to discredit us. This time, by George, you've gone too far. Now, you look here, Barton. I've had enough of this. Come on, Mr. Leonard, let's go. Mr. Barton, I'll be back to see you later, after I've found Miss Lane. I want to talk with you. I, uh, I'm really sorry for what happened, Kent. Forget it. Never should have lost my temper with that poor chap. After all, the drought is ruining him, so well... naturally his nerves are affected. I assure you, he doesn't know what he's saying. On the contrary, I thought he was well aware of what he was saying. No, look here, Kent. You, you don't mean you believe all that, that balded ash about me and Uncle Ed Clayton. Well, never mind that now or Uncle Ed either. I've got to find Miss Lane. Oh, of course. But I'm afraid you won't be able to get Barton's cooperation. The state he's in. I don't need his cooperation at the moment. 
Look, Mr. Leonard, you drive your car down the road a mile or so, will you, and wait for me. There's something I want to do alone. Oh, what's that, man? Oh, nothing much. It's just a little idea I want to work out. Oh, very well, Kent. I'll be waiting for you. Thank you. Leaving Fred Leonard, Clark Kent walks across the road, enters a patch of woods where he swiftly resumes his true identity of Superman. Then, up, up, and away! <laughs> Leaping up from the woods, Superman hovers first over Jerry Barton's farm, his keen eyes searching every inch of terrain at buildings below him. Then, failing to see any sign of Lois Lane, he streaks away, ranging in great sweeps and circles above the other farms of the homesteading war veterans. Dry, sun-parched acres now, on which haggard-faced men stand with faces upturned to the skies from which no rain descends. Finally, admitting defeat, Superman rockets back to the patch of woods, resumes his guise and garb of Clark Kent, rejoins the waiting Fred Leonard in his car. Okay, Mr. Leonard, let's go. Right. How'd your idea work out? Oh, fair enough. Good. You want to start searching the veterans' farms, Kent? No, thanks. I've already done that. You what? Hmm? Oh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite sure Miss Lane isn't anywhere around here. Oh, how can you be sure? I think... Skip that... it, will you? Let's get back to town, if you don't mind, please. Oh, whatever you say. Thanks. You want to have another talk with that telegrapher, Abner Sykes? You're wasting your time, Kent. I told you about old Abner. He, well, he's a fine old chap, but, well, he always thinks people are in danger around here. Why, he Maybe you're right. What'd you say, Kent? Oh, nothing, nothing, Mr. Leonard. Just drop me at the telegraph office, if you will. Well, if you insist. But I still say you're wasting your time. Sykes, I intend to stay here until I find Miss Lane. You won't find her, young feller. But I must. I can't just ignore Take the fact Take my that advice. She... Grab the next train back to Metropolis. Ridiculous. There must be some way Better of finding still, her. Better still, drive over to Rollins and board the eastbound plane. Get your way faster. Nothing doing, Mr. Sykes. As I said before, I'm not leaving here until I find Miss Lane. And then, not until I find out what's going on around here. Hmm. Well, maybe this will change your mind. What's that? Telegram just coming in for you. No use to paste it up. Read it on the tape. Let's see. Uh-oh. Get out of Freeville at once before it's too late. Signed, a friend. You see what I mean? Shocked and puzzled, Clark Kent stares at the words on the telegraph tape. The same threatening words used to warn Lois Lane to leave Freeville before she disappeared. What will happen now? We'll be back in a moment for the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, you fellows and girls know what a kick you'd get out of meeting up with one of your friends unexpectedly. Well, there's the same sort of thrill for you when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. First off, you're glad that there's more of that super delicious cereal to eat. And when you get one of those exciting comic buttons in that pet package, why, you're meeting up with an old funny sheet friend. Yes, sir. Every single one of those comic strip characters is someone that you have known in the funny papers. For instance, there's uh, there's Brenda Starr, you remember her? And Cindy and Spud from Winning Winkle. And Goofy and Beezy from Harold Teen. And uh, Judy and Corky. And Superman, of course. Eighteen in all. And each one a humdinger for looks. So, how's about asking Mom, right now, to get some more Kellogg's Pet? That's how easy it is to get these comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere, but you just look inside the pet package for your prize. Get a glimpse of those golden toasted whole wheat flakes, too, and your appetite will sit right up and take notice right away. Pet looks so crisp and inviting, and, and it tastes so doggone delicious that, well, you practically won't be able to resist it. So just make sure that Mom gets P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pet. In the little telegraph office operated by Abner Sykes in Freeville, Clark Kent has just received a telegram warning him to leave town at once. The aged telegrapher shakes his head and mutters, See what I mean, Mr. Kent? Yes. Now will you go back to Metropolis? Certainly not. Let's see, this telegram was sent from Rawlings. Where's that? About 30 miles south. 30 miles south. Well, that's where I'm going, because whoever sent this telegram probably knows where Miss Lane is and... Oh, gee, Jerusalem, look who's coming in. Great Scott. Lois. Lois, what's the matter? Quick, catch her, Mr. Kent. She's keeling over. 
Startled, Clark Kent springs forward as Lois Lane, her face white, her eyes set in a glassy stare, moans, falls into his arms, unconscious. What has happened to the girl reporter? What is the answer to the strange goings-on in the sun-parched, drought-afflicted area of Freeville? Monday's episode is tense and exciting, gang, so don't miss a minute of it. Be sure to tune in again Monday. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, breakfast is a picnic all year round when there's Kellogg's variety on the table. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages, each one a serve-yourself portion of one of your favorite Kellogg cereals. Different Kellogg cereals to choose from, and whatever you pick, you know it'll be crisp and fresh and good because it's Kellogg's. One day you'll want Kellogg's Pep, the next Rice Krispies, then Corn Flakes, and on down the line. Just one thing, gang, make sure that Mom gets Kellogg's. Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent and Lois Lane determined to fight the unknown dangerous elements that thwart their progress, little realizing the dire menace hanging over anyone who helps them. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. You know, it'd be a tough job to locate a fellow or girl who doesn't get a kick out of the funny papers. So it's no wonder those nifty comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out make such a big hit. Because every single character on every single one of those 18 different buttons is straight from the comic strips. Take Vitamin Flintheart, for instance. Why, you'd know him any time with his slouch hat and his fuzzy fur coat. And Chief Brandon, why, he looks so real he could speak. Of course, Superman's an old favorite with his bright blue jersey and his Superman insignia. And remember, these pep comic buttons are done up in full color. Sure, they show up like anything when you wear them pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. So hop to it, gang. Ask Mom to get you another box or two of Kellogg's Pep. That's the only way you can get these comic buttons, you know. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But you get this really terrific prize, plus a catchy sunny dish for breakfast in every package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Yes, sir, Pep's a prize when it comes to good eating, all right. So golden, toasted, and delicious that, well, you practically can't resist it. So ask Mom for lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. While covering a routine story of a drought in the farming area of Freeville, Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, mysteriously disappeared. Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the little local paper, told Clark Kent that a group of war veterans who had taken homesteads nearby and who were facing ruin because of the drought had been robbing and pillaging. And Leonard hinted that the veterans might have seized Lois to prevent her from wiring the stories of their vandalism to the Daily Planet. As Superman, Kent searched the farms of the veterans, and finding nothing, returned to Freeville, where he questioned Abner Sykes, the elderly telegrapher, whom he suspected of knowing more than he would admit. As they were talking, the door of the little telegraph office opened, and Lois staggered in. 
falling in a dead faint in Kent's arms. As we continue now, Kent has placed her on a chair and with Abner Sykes is trying to revive the girl reporter. Listen. Lois. Rub her hands, Mr. Sykes. I am rubbing them. Doesn't seem to have been injured. She must have suffered some shock. Told her to go back to Metropolis. Lois, talk to me. Told you to go, too. Oh, stop that nonsense. Hey, Lois. nonsense. You'll be sorry. This doesn't seem to be coming around. Where's the nearest doctor, Mr. Sykes? Doc Bedlow. Office over the bank. Well, get him on the phone, please. Tell him to rush right over here. Okay. Oh. No, wait a minute. Maybe... Yes, I think she's coming, too. Oh, good. Quick, get me a glass of water, please. I already got it on the bench in your hand there. Oh, oh yes, thanks. Clark. Easy, Lois. Wait a minute now. Drink this. Clark. Come on. Don't try to talk yet. Drink this water. That's it. Wait a minute. Hold your head up. Come on. Now. Drink all of it. Come on. Drink some more. That's the girl. Feel better now? Yes. Easy now. Now, wait a minute. Don't try to talk yet. Just rest a moment. No, I, I'm all right. I was just exhausted. I must have run about two miles. Ran two miles? Yes. Now, you wait, see... Wait a minute. Wait I, a minute. Wait a minute. If you have to talk, suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything that happened. Well, nothing happened until this afternoon. I just went around Freeville asking questions about the drought and nobody would answer me. All they did was look scared. Yes, I know. I had the same experience. I couldn't understand it. So this afternoon I started down here to see Mr. Sykes again. I had a feeling he knew a lot more than he was telling. Don't know nothing. You mean you're not talking? We'll let that pass for the moment. Go on, Lois. Well, I started to walk down from the hotel. It's just a couple of blocks from here, you know. I know. And I was going past a, a broken-down old building. The uh, granary it was. Ain't used now, though. Pete Simpkins built a new one other end of town. I see. Well, whatever it was, I was going past it when somebody called my name. Miss Lane. So I stopped and looked around, but I didn't see anybody. And then this voice called me again. Miss Lane. This time I realized the voice came from the old granary. So without thinking, I just stepped toward the open door, and then somebody grabbed me. Here. Brother. Brother. Get that sack over her head. Okay. Stop fighting, sister. Do you no good. There. There. That does it. Now, inside with her. There was chloroform soaked into that sack over my head. And soon I felt myself losing consciousness. I don't know how long I was out. But when I woke up, I was sitting on the ground in some cold, damp, musty place. It was kind of eerie. Almost pitch black. Except for a candle set quite a way back on the ground. Two men stood between me and the candle. But it was too dark to see their faces. And the small, flickering light threw weird shadows on the walls and made them seem enormous. I asked them who they were and what the meaning of this was. Never mind who we are, Miss Lane. All we got to say is that you're a lucky girl. Lucky? What do you mean? You're lucky you're not dead. Look, what's the meaning of all this? We don't like reporters in Freeville, that's all. Especially reporters from out of town. Why not? What have I done to you? Nothing. We just don't like reporters. Oh, stop playing mysterious. Just what is going on around here? Why does everybody seem so don't scared? Don't waste your breath asking questions, Miss Lane. Besides, asking questions ain't healthy around here. But, but why? What's behind all this? Ain't nothing to concern you. Now, the eastbound limited goes through Freeville at midnight. You get on it and don't come back. Now, look here. You can't you help heard me. Get out of Freeville on the limited tonight and stay out. Understand? And suppose I refuse. That would be the last you'll ever refuse in this world, Miss Lane. Because I warn you, if you are still in town by morning, you won't be breathing. Get up on you. That's the whole story, Clark. Except that after that, they put the sack over my head again, and they made me climb up a tall ladder. A ladder? Yes, it seemed as if I climbed and climbed until suddenly the air got clear. Say, must have been the old lead mine they took you to. A lead oh, mine? Oh, come to think of it, it did feel as if we were in a mine shaft. That's where you were, all right. Lead, the one substance I can't see. The old Bruce mine. What did you say? How's uh, that? Oh, oh not, nothing, Mr. Sykes, nothing, Lois. Uh, finish your story. How did you get back here? 
Oh, well, the men put me back in the car and drove a few minutes, and then they took me out and spun me around and around until I was so dizzy. Uh -huh. Then I heard them drive off. But by the time I stopped reeling and got the sack off my head, they were out of sight. Of course. I could see the lights of a town in the distance, and I started running toward it. Well, it turned out to be Freeville. Uh -huh. but I was pretty winded by the time I got here, and That's so... That's why you... you fainted. That's right. Poor kid, you had a rough time. Listen, Lois, did you get a look at the men at all? I mean, enough to identify them? No, I didn't, Clark. You see, they threw the sack over my head right away. Mm -hmm. And in the mine, it was too dark, I guess. That's right. Look, Clark, uh, why do you suppose they don't want reporters around? What is going on in Freeville? I, I don't know exactly, but I do know this much. It's a lot of bad feeling out here against the war veterans on the Homestead Farm Project. The war? Uh -huh, it's created an equal amount of bad feeling on the part of the veterans. How do you mean? Well, people have accused the veterans of pillaging and burglary and other acts of vandalism. What? And the veterans say that's a lie and accuse the political leaders of trying to discredit them and so get rid of them. I see. Well, why would anyone want to discredit the war veterans? According to Jerry Barton, head of the veterans post on the project, the politicians feel the veterans are a threat to their rule out here. Also, Jerry says they object to the fact that some of the veterans go to a different church or have a different colored skin for most of the natives out here. Why, what difference does that make? They're all Americans, aren't they? Well, they sure. all fought for their country, and all Americans are entitled to equal rights. That's right, but unfortunately, some people don't think so, Lois. Well, then they're bigots. They're un-Americans. Well, wait a minute, I'll take it easy. Well, so, I never so heard... So far, of... we have only Jerry Barton's word on all this, but we're going to find out. Well, Mr. Sykes here will know. What about it, Mr. Sykes? Do you think our veterans are being pushed around and persecuted? Seven o'clock local will be in pretty soon, Miss Lane. Oh, now, Better look, take I'm... it. Oh, don't change the subject. Remember I Remember what you them something. fillers told you to I mind? don't care what they told me. They can't scare me, and neither can you. Look, Lois, maybe Mr. Sykes is right. Maybe you should go back to Metropolis. I'll stay oh, here. Yes, you'll stay here and scoop me on a big story. Oh, hmm? now, don't be ridiculous. Well, Something I... far more important than a mere story going on here. Your life's in danger. You've already been threatened. So have you, I... mister. That telegram, remember? Oh, that. What telegram? No, it's nothing. Oh, it's just a telegram some crackpot sent me suggesting that I leave town. But I still think Save that you... Save your breath, Clark. This sounds like big stuff to me, and I'm seeing it through with you. Yeah, well, I didn't really think you'd leave, but... Mean you're both staying? We certainly are. Well, so now that you know where we stand, Mr. Sykes, maybe you'll agree to help us by telling us what you know. I, uh... I don't know. Come on, Mr. Sykes. It's your duty as an American. Well... Might be a good thing. I assure you, you won't regret it. What do you say? Well... Mm. Yep, reckon I will. Oh, that's wonderful. Now we're getting someplace. All right, Mr. Sykes, start talking. Eagerly, Clark Kent and Lois Lane wait for the white-haired old telegrapher to begin telling them what he knows of the mysterious goings-on in Freeville. What will he reveal? We'll be back in a moment for the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, the other day, I was talking to a certain young lady who lives in our block, and she was telling me how she's going to knuckle down to collecting those swell comic buttons. You know, the new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep? Of course, she's been collecting them right along, but now she's discovered that her brother is way ahead of her, so she's going to work even harder at it. And she has some duplicates that she wants to trade with her friends, and of course, any new ones that she gets will be pinned with the others right on her jacket. And she agreed that all 18 of those new pep comic buttons are doggone smart looking, including Tess Trueheart and Beezy and Superman and all the rest. So uh, maybe you'd better get busy on your collection, too. Just ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pep. That's how easy it is to get these exciting prizes. You don't send in any money, not even a box top, and you can't buy them anywhere. But you get a comic button every time you open a package of Kellogg's Pep. That's the sunshine cereal, crisp golden flakes of good whole wheat that are loaded with catchy, sunny flavor. Good for you, too, sure, with extra amounts of vitamin D1 and energy vitamin and good old sunshine vitamin D. Yes, sir, for a nifty dish for breakfast, tell Mom that you want P-E-P, -E the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In his little telegraph office, old Abner Sykes has just agreed to tell Clark Kent and Lois Lane what deep, dark mystery is gripping Freeville. As we rejoin them now, Sykes gets up and walks toward the door. Where are you going, Mr. Sykes? Uh, close up. Close up? Yep, it's closing time. Oh, more private, too. Well, that's right, but why are you going out? Gonna have a look around outside. Make sure nobody's spying. Be right back. Okay. 
sure is frightened, isn't he, Clark? Yes, and so is everyone else in this crazy town. Uh Uh-huh. It is everyone but my good friend and fellow newspaper man. Who do you mean? Local Gazette editor, Fred... What's that? Pistol shots. Good heavens, what do you think? Come on, follow me. What? Lois, look! On the sidewalk! (gasps) It's Mr. Stikes. Shocked. Clark Kent and Lois Lane stand outside the little telegraph office, where in the faint light from the open door, old Abner Sykes lies motionless on the ground, his eyes closed. Obviously, this was a deliberate attempt to keep the truth from Clark Kent and Lois Lane. But who shot the old telegrapher just before he could reveal the secret of the mystery that grips the town of Freeville? Don't miss tomorrow's tense and exciting episode as Superman and Lois Lane battle through a dark, tangling web of mystery and danger. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DZ comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, get a load of this. In Kellogg's Variety, there are ten individual packages of cereal for you to choose from. Every morning you can have your own private box of cereal. Pick it out yourself, and it'll be one of your Kellogg favorites, like Pep, Rice Krispies, and Corn Flakes. Boy, that's a circus of fun. And that's Kellogg's Variety, the handy white, green, and red package with all those crisp, fresh Kellogg cereals that you like so much. Some flaked, some shredded, some popped, made from corn, wheat, rice. Just be sure that it's Kellogg's. Ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, 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 Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent and Lois Lane's continued probing for information behind the mystery of Freeville brings them that much closer to the edge of doom. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, most fellows and girls think that surprises are more fun than anything. And that's why you members of the gang get such a kick out of it when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. Because you never know exactly which comic button you're going to find inside. Could be any one of 18 in that new series, you know. Old favorite funny paper characters like uh, Brenda Starr and the Little Moose and Pat Patton and, and Tess Trueheart, Chief Brandon, Vitamin Flintheart, and Superman, of course. And if it's a duplicate comic button, you know, like one that you already have pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap, why, that's even more fun, because then you can exchange with your pals. And you know, the best part is, these pep comic buttons are so easy to collect. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to stock up on Kellogg's Pep and look for your prize in every package you open. That's Pep. The whole wheat flakes with a kettle, the crisp, fresh Kellogg cereal that's a doggone good tasting that every single spoonful calls for more. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is the breakfast dish for you. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Arriving in Freeville to cover a routine story of a prolonged dry spell, Lois Lane was captured by two unknown men who finally released the girl reporter only after warning her to leave Freeville that night or die. 
Clark Kent, who, as we know, is Superman, believed that the threat to Lois was tied up somehow with the bad feeling existing between the local bigwigs and politicians and a group of war veterans who were homesteading nearby. Convinced that Abner Sykes, the close-mouthed telegrapher, knew a great deal about the mystery, Kent and Lois finally persuaded him to take them into his confidence. But before the old man could reveal what he knew, he was shot by an unseen assailant. As we continue now, the two reporters are in the corridor of the little local hospital, where they wait anxiously for word of Abner Sykes' condition. Listen. I do hope Mr. Sykes will pull through. Yeah, so do I, Lois. He seems gruff, but he's really such a sweet old man. Mm. Why would anyone want to shoot him? Oh, well, that's obvious, to keep him from talking, of course. Really? Well, certainly. Sykes obviously knows the answer to what's going on here in Freeville. Why all the people seem afraid and, and why they walk away when you try to question them. Oh, yes, but just what's the more, same. he knows what's behind the ill feeling between the local bigwigs and the war veterans on that farm project. That's why he was shot. You mean to keep him from telling us? Definitely. Good heavens. What do you suppose is going on, Clark? Well, I'm not sure yet. I am certain it's something big, very big. Yes, I suppose so. Oh, Clark, Mr. Sykes must pull through. Wait a minute, Lois. Here comes the doctor now. Oh, dear, I'm afraid of... You're up. He's smiling. He is? Uh Well, what's the good word, doctor? (laughs) That old Abner. Never saw the likes of him. Oh, what do you mean, doctor? How is Mr. Sykes? (laughs) He's fine, Candy. Just fine. Oh, how wonderful. There's not a thing wrong with him. Old Abner sheds bullets just like that Superman fella does. Sheds bullets? (laughs) That's right. You see, old Abner had made himself a bulletproof vest. Oh, no. A bulletproof vest? (laughs) Stitched it right into his red flannel underwear. Well, I'll be hanged. That's all, brother. (laughs) Yep. I've known old Ab all my life and... Oh, he said he was the smartest man in the county, even though he hardly ever opened his mouth. Yes, sir. I knew he knew what he was doing all the time, too. Wasn't taking any chances. What do you mean, doctor? He wasn't taking any chances with whom? Uh, look, I'm just a medical man, Kent. Yes, I know, but and you made And I don't st- meddle with politics or anything else outside my profession. But you just said Mr. Sykes was your friend. Yes, and somebody tried to shoot him, so it's your duty to find... My duty's to help the sick and injured. It's a sheriff's job to find the man who tried to kill Ab Sykes. Well, that's right, but I understand the sheriff is out of town. It's so still we... his job. You've got a family, and... Yeah, but that's neither here nor there. I came out to tell you that Abner's all right. He's just stunned from the force of the bullets. And he wants to see you two. Oh, you mean we can see him now? That's right, Miss Lane. You can go right on in. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Come on, Lois. <laughs> That you, Mr. Kidd? Yes, Mr. Sykes. Miss Lane with you? Uh-huh. Yes, I'm right here. Good. Come on over to the bed. Well, we're both mighty glad to know you weren't hurt. Are you sure you're all right now? Yep, just got a little pain in my chest is all. Oh, I'm sorry. But it's nothing. No great harm done. Oh, thanks to your bulletproof vest. Yep. Came in handy this time, did. You can say that again. Why, when we saw you lying on well, the ground, n- we were... never mind that now, Lois. Look, uh, Mr. Sykes... Do you know who shot you? Yep, I do. Who was it? Tell you later. Why can't you tell us now? Well, I got to tell you the whole story all at one time. Oh, but look, we've got to get... You and Miss Lane here sure got gumption, Kent. Thanks. That's what we need here in Freeville. Folks with gumption who'll stand up to them scalawags. What scalawags? Them was out to ruin Freeville. Maybe the whole country besides. Just what do you mean, Mr. Sykes? Well, can't tell you exactly, because... Some things I'm sure of, and some I'm not quite so sure of. Well, suppose we start with the things you are sure of. Well, here's how it is. When we first heard about them war veterans coming in here... Hey, what is this? Uh Uh-oh. Hello, Mr. Kent. Oh, hi, Mr. Leonard. Abner, you old scallywag. Uh, what excuse in the world me, is... Mr. Clayton. Uh, yes, sir. What is it? I'd like you to meet a fellow newspaper man. Oh. Oh, a pleasure, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Clark Kent of the Metropolis Daily Planet, meet the Honorable Edward C. Clayton, three times governor of this state. How do you do? Mr. Kent, it's an honor to make the acquaintance of a fine journalist such as you are reputed to be. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Miss Lane, may I present Mr. Clayton? Lane, and, uh, uh, Mr. Leonard? did I... Uh... Did I hear you say Miss Lane, sir? Yes, you did. I'm Lois Lane, also of the Metropolis Daily Planet. Oh? Why, uh, why, this is the young lady who was reported missing, Mr. Clayton. Well, 
Well, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to meet you, my dear. As mm. soon as I heard you were missing, I said, uh, she'll show up all right. Nothing happens to folks in my estate. No, sirree, Bob. Well, something did happen this time. Uh, huh? Uh, what's that? Oh, no, nothing, nothing. She's just joking. Lois, I'd like you to meet Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the Freeville Gazette. How do you do, Mr. Leonard? A pleasure to meet you, Miss Lane. Yes, indeed. Yes, it is a real pleasure to meet the representatives of so, so excellent a newspaper as the Daily Planet. Yes, sir, Bob. A great newspaper. Go away. Everybody, please go away. Huh? Why, why, Abner, I'm surprised at you. That's no way to talk to your friends who come over to see you as soon as they heard something had happened to you. Nothing happened to me. Nothing? Nope. Well, uh, what's all this I hear about somebody taking a shot at you? Why, yes, we were all upset when we heard about it, Abner, and we rushed right over here. Well, nothing to be upset about. Just go away and take them reporter folks away from me. What? Now, look here. You heard me. Go away. You bother me. No, no, Abner. Say, what's gotten into you, Mr. Sykes? Lois. You're the one man who can tell us what's going on here in the I tell you, I don't know nothing. Look, Lois, I think we'd better run along. Look, Clark, what's gotten into you? I'm sorry, Miss Lane. You and Mr. Kent got to let me alone. I'm a sick man. Can't stand questioning. And I don't know nothing. Well, I'll Uh, tell you. Folks, folks, I I think I'd better apologize for my friend Abner. Uh, after all, he, he did just suffer a great shock. Oh, yes, and he's sort of upset. Yeah. Maybe we'd all better just leave now, don't you think so, Mr. Clayton? Uh, yes, Fred, I do. I'm, uh, I'm sure Miss Lane, Mr. Kent will understand. Yes, yes, of course. Come on, Lois. But Clark... Come on, please. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Sykes. Hope you recover quickly. Yes, yes, indeed, Abner. That expresses the sentiments of us all, I'm sure. Uh, come on, Fred. Well, goodbye, Abner. See you again soon. Uh, Miss Lane, uh, Mr. Kent, I uh, I want to tell you again how happy I am to meet you. And, and I want you to know how much I think of your paper, The Daily Planet. Yes, sir, e. Bob. What this country needs is more fine papers like that, which spread the gospel of understanding and progress. Huh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clayton. Yes, sir. You know, you know, we're all brothers under the stars and stripes. All of us Americans, that is. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner we'll all get along like brothers. Right, Fred? That's absolutely right, Mr. Clayton. Yes, but there's something going on here that's uh, not it's very... It's nice to have met you, Mr. Clayton. Hope to see you again sometime. Come on, Lois. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, we've got a car. Can we drop you somewhere? Yes, uh, Thank you, no. We'd rather walk. Goodbye. Clark, uh, I want to go. Still angry and puzzled by what she has just seen and heard, Lois Lane is literally dragged by Clark Kent away from the Honorable Ed Clayton and editor Fred Leonard. What is going on? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, you've heard of infantile paralysis, that dread disease that cripples so many, many children every year? Well, here in America, we're fighting infantile paralysis epidemics with all our power and our strength. We provide medical care for its victims... We train nurses and doctors to treat it. We're studying its cause and its prevention through research. And the service that carries on this fight is the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, supported by the annual March of Dimes. Every year across the country, grown-ups and children give their dimes and dollars. So how about putting part of your allowance to work? And remind Mom and Dad, too, to give their contributions to the annual March of Dimes. As we rejoin them now, Clark Kent and Lois Lane have returned to the Central Hotel in Freeville and are walking through the third floor corridor to their respective rooms. Lois, still furious, is trying to make sense out of Abner Sykes' strange behavior. Listen. You mean Mr. Sykes suddenly changed his tune because he was afraid of Mr. Clayton and Mr. Leonard? Is that what you're trying to say, Clark? I'm not sure, Lois. Either he was afraid of them or else... He just didn't want to reveal what he knew. But he was just about to tell us everything. I know. Well, that's because we're outsiders. So we're not involved in whatever's going on around here between the local bigwigs and politicians and the war veterans. Yes, but... And as you remember, Mr. Sykes said he wasn't sure of all his facts, just some of them. Now, my hunch is that he wanted our help in finding all the facts. 
Oh, hold it. Here's your room. Look, Clark, let's go back to the hospital. No. With Leonard and that flag-waving ex-governor gone, maybe... No, we... I, I don't think that's smart, Lois. And anyway, you need a rest after all you've gone through today. Oh, you're right. Gee, I... Oh, I am pretty tired. Of course you are. You got a good night's sleep. I'll see you in the morning, and we'll continue our investigation then. Okay, Clark. Mm, good night. Good night, mm. Lois. I'll knock on your door at 7 o'clock. Okay, Clark. Matter, you having trouble? Yes, the door is stuck. Here, wait a minute, I'll help you. Oh, never mind. Here it is. It's opening now. Look out, Lois! Look out! I said, get back! <laughs> Horrified, Clark Kent springs forward, his X-ray vision perceiving something within the room just as Lois enters it, and a violent explosion shatters the silence of the little village hotel. What has happened to the girl reporter? Is this the answer to Lois's defiance of the warning to get out of Freeville? What is going on in this sleepy little farming area? Don't miss tomorrow's thrilling episode, fellows and girls. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, how'd you like to pick out your own favorite Kellogg's cereal every morning and open your own individual package yourself? Well, ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of your own favorite Kellogg cereals, like Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pep. And you know they're good because you've always liked Kellogg cereals so much. Every day you get your choice, and every day you treat yourself to one of your favorite Kellogg cereals for breakfast. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman stalks the mysterious forces which hold Freeville in its evil clutches, events fraught with great danger move thick and fast against him. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, if you were the only fellow or girl in the world who was collecting those comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet, well, it wouldn't be half as much fun. What makes it exciting is that so many of your friends are collecting them, too. You know, so you can compare notes, and you can even trade duplicates. And it really means something when you wear all your comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap for everybody to see how many you've collected. Yes, sir, there's a real thrill in adding any one of those 18 different pep comic buttons to your collection. Brenda Starr, or Goofy, or Beezy, or, or Superman, and all the rest. So, remind Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's pep. Because that's the only way you can get these new comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But there's an exciting prize every time you open a package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. There's good eating, too, because these are the whole wheat flakes with a sunny golden toasted flavor. What's more, Mom's glad to see you polish off your breakfast bowl of Kellogg's Pep. Because Pep gives you energy vitamin B1, plus good old sunshine vitamin D. That's extra important these wintry days when the sun's rays aren't quite so strong. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, -E the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Now the adventures of Superman. 
A prolonged dry spell in the area of Freeville, where 300 war veteran farmers face ruin, brought Lois Lane and then Clark Kent, reporters for the Metropolis Daily Planet, to the scene. And at once, things began to happen. First, unknown men warned Lois to leave Freeville at once or forfeit her life. Then Kent, who, as we know, a Superman, received a similar warning. Finally, old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, narrowly escaped death as he was about to reveal what he knew to the reporters. Returning to their hotel after learning that Sykes was all right, Kent had just said goodnight to Lois. And as she opened the door of her room and started to step inside, he suddenly lunged toward her, shouting a warning. Look out, Lois! <laughs> Just as the explosion shattered the stillness, Clark Kent, whose X-ray vision had enabled him to see the danger to Lois a split second before, leaped forward with the speed of light and shielded the girl reporter from the searing flash with his own body. As we continue now, shaken but unhurt, Lois stares in wide-eyed astonishment at her wrecked hotel room. Listen. Good heavens. What what happened, Clark? Plenty. A booby trap just missed getting you, Lois. Uh, a booby trap? Yes, a charge of dynamite was set in a can on the floor of your room here. Good heavens. A wire running from the can was attached to the doorknob. What? When you opened the door, you set off the charge. Good gracious, I, I might have been killed. That's exactly what was intended by whoever set this little trap. But but who set Undoubtedly, it? Undoubtedly, the same men who warned you to leave pre Freeville and tried to finish old Abner Sykes tonight were behind this. Why, of course, it must have been. Sure. But what's it all about, Clark? What is going on in this town? I don't know yet, but believe me, I'm going to find out. Uh-oh, we're getting company. Oh, Miss Lane! Mr. Kent! What happened? Mr. Keeley, you're the manager of this hotel, aren't you? That's right, but what happened? Come in here, please. I want to talk to you. Oh, yes, Stand yes, back, of course. Everybody. Well, good gracious, look at this room. Pretty, isn't it? Look here, Mr. Keeley. Miss Lane, are you all right? Yes, saved by a miracle. Look, what kind of a place is Wait this a minute, anyway? Wait let me handle this, please. My word, Mr. Kent, the whole back of your suit coat is gone. What? It is? Yes, and your shirt is blackened. Really? Oh, Clark, you must have been burned when you shielded me from the bomb. Bomb? Why, you saved my life, but you were caught by the explosion. Oh, no. Oh, well, n- n- never mind that now, Lois. You see, I'm okay, and But now... I don't understand. Well, stop wasting time. Remember, Lois, somebody is using us by clay pigeons around here, and we've got to put a stop to it. Yes, Now, look, but somebody please tell me what happened here. That's what we want you to tell us, Mr. Keeler. Well, how can I tell you Is it the custom to furnish a bomb with each room in your hotel? Well, how absurd, Mr. Kent. I can't believe there was a bomb. Oh, you can't. Oh, no. Well, that explosion you heard wasn't me cracking my bubble gum, Mr. Keeler. Well, well, no, of course not. It was a bomb, all right, and it was meant to do away with Miss Lane. Jump and she hustled. Now, who would do a thing like that? Well, we thought you might have some ideas on that subject. I? Yes. The bomb didn't walk in here by itself, you know. Somebody obviously brought it in. Well, yes, of course, but but I have no idea who did it. You haven't, eh? Well, certainly not. I, I think I'll call Sheriff Cleary at once. Perhaps he can find it. Oh, I forgot the sheriff's out of town. Is the sheriff the whole police force around here? Why, yes, he is, Miss Lane. After all, Freeville's a small place, well, you know. we'll have we... to get along without the sheriff, then. I think you can help us, Mr. Keeler, if you want to. Oh, naturally, I'll be happy to do anything I can to help clear up this terrible thing, Mr. Kent. All right. Tell me this. Yes? What's behind the ill feeling between the local natives and politicians and the war veterans who've taken homesteads on the reclaimed land in this county? Well, I... I wouldn't know anything about that. Oh, here we go again, Clark. Yes, you're as bad as the others around here, Keeler. Well, now, look here... All right, we'll handle this our own way. We can't do anything until morning, and you need sleep, Lois. Yes, but I can't sleep in what's left of this mess. Well, I I can't tell you how much I regret this inconvenience to you, but uh, there's a vacant room across the hall, and then you can have that, Miss Lane. All right, I'll take it. Very good. Uh, Follow me, please. Seeing Lois Lane safely to another room, Kent returns to his own room, where he spends the night in a watchful vigil. But the little hotel is quiet, and so is Freeville. At 7.30 the next morning, Kent raps on Lois's door to awaken her. Then, after a hearty breakfast, the two reporters hurry to the small local hospital where the night before they had left Abner Sykes, the old telegrapher. I'd like to see Mr. Abner Sykes, please. He's not here. What? He isn't. He left the hospital about an hour ago. Oh, no. You know where he went? Back to his telegraph office, I guess. Doctor said there was nothing wrong with him. I see. All right, thanks very much. Come on, Lois. You're looking for old Abner, eh? That's right. They told us at the hospital that he's Well, come back. Abner ain't around. We can see that, but what can we want... Can you tell us where to find him? Well, I don't know as you can, mister. Why? 
He went off on a little vacation, you see. What? That? Vacation? That's right. He got me out of bed about an hour ago, said he was plum wore out, needed a little vacation. Uh-oh. And told me to take over the office while he was gone. Oh, Clark. See, I spell him once in a while, holidays and so. Name's Lem Hawkins. Well, did he happen to say where he was going for his vacation last No, sir, he didn't. What'll we do, Clark? Mr. Sykes is the only one who might tell us the truth about what's going on in this I town. I know, Lois. Look, Lem, don't you have any idea where Mr. Sykes went? No. All I know is he went south on Highway 319. 319? Yep. That's highway just below here. How long ago did he leave? Oh, half hour, maybe 45 minutes ago. Thanks very much. Come on, Lois. Okay. But where to now, Clark? Do you think we I'm ought to go... I'm going after Mr. Sykes. You're you... going after him? How? Uh, well, don't, don't, don't worry. I'll find transportation. Now, listen... Well, you don't I... even know where he is. I know enough. Now, please, let's stop wasting time. After all, you admit our best chance to solve this whole mystery is to get hold of Mr. Sykes, don't you? Well, certainly. But I've got a hunch. He left so he wouldn't have to answer any questions. After somebody convinced him, it would mean his life. All right, I go along with you on that. But I've got to find him, so I want you to promise to sit tight in the hotel until I get back. Oh, now, wait a minute, Clark. I think I'd like to look over this Veterans Farm project. Uh-uh, nothing doing. You've got to stay right here till I get back. But you said yourself you were sure the threats against us and everything else had something to do with the trouble between the veterans and the neighbors. I know, but you can't risk getting into any more trouble. I won't get into trouble. I'm just going Please, to... Please, Lois, do as I ask. Just this once. Now, I assure you it's the safest and sanest thing to do. But, Clark, after all, I'm not Lois, a child. please. Well, I... Every second counts if I'm to catch up with Mr. Sykes. Oh, well. All right, Clark. You promise to sit tight and do nothing till I get back? Yes, I promise. Good, thanks. I'll be back as soon as I can. Well, good luck. Thanks. Now, oh, where can I change clothes? Oh, that empty granary across the street. I hate to leave Lois even for a few minutes, but I think she'll be safe in broad daylight, and I can only catch up with Abner Sykes as Superman. <laughs> Stepping into the deserted granary, Clark Kent swiftly stripped down to the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Then, up, up, and away! <laughs> Leaping out and high into the sky, Superman rockets away above Highway 319 in pursuit of the old telegrapher, Abner Sykes. We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, have you ever noticed how much Judy and Corky from Gasoline Alley look alike? Of course, uh, Judy's blonde and Corky's got dark hair, but they both have the same sort of button nose, and they're both mighty nice-looking kids. Yes, that's how clear and sharp the pictures of your favorite funny paper characters are on those comic buttons in the new series that you're all collecting from packages of Kellogg's Pet. That's one reason it's such an exciting hobby to collect them and to wear your collection pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. And you'll also get a kick out of trading duplicates with your pals and checking up to see if you've collected more different comic strip characters than they have. So get busy, gang. Ask Mom to get you some more Kellogg's Pep. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box top. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. But there's one inside every package of Kellogg's Pep. That's the mighty good eating, too, you're going to find, too. Pep is called the sunshine cereal, you know. It's loaded with catchy, sunny, toasted flavor. Crisp and fresh as can be. So doggone delicious that, well, your spoon just naturally keeps digging in again and again for more. So tell Mom that you want Pep for breakfast every day. And get your prizes from P.E.P., -E the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> Returning to the Preville Hotel alone, Lois Lane is approached by a husky, sunburned young man who has apparently been waiting there for her. Uh, are you Miss Lois Lane? Yes. I'm Jerry Barton. I'm one of the fellows of the Veterans Homestead Farm Project. Oh, near here. yes, Mr. Barton. Mr. Kent told me about meeting you. Uh-huh. Well, look, do you know where he is now? Why, no, I don't. But the hotel manager said you'd gone out with him early this morning. Yes, I did, but he just left to, uh... To look for someone we want to talk with. Oh, I see. Any idea how soon he'll be back? No, Mr. Barton, I haven't. Why? Well, it, it's kind of important that I see him right away. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you tell me about it? I'm a reporter for the Daily Planet, too, you know. Yes, I, I know, but... Well, maybe you'll do as well as Mr. Kent on this. Oh, good. What is it? Well, look. You and Mr. Kent want to know what's going on around Freeville, don't you? Why we vets are in trouble with Fred Leonard and Uncle Ed Clayton and their gang? Why, yes. Well, I was just tipped off to something that's scheduled for this morning. And if you go there with me, it'll answer a lot of your questions. 
What do you mean? What schedule for this morning? Well, I haven't got time to explain, but you'll see when we get there. We've got to hurry if we're going to get there on time. Well, now, time. wait a minute. Can't you tell me more about this, uh, whatever it is? No, not now. There isn't time. But I'm sure you wouldn't want to miss this, Miss Lane. It, well, it'll tell you just about everything you want to know. Well, I, I don't know, Mr. Why? Biden. I... You're here to get a story, aren't you? Yes, certainly, but I promise... Well, this is a story, a real humdinger of a yes, story. Yes, but I promised Clark Kent that I'd wait This until... story won't wait, Miss Lane. If you want it, you've got to come with me now. Okay. I'll go with you. That's the way to talk, Miss Lane. I've got my car outside. Come on. <laughs> Deciding to disregard Clark Kent's warning and to break her promise not to leave the hotel for any reason until he returns, Lois Lane walks out and rides away with Jerry Barton. What, if any, is the story Jerry Barton says he has for Lois? And what of Superman rocketing farther and farther away from Freeville on the trail of Abner Sykes, unaware that Lois has left the hotel with Jerry Barton? Is the girl reporter stepping into another trap? Tomorrow's episode is one of the most exciting in this series, so don't miss it. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, you can save mom a lot of work and give yourself a load of fun with Kellogg's Variety at breakfast. Sure, you just open up one of those individual boxes of your favorite Kellogg's cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the Kell Bowl Pack. It saves washing dishes, and it's more fun than a picnic. You know Kellogg's Variety is the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of favorites like Kellogg's Pep and Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes. Just be sure that Mom gets Kellogg's. Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Clark Kent trails the path of Abner Sykes, his only clue... Lois Lane dangerously pursues another lead to the vicious mystery enveloping the town of Freeville. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, Barney Google's been in the comic strips for a long, long time. Why, uh, somebody even wrote a song about him once, so he's bound to be one of the favorites in that new series of comic buttons Kellogg's Pep is putting out. Uh, maybe you've already got him in your collection. There were 18 new and different buttons at all, you know. Every single one a familiar funny paper character like Brenda Starr or, or Cindy and, and Spud from Winnie Winkle and the Little Moose and Goofy and Beezy from Harold Teen and, and Judy and Corky and Superman, of course. And are these comic buttons bright with color? Why, they look mighty smart on your jacket or your dress or cap. Yes, sir, you'll want to collect every one of these new series buttons. And you can, too. Sure, easy as anything. You just ask Mom to, to keep you supplied with plenty of Kellogg's Pet. That's right. You don't send in any money, not even a box top. And you can't buy these prizes anywhere, but you get a comic button in every package of Pep you open. And you get some mighty grand eating, too, because Pep is really terrific when it comes to sunny golden toasted flavor. Every single flake and every single spoonful is crisp and fresh and tasty as can be. A swell breakfast dish. That's the Sunshine Cereal Gang, P-E-P, -P, Kellogg's Pep. Ask Mom to get you some today. And now, the adventures of Superman. Frightened townspeople who refuse to answer questions. Anonymous warnings to leave town. 
attempts on the lives of the local telegrapher and Lois Lane. These are some of the strange circumstances baffling Lois and Clark Kent, reporters for the Daily Planet who are in Freeville, center of a farming area in the grip of a de- severe drought. Now, after once again running against a blank wall in an attempt to solve the mystery, Clark Kent as Superman left Freeville in pursuit of old Abner Sykes, the telegrapher, who had suddenly departed following the attempt on his life. Meanwhile, Lois was approached by Jerry Barton, head of a group of war veterans who had settled on homesteads nearby, who offered the key to the Freeville mystery. And as we continue now, the young veteran with Lois beside him is driving his car over a lonely country road. Listen. Now, can you tell me where we're going, Mr. Barton? Well, I... I don't know, Miss Lane. You don't know? Well, I mean, I... Uh, I don't I'm understand. Sure. What is this? Are you taking... Take it easy, Miss Lane. What I'm trying to say is that one of the boys, a buddy of mine, is going to tell us where to go. Oh, well, what is this mysterious thing we're going to? A meeting. What meeting? Well, I don't know that exactly. Either, what do you I... mean? Well, Phil Dyer, my buddy, says this meeting is arranged to shoot the works. He now, can... look here, Mr. Barton. I don't like this. You said you could lead me to a terrific story, the answer to all the mystery in Freeville. That's right. And now you pre... tell me you don't know where you're taking me, except that it's to some meeting or other, and you don't even know where the meeting is being held or anything now, about wait it. wait a minute, please. Who said I didn't know anything about it? You did. You I just said said... I didn't know exactly what it was. But I do know this. The big shots will be there. And what's more important, they're all set to lay their cards on the table, according to Phil. Really? And who are these big shots that you're talking about? They're the boys who run things in Freeville and in this part of the state. The ones who pull the political strings everybody here has to dance to. But or who else. are they? The guys who've been trying to discredit the homesteading war veterans around here. Those who spread the stories that we're hotheads and foreigners. That we've been burglarizing and beating up people. But... But why are they doing that? Why do they They want want to to get rid of us, that's why. Get rid of you? Sure. Oh, we were great guys while we fought their war for them. Now we're not even good enough to make an honest living on the land that we protect. Wait a minute, will you? Who are these people that you're talking about? You'll see that when we get there. But why can't you tell me now? Because I've tried to tell other people, and they wouldn't believe me. Or else they were afraid to believe me. Afraid? Yes, afraid. Everybody around here is afraid. So when Phil came in with the news about this meeting, I thought about your friend Kent. Because he seemed like a right Joe to me. Uh, like a guy who wouldn't faint when he saw his own shadow. Well, I wouldn't call Clark exactly brave. I Like I... I say, I've talked to other people who got cold feet as soon as they got the lowdown. So I decided I wouldn't take the chance of Kent or you running out the way the rest of them did. You're reporters for a big paper. You can help us by printing the truth. <gasps> Look out for that curve! <laughs> these roads like the back of my own hand. Well, take it easy, will you, please? Yes, ma'am. All right. So I decided this time I'd just offer Kent a big story and not take a chance of scaring him off by telling him all about it beforehand. Well, Kent is away. So the same goes for you, Miss Lane. And, well, that's why I've been so mysterious. Well, I certainly hope this meeting or whatever it is will explain all this hocus-pocus that Clark and I have been running into here in Freeville. You bet it will. And besides, uh uh-oh. What's the matter? What are you stopping for? There's a car parked at the foot of the hill. See it? No. I don't see any car. It's pulled off the road on the right. Almost hidden by the brush there. You see it now? Oh. Oh, yes. Well, what about it? Well, we're getting near the meeting place now, so we've got to be careful. Someone may be posted in that car as a guard. I see. Well... No. No, it's okay. How do you know? Oh, I recognize him. Phil Dyer's car. He said he'd be waiting near where the wood started. I just had to be sure. Well, of course. Look, is this meeting closed to you veteran homesteaders? <laughs> oh, and how? Then who are the people who... Wait a minute. Now, be quiet, please. I... I don't see your friend. No, he's not in the car. Must be nearby somewhere. Well, I'll give him the whistle. Okay, Jerry. Drive in here off the road. Why, he must have been behind that tree all the time. Uh Uh-huh. Check, Phil. Hold on, Miss Lane. It's going to be a little bumpy. Okay, I'm set. Okay, hold it, Jerry. Give your order. Right. Okay. Get out, pal. From here in, you walk. Okay. Come on, Miss Lane. All right. Well, sure took you long enough to get here, Jerry. Oh, sorry, Phil. I had to wait for Miss Lane at her hotel. 
Oh, Miss Lane, this is Phil Dyer. How do you do, Mr. Dyer? How do you do? Look, Jerry, huh? I don't get this. I thought you were bringing that Daily Planet reporter, Clark Kent. Why, Clark he Kent went... had to go somewhere, so I came instead. You see, you I'm... You came instead? Holy smokes, Jerry, are you off your nut? This is no job for I a girl. Know, Phil, Look, but Mr. I... Dyer, this girl has been on plenty of tough assignments. Not as dangerous as this. Even more dangerous than this. You see, I'm a Daily Planet reporter, too. I don't care. This is tough business, and we can't let you take the chance Oh, of now, be... don't be silly. I'm not. I'm just oh, thinking... cut of... it out, Phil. You know that what we need is a reporter for a big city newspaper who isn't afraid to go out after the truth, who isn't scared to print it. Right, but a girl. This job is too dangerous, Will I you tell stop you. I had to bring her, Phil. There's no telling when Ken will be back, and I didn't dare wait. Well, you said this meeting was going to be today at noon, didn't you? That's right, All but right, I'm t- then. Let's stop wasting time and get to work. According to my watch, it's 11.15. Well, all right. I still don't like it, but if it's okay with you, it's Jerry... It's okay. Now, what do we do, Phil? Well, you start hiking along a narrow trail through these woods that starts at a point about 50 feet up ahead. Uh-huh. You well, follow the trail, and after you've gone about a mile and a half, mile you'll and come to a stream. Okay. Follow that stream until it brings you out into a big clearing. Yeah. That's where the meeting's being held. Okay, I got it. Come on, Miss Lane. Now, wait a minute. Before we go, can't you give me some idea of what this meeting is about, Mr. Dyer? You'll see when you get there. Now, be careful, Jerry, because they'll be on the lookout for any outsiders, and if you get caught... Well, it might be too bad. I know. Don't worry. We'll be careful. Who will be on the lookout? You'll find that out, too, Miss Lane. But look, Save it, Miss Lane, please. We've got oh. to get started now. So long, Phil. See you later. Right. And good luck to both of you. Thanks. Thanks guys. And remember, be careful. Okay. Come on, Miss Lane. Lead the way. I'm right behind you. Rapidly, Lois Lane follows Jerry Barton into the dense woods. As meanwhile, on the trail of the elderly telegrapher Abner Sykes, Superman has arrived at a toll bridge 60 miles north of Freeville, where he is questioning the man in charge. You say you know Abner Sykes? Sure do, Superman. You're positive he hasn't come over this bridge in the past hour? Yep, I know he hasn't. That's strange. He was headed this way, and he's nowhere on the road ahead or behind. Well, maybe he turned off on a side road. Well, there are only two or three side roads, and I didn't see him on any of them. But I didn't search them thoroughly. I better go back and do that now. Hey, listen. What old Abner do? Huh? Must have been something important to have you after him. Well, he didn't do anything wrong, if that's what you mean. But he can help me on something important. Something very important. So I've got to find him. That's so. What's it all no about? No time to explain now. Thanks very much, though. Up and away! <laughs> Lucifer, jump right up into the sky! <laughs> His mouth gaping, the bridge tender watches in amazement as Superman rockets away in search of Abner Sykes. Will he find the old telegrapher? And meanwhile, what of Lois Lane and Jerry Barton on their hazardous mission in the woods? We'll be back in a moment with the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, don't forget, gang, if you have duplicate comic buttons to trade in that swell new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet, Be sure to let your pals know about it. Tell them which duplicates you have and which comic strip characters you need. Then you can swap and have an exciting new pet comic button for your collection. You won't want to miss out on a single one of the 18 buttons in this new series because they're all true to life and bright colored as anything. Like the Little Moose, for instance, and uh, and Pat Patton and Superman himself. Boy, do they look terrific when you wear your collection of pet comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. Why, you'll feel like really strutting around. And it's so easy to get these pet comic buttons. You don't send in a single penny, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But every time that you open a package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your exciting prize. And look for some mighty good eating, too, because Pep is a super delicious breakfast dish. It's called the Sunshine Cereal. Every crispy whole wheat flake is loaded with golden toasted sunshine flavor that really hits just the right spot those cold winter mornings. Pep really gives breakfast and your day a wonderful lift. So ask Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In the dense woods several miles from Freeville, Lois Lane is following Jerry Barton along a narrow, twisting trail, crowded with brambles and overhung by moss. Fire winded, finally breaks the silence. Look, Jerry, how much farther is this? I'm getting winded. Can't be much farther, Miss Lane. What? Phil said it was right. Hold it. What's the matter? I thought I heard something. Hey! That's you, uh, hear that? Yes. Hey, hey! Where'd you get 
Yeah. Somebody's coming this way. Quick, Miss Lane, get off the trail. We've got to hide. Hey! Oh! I don't know where Hank got me. Come over here and help me look. Get down low, Miss Lane. They're coming this way. If they see us, we're dead pigeons. <laughs> Crouching in the thick brambles and damp moss, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton hold their breaths as the unseen men converge toward them. Will Lois and Jerry be discovered? What is the mysterious meeting which the war veterans are so eager to have Lois overhear? While Superman, many miles away, searches for Abner Sykes, whom he believes holds the key to the Freeville mystery. Tomorrow's episode is packed with thrills and suspense, so be sure not to miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, what's your favorite Kellogg's cereal for breakfast? Kellogg's Rice Krispies? Corn Flakes? Pep? Well, you can take your pick of ten individual boxes of different Kellogg's cereals every morning if you'll get Mom to set out Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with a grand lineup of Kellogg favorites. Some are flaked, some popped, some shredded, made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a favorite Kellogg cereal. Yes, sir, breakfast is a picnic all year round when Kellogg's variety is on the table. So ask Mom for Kellogg's variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman speeds his determined way to solve the mystery of Freeville, little realizing that Lois Lane, proceeding on her own, now stands in dire peril of her very life. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know what I think is particularly swell about those snappy comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out? Well, I think they sort of hold our Superman gang together. All you fellows and girls have something in common because you're all collecting these exciting new comic buttons and having great fun, too. First of all, there's the thrill of seeing which button's inside every time that Mom opens a new package of pet. If it's a brand new one, well, you can pin it with the others right on your jacket or your dress or cap. Or if it's a duplicate, you know, like one that you already have, why, that's even more fun because then you have the business of swapping with one of your pals. And you'll want every single one of these 18 new buttons, too. From Judy and Corky right on up to Superman. And you can get them. Sure, easy as anything. You just ask Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pet. And don't send in any money. Not even a box stop. And remember, you can't buy these prizes anywhere. But look for one inside every package of Pet that you open. That's Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal. The sunny golden toasted whole wheat flakes. Yes, sir. Pep certainly makes your appetite sit right up and take notice these cold winter mornings. It's such a solid, hearty sort of dish for breakfast. So remember, be sure that you ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. In Freeville, center of a farm area which is in the grip of a prolonged drought... Mysterious goings-on have involved Clark Kent and Lois Lane to the point where both reporters received anonymous warnings to leave town. And when they defied the threats, an attempt was made on Lois's life. An attempt was also made on the life of Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, who was about to give them the key to the mystery before he was frightened into leaving Freeville without revealing his destination. Then, while Kent, as Superman, searched for the telegrapher, 
Lois joined forces with Jerry Barton, a young war veteran who led her through dense woods bound for a secret meeting which he promised would provide the answers to all her questions. But suddenly, as they approached the meeting place, men's voices were heard nearby. Jerry hastily led Lois off the trail. And as we continue now, they are crouching in a mass of brambles. Listen. Keep down low, Miss Lane. Those men spot us. We're dead pigeons. Why, Jerry? Who are they? They work for the big shot. I caught a glimpse of one of them. He's wearing yellow suspenders. He was wearing what? Yellow suspenders. Yellow su- or gallus, as they call them down here. All the big shots follow us with them. Same as he does. But who is the big oh, shot? Miss Lane, they're getting closer. Hey, where in Darnation you been, Hank? I went to the spring for a drink. Mm. Why? You're supposed to watch the trail, that's why. Supposing some outsiders got in here. Ah, oh, relax, Charlie. Couldn't know outsiders get in without my seeing them. Well, we can't be too careful. A couple of reporters from Metropolis came to Freeville yesterday. When I asked him questions. He must be in Clark and me. Uh, yeah, don't you right. worry. They won't come tracing around here if they know what's good for them. Oh, they better not. I have most time for the meeting to get started. Let's get over there. Wait. Who's going to watch out back here? Great. You'll be along pretty soon. Come on. Okay, Miss Lane, come on. They're out of sight now. But don't make any more noise than you have to. Right. That guy Rafe may be lurking around, so watch it. Just follow me and don't say any more till we see how the land lies. All right, Jerry. Lead on. Swiftly, but as quietly as they can, Jerry Barton and Lois walk through the woods for a quarter of a mile. And suddenly, at a hand signal from Jerry, Lois stops. A little below them and just ahead stretches a large clearing in the woods, in which are some 200 sunburned, straw-hatted men and women, dressed in frayed overalls and calico dresses. A huge barbecue pit in which several pigs are roasting stands at one end of the clearing, and husky shirt-sleeved men wearing bright yellow suspenders serve meat and cold drinks to the crowd. A roughly built plank platform stands in the middle of the clearing. Alone on the platform, another shirt-sleeved man with yellow suspenders works hard at a pipeless organ. We'll be able to hear everything from here, Miss Lane, but keep back behind the tree where they can't see you. Okay. This is one of those backwoods political rallies. Barbecue, music, and all the trimmings. And speeches? Yeah. That's what I brought you here to hear. Look, if this is just a political rally, why all the secrecy and the guards out in the woods? Because the people running this show don't want what they call outsiders to know what's going on. But why? I don't see anything wrong. Well, here's where you find out, Miss Lane. Look. See those two men climbing up on the speaker's platform? Yes. They look familiar. Say, well, that's Mr. Leonard, the editor of the Freeville Gazette. That's right. And Mr. Clayton, the ex-governor of the state, the one they call Uncle Ed. Yeah. You know there was a contested senator election in the state. Yes, I know. And they're going to run it off next month. Uncle Ed wants to be our next senator. Oh, I get it. Oh, let's listen to him talk. Just keep your ears open, Miss Lane. And how about is it? Well, now you let me tell you. You see, this here is our state, yours and mine. But without asking us for our permission, a few fellas in Washington saw fit to dump a heap of rascal foreigners on us. Foreigners? Yes, sir. They dumped them foreigners right down in our front yard and told us to wait. What does he mean, Jerry? He'll tell you in just a moment. Men who fought for our country first. 
just because of their color or the, or the country their parents came That's from. That's what he always says, Miss Wayne. How dare he say that? He's a hate peddler. That's the regular hate preacher's line. What a dirty lie. The land we veterans got was state owned, reclaimed swamp land that nobody ever wanted before. I know. This is terrible, Jerry. Clayton and his gang are trying to discredit us because they know they can't make men who fought a war against Nazis vote for old Uncle Ed. He knows that we'll work against him and try to wake the people up to the fact that he peddles the same poison Hitler did. I know, Jerry. I'm beginning to understand a lot about the mystery in Freeville now. Say anything to get No, but wait a minute. That's very strange. He actually yeah, yeah. figure out what he he must wait. be. The outsiders belong to that car Ray found back in the road. Hey, now, wait a minute. Don't move, you two. Now, look here. Don't you point those rifles at us. Hank, this is that reporter gal I told you about. It is. Put yeah. those guns down, you fools. Don't move, I said, or this gun will go off. Now, you look here. We haven't done anything Shut up, wrong and... Shut up and turn around. Now, wait a minute. You two, Barton. Hank, come along. Uncle Ed will want to see you. See us? What for? To say goodbye. But you two are going on a long trip. I start walking. Trapped, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton have no choice but to turn and march into the clearing, crowded by the long rifles of the two burly men wearing yellow suspenders. What will happen? We'll be back in a moment with the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, you fellows know how often the girls win out in uh, spelling bees or reading contests? Well, nowadays, I'm hearing of a lot of times when the girls are winning out in collecting comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep. Of course, uh, whenever that happens, the boys get busy right away and the race is on. Good fun it is, too, because everybody gets a kick out of those true-to-life pictures of, of your favorite comic strip characters, like Chief Brandon with his uniform and his official badge, and Tess Trueheart with her red hat and long blonde hair, and Superman himself, complete with bright blue jersey and flying red cape and Superman insignia. So, fellas, don't you let those girls get ahead of you. And girls, don't let the fellas get ahead of you. Everybody, pitch in. It's easy, you know. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. But every time that you open a package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your snappy prize. And there's some mighty snappy eating, too, because Pep is a whiz of a breakfast cereal. Tastes a crisp and sunny and golden toasted that, well, you practically can't resist it. Pep's good for you, too. Mom knows it's a grand dish to start off a cold, wintry day. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As Lois Lane and Jerry Barton were captured by Uncle Ed Clayton's followers, Superman, mystified by his failure to find old Abner Sykes, the telegrapher, has returned to the hotel in Freeville where he had left Lois. Finding Lois gone, he has resumed the guise and garb of reporter Clark Kent and is questioning Mr. Keeler, the hotel manager. Lane left the hotel, Mr. Keeler? That's right, Mr. Kent, a couple of hours ago. But she promised to stay right here. Was she alone? No, she went out with Jerry Barton. Jerry Barton? Yes, uh, he's that young fellow. I know who he is, but have you any idea where they went? Well, I noticed them drive off in the car. That's all I know. Scott, I gave Lewis strict orders not to leave the hotel. Yeah, what's that? Oh, never mind. Thanks, Mr. Keeler. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. I don't like this. We've got to find Lois. I've got a hunch that this time she's walked into real trouble. <laughs> Hurrying from the hotel, Clark Kent steps into an airway and swiftly resumes his true identity of Superman. Then, up, up, and away! 
Leaping high into the bright sky, the Man of Steel rockets away, bound for Jerry Barton's farm. But as we know, Jerry and Lois Lane are in serious trouble, a long distance away from his farm. What will happen to the young war veteran and girl reporter who are now in the hands of the men of hate? Will Superman be able to trace them? And in time... Don't miss Monday's thrilling episode, fellows and girls. Be sure to tune in. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, there's almost no end to the fun you can have with Kellogg's variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages of your favorite Kellogg cereals, like Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pep. You can take your choice every morning. Pick out your own private box of cereal. Makes breakfast a picnic. And sister will get a kick out of the cutout dolls on the bottom of the tray. Cut them out and dress them up and play all sorts of games with them. Tell mom to be sure to get Kellogg's. Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman, alarmed to find Lois Lane gone, speedily sets out to find her, little realizing that the girl reporter is already in the clutches of Freeville's bigoted villains. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, you know how much fun it is to look through a photograph album? Well, you know, you've got a sort of photograph album in full view for everybody to see when you wear your collection of pep comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. Yes, sir, these bright-colored comic buttons in that new series that Kellogg's Pep is putting out are true-to-life pictures of your favorite funny paper friends. And there are 18 new and different buttons in the series. Characters like Pat Patton and Tess Trueheart and Chief Brandon and Vitamin Flintheart and Superman, of course. Boy, is it a load of fun collecting these pep comic buttons and swapping duplicates with your friends, too. Boy, you wouldn't want to miss out. So hop to it, gang. Ask Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's Pep. That's right. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. All you do is to look for your prize every time you open a new package of Kellogg's Pep. And look for some mighty delicious eating, too, because Pep is loaded with catchy, sunny flavor, a golden toasted flavor that's got come on in every bite. Pep is called the sunshine cereal. It's mighty good for you with all that sunshine vitamin D plus energy vitamin B1. So, gang, get your good eating and exciting prizes from P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Soon after arriving in the farming area of Freeville to cover the story of a strange and ruinous drought, Clark Kent and Lois Lane received anonymous warnings to get out. And when they ignored the threats, an attempt was made on Lois's life. Then Abner Sykes, the elderly local telegrapher, was also attacked. Frightened, Sykes left the vicinity. And while Kent, as Superman, searched for the telegrapher, Lois went with Jerry Barton, a young war veteran, to a secret political rally held in the woods. There, they heard the Honorable Edward C. Clayton, known to the natives as Uncle Ed, ex-governor and now a candidate for senator, make a vicious, un-American speech. But before Lois and Jerry could leave, they were discovered by Uncle Ed's henchmen. And as we continue now, they stand in a far corner of a large clearing, guarded by a burly man with a rifle. Across the clearing, Uncle Ed is shaking hands with his departing followers, the local farmers and villagers, and their wives. Listen. Now look here, you. 
I'd advise you to put that rifle down and let us pass her out. I'd advise you to stay right where you are, Miss Lane. This gun is loaded, you know. That goes for you too, Bart. Nothing doing. You'd you better can't do make... what the man says, Miss Lane. Why should I, Jerry? After hold all, it. I'm... No, a... Hold it. Here comes Uncle Ed in prison. Oh, good. I want to tell him just what I think of an ex-governor and a man who wants to be senator making such a rabble-rousing speech and trying to turn one group of Americans against another. Well, now, what's this? Uh, seems to me I see the faces of two old friends. Friends, huh? <laughs> why, why, Miss Lane? It does me good to see your charming face again. Oh. Bart and my hand, sir. Oh, how, hold on, Mr. Clayton. Why? These folks can't be your friends. They they spy. Huh? What's that? Yeah, Hank and me caught them snooping around. How dare you call us spies? Why, of this? course you're not spies, Miss Lane. Why, why spies are emissaries from the enemy. But we haven't any enemies around here. Why, well, we're all brothers, fellow Americans, that is. Listen, you old friend. Now, look, you don't get it, Uncle Ed. This gal is a reporter from a big paper well, in Metropolis. I know that, Charlie. I know that. I know she's a reporter from the Daily Planet. Great news. Newspaper, which spreads the gospel of liberty, fraternity, and free speech. Isn't that right, Miss Lane? Well, well, yes. But how dare you? Yes, sir. A... I always say, I always say that you can't have liberty without free speech. Yes, but free mm. speech doesn't yeah. mean the right to tell lies in order to incite people to violence. Huh? It doesn't give you license to turn one group against another the way you just did in your speech, Mister Clayton. You're right, better, my it. dear Miss Lane. I, I wasn't turning nobody against nobody. What do you call it when you say the war veterans who've been given homesteads in this county are foreigners? Well, well, you I... know that's not true. Uh, you know that they're all good Americans, boys who fought and bled for America. Well, now, now well, let, no. lots of them. Our foreigners. You can tell by the names and where the folks come from. According to the Bill of Rights, my bigoted friend, every American, regardless of how he spells his name or or parts his hair or or how he chooses to worship his God, is entitled to equal rights. And what's more, I fought the war with thousands of the men that you call foreigners. I fought by their side and I saw them die. Nobody asked them what church they belonged to when they sent them out to fight the Germans and Japs. You bet they did. And no bullet ever drew a color line either. You see, that's just what I mean. What you what mean? You mean? Uh, yes, sir. That's exactly what I mean. All brothers under the grand old stars and stripes. Brother Americans, oh, that is. brother. Uh, you may quote me on that in your great paper, Miss Lane. I'll quote you, all right, you, you hypocritical windbag. I'll quote the un-Americanism, the, the, the Nazism that you just No, no, you won't do no such thing. Oh, yeah. County, you're not uh, going to easy get the there, Charlie. Not... Easy, like I say, I believe in free speech. I believe in everything it says in the Bill of Rights and in the glorious Constitution. I'll just bet you do. Come on, Jerry. Now, now hold go. on there. Hold, look here, Uncle Ed. You ain't going to let these two just walk Why, out. Why, of course I am, Charlie. Why not? They're friends of mine. But, but I tell However, them. however, Charlie, I, I want you and Hank to escort them. Uh, just so they'll be safe. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, Don't bother. I... I know the way. Uh, Come on, Miss Lane. Now, just a minute, friend Barton. Just a minute. Some what? of my other friends around here just might get the wrong idea about you, like uh, Charlie and Hank did. So I'm sending these two boys along with you to, uh, well, to make sure nothing will happen. Uh, Charlie, take them uh, around by Cider Creek. Uh, uh, meet less folks that way. But, but that... Uh... Oh, 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 yeah. I, I get it. Uh, Hank, uh, come over here. Wait a minute. We don't need your guard, Mr. Clayton. Of course we don't. We'd rather go along. No, no, don't argue, five friends. Uh, this here's my state, you know, and I personally see to it that nothing happens to anybody in it. Oh. So uh, you go along with the boys now. Well, I, I got to be getting along myself now, so good luck to you, Miss Lane. You, Mr. Barton. I don't like this, Miss Lane. He's up to something. What do you mean, Jerry? Well, he's being so nice to us. Okay, okay. Get going, you two. Straight ahead. Come on, Jerry. I want to get back to see though anyway and see Clark Kent. Clayton mentioned Cider Creek. I know these parts pretty well. I never heard of any Cider Creek. You didn't? No. And besides, the way we're heading now, upstream, that's just the opposite way of the way we want to go. Oh, gee, that's funny. Wait a minute. Let's stop a minute. Now, what are you stopping for? Keep them moving. Wait. I want to get something straight. First, I never heard of any Cider Creek. And second, I can tell from the sun that we're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah, well, me and my rifle says you're heading the right way, see? Get moving. But why are we going... Get to... on, get... Come on, Jerry. There's no use arguing. Well, okay. But something tells me we're in for trouble, Miss Lane. Bad trouble. <laughs> Easily, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton walk in the direction indicated by Charlie and Hank. Follow silently, holding their rifles at the alert. 
Meanwhile, finding nobody at Jerry Barton's farm, Superman has arrived at the Legion Post, situated at a crossroads in the heart of the veterans' farm community. Once more in his guise of Clark Kent, he is speaking to the only person there, a red-headed veteran named Don Smith. See, Don, Miss Lane left Freeville a couple of hours ago with Jerry Barton. I'm rather worried about it. If Miss Lane's with Jerry, you've got nothing to worry about, Mr. Kent. And I can't be too sure. After all, one attempt was already made on her life. I hope you don't think we veterans were responsible. Well, no, but I... Don't believe everything you hear around Freeville. Certain people, important people, are trying to discredit us veterans and get us out of the state. I know, and I intend to find out about that. Right now, though, I'm worried about Miss Lane. Haven't you any idea where Jerry Barton is? All I can tell you, Mr. Kent, is that Jerry and Phil Dyer, another one of our boys, is on the trail of something important today. What is this something important, Don? I don't know, and I couldn't tell you if I did. They ought to be back any time now. Relax. <laughs> I guess I'll have to. Don't worry. Jerry and Phil know their way around. They... Uh-oh. Excuse me. What's the matter? Time for the weather report. Bet you we got the same old malarkey. What's that? Well, oh, wait a minute. Weather There's forecast Mr. Cheerful now. Rebuilding vicinity, heavy rains. Rains? Continuing through the day and into the night. For tomorrow? Ah, I heard enough. Same old stuff, all right. Wait a minute, Don. That means your dry spell is broken. Are you kidding? We've been getting reports of rain every day for the past month. You have? Sure. This is supposed to be the rainy season out here, you know. I know. So every day, every day, the weatherman says that it's raining here. And every day he's talking through his hat. Well, that's strange. You're telling me. Very strange. I wonder... What? No, no, it can't be. Just the same, I'll look into that as soon as I find Lois. Oh, where are your friends and Miss Lane? Why don't they get back? Easy, easy, Mr. Kent. They'll be back any minute, I'm sure. I certainly hope so. Frankly, I'm worried, Don. Badly worried. Dreadfully, Clark Kent paces the floor of the little Legion post, waiting for Jerry Barton and Phil Dyer to return with Lois Lane. What is happening to Lois and Jerry Barton? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. Say, there's a girl in our neighborhood who's always been mighty fond of Brenda Starr. Follows her adventures regularly in the funny papers, so she was mighty thrilled when she found that Brenda is one of the characters in that new series of comic buttons that that Kellogg's Pep is putting out. So thrilled, in fact, that she started to specialize in collecting Brenda Starr buttons. And she already has five of them pinned right on her jacket. Of course, most of the fellows and girls in the gang think that it's more fun to collect different buttons. And that's why uh, they want Cindy and and Vitamin Flint Heart and Superman and all the others. Of course, however you do it, it's doggone exciting fun. As you know, the best part is these comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But there's one of these exciting prizes in every package of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. The crisp, tender whole wheat flakes with that catchy sunshine flavor. Makes a mighty good eating for breakfast. So crisp and and fresh and toasty that, well, you want to pitch right in and eat hearty. And that's always a good idea on a cold morning. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is mighty good for you. Mom knows that. So remind her to get plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Closely guarded and followed by two armed men, yellow suspender-wearing followers of Uncle Ed Clayton, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton have proceeded to follow an almost impenetrable trail through a dense forest. Now they are ordered to halt. I wonder what we're stopping here for. Because from here on in, you go alone. What? Alone? Yeah, you don't need no more escort. But where are we? How do we get out to the... Well, you know, straight ahead about 50 yards and you'll have nothing to worry about. Wait a minute. Does that take us out on the highway? Yeah. End of the trail, sort of. And the beginning of a new road. A new road? I don't like the sound of this, Jerry. No, neither do I. Get along with you now. Don't try coming back this way, because we'll be waiting. Go on. Well, all right. But that highway better be there. Come on, Miss Lane. Okay. But keep your eyes open, Jerry. Remember what I said now? Don't try coming back this way. Just keep right on walking. Yeah, just keep on walking. Till you fetch up in the quicksand, Bob. <laughs> yeah. They'll be in that quicksand in a minute. When we hear them thrashing and yelling, we'll know they'll never give us nor Uncle Ed no more trouble. Smiling evilly, the two men stand by and watch cold-bloodedly as Lois Lane and Jerry Barton unwittingly walk directly toward a hidden quicksand bog. And what seems like certain death. 
What will happen as Superman, still unaware of their predicament, waits fretfully for news of them? There's a thrill a minute in tomorrow's exciting episode, gang, so don't miss it. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, what'll you have, gang? Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Pep, or one of your other favorite Kellogg cereals? Well, you can take your pick every morning at breakfast when Mom sets out Kellogg's Variety. Sure, that's the white, green, and red package with ten individual packages, each one a serving just for you. One day you'll choose a shredded cereal, next day uh, one that's pop, next day a flake cereal made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a treat because it's a favorite Kellogg's cereal. It's a grand variety to make breakfast a picnic of fun because it's Kellogg's variety. Remind Mom to get you Kellogg's variety and be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman gets a hunch that means the beginning of the end of the evil mystery strangling the town of Freevale. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, I'll bet there's nothing that you look forward to more eagerly than following the adventures of your favorite characters in the funny papers. That's why those comic buttons in the new series that come as prizes and packages of Kellogg's Pet are making such a hit. Because it's just as if these folks like the Little Moose and the Goofy and Beezy and Superman had come alive. You have their bright colored pictures on sturdy white enameled metal buttons that you're mighty proud to wear pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. Yes, sir, every single one of these 18 new and different buttons is a honey. And remember, these pep comic buttons are easy to get. You don't have to spend a single penny of your allowance. You don't even have to send in a box stop. Actually, you can't buy these buttons anywhere. They come only as prizes in packages of Kellogg's Pep. That's P-E-P, the sunshine cereal. Yes, and Pep's a dish that's just right for breakfast these cold mornings. It's so sunny and and golden toasted and delicious. Why, that famous sunshine flavor is so doggone tantalizing, your spoon keeps digging in for more. And before you know it, your bowl's polished clean as a whistle. Mom likes that because Pep's so good for you. So ask her to get you some Kellogg's Pep next time she goes shopping. Now, the adventures of Superman. While Superman searched for them, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton, a young war veteran, were eavesdropping at a secret political rally in the woods at which Edward C. Clayton, rabble-rousing ex-governor and senatorial candidate, made a vicious, un-American speech. Discovered by Clayton's henchmen, Lois and Jerry, to their surprise, were greeted cordially by Clayton, who assigned two men to escort them safely through the woods. After a long walk, the men instructed them to continue straight ahead, saying they would soon reach a highway. The men then departed, chuckling over the fact that the girl reporter and the war veteran were headed directly toward a deadly bog of quicksand. As we continue now, Lois and Jerry have emerged from the trees, where before them stretches what appears to be a mossy clearing. Listen. Look, Jerry. You can see the highway through those trees. Gee, our tough friends were on the level after all. Well, it's a highway, all right, Miss Lane. But it's miles from where we left my car. I wonder what was the idea they're bringing us way out here. Well, Clayton said we might get hurt if we ran into any of his followers. Maybe that's why he sent us the long way round. Maybe. 
But I wouldn't trust that guy as far as I can throw a Sherman tank, Miss Lane. Oh, neither would I, but he wouldn't dare let anything happen to us. I don't know about that. Well, we'll talk He's... about him later. Right now, I'm anxious to get back to Freeville and tell Clark Kent all about this, Jerry. Have you got your breath back? Sure. Come on, then. Let's go. Okay. When we get on the highway, we'll fly the car and we can get... Jerry! What? Look out! What the... Jerry! I... I can't walk! Gee, I'm who's speaking. the fact, Miss Lane? We've walked into a quicksand for Oh, no! Yes! Look, stop threshing around. It'll only pull you under faster. But, but I've got... Try to work your way over that limb. It's hanging over the edge of the bog. But... We can but, get, get a hold of those branches. We can pull ourselves out. But I... I can't move. I keep sinking deeper. You've got to keep trying, Miss Lane. You've got to. It's no use, Jerry. I'm almost down to my waist now. Try to keep calm, Miss Lane. I'm getting closer to that tree. No, you're not. You're... You're sinking, too. Help! Help! No use yelling. That's no use. Help! Nobody can hear us on the highway. It's too far. There's nobody around here. But those men who let us here, Charlie and Hank, they can't be far away. Charlie! Hank! Don't waste your breath Help! calling them. Stop it, Miss Lane. Can't you see they plan for us to fall in this bog? What? Sure. Do you remember that Clayton rat told him to take us by way of Cider Creek? I said there wasn't any Cider Creek. Oh, oh! Well, he obviously meant for them to lead us into this quicksand. Get rid of us that way so that we couldn't spread the story of how he's feeding natives hate poison down here. Oh, if I could only get my hands on him. I'm afraid you never will, Jerry. Look, it's over my waist now. In a few minutes. Don't lose your head, Miss Lane. I'll get to that limb somehow. Oh, Jerry... Clark told me not to leave the hotel. He said I'd get into trouble if I did. Never mind that now. Just take it easy. While I try to reach that tree. As Lois Lane feels herself being dragged deeper and deeper into the bottomless depths of treacherous quicksand, Jerry Barton continues his valiant but hopeless attempt to reach the overhanging branch of a nearby tree. A feat which, in his heart, he knows is hopeless. But meanwhile, several miles away at the Veterans Legion post, Superman, in his guise of Clark Kent, is questioning Phil Dyer, a friend of Jerry Barton's, who has just come in. Well, tell me about this political meeting you say Jerry took Miss Lane to, Dyer. Well, Mr. Kent, I found out this morning that Ed Clayton was going to hold a hate rally back in the woods for the natives around here. You mean the ex-governor, the one they call Uncle Ed? Yeah, that's the one. He's running for senator now, you know. Yes. When I found out what precautions his gang was taking to keep all outsiders away from the meeting, I figured it was big stuff. So I told Jerry, and we decided to smuggle you in. Now, wait a minute, but... wait a minute. What, what do you mean they were taking precautions to keep outsiders away? What precautions? Oh, Uncle Ed had guards spread all through the woods. Tough gents with rifles and pistols. Uh Uh-oh, and you let Miss Lane walk into that setup? No, I didn't want to, Mr. Kent, but she insisted. Yeah, she would. I did my best to argue her out of it. Oh, all right, never mind that now. Where is this meeting being held? About nine miles south of here in a big clearing near Puddler's Stream. Thanks very much, Dyer. I'll see you later. Well, uh, wait. I'll I'll drive you over in my car. Oh, thanks, but I uh, I have my own transportation. So long. Hurrying from the Legion post, Clark Kent steps into a grove of trees, strips off his business suit to reveal the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Then... Up! Up! And away! <laughs> Leaping high into the air, Superman rockets away to the south, over fields and woods, and checks his flight above a large clearing near a stream, where a rough plank platform stands. That must be the clearing Phil Dyer meant. Nobody here now, though. Lois and Jerry must have left with the others and gone back to Freeville. Well, that's a relief. Now I can turn back. Wait a minute. What's that? Every sense alert, Superman poses motionless in in midair. As far in the distance, over the sounds of birds and stream and rustling trees, he hears a faint call, a human call for help. He listens, his amazingly acute hearing strained, his X-ray vision piercing the forest. Then, that's a man and a woman calling for help. Away! Great Scott. Lois and Jerry Barton, unconscious and being dragged under the surface of a quicksand bog. Down to them. Down! (laughs) Lois. Jerry. Oh, if only I'm not too late. I've got to get them to a doctor in a hurry. Up with them now. There we are. 
Up and away! <laughs> Clenching the unconscious Lois Lane and Jerry Barton free of the treacherous quicksand, Superman streaks away to find a doctor. Have the men of hate succeeded in silencing Lois and Jerry? We'll find out in just a moment, so stand by. You know, when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep, it's a real occasion. In the first place, you're always glad to have plenty of Pep to eat for breakfast. And then, every package means that you get a new comic button to add to your collection. And that's an extra thrill. If it's a duplicate, why, that's even more fun, because then you can trade with your friends. And you know, fellows and girls tell me that these new series comic buttons are just about the best-looking things they ever saw. First off, they're true-to-life pictures of your favorite funny paper characters like Judy and Carkey and, and Vitamin Flintheart and Superman himself. Then they're done up in such bright colors that, well, you're proud to wear them pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. So hop to it, gang. Get all 18 different buttons in this new series. And you don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere, but you'll find your exclusive prize in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. That's the Sunshine Cereal. Tastes so catchy and golden at breakfast that you want to eat lots, which is always a good idea because Pep's particularly good for you these wintry days when there's not so much sunshine around. Pep helps keep your supply up of, of good old sunshine vitamin D. Yes, sir, Mom will be glad to get you some P-E-P, the Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> After bringing Lois Lane and Jerry Barton to the home of a nearby country doctor, Superman soon learned that they would be all right. Then, leaving, he reappeared a short time later in the guise and garb of Clark Kent. And as we rejoin our friends now in the doctor's library, Lois and Jerry, wearing clothing donated by the doctor and his wife, sit in large chairs, relating their experience to Kent. You see, Clark... Uncle Ed Clayton wanted to get rid of Jerry and me, so we couldn't report the kind of un-American poison we heard him feeding the natives down here. That's right. No, no, I, I don't think that's the reason, Lois. Why, of course it is. We know now that it was his men who tried to scare you and me out of town. He did that so we couldn't find out how he's working to discredit the war veterans who've been given homesteads in this county. Men who represent a threat to his vicious political machine. She's right, Mr. Kent. Clayton knows that if he doesn't get rid of us veterans, we'll get rid of him eventually. Well, that may be true, Jerry, Why, but Jerry I still... tells me that Uncle Ed owns most of the town. The hotel, Fred Leonard's newspaper, practically everything. Mm. Sure. Why, Fred Leonard is Uncle Ed's stooge, Ken. And that's why everybody walked away when we tried to question them, Clark. They were either working for Uncle Ed or else Or they were, were afraid of his goon squad. That's right. He's undoubtedly given orders not to talk to strangers particularly reporters who would let the rest of the country know that the Honorable Ed Clayton, three times governor and now candidate for the Senate, has set up a regular little Nazi Germany right in this state. Well, that was waste effort, Lois, because the rest of the country already suspects that Clayton is a hate monger and rabble rouser. What? Well, then, then why don't they do something about it? That's a matter for the people of this state themselves to handle, Jerry. Oh, I see. No, Uncle Ed didn't try to get rid of you to keep his rotten tactics a secret, and the people of Freeville weren't worried about us discovering that either. Well, then why did they all look so frightened, and why did they walk away when we tried to question them? Because we questioned them about the drought. So what? I don't see what you're driving at. Neither do I, Kent. I'm not exactly sure myself, but something happened at the Legion Post today, and... Now, wait a minute. You, you, you said Clayton said something about the drought at his meeting in the woods today? Oh, yes, but it wasn't important. Well, tell me again what he said, Lawrence. It's really a laugh, Clark. He said he'd been praying to heaven to help him in his fight against the foreign war veterans. To heaven? Yes, and he said that heaven had answered his prayers. What? Uh-huh. He said that because of his prayers, there'd been no rain. <laughs> and what was more, there wouldn't be any rain until the veterans' crops were completely ruined and the veterans were broken financially and forced to leave the state. Clayton said that? He certainly did, didn't he, Jerry? That's right. Why, can you imagine that windbag claiming to have a direct line to heaven? Why, that's blasphemy, that's what it is. And utter nonsense, which anybody in his right mind would laugh at. I don't know, Lois. Maybe Clayton knew what he was talking about. What? Are you out of your mind, Clark? Oh, I, I don't mean that I believe his prayers had anything to do with the drought, but... But maybe, just maybe, we've stumbled on the wildest, most amazing plot in history. <laughs> Puzzled, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton stare at Clark Kent, wondering what he can possibly mean by saying they may have stumbled on the most amazing plot in history. Does Kent suspect that Uncle Ed Clayton, the politician who plays on ignorant men's prejudices, can be responsible for a drought? 
How could that be? Don't fail to be with us tomorrow when Kent explains his theory. And more exciting and surprising things happen. Tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, it's more fun than a picnic gang to open up your own individual package of your favorite Kellogg cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the Kell Bowl Pack in Kellogg's Variety. Saves washing dishes. And Mom likes Kellogg's Variety because it's got those nutritious Kellogg cereals that are so good for you. Ten packages in all, different Kellogg cereals like Pep and Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes in a handy white, green, and red package. Just be sure it's Kellogg's, Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet... More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman tries to prove his conviction that Freeville's drought is man-made, he is unaware of the brutal obstacles planted in his way. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, there's one thing that I'm sure about, and that's that both fellas and girls hate to miss out on anything exciting. That's why all the gang's getting such a kick out of collecting those nifty comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. Because you're really in the swim when you sport a jacket or a dress or cap with these colorful buttons pinned on it. You want everybody to, to know how many different funny paper characters you've collected, too. Old favorites like Chief Brandon and Tess Trueheart and, and Superman himself. And, you know, it's even more exciting to trade duplicates with your friends. And these pep comic buttons are so doggone good-looking that, well, you just show me a fellow or girl who, who would want to miss out on even one of the 18 new and different buttons in the series. Now, how you get these pep comic buttons is important. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pep and look inside every package for your prize. And you'll find some mighty swell eating in a package of Pep, too. A breakfast dish with a sunny, golden toasted flavor that's mighty satisfying these cold, wintry mornings. Every single whole wheat flake is crisp. Every spoonful gives your morning appetite a real lift. So ask Mom to get you some P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. When Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, heard Uncle Ed Clayton, ex-governor and now a candidate for the Senate, make a vicious un-American speech against the war veterans who had taken homesteads in his county, she thought she had solved the mystery of Freeville. But Clark Kent, who as we know is Superman, said she was not entirely right and declared that the recent attacks on Lois, a young war veteran named Jerry Barton, and on old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, were somehow tied up with a prolonged dry spell in the community. As we continue now, Kent is querying Lois and Jerry Barton about their recent experience with the demagogue, Ed Clayton. Listen. Now, let me get this straight, Lois. You say that in his speech at that secret rally, Uncle Ed said his prayers were responsible for the drought? That's right, Clark. He said heaven wouldn't let any rain fall until the veterans' crops were ruined and they were forced to leave the state. Did you ever hear such nonsense? And blasphemy. Uh, that's blasphemy, all right, but I think it's a tip-off to what is probably the most amazing plot in history. A plot? Well, what do you mean, Mr. Kent? Well, it's just a foggy notion at the moment, Jerry. It'll sound wild and incredible, but... Will you please tell us what you're driving at, Clark? Oh, wait a minute, Lord. Let's go over this one step at a time. You came to Freeville to cover a simple human interest story on the drought, didn't you? Well, yes, of course. Well, when you but... tried to talk to the natives, they looked frightened and walked away without answering, right? 
Well, yes, but that's because practically everyone around Freeville works for Uncle Ed Clayton or has other reasons to be afraid of him. And they know he doesn't like strangers around, particularly reporters who would discover that the Honorable Mr. Clayton has practically set up a little Nazi Germany in this state. That's right, Mr. Kent. And that's why Clayton's men tried to get rid of Miss Lane and me in that quick sandbog when they caught us listening in on that speech that he made to his followers. No, Jerry. Uh -uh. Clayton knows that the rest of the country is pretty well aware of his being a rabble-rouser and hate monger. He wasn't afraid of your discovering that. Well, then why does he resort to secret meetings? Because he'd rather no one other than his faithful followers would know what he'd said about the drought. The drought? Mm -hmm. You mean that nonsense about his prayers causing it? That's right. Look, I may be thick, Clark, but I don't get it. Oh, neither do I. Well, look, why, despite this being the rainy season, and despite the fact that the weather reports called for rain practically every day for the past month, has there been no rain? I don't know, but... Mr. Kent, you don't really believe that Ed Clayton's prayers had anything to do with it, do you? Oh, of course not. But I'm not so sure that Ed Clayton himself doesn't have something to do with it. Are you kidding? But, well, you just Wait said a minute, that... Wait Jerry. You're... Clark, are you trying to say that you think Uncle Ed, by some some hocus-pocus or other, keeps the rain away from Freeville? That's my hunch, Lois. Oh, now, look, Clark. I told you it would sound wild and incredible. Wild and incredible? Why, it sounds... Crazy, mad, just out of this world. It certainly does. Well, I never Wait, heard I... anything so ridiculous in my whole life. Uh, look, Uncle but... Ed Clayton, the rain preventer. Well, I only and wa... that from you, a newspaper reporter. If you listen just for a listen moment, I'll... Listen For my money, Uncle Ed is simply taking advantage of an unusual drought to play on the superstitions and prejudices of the natives. I think that's the answer, kid. Clayton would do anything to get rid of us veterans because he knows that the men who fought Hitler won't stand for his setting himself up as a Hitler right here in the USA. Well, that's true, but... but... as for his being able to cause a drought, but just in order to break us and drive us out of the state, well, that's just plain silly. And how? Okay, you both had your say and you may be right, but before I say more, I'm going to take a little trip and I'd like you to come along, Lois. Where are you going? To the nearest weather observation station. Happen to know where that is, Jerry? Sure, that's in Rawlings, about 18 miles north of here. Fine. Now, well, wait I... a minute. Why do you want to go there, Clark? You called me a bum reporter a moment ago. Don't you, as a good reporter, think that 30 days of rain predictions followed by 30 days of drought deserves a statement from a meteorologist? Well, yes. How do we get to Rawlings, Jerry? Oh, that's easy. Just about every northbound train out of Freeville goes through Rawlings. Okay. Now, look, you lay low until we get back, Jerry. Okay, Mr. Don't Jones. worry. You fellas are not licked yet. Sit tight until you hear from us. Come on, Lois. <laughs> Leaving Jerry Barton, Kent and Lois go to the Freeville Depot and take a train to Rawlings. But a short time later, they're in the office of John Murray, chief county meteorologist, where they question the weatherman. John Murray, how can you explain the fact that your weather predictions have been wrong for 30 days? Well, frankly, Mr. Kent, I can't explain it. You see, our predictions are based on reports which come in constantly by teletype from as many as 1,000 to 1,500 observers. That many observers? That's right, Miss Lane. They are men stationed throughout the country at levels ranging from 1,000 to 30,000 feet above sea level to report on the precipitation, atmospheric pressure, wind velocity, and so on in their areas. Yes. Then we record all reports on surface synoptic and pressure charts. I see. From all that data assembled and charted, we're then able to predict with reasonable accuracy the weather in a given area up to 72 hours in advance. And how come you've been so wrong about Freeville? I can't understand it. Ordinarily, there's a good deal of rain in that area during this season. Well, would you call it a, a freak of nature? I can't give any other explanation. Usually, when such a phenomenon occurs, we can trace some warm air currents which evaporate the moisture in the saturated clouds, thus causing drought. But... Wait a minute. What, what, what's that about warm air currents, Mr. Murray? Well, during the war, our meteorologists in the African desert saw their predictions go haywire, then discovered that freak air currents, apparently coming from nowhere, suddenly spiraled up from the desert sand. I see. But there's no desert around Freeville. I know, Ken. There are mountains, of course, and they often affect the atmosphere and rain clouds. But mountains never caused a situation like this, did they? No, never to my knowledge. This drought has me stumped. Well, I guess that's that, Clark. Excuse me, Lois. Look, Mr. Murray, you say that warm air currents can evaporate the moisture in a saturated cloud? That's right. Well, have you ever heard of anyone being able to uh, create warm air currents in amounts large enough to affect rainfall? Oh, oh well, King. Oh, come now, Clark. Are you still harping on that nonsense? Now, just a minute, Now, Lois. stop being silly. Clark has the wild idea, Mr. Murray, that Lois. Uncle, uh, uh, that that somebody might be deliberately doing something to prevent the rain from falling over Freeville. Did you ever hear anything so absurd? Well, is it absurd, Mr. Murray? I'm afraid it is, Kent. There, you see? Of course, there are a lot of experiments being conducted. I won't say that in time precipitation won't be able to be controlled over a given area, but... But you don't think anyone's discovered a way of doing that yet? I'm afraid not. 
You know the old saying, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody can do anything about it. Are you satisfied now, Clark? Uh, not exactly, but it seems I'm overruled by experts. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Murray. You're quite welcome. I hope you won't be too hard on me in your newspaper. Oh, no, of course not. It isn't your fault. Right. Goodbye, and thanks again. Goodbye, Mr. Murray. Goodbye. Well, what do we do now? We didn't get much of a story to put on the wires, Clark. And, oh, if I know the chief, he's going to be hopping mad. Uh, if I could only find old Abner. What did you say? Abner Sykes, you know, the old Freeville telegrapher. Good grief, I forgot all about him. Weren't you able to find him, Clark? No, and that's another thing I can't understand. He just seems to have disappeared. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Well, that proves my theory, then. Hmm? What theory? That after somebody tried to shoot him, undoubtedly one of dear old Uncle Ed's hoodlums, Sykes just up and left Freeville. Well, could be, but that also proves my theory. What's your theory? That after Sykes knows something very important, something Uncle Ed Clayton didn't want him to tell us. And my hunch is that what he knows is the secret of the drought. What are you talking about, Clark? You just heard that it isn't a secret. It's a freak, a freak of nature. Maybe, but... Look, Lois, there's a nice-looking restaurant across the street. Go on over and have something to eat while you wait there for me, will you? Wait for you? Where are you going? I, uh, uh I've got a little idea I want to check. Oh, no. Now, now, go on. Be a good girl and have dinner without me. I'll be back soon. So long. Hurrying away from Lois, Clark Kent walks around the municipal building, stops in a dark areaway, and then strips to the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Well, maybe I am all wet, but I want to have a look around Freeville again just to double-check. Up! And away! Leaping up into the twilight sky, Superman rockets away to the Freeville area of village, farms, and spreading woodland, where, for several minutes, he moves slowly through the air, searching the terrain below him. Then he streaks away to the looming mountains, swooping and coasting above them, his keen eyes continuously probing. Finally, as the evening closes in, he shakes his head ruefully. That uh, looks as if Lois, Jerry Barton, and Mr. Murray were right and I was wrong, because there's nothing the least bit suspicious around here. This drought must be a natural one, freak of nature, so that's that. Huh, wait a minute. What's that far over there in the woods? It looks like... Yes, it is. Away! Calling on every ounce of speed in his muscle, Superman rockets away toward the distant woods, where something has excited his interest. What has he seen? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. You know, it seems like every time two or more kids get together these days, they start right off talking about those swell comic buttons in the new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. At school recess or after school or on weekends, you fellows and girls are mighty busy comparing notes on how many pep comic buttons you've collected so far. And trading duplicates, too. Boy, that's a load of fun. Maybe you have two little moose buttons, but you don't have a Superman yet. And then uh, maybe one of your friends has a duplicate Superman but needs the little moose. So you swap. And each one has a new comic button to add to his collection. And you know, the best part is, your fun keeps right on. Sure, because there are 18 different buttons in this new series. So, how's about asking Mom to get you some more Kellogg's Pet? You don't send in any money for these swell prizes, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you get a comic button every time you open a new package of Kellogg's Pet. That's Pep, the sunshine cereal. The good whole wheat flakes with a catchy sunshine flavor. So crisp and tender and fresh that, well, it makes you glad when breakfast time rolls around. Why, Pep tastes a doggone toasty and golden. Your appetite warms right up on a cold morning. So, gang, get your prizes and your good eating in P-E-P, -E -P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> As we rejoin him now, Superman has arrived over a patch of woods high on a mountain slope. Looking down, he observes a mass of flames whose flickering brightness had drawn his attention from far away. There's a cabin on fire. Uh-oh, a man inside the cabin, unconscious. Down to him. Down! Ah, there he is. Now, let's... Great Scott! It's the Freeville Telegrapher. Old Abner Sykes! For a startled moment, Superman stares at the unconscious old man for whom he had searched in vain. The one person he is certain can solve the riddle which has so far stumped him. The relation between the drought and Uncle Ed Clayton, the man of hate. Then a split second later, Superman streaks upward from the blazing cabin with Abner Sykes in his arms. 
Will the telegrapher live and be able to reveal what he knows about the mystery of the Freeville drought? We'll know more tomorrow, gang, so don't miss the next thrilling episode in this exciting story of mystery and intrigue. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow, same time, same station. Remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. For Superman is brought to you at the same time, Monday through Friday. Say, gang, breakfast is a picnic all year round when there's Kellogg's variety on the table. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages, each one a serve-yourself portion of one of your favorite Kellogg cereals. Different Kellogg cereals to choose from, and whatever you pick, you know it'll be crisp and fresh and good because it's Kellogg's. One day you'll want Kellogg's Pep, the next Rice Krispies, and then Corn Flakes, and so on down the line. So ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent and Lois Lane wait anxiously for the recovery of Abner Sykes, fully realizing that the old telegrapher possesses the only key to Freeville's mysterious and devastating drought. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's hard to tell who's having the most fun collecting those swell comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep. The fellas or the girls. Fact is, all you members of the gang are having a whale of a lot of fun, and there's a lot of rivalry to see whether fellas or girls can collect the most different buttons. Oh, it's almost like a race. And these pictures of your favorite comic strip characters are so doggone bright and smart looking, everybody wants to collect all 18 in the series. That's right. 18 different comic strip characters and all, like Brenda Starr and, and Cindy and Spud and the Little Moose and uh, Goofy and Beezy and Judy and Corky and Superman, of course. So you better hop to it, gang. And these exciting comic buttons are really easy to get. You just ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pet and look for your prize inside every package you open. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere, but you get one plus loads of good breakfast eating in every package of Kellogg's Pep. The whole wheat flakes with a catchy golden toasted flavor that always tastes like more. Pep's good for you, too. It has extra amounts of energy, vitamin B1, and good old sunshine vitamin D. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Incredible as it seemed, Clark Kent, who as we know is Superman, was unable to down to the suspicion that Uncle Ed Clayton, rabble-rousing ex-governor and senatorial candidate, was somehow responsible for the prolonged drought in the Freeville area, where 300 war veterans who strongly opposed Uncle Ed's un-American tactics had taken homesteads. After a thorough search of the area failed to verify his suspicions, however, Superman was about to admit he had been mistaken when he spotted a fire in a patch of woods on a distant mountain slope. Streaking there, he found a small cabin ablaze, and in the cabin, the unconscious figure of old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher who had recently disappeared. As we continue now in a restaurant many miles away, Lois Lane has been called to the telephone. Listen. Hello? That you, Lois? Yes, Clark. That's right. Listen. Look, want... Clark, I thought you were coming right back. Where are you? Well, about 80 or 90 miles away. 80 or 90 look... miles away? Yes, in the mountains. Clark, what it? are you talking about? How could you be that far away? You only left here a half an hour ago. Oh, look, Lois, will you please stop interrupting? This is important. But how... Oh, all right. What is it, Clark? I get this. The municipal building, which is across the street from where you are, should be deserted by now. Yes. Also, it'll be dark out in front. Well, what of it? If you'll walk across the street, a friend of ours will pick you up and bring you out here. 
What friend will bring me where? Will you please stop asking questions and do as you're told? We haven't any time to lose. You're certainly being mysterious, I must say. I don't see oh, what... Oh, Lois, why don't you cooperate Oh, for all right, all right. I'll pay my dinner check immediately and go across the street. And there, a little man with a long white beard and a magic carpet will be waiting for me, I suppose, right? And you're pretty close, but... What? Get going, Lois. I'll see you later. So long. So long. <laughs> Trust Clark Kent to be mysterious. And all the time, I'm sure he's just building atmosphere so he can keep me waiting out here for an hour and then show up with some cock and bull story about how to... Hope I didn't keep you waiting long, Miss Lane. Superman! That's right. You ready to take a little ride with me? Ride? With you? Uh-huh. Why, certain... Uh, wait a minute. What? Are you the friend Clark Kent said would call for me? Yes. Now, if you're ready... Well, where but... is Clark? Well... And since when are you running a taxi service for him? Look, Miss Lane, I'm afraid some people across the street have spotted me, and that means there'll be a crowd around us in a moment, so if you're ready, oh, I'll get going. Oh, yes. I, I'm sorry. I'm, yes, of course I'm ready. All right, up with you then. There. Now. Up and away! <laughs> You all right, Miss Lane? Oh, yes. Regular airplanes are going to seem pretty tame after this. And I take it you like Kent's taxi service. Yes. So that reminds me. What? What are you doing here? And where is Clark? And how do uh, you... Oh, one question at a time, Miss Lane. It just happens that the story you and Kent are working on interests me. Oh, you mean the story I mean about... Uncle Ed Clayton's attempt to rule this state as a tyrannical demagogue and to promote anti-racial hate makes him a menace to America and to everything America stands for. It certainly does. But look... About Clark. What? Apparently you were just in contact with him. What's well, he I just doing... made a little discovery, and I'm leaving Kent and you to follow it through. Really? What is it? You'll see for yourself in a moment. Hang on. Here we go down to those woods. Down! There we are, Miss Lane. Yes, but... But where are we? See that little cabin? Or the charred remains of a cabin just up the hill there? Oh, yes. Well, go on up. You'll find Clark Kent in there, and a surprise. A surprise? Yes. I'll see you later. But wait a minute, Superman. Kent will explain everything. Goodbye, Miss Lane. Up and away! Rocketing up from the little clearing, Superman disappears like a bolt into the sky. But unknown to Lois Lane, who hurries up the narrow winding path to the half-burned little cabin clinging to the side of the wooded mountain, the Man of Steel has plummeted to Earth on the other side of the cabin. There, swiftly resuming his guise and garb of Clark Kent, he slips around to the door just as Lois arrives, somewhat out of breath. Clark. Hello, Lois. What's going on here? What is this Come all inside. about? Got a surprise for you. Really? Mm -hmm. Superman said he discovered something. Is that it? You bet. Watch where you step, Lois. We've uh, had a little fire here, as you can see. A little fire? There's practically nothing left of this cabin. Now listen, Wait Clark. A look. <gasps> Who? Who's that man lying on the couch? Whom does it look like? What? Why, it's Abner Sykes. That's right. But but where did you find him? How are you he... feeling now, Mr. Sykes? Oh, might better. Good. Look, how did that you find... Superman feller get my condenser? Yes, he got it. Now, wait a minute. Okay, I'll set up the receiver then and... Oh! Nope, can't make it yet. Too weak. Well, you'd better rest a while. You had a bad time. Look, Clark, I wish you'd tell what me what... time is it? It's, uh... Just ten minutes of eight in the evening. Yes, and time you told got me what... a few minutes left to get my strength back then. Signals don't usually come in four eight. Tell me more about these signals, what Mr. Sykes. What in heaven's name are you talking about? And what are you doing here, Mr. Sykes? And why Hold on, Miss you... Lane. Don't nobody talk to me until I get my strength back. No, but listen. Won't say nothing. Better be quiet, Lois. Just relax for a few minutes. Relax? Good heavens, of all the maddening people I ever saw. Clark, you've got to tell me, what is all this? What is Mr. Sykes doing in these mountains in a burned-out cabin? Hiding out, for one thing, Lois. But why? And, also... and why did he leave Freeville so suddenly the other day? For the reason that you figured. He was afraid the same man or men who shot at him would try again. You mean Uncle Ed Clayton's men? I think so. That right, Mr. Sykes? He ain't ready to talk yet. Well, go on, Clark, you tell me. Why did Clayton's men try to shoot him? Because Mr. Sykes knows something. Something he was going to tell us. And unless I'm very much mistaken, it has something to do with the drought in Freeville. What do you mean? Well, that's what I want Mr. Sykes to tell us. Oh, well, listen, Mr. Sykes. Quiet. He ain't talking yet. Oh, for the love of Mike, how long is this... Easy, Lois. Wait a minute. Now, he did have a pretty rough time. 
You see, somebody hit him on the head a little while ago, knocked him unconscious, and then set this cabin on fire. Good heavens! Then how did you... Find... Well, I... Uh, I mean, Superman got here just in time to save him and, and save what's left of this cabin. Yeah, and he saved my shortwave receiver. That's the important thing. Oh? Are you ready to talk now? Uh, yep. Well, who struck you and set the cabin on fire? The scientist feller. And another one. Who? What scientist fella? Same one I went to see yesterday about them signals I've been picking up. Feller works for the county. What signals are you talking about, and why did you... Should have known better than to go to him when Uncle Ed gives out all the jobs in this county. You mean Mr. Clayton was responsible for this last attack on you, too? Yep. But why, Mr. Sykes? Just what is this all about? Dry spell in Freeville. I knew it. All right, keep talking, Mr. Sykes. What about the dry spell? Well, listen, I'm dead wrong, and I'm pretty sure I ain't now, count what happened to me. That dry spell ain't a natural one. It's being caused by some mechanical means. Now we're getting someplace. Keep talking, Mr. Sykes. His eyes gleaming, Clark Kent orders old Abner Sykes to continue talking, while Lois Lane sits by, a look of shocked amazement on her face. What does the old telegrapher mean? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, you've probably heard the older folks talk about perpetual motion. You know, something that never stops moving. Well, one young fellow told me the other day that he thinks that these comic buttons in the new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep are perpetual fun. Sure, no sooner do you add a new button to your collection than you're already on the lookout for another. And, of course, when you get a duplicate, why, you can swap with your friends. And these buttons are so terrific looking, you're proud to wear them pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. Take uh, Vitamin Flintheart, for instance, with his fuzzy fur coat and that slouch hat. Or Superman himself, complete with red cape and Superman insignia. Yes, sir, you'll want to collect all 18 of these new serious comic buttons. And you can do. Sure, easy as anything. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you'll find a comic button, an exclusive prize, in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And believe me, gang, you'll like these toasted flakes of good whole wheat with their catchy sunshine flavor. You'll want to eat a bowl of pep for breakfast every single morning. Delicious is the word for Kellogg's Pep. So ask Mom to keep you supplied with plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In his little half-burned cabin in the mountains, old Abner Sykes has just startled Clark Kent and Lois Lane by saying, Listen, I'm dead wrong. And I'm pretty sure I ain't now, count of what happened to me. That dry spell in Freeville ain't a natural one. It's being caused by some mechanical means. What? That's what I thought. Now can you tell us who's doing it, Mr. Sykes? Well, way I got it lined up, Mr. Kent, it's being caused by Uncle Ed Clayton. Clayton? To bust them war veterans off their homesteads and drive them out of the state. Oh, huh? nonsense. That's what clark has been saying, but it's too silly for words. No, it isn't, Lois. I told of you. Of course it is. How could Uncle Ed Clayton or any other human being cause a drought? Oh, I don't know. Do you, Mr. Sykes? Don't exactly know how yet, but I can prove Uncle Ed's doing it. How? You'll see. What time's it now? Uh, it's, uh, just two minutes to wait. No. Oh, well, just two minutes to go now, then. So I gotta work fast. Where's the condenser that Superman filler brought, eh? Mr. I've Kent? already installed it in your short wave set. Okay, then. Here goes. Here goes what? You'll hear in a minute, Miss Lane. Oh, now, look, Clark, I do think this is a lot of nonsense. Quiet, Lois. But, Clark, Please, nobody... Lois, be quiet for just a minute. Well, Mr. Sykes? Won't be long now, Mr. Kidd. Them signals should be coming in any second. What signals? You'll see. Oh, sure, we'll see. If you ask me, I think Lois, it's all... please. Oh, all right. Get ready, Mr. Kent. Here she comes. Tensely, Clark Kent and old Abner Sykes lean closer to the shortwave receiver. And despite her skepticism, Lois Lane leans forward, too. What are they about to hear? Can it be possible that Clark Kent's suspicions were correct? and that Uncle Ed Clayton, the rabble-rousing demagogue, is able to defy the forces of nature and cause a man-made drought? Tomorrow's episode is swift and exciting, so don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman.
Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, just think of the circus of fun, gang, when Mom sets Kellogg's variety out on the table at breakfast. There's the business of picking out your own favorite Kellogg's cereal from this handy white, green, and red package with the ten individual packages. You'll uh, take Kellogg's Corn Flakes or, or Pep or Rice Krispies or one of your other Kellogg favorites, and you'll have your own private box of cereal to open yourself. Then for Sister, there's the cutout doll on the bottom of the tray to dress up and to play all sorts of games with. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Superman, with the help of Abner Sykes, comes close to a solution of the mystery, Freeville's murderous bigots make plans to stop him at any cost. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. You know, fellas and girls tell me that it's almost like a birthday every time Mother opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. Because not only do you know that you're in for some mighty swell eating, but you also get a brand new bright-colored comic button. It's an exclusive prize from Pet. Maybe it'll be a true-to-life picture of Vitamin Flintheart, all dressed up in a, in a woolly fur coat and red scarf and black slouch hat. Or maybe Tess Trueheart, heart-shaped hat and long blonde hair and all. Maybe Superman himself, his red cape flying in the wind. And if it's a duplicate, well, that's even more fun because then you can trade with your pals. So, gang, you better get busy. Just ask Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pet. That's right, you don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these terrific comic buttons anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's Pep and look for your prize inside every package you open. Pep's a prize when it comes to good eating, too. It tastes a doggone sunny and golden. It's as cheerful as bright golden sunshine at the breakfast table. Why, your very first spoonful of those toasted whole wheat flakes tells you this is going to be good. Yes, sir. Pep's the dish for breakfast these winter mornings. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Working on a hunch, Clark Kent has set out to prove that Uncle Ed Clayton... The rabble-rousing ex-governor who is now a candidate for the Senate is somehow responsible for the unnatural drought that threatens the existence of several hundred war veteran homesteaders. As Superman, he saved the life of old Abner Sykes, the aged Freeville telegrapher, who, because he knows too much, had been struck on the head and left unconscious in a burning cabin in the mountains. Sykes blamed the attack on men connected with Uncle Ed Clayton and confirmed Kent's hunch when he said, Now I'm sure Uncle Ed's causing this drought, and I'll prove it. As we continue, in the half-burned little mountain cabin, Abner Sykes has turned on his shortwave radio receiver. To his companions, Clark Kent and Lois Lane, the elderly telegrapher explains... Really? Eight o'clock. In a minute, you'll be hearing them signals. What signals? Radio signals I pick up every night at this time. That is, when there's been rain predicted for Freeville. So what? I don't understand what that has to do... Eh, just you listen, Miss Lane. Now, here they come. Well, I don't hear anything except a lot of static. Don't you hear that? Dit dat, dit dat. Yes. Is that but... the signal you were talking about? Nope. That there's the code from the sending station, Mister Kent. The signals follow right after. Oh, I see. They'll be coming through now. Say, what's happening? Yeah, reception's petering out. That's what. Don't you hear? Why, yes. What's but... the matter? I don't know. Never done that before. 
Hey, something's wrong. Where's my screwdriver? Oh, now, look, Clark. Fun's fun. But after all, when two grown men actually believe that another man, a human being, can cause a drought, that's too much. I know it seems cockeyed, Lois, but I tell what you, you that you it... tell me makes no more sense than what Uncle Ed tells the superstitious backwoods people, that the drought was sent by heaven to punish the war veterans because some of their parents were born in a foreign country. It's the same thing at all, Lois. This is a scientific possibility. Yeah, you ain't as so smart as I thought you was, Mr. Kent. Why? What do you mean? Well, you put this condenser in wrong, that's why. Oh? Oh, bright boy. That's why we lost the code. Yeah, have it fixed in the jiffy, though. Sorry, I messed it up. Does that mean we lose those signals you were talking about? Nope. They usually last an hour or two. An hour or two? That long? Yep, sometimes three, four hours. There. That ought to do it. I hope so. Yeah, turn around again and see. I don't hear the code, Mr. Sykes. Nope, near the signals either. They don't understand it. I, uh, I believe this is where we came in, Jim. Now, wait, wait, wait. I got an idea. XC3, calling HJ4. XC3, calling HJ4. Come in, Doc. Oh, now that's the first bit of sense I've heard here this evening. You boys need a doctor, all right. Oh, Lois. XC3, HJ4. XC3, HJ4. Come in, Doc. Whom are you calling, Mr. Sykes? Another radio ham. Lives over to Rollins. I want to ask him... To... Oh, there he is. Evening, Doc. Listen, you been getting them funny signals tonight? Yes, I have, Abner. Came in promptly about eight as usual. Did you get them? Nope. There was something wrong with my condenser. Hey, you hear anything to count for their not being on now? Well, the last direction said something about 30 miles. I've noticed that there's usually a break when they say more than a few miles. What is this? Yes, that must be it, then. You're much obliged, Doc. Good night. Good night, Abner. Look, Mr. Sykes, just what is all this double talk now, about? Now, wait, Mr. Kent. Them signals will be on any minute again. You just be patient. In just a minute, I'm going to be fresh out of patience. Because I still can't believe that these signals, or whatever they are, have anything to do with Uncle Ed causing a drought. Oh, is that so? And how come when I told that feller in the county agricultural office about them signals and told him I figured they had something to do with the drought, he followed me back here and tried to kill me, hey? He did? Yep, he did. And I figured it's because he owes his job to Uncle Ed Clayton, just like everybody else in the county office does. So he hot-footed it to Uncle Ed with what I said, and Ed told him to get me. Hey, what do you think now, eh? I think that's a long jump to an even longer conclusion. Maybe not, Lois. Oh, now, look, Clark. I realize that Uncle Ed is a demagogue, the most vicious sort of hate monger and rabble rouser. But to think that he or, or any other mortal can stop rain from falling... Wait a minute, Lois. Wait a minute. Isn't that the cold coming through again, Mr. Sykes? Yep, it is. Sit tight, because now you're really going to hear something. Tensely, Clark Kent and old Abner Sykes leaned toward the shortwave loudspeaker, waiting for what the old man called the signals to come through. But meanwhile, in what he refers to as his simple little place, but which is in reality a magnificent colonial mansion set in broad acres overlooking a river, Uncle Ed Clayton sits in his library with Fred Leonard, editor of the Freeville Gazette. Uh, trouble with you, Fred, is that you're a warrior. Maybe, but What I... if that Jerry Barton fella and the newspaper gal did get away? Well, they can't hurt us none. I'm not so sure, Mr. Clayton. They heard you make that speech at the rally today, you know. So what? Uh, they can't prove nothing. Not even that I had anything to do with the boys leading them into that quicksand bog. Anyhow, all I care about is that no-count Abner Sykes being taken care of. You, uh... You are sure he was taken care of, ain't you, Fred? Well, Clarkson says so, Mr. Clayton. You can depend on him. Well, then, like I say, there ain't nothing to worry about. Why, them war veterans will be busted and pulling up stakes in another couple of weeks, and then we'll have things all our own way again, just the way we always did. I hope you're right. I know I am. And besides... Yeah, we'll answer the phone. Ed Clayton speaking. Oh? Oh, yes, home are you? Huh? What's that? Give me that again. What's the matter? Just a minute, Fred. You sure about that, Homer? You did, huh? Okay. Good thing you called me. Right. Bye. What is it, Mr. Clayton? What is it? Well, just you listen to this. That old coot Abner Sykes ain't no more dead than we are. What? That's right, son. Homer just heard him talk on this shortwave radio transmitter. But, but that's impossible. Clarkson's... Clarkson lied, consign him! 
and he'll pay for this. That don't matter right now. Them two Daily Planet reporters, Clark Kent and Miss Lane, are still around, and they're friendly with Ab Sykes. I know so, they are. So what you got to do, Fred, is personally see to it that old Abner don't tell him what he knows. Understand? You mean you want me I to... mean you got to take care of Ab Sykes yourself tonight. But, Governor, Don't I... give me no butt, son. Abner's out to that cabin of his right now. Now, you get in your car with Hank and drive out there lickety-split. And when you get there, well, you know what to do. I know what to do, Mr. Clayton. Good. And just in case them Daily Planet reporters is out there with Abner, we'll just make sure they stay there. Forever. What will happen at the little cabin in the mountains when the murder-bent Fred Leonard meets with our friends? We'll be back in a moment with the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, if you should happen to help your mother with the weekend shopping, and if she should happen to need a new package or two of Kellogg's Pet, don't you forget to remind her, because this sunny golden toasted cereal makes a real hit for breakfast these winter mornings. And because that's how you get those snappy comic buttons in that new series that all the gang's collecting. That's right, you get a comic button every time you open a package of Pet. Real humdingers they are, too. Bright colored pictures of your favorite comic strip characters on sturdy white enameled metal buttons that you can wear pinned right on your jacket or your dress or cap. There's Cindy and the Little Moose and, and Superman. Eighteen different buttons in all. So you better get busy on your collection. Make sure that Mom keeps stocked up on Kellogg's Pep because that's the only way you can get these exciting prizes. You don't send it any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But you'll find a comic button in every package of pep you open. That's Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Pep, the whole wheat flakes with a come on flavor for breakfast. A golden toasted and crisp that, well, you practically can't resist it. Pep's good for you, too. Sure, Mom knows that. Makes a grand dish to, to give that right start to your winter days. So remind her to stock up on P E P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> In Abner Sykes' little mountain cabin, the old telegrapher and Clark Kent are listening tensely to voices issuing from the loudspeaker of the shortwave radio. Even Lois Lane, who has been skeptical, is interested. Hey, listen, Mr. Kent. I think them signals are about to commence again. I'm listening. About six hey. miles south, southwest of K. Over. Did you hear that? Six miles south, southwest of K. Over. Six miles southwest. What does that mean, Clark? Mm. Not quite sure, Lois, but I think. And sharp three miles north. And watch drifting just off east. Over. Three miles north, then drifting east. Any more? Over. Oh, oh, Quiet, Lois, please. That's all for now. Check from pass. Over and out. Right. We'll check further from pass. Over and out. What gibberish. K. R. Pass. I wonder... Well, might as well turn it off. Won't be no more signals for a while. You wonder what, Clark? About all those peculiar directions. Tell me, Mr. Sykes, do you know of any, uh, well, towns or mountains or something in this section which begin with K and R? K and R? Uh -huh. I know there's a Rawlings, Clark. Say, that's right. It's not far from Freeville. Yep, and there's a Kennecott Junction, about 30 miles north of here. Good, and pass. That might refer to a mountain pass. Might be good time pass, top of Mount Peel. Good. I think I've got the answer. Really? What is it? No time to explain now. i got to move fast. You two stay here. Where are you hey? going, Clark? Got a little job to do. I won't be long. You wait here. Hurrying from the little cabin, Clark Kent stops in the darkness and swiftly resumes his true identity of Superman. Then... If I'm right, I'll have the answer to the drought tonight. Up! Up! And away! Leaping up from the dark mountain slope, Superman rockets away through the starlit sky. And in his haste, he does not look backward through the half-hidden rutted road climbing to Abner Sykes' cabin, on which, at this moment, a car containing two armed men is toiling up the slope. Uncle Ed, the demagogue, has ordered Fred Leonard to do away with old Abner tonight and to do likewise to any Daily Planet reporter found with him. What will happen to old Abner and to Lois Lane as Superman speaks farther and farther away? And what will the Man of Steel discover on his meteoric flight? Monday's suspenseful climax is full of thrills and surprises, fellows and girls, so don't fail to be with us. Tune in Monday, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman.
Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, get a load of this. In Kellogg's Variety, there were ten individual packages of cereal for you to choose from. Every morning you can have your own private box of cereal. You can pick it out yourself. And it'll be one of your Kellogg favorites, like pepper or Rice Krispies or Corn Flakes. Boy, that's a circus of fun. That's Kellogg's Variety, the handy white, green, and red package with all those crisp, fresh Kellogg cereals that you like so much. Some flaked, some shredded, some popped, made from corn, wheat, or rice. Just be sure it's Kellogg's. Ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman uncovers the key to the plot behind Freeville's drought, he is unaware that Lois Lane and Abner Sykes are face to face with death. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, if somebody should just hand you a full set of that new series of 18 comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pet all at once, it wouldn't be half so much fun as collecting them right along. Of course, you're always mighty proud to wear these slick-looking buttons on your jacket or your dress or cap, but you'd hate to miss the thrill of seeing which button is inside when Mom opens a new package of pet. And you'd sort of feel out of it if you couldn't trade duplicates with your pals and, and sort of race with them to see who can collect the most different buttons. Yes, sir, it's loads more fun to collect these pep comic buttons one by one. Brenda Starr and, and Goofy and Beezy and Superman and all the rest. And, you know, they're so easy to get. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. You just ask Mom to get you plenty of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep, and look for a new comic button inside every package you open. And look for some mighty terrific eating, too, because these good whole wheat flakes are loaded with catchy sunshine flavor that invites you right back for more, which is a mighty good thing because Pep's so good for you with added energy vitamin B1 plus good old sunshine vitamin D that helps build strong bones and teeth. So get your good eating and your exciting prizes, gang, from P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Incredible as it seems to Lois, Clark Kent suspects that Uncle Ed Clayton, political hate monger and candidate for the Senate, is somehow responsible for the prolonged drought in the Freeville area, an unusual and disastrous drought which is bankrupting hundreds of war veteran farmers. As Superman, Kent saved the life of Abner Sykes, the elderly telegrapher who had been attacked by Uncle Ed's henchmen and left to die in his burning mountain cabin. Then old Abner told Kent and Lois Lane of what he called strange signals that he picked up on his shortwave radio. And when Kent, too, heard the mysterious signals, he left to investigate as Superman. Meanwhile, learning that old Abner was still alive, Uncle Ed sent two men to do away with him. And as we continue now... The men have stopped their car at the foot of a narrow, rutted mountain road, at the crest of which, silhouetted against a pale moon, is the half-burned little cabin in which Lois and Abner Sykes await the return of Kent. Listen. Okay, Hank. Get out. What's the idea, Fred? Why don't we drive right up to the cabin? Because we're playing it safe. Come on, now, get out. I don't get it, Fred. Ain't nothing to this job. Ain't nobody but that old cool Abner Sykes up to the cabin. Can't tell. Those reporters might be with him. What reporters? Those two from Metropolis. Clark Kent and the Lane Girl. Oh, them. Well, if they are there, we'll take care of them, too. Right. Uh, don't walk so far out on the road. Moon shining down on it. They might look down from the cabin and see us. Not much chance of that. Ain't much moon. We're not taking any chances. This job was messed up once today. Uncle Ed won't like it if it's messed up again. It won't be. Not with me on the job. That's what you said this afternoon. 
And you're going to get rid of the lame girl and that war veteran, Jerry Barton. I know, I know. Look, I can't figure that out, Fred. Why, Charlie and me walked them almost up to the quicksand bog and made them keep going. I just can't figure out how they come to be still alive. You must have messed it up somehow. That's why Uncle Ed told me to handle this business tonight. Who do you think? What's the matter? Somebody just opened the door of the cabin. You see? Yeah. Hey, it's a gal. Uh Uh-huh. Can't be sure from here, but I think it's that reporter. It is, huh? Well, just step out of the way, Fred. I'll take care of her right now. Put your rifle down, you fool. Why? I can't miss it from here. Put the gun down, I said. You want to warn old Abner and maybe that other reporter, Kent, that we're here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. I know I am. Don't move now. She's looking around. Maybe she heard the car pull up. No, I don't think so. She went back in the cabin. Come on, Hank. Okay. But watch your step. I don't want them to hear us until we open the cabin door and walk in. Proceeding with caution, the would-be assassins approach closer and closer to the tiny cabin where Lois Lane and Abner Sykes await the return of Clark Kent. But meanwhile, having searched over Rawlings and Kennecott Junction, the two locations identified in the mysterious shortwave radio signals, Kent, as Superman, is now stationed in a rugged, windy pass atop Mount Peel, the loftiest range in the area, about 60 miles from Abner Sykes' cabin. Well, this is the third location mentioned in that mysterious code. I've been here 15 minutes, but I haven't seen a thing yet. Maybe Sykes and I misinterpreted those radio signals. Well, unless something happens soon, I'll have to give up and go... Wait a minute, what's that? Sounds like a plane. Yes, I was pretty sure a plane was mixed up in this. Now, where? I can hear it, but I can't see it. Strange. It's coming closer. It's held by the sound. I still can't see it. Wait a minute. I think I see it now. Yes, dead ahead and flying high. A small cabin job, camouflaged. Well, this is very interesting. I want a better look at that plane. Up and away! Leaping high from the mountain pass, Superman streaks toward the small, camouflaged cabin plane, which cruises through the dark sky. Then, checking his meteoric flight above the plane, the Man of Steel hovers closely above it, unseen. His keen eyes probing the hull of the ship to observe the two men in the cabin. His amazingly acute hearing attuned to their conversation. Where's the next one, Emery? Should That's be dead ahead in line with the pass if those last directions were accurate. Well, they haven't been wrong yet. No. There it is. A little above and off to the left. See it, Carson? Yeah, I see it. Get ready. All set. Okay, here we go, then. Now, where are they going? I don't see... Uh Uh-oh, I think I get it. Well, I guess I'll just follow them for a while. Away! They dove right into this cloud. Something's dropping from the plane. Little pellets. Can't tell what they are, but I've got a hunch. Oh, there they go out of the cloud. I'd better listen to their conversation again. Away! That's what you think, brother. <laughs> Plenty of rain up here, huh? You said it. Plenty. Yes, it is raining right behind us. Well, this confirms my suspicions because I had a hunch they were doing it this way. Just to make sure, I'll watch and wait for a double check. What's next to old Uncle Ed's boy, son? Uncle Ed, eh? Let's see. Here we are. About three miles to east. Three miles to east. Right. Here we go. Three miles to east. Oh, yes, I see it. Now I'll confirm my hunch about their method of operation. There it is, Em. A nice big one. Those homesteaders can sure use that. Yeah, but they'll never get a chance to. Get ready to take her down. Okay. No, I think not, boys. I've seen enough. Now I think I'll join you. Down to that plane. Down. What? What the... Emery, look. Hey, Jim. Oh, what? Permit me to introduce myself, gentlemen. My name is Superman. Who has Superman? All right. At the moment, the protector of rain-bearing clouds. Ah, 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 I wouldn't go for that pistol if I were you, Mr. Emery. That's the good little man. Hand it over. Thank you. Take her down, Mr. Carson. I said take her down, please. 
No, not up into that rain cloud. As you pointed out a moment ago, the war veterans in Freeville will be glad to see it. And this time they're going to get it. Because from now on, Uncle Ed's man-made drought is ended. Now, now look here. Very clever of you to make the clouds spill their moisture before reaching Freeville. Look, we didn't mean any harm, Superman. That's right. You see, I... Meant no harm. I suppose your ingenious method of creating a drought, your attempt to ruin several hundred war veterans who fought for their country is your idea of a joke, eh? No, no, you, you don't understand. You... I understand everything, my whining friends. Take this plane down it. No, wait a minute. On second thought, head for Abner Sykes' cabin. I believe you know where that is, Carson. <laughs> who, me? Why, why, no, Stop I... Stop lying. I know you tried to murder old Abner today. No, no, I didn't. Head for the cabin, I said. We'll let Mr. Sykes and Miss Lane be in on the last act of this dirty little play. Now go on. Open it up and make time. Grimly, Superman directs the two trembling henchmen of Uncle Ed Clayton toward Abner Sykes' little cabin, 50 miles away, where, at this moment, Lois Lane and the elderly telegrapher are in deadly peril. Stand by for the tense climax of today's episode. Say, you know something I've noticed lately? Well, the girls in the gang have a few tricks up their sleeves when it comes to displaying their collection of comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. Some of them pin them in sort of formations or designs on their jackets or dresses. Of course, uh, it doesn't really matter how you wear your pep comic buttons as long as you wear them because you want everybody to see how many you've collected and how smart looking they are, too. Why, the pictures of your favorite comic strip characters look so real, why, they could almost speak. Old friends like Judy and Corky and, and Superman himself. So it's no wonder that both fellas and girls want to collect all 18 buttons in this new series. And they're easy to get, you know. Sure, you just remind Mom to get you a package or two of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep, and you'll find a comic button inside every package you open. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these swell prizes anywhere. But you get them, along with a mighty delicious dish for breakfast, in packages of the toasted whole wheat flakes with that catchy sunshine flavor. Yes, sir, gang, Pep's a prize itself, but it comes to good eating. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In Abner Sykes' little cabin, Lois Lane has begun to be worried over the absence of Clark Kent. Returning from the door, she says to the old telegrapher, I'm worried, Mr. Sykes. I can't understand where Clark is. The way I size Mr. Kent up, he's a mighty smart young fellow, Miss Lane. Uh, you don't have to worry none about him. But how could he investigate those radio signals at night and in these mountains? Yeah, I don't know, but like I say, I, I reckon he's smart enough to look out for himself. Well, maybe. But just the same, I can't help being worried. And if he doesn't come back right away, I'm going out to look for him. Well, who oh, is that? that must be Clark now. Oh, no, no, Miss Lane, it isn't Kent at all. <laughs> Wait, hey, what in tarnation? Good heavens. Put your hands up, Abner. Mr. Leonard. Yes, and Uncle Ed's no count man, Charlie. Hey, now, look here, you Shut two. Up, Abner. What do you two want? Why are you pointing those guns at us? Can't you guess, Miss Lane? Why, why, no. Well, this is really the end of the trail for you, Miss Lane. And for Abner Sykes, too. Oh, no. It's set to let him have it, Hank. Her face drained of color Lois Lane looks at the rifles in the hands of Fred Leonard and Hank Rifles that are pointed steadily at her and Abner Sykes Superman, hardly 50 miles away, could cover the distance to the cabin with the speed of light But at present, unaware of his friend's peril The Man of Steel is in a plane Which will require several minutes to reach the little mountain cabin So what will happen to Lois and old Abner? We'll find that out tomorrow, gang as well as just what is the secret method of preventing rainfall discovered by Superman. So don't fail to be with us then. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, how'd you like to pick out your own favorite Kellogg's cereal every morning and open your own individual package yourself? 
Well, ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of your favorite Kellogg cereals like Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pep. And you know they're good because you've always liked Kellogg cereals. And every day you get your choice and you treat yourself to one of your favorite Kellogg cereals for breakfast. So ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman exposes the bigoted Ed Clayton and saves Freeville from inevitable deterioration, alarming news awaits his return to Metropolis. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, I'll bet nowadays when Mom asks you to run an errand to the grocery store, you start out like a streak of lightning because she's pretty sure to be sending for some Kellogg's Pet. Folks like it that well for breakfast. And that means another bright-colored comic button to add to your collection of that exciting new series. There were 18 new and different buttons at all, you know. Old-time favorites like Judy and Corky and, and Pat Patton, Tess Trueheart, Chief Brandon, and, and Vitamin Frenthart, and Superman himself. And say, if you happen to get a duplicate, well, that's even more fun because then you can swap with your pals. And you know the best part is you don't have to send in a single penny to get these keen-looking buttons, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. They come only as prizes, one in every package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. That's the come-on dish for breakfast, you know, the whole wheat flakes with a catchy sunshine flavor that really tickles your taste like anything. Why, a bowl of Kellogg's Pep looks a doggone sunny and golden and tastes a sunny and golden toasted that, well, you just show me a fellow or girl who can resist eating hearty. So ask Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. Superman's belief that the drought in the Freeville area was mechanically induced in order to ruin a community of farmer war veterans was startling substantiated when the Man of Steel intercepted a camouflaged cabin plane which was performing strange gyrations in the sky. Then, from the occupants of the plane, he learned the mystery of the drought and the fact that Uncle Ed Clayton, a hate-mongering senatorial candidate, was behind it. But at the same time, unknown to Superman, Lois Lane and Abner Sykes were waiting for him in the old telegrapher's mountain cabin or in grave danger from two of Uncle Ed's henchmen. And as we continue now, Superman is in the camouflaged plane with the two captured pilots heading toward the cabin some 40 miles away. Suddenly, topping a tall ridge, the Man of Steel's X-ray vision pierces the dark miles ahead and reveals a shocking scene. Listen. Great Scott. Two men aiming rifles at Lois and Mr. Sykes. Out oh, and away! Busting open the cabin door, Superman leaps from the plane, leaving the two pilots to stare after him open-mouthed as he flashes through the starry sky like a meteor whirled from its orbit. With the speed of light, the figure in red and blue rushes down upon the tiny cabin, where at that instant, facing the guns in the hands of Ed Clayton's henchman, Lois Lane gasps. No, don't, don't shoot! Don't waste your breath, Miss Lane. Them fellers work for Ed Clayton. He won't stop at nothing, not even murder. You're right, Abner. Uncle Ed's word is law in this here state. And he says you and this newspaper gal dies. So here you come. You mean here I come? My glory! Superman. Up with those guns! Seizing the rifles of the would-be assassins, Superman thrusts them upward, even as they squeeze the triggers and the deadly leaden pellets scream up through the burned cabin roof. Then, not pausing, Superman seizes the pop-eyed gunmen by the scruffs of their necks, wraps their heads sharply together, and as they fall unconscious, he turns to Lois and Sykes. I'm going to take these two characters with me. You, Miss Lane, and Mr. Sykes take their car and drive to state police headquarters at the county seat. Clark Kent will be waiting for you there. But, Superman... Up and away! Now I must pick up that plane again because the evidence I need is in it. Oh, great Scott, where is... Uh Uh-oh, there it is. 
and the pilot's making a desperate attempt to get away. Well, I'm sorry, my friends. You're coming back with me to face the music. Away! Zooming down on the fleeing plane, Superman dumps the two unconscious would-be assassins in with the now panicky flyers. Then, grasping the plane's landing gear, he propels the aircraft with the speed of light toward the county airport. And a few minutes later, he delivers all four of Clayton's men to the state police. Meanwhile, in the sumptuous library of his palatial mansion on the river, Clayton is listening to startling news on his telephone. What? Rain? In Freeville? Well, that can't be! I, I can't understand it! Hey, you don't have to tell me the rain will save them veterans. I know that too well. Yeah, hey, you darn tootin', I'll see about it. And right this minute, something went wrong, but I'm gonna... I'm afraid you won't do anything about it, Mr. Clayton. What? Uh, oh, uh, uh, look, uh, I, uh, I'll call you back later, Homer. Bye. <laughs> well, well, if it ain't my old friend, Mr. Cant. Mighty nice of you to drop in on me, sir. I don't think you'll feel the same way about that when you hear well, why. Well, if it isn't Miss Lane and my old friend Major Renshaw of the state police. Hello, Miss Clayton. <laughs> We've come here to... Why, well, nothing makes me so happy as to have my good friends around me. <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of the blessings of these fine old United States. A man can get together with his friends in peace and freedom. You can skip the flag waving, Clayton. Yes, Mr. Clayton. You can let your hair down now. <laughs> you sure are amusing people. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, you, oh, let me offer you some refreshments. You know, nothing elaborate, you understand. I'm a poor, simple man, oh, but brother, uh, I'll, I'll be state. proud to serve you what I can. Wait a minute. Stay where you are, Mr. Clayton. We've hey. got something to say to you. Oh, hey. you, you have? Yes. Ah. For one thing, we wanted to tell you that it's raining in Freeville. Oh, is that so? Hell, yeah. well, that's fine. Yeah, it's wonderful. What? Yeah. You know, you know, I've been worrying about them poor homestead and war veterans of uh, uh, being busted by the drought. And is that why you yeah. caused the drought, Mr. Clayton? I? I caused the drought? <laughs> that's a good joke, son. <laughs> really? Well, we don't think it's so funny. We yeah. certainly don't. You see, Mr. Clayton, we know all about your so clever plan. We learned about it from your two plane pilots, Carson and Emery. They confessed everything. Eh? Uh, confessed, you say? That's right. Yes, they admitted they'd been hired by you to fly into the rain clouds before the clouds reached the Freeville area. Then, also at your orders, they dropped dry ice, which resulted in saturating the moisture-laden clouds to a point where they released their rain at once, and always on the other side of the mountains. Oh, now, now, uh, you must know that's preposterous, son. Why, that's... Oh, it's... no, it isn't. I've just found out that the same thing was done as an experiment in upstate New York a few months ago, and that's where you must have gotten your idea. Why, why, why that's ridiculous, I say. No why, use, you... Clayton. Your men confessed. But I... What's more, we located a shortwave radio shack at the edge of your own estate. Well, your man was in contact with an observer some distance away, and from which he radioed the direction of the approaching rain clouds to your pilots in the plane. Incidentally, your radio man and the observer have confessed, too. Now, are you ready to come along with me quietly, Mr. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute, friends. Wait a minute. Why, uh, this is obviously a plot against me. Yes, sir. My enemies are trying to do me in. My political enemies, that is. Oh, come on, Now, Mr. why should I do a thing like this? Why, why, why should I cause a drought to injure the citizens of my own beloved state? Your own beloved state. Don't make me laugh. Why, Miss Lane? Wait, you did this deliberately to ruin the war veterans who'd settled on homesteads here. You wanted to bankrupt them and so drive them out of the state. I didn't do such thing, Kent. Why, you I feared I... them because you knew that men who had fought for America wouldn't stand for the kind of un-American government you'd set up when you were governor. A kind of government you now wanted to perpetuate as senator. Why, why, how dare you call me un-American, sir? Why, I'll fight to the last drop of my blood for the grand old Constitution. You would, eh? Well, the Constitution guarantees equal rights to every American, regardless of race or creed or color. But you've been trying to deprive the veterans of their simple right to make an honest living. That ain't true. It is true. I know because I heard you stir up the backwoods folks against the veterans by saying that the boys were foreigners because some of their parents were born abroad. Now, you look here. You're making a big mistake. Oh, no, I'm not, Mr. Clayton. Don't I Don't waste that... your breath on him, Lois. He's licked now, stripped of all power in this state, and so is his party. Oh, am I? Right. And it's a safe bet you'll spend the rest of your life in jail. All right, come along, Clayton. Oh, no, Major. I ain't going with you. Don't be a fool, Clayton. Don't move any of you. Look out, Major. He's got a gun. Yes, I have. I aim to use it, too. Put that gun down, Clayton. No, I ain't a putting it down till I put a bullet in each one of you. Cause Uncle Ed Clayton ain't a never going to no jail. No, sir. He. Listen to me. Be sensible, Clayton. I'm done listening, Major. You're all done living. Yes, you and these two pesky reporters. Wait, Clayton. Don't move, Kenton. You either, Major. 
Now, permit me to say goodbye, brother Americans. Moving back a step, Uncle Ed Clayton levels his pistol at Clark Kent, Lois Lane at Major Renshaw. And as Kent hesitates, not knowing how to act without revealing himself as Superman, the man of hate's finger begins to squeeze the trigger. What will happen? We'll return in a moment to find out. So stand by. You know, gang, all the time we're hearing about young fellows and girls who were hurt or killed in traffic accidents. Now, uh, maybe you think, it can't happen to me. Well, it can happen to you if you're not careful. That's why Mom and Dad are always cautioning you about things like jaywalking and, and playing in the streets and, and hitching rides on cars or trucks. It just doesn't pay to take a chance. And say, uh, about riding your bicycle, here are a few don'ts to keep in mind. Don't ride with two people on a bike. And don't ride your bike in the dusk or darkness without front and rear lights. And don't shoot out into the street from behind a parked car. And don't race another bicycle on the sidewalk. These things are important, gang. Don't give an accident a single chance to catch up with you. In the library of his mansion, Uncle Ed Clayton has leveled a pistol at Clark Kent Lois Lane at Major Renshaw of the state police. But just as Clayton is about to squeeze the trigger, Clark Kent goes into action. His foot, guided by muscles of steel, jerks backward, and the rug on which they all stand sweeps backward with him, spilling Ed Clayton, Major Renshaw, and Lois Lane in a sprawling heap. The pistol shot goes wildly into the wall. Then Clayton speaks no more as Kent, hurling himself forward, throws a smashing blow at the chin of the infuriated demagogue. A moment later, Ed Clayton, unconscious, is handcuffed by Renshaw. Nice work, Kent. It certainly was. Why, Clark, you... You were wonderful. That from you, Lois? Yes, from me. And I owe you an apology, too. Oh, no, this is too much. Everything you said about this story out here was right. But I sneered at you and I... No, wait a minute. Stop, Lois. You're turning my head. Look, why don't you get on Clayton's phone and give this story to Perry White? I'm sure Major Renshaw will excuse us. Why, sure. Go right ahead. You two have earned a scoop. Clayton will be quiet until the highway patrol car gets here to take him away. Thanks, Major. Go ahead, Lois. Call the plan. No, you call, Clark. After all, it is your story. Now I know I'm dreaming. Look, I tell you what. We'll split my life. Okay, it's a deal. Right. And thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till the chief gets a load of this story. It'll curl the few hairs he has left on his head. Sorry, Chief. Major Renshaw's waiting for a patrol car to take Clayton to the calaboose now, and Lois and I are going with him. Yeah. What? You kidding? What's up, Clark? What do you mean I should come back and leave Lois here? What's... Le- what? When was this? What, what, Clark? Just a moment, Lois. Yes, I hear you, Chief. I see. Well, that does make a difference. What? What makes a difference? Right, I'll come back at once, Chief. Clark. Be there in a few minutes. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll leave at once. Right. So long. What is it, Clark? You have to finish up the story down here alone, Lois. I've got to get back to Metropolis in a hurry. But why? What happened? No time to tell you. So long. See you later. Rushing away from the surprised Lois Lane, Clark Kent leaves Ed Clayton's house by the rear door, strips off his business suit, and then as Superman rockets up into the air, bound for Metropolis. What did Editor Perry White tell Kent that caused him to leave in such haste? What has happened in Metropolis? We can tell you this much, gang. Superman and you are in for the surprise of your lives tomorrow when the Man of Steel confronts one of the most baffling adventures of his entire career. So whatever you do, don't fail to hear tomorrow's episode. Tune in. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, you can save Mom a lot of work and give yourself a load of fun with Kellogg's Variety at breakfast. Sure, open up one of those individual boxes of your favorite Kellogg cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the Kell Bowl Pack, and it saves washing dishes. And it's more fun than a picnic. You know, Kellogg's Variety is the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of favorites like Kellogg's Pep and Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes. But be sure Mom gets Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. 
This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time, transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now in the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of Trophy Room. beast and the scream of a woman. Tarzan grasped a hanging vine and hurled himself into the middle level of jungle growth. Swinging from tree to tree with incredible speed, he neared the spot where a beautiful blonde girl crouched in fear, a few feet from an angry lioness. On the ground, between the girl and the she-lion, lay a rifle. Now the girl gathered courage and reached out for the weapon, but the lioness, seeming to sense her intentions, struck out with cruel talons, breaking the girl's slender arm. The scent of blood was strong now, and the lioness leaped forward. But a metal-tipped arrow, seeming to come from nowhere, caught the lioness in midair and plunged deep into its savage heart. You've spoiled everything. I've spoiled everything by, by saving your life? I could have reached the gun. I would have reached it. I see. Well, then I apologize for interfering. Apologies won't help now. I have no intention of claiming the animal. I, I can find meat elsewhere. Meat? I didn't want the lioness for food. Your attitude is most strange. In, in fact, the very presence of a white woman here is most mysterious. There's nothing mysterious about my presence at all. This land belongs to my husband. We have a large house less than a mile from here. In the middle of the jungle? Yes, in the middle of the jungle. But why should you question me? You're a trespasser on this land. It's up to you to explain what you're doing here. This section of the jungle is one of the few I have not explored up until now. I like to explore. I did not know that this was private land. Well, you know it now. So you'd better leave. I shall. But next time I'd suggest that you exercise a little more care when you take a walk. It isn't safe for a woman to wander aimlessly in the jungle. I wasn't wandering aimlessly. I saw the lioness prowling out here. I can see a great distance from my bedroom window. You came here deliberately to stalk a lioness? Why? Oh, you ask too many questions. I advise you to get off our land at once. And I'd advise you to hurry home and have that arm looked at. It's badly injured. I'd have given my whole arm to take that lioness home. But you can take it home. I, I told you I'd not claim it. I'll carry it to your house for you and... And then leave your property. Oh, thank you, but it wouldn't do any good now. My husband could tell at a glance how it had been killed. He'd know I hadn't shot it. Byron knows all there is to know about hunting. Byron, that's your husband's name? Byron Baldwin. I'm Althea Baldwin. I'm Tarzan. And I apologize for spoiling whatever it is I've spoiled. I, I thought you were in danger. Oh, I was. I couldn't have reached the rifle. And even if I had, I probably couldn't have killed the lioness... But I wanted to so very badly. I've never been able to understand man's passion for killing. Nor I. But hunting means everything to Byron. That's why he had our house built in the jungle. Hunting is all he cares about. I thought if I could come out here alone, if I could kill that lioness without help, I could make him respect me again. I guess a woman will do anything to recapture her husband's love. Recapture? Ah, that explains a great deal. You imagine your husband no longer loves you, huh? It, it isn't imagination. But you're very beautiful. You have courage, too. Surely you must be mistaken about your husband's love. I'm not mistaken. If you don't believe me, come back to the house with me. I'll show you a man who lives only so he can hunt. A man whose only love is the love of killing. <laughs> It's a fabulous house, Althea. Carved right out of the jungle. Yes, it's quite a show place. For the animals and the handful of natives who sometimes come here by accident. Byron! Byron! I guess he's still out hunting. Sometimes he doesn't return for days. 
You don't know what it's like being all alone in this big house. Alone? But but surely you have family or servants here with you. We've had a few native women from time to time, but they never stay more than a few days. Not that I blame them. Why do they leave? Because of Muani. I didn't tell you about Muani, did I? No, you didn't. I think I'm more afraid of Muani than I am of Byron when he's aching to kill. More afraid than I am of spending nights alone here in this barren house. More than the fear that I'll go mad unless I can leave here. Who or what is Muani? Come into the trophy room with me and I'll tell you. Only walk quietly because maybe Muani's here. Maybe Muani didn't go with Byron today. In just a moment, we'll return to our exciting story of Tarzan. Althea led Tarzan down a long, narrow hall until finally they stood before a heavily paneled door of polished oak. This was the trophy room. Althea swallowed hard and then swung the door open, admitting a narrow shaft of light that illuminated a few mounted heads of animals and reptiles hanging on the walls. Beneath them were large gun cases made of glass and containing every conceivable instrument of death. Aside from the narrow shaft of light, the room was in total darkness. Tarzan crossed to open the somber black drapes, but as he did so, a figure moved in the shadows, and a huge negro, the largest man Tarzan had ever seen, came at him, his dark face contorted with rage. Now I've got my hand on my knife. No, Tarzan, don't harm you, Annie. He didn't he didn't know what he was doing. He's like a child. I'll find out what sort of a child he is. Tell me why you attack me. Or I'll plunge this knife into your heart. Tell me! Please, Tarzan, let him go. He can't tell you what was in his mind. He has no powers of speech. You what? Oh. All right, I'll let him go. For now. There you are, Muani. But I warn you. Thank you, Tarzan. If anything had happened to him, Byron would never have forgiven me. Muani, go to your room. I'll call you when the master comes. I said go to your room. Well, if that's the reception Muani accords every newcomer here, I don't wonder that you're alone. I don't think he's actually vicious. He just has some sort of strange idea that he must protect everything that belongs to Byron. And, of course, he thinks of me as one of Byron's possessions. I guess I am. Has he never spoken? I don't think so. Although, of course, we're not sure. You see, Byron bought him at a slave auction when he was full grown. Despite his size and his strength, he was quite a bargain, being mute. Is he deaf as well? Oh, no. He has superhuman hearing. The way Dr. Sloan explained it, he's extremely sensitive to vibrations. I suppose that's why he can sense the coming of an animal from an incredible distance, even against the wind. A valuable asset for a hunting companion. Is that why Byron keeps him? Of course. Dr. Sloan examined Muani and said that with his sensitivity to vibrations, he could be taught to speak. Byron was furious. He hadn't given Dr. Sloan permission to examine Muani, and he had no intention of having his perfect servant changed. Who was Dr. Sloan? Oh, I, I didn't tell you about him, did I? No, you didn't. He was a well-known hunter as well as being a famous doctor. Byron invited him here, and he was our guest for several months. I suppose he would have remained longer had it not been for his interference in the case of Muani. That's incredible. Byron suddenly decided Dr. Sloan was a meddling fool, and he was afraid Muani might hear the doctor say he could be taught to speak. Byron didn't want that. He drove Dr. Sloan out of the house in the middle of the night at the point of a gun. Well, I'll open the drape so you can see my beloved husband's altar room more easily. Oh, I'll do it. You call this his altar room? Yes. This is where he does his worshipping to the only god he knows. I've seen him spend hours here just polishing the stock of a favorite gun. Althea... When we met, you said you wanted to kill the lioness so you could recapture your husband's love. And yet you speak of him with hatred in your voice. Do I? Why did you marry him? Oh, he was quite a catch. Tall, handsome, wealthy. A well-known sportsman with a romantic hunting lodge in Africa. 
Any girl would have jumped at the chance. Yes, I can understand that. But now that you know what he is, why don't you leave him? I tried that twice. Oh, yes, I have a great chance of trying to get away from Byron and his watchdog, Muaney. No one should be forced to remain in a place they find unbearable with people they've come to hate. I'll help you escape, Althea. Oh, would you, Tarzan? Would you take me with you to another land? To a place where Byron can't find me? Of course I will. Oh, Tarzan, I've waited years for someone like you to come along. Promise you won't go back on your word. Of course I won't. Well, well stay- this is a pleasant little scene. Byron. It's quite a surprise to come home and find my wife in the arms of another man. She was hardly in my arms. She'd started to cry and I was merely comforting her, patting her on the back as I would a small jungle creature who was lost and frightened. Yes, I can see from your attire that you're more used to the jungle than to the drawing room. Yet certain, shall we say, gifts seem instinctive. Among the apes who raised me, there was always one crime that was unforgivable. The taking of another's mate. It's a crime I could never be guilty of, for I myself have helped a pack of apes tear the violator of this law limb from limb. I have no intention of attempting to tear you limb from limb, jungle man. But I think you will find that I am not without my own forms of punishment. If I'd known you were Tarzan, I never would have talked to you like that. Tarzan? Hmm? Why should my identity make any difference? Uh, We'll get to that. But right now, you've got to promise to stay for dinner. Althea's fixing it now, and I have to admit she's a good cook. Is that why you keep her here against her will, so she can cook for you? Oh, so she's been off on that tack again, eh? I suppose she told you I was a little off my rocker, and I kept her a virtual prisoner here. Yes, she did. Poor Althea. I wish I knew what to do with her. She has the most incredible imagination. Are you sure that what she's told me stems from imagination? Well, of course, I don't know exactly what she's told you, but I know her usual line. It's part of her malady. I had a famous doctor come all the way here to examine her. He said she'd have to be placed in an institution for an indefinite period. Was that Dr. Sloan? Yes, it was. So she told you, huh? Well, your stories concerning him differ slightly. I never told Althea the whole truth. I was so furious at Dr. Sloan's diagnosis, I'm afraid I ran him off. Althea told me you drove him off because he threatened to teach Muaney how to speak. Poor Althea, she knows I'd give my right arm to help Muaney lead a normal life. I bought him from his parents because they planned to kill him out of fear of his mutinous. They thought he was the reincarnation of some evil spirit. Yes, knowing the native mind, I can believe that. You can believe everything I've told you, Tarzan. What reason could I have for lying? I don't know. Ah, Ah, here comes our dinner. Put the tray on the low table, Muaney. Are we to eat here, Mr. Baldwin? Please call me Byron. We're going to be great friends, Tarzan. You don't mind eating here? To be truthful, I dislike this room, the display of guns and the mounted heads of animals killed only for the satisfaction of killing them. We could eat in the dining room, Byron. Nonsense, my dear. I'm not having you go to additional work. You see, Tarzan, we keep most of the house closed up because of the, well, the impossibility of obtaining reliable native servants. It would take Althea and Muaney hours to get the dining room into usable shape. I see. Why don't you tell him the truth, Byron? That you even sleep in this room? That you can't bear to be separated from the animals you've mastered? Oh, now, now, please, dear, try to calm down. I know you're upset today, but all Yes, I am upset. I'm upset because now I can see from Tarzan's expression you've convinced him I'm crazy. Please, Arthur. It'll be the same as it's always been. He'll go away convinced I'm insane and you're normal. Well, I won't let you fool anyone else. I won't. Althea. No, no, no. You any back? I'm holding your wrists. Althea wasn't going to hurt me. She's just a little overwrought. Tell Muaney you weren't going to hurt me, Althea. No, Muaney. I wasn't going to hurt the precious Byron. (laughs) See, Tarzan? Yes, I'm afraid I do. He has convinced you, Tarzan. You didn't raise a finger to help me. You think I'm mad now? The way you flew at him, it it wasn't the act of a sane person. I've seen such fury in the jungle, but only from animals who had... (laughs) Shall we eat, Tarzan? Althea will get over it in a few minutes. She'll sulk over in that corner for a little while, and then she'll join us. Uh, Muaney, better take the coffee back to the kitchen and heat it again. The strange thing is that when Althea gets over this spell, she'll be normal and lovely again. Here, have a bit of this cold mutton. I'm afraid my appetite has deserted me. 
Althea, what are you doing with that gun? Althea, put that gun down. Killing is never the way to solve a problem. The gun isn't loaded. I just want to prove to you whether it's Byron or I who's crazy. What? Oh. My favorite rifle. You smashed it. You broke it into pieces. Look at it. My lovely Cogswell and Harrison. Even the telescopic sight ruined. Althea, I'll never forgive you for this. It was my favorite rifle. My very favorite... Byron, Byron, after all, it's only a gun. Only a gun? I killed a hundred animals with it. I've worked over it for days, adjusting the sight, finding out the best ammunition for a sure kill. It... It was the one rifle I really loved. <laughs> She's ruined it. I hate to destroy anything, Tarzan. But it was the only way of making him show his hand. I can see the picture now, Althea. I'll keep my promise. I'll help you escape. Oh, no, you won't. Just step back or I'll put a nice little hole in your forehead. I always carry a pistol. Just in case. There's no use reaching for your knife. Ueni is very skillful at sleight of hand. My knife is gone. Yes, and your bow and arrows, too. You, Annie, and I expected something like this. No, Tarzan. Don't move toward him. He's an excellent shot. He couldn't miss at this distance. No, I couldn't possibly miss. But I'm going to give you one chance to escape, Tarzan. However, I hardly think you'll like the condition. <laughs> In just a moment, the exciting conclusion of Trophy Room. Byron, you spoke of giving me one chance to escape, provided I met certain conditions. What are the conditions? I read a story once about another man who had tired of the endless game of pitting his intelligence against that of dumb animals. He contrived a game wherein he would hunt man. Byron. Yes, yes. I've begun to find that even the most formidable of four-legged animals is no match for my hunting skill. But from what I've heard of you, Tarzan, you combine the intelligence of man and the jungle knowledge of wild animals. Were I to hunt you, it might prove a thrilling experience. And why should I agree to serve as the quarry of your mad hunt? Because were I to give you a head start, there might be some chance of your getting away. I could just as easily kill you now. But you wouldn't, Byron. You're too much of a sportsman to kill a defenseless animal, even though he'd be a man. <laughs> I would prefer a hunt. But it takes two to provide a chase, the hunter and the hunted. You can't play your game unless I agree, so I too can set forth conditions. Tarzan, you aren't thinking of playing his crazy game. I may. What are your conditions, Tarzan? That you return my bow to me, and that you provide me with one arrow. You may select any gun you choose, and you may take one bullet. Before our game is over, we shall find out who is to be the hunter and who the hunted. Why should I agree to such ridiculous terms? Because were you to merely set me free, were you to give me the head start you mentioned, I I could take to the upper level of jungle growth and be miles from here, almost before you left the house. Why don't you take Byron up on it if you can escape? Why do you stand But if here? you agree to play the game my way, Byron, I will remain within a certain area. I promise that I shall not travel further than you can follow between now and dawn. All right. It's agreed. Let's take my property as the area for the hunt. There are fences on two sides, to the north and the east. The western boundary is marked by a wide creek, and the southern by the bamboo forest. I understand. The area is acceptable. And you shall have one arrow, and I, one bullet. It shall be a contest between one man and another, with life as the prize. Are you mad too, Tarzan? No, Althea, I'm quite sane, but... This is the only method I can think of to free you from your captivity. Your only chance of a future rests in my ability to kill Byron before he kills me. Tarzan knew well the odds of this strange game, the advantage that a man with a gun had over one with a bow and a wooden arrow.
He headed for the bamboo forest and then circled back along the heavy steel fencing that marked the north end of the hunting area. He walked softly, but if his adversary were near, he too knew the lore of the forest. No rustling leaf and a cracking twig revealed his presence. The wind was still, but even if it had not been, Tarzan realized his opponent was enough of a hunter to circle away from the wind. There was no scent, no sound, no hint that death in the form of a bullet might be waiting for Tarzan behind a bush, behind a small rock, from the creek bed, or the fork of a tree. Hours passed, and still there was no sign of the hunter who had selected Tarzan as his quarry. Well, Mr. Byron Baldwin, you're not quite as accurate a shot as you gave yourself credit for. Perhaps the excitement of this hunt... So, you're neither a good shot nor a good sportsman. You have many bullets. (laughs) I am a more resourceful opponent than you have ever met before, Tarzan. Yes, excitement spoiled my aim. But it will not do so next time. Or if it should, I will shoot again. And again after that, if necessary. I have but the one arrow. But my hand will not tremble. And now there was little doubt of who was the hunter and who the hunter. Tarzan used every trick at his command, but Byron kept on his trail, firing each time Tarzan exposed himself for a split second, never permitting Tarzan to draw close enough to use his bow. Now the jungle was quiet again. Tarzan had evaded his pursuer for a moment. He breathed more easily. And then, rounding the turn of the creek, he saw Mueni waiting for him in the shadow of a great tree, a gun in his hand. But Tarzan saw one thing more, a deadly python hanging from the tree about to wind its life-crushing coils about the mute. Tarzan raised his bow, fitted his lone arrow carefully to the string. He let the arrow fly, and the python dropped to the ground at Mueni's feet, a slender missile through its brain. Yes, I know I'm a fool, Mueni, to have wasted my single arrow and then to let my hunter know where I am by sounding my victory cry. But perhaps life isn't the most precious thing in the world anyway. Maybe self-respect is. <laughs> well, Mueni, we've cornered our quarry, haven't we? And his arrow is spent. Go ahead, Byron, shoot me. You've won the game. Oh, it's too easy this way. At point-blank range. Start running. I want to hear you beg for your life. Go ahead. Run and plead. You have never yet heard an animal of the jungle plead for mercy. Go ahead, Byron. Prove once more that you're a great hunter, a noble sportsman. <laughs> you sound brave. But you'll crack yet. You'll crack now. As I raise my rifle to my shoulder. As I squint my eye. Take my sight carefully. Begin the pressure on the trigger. And... (coughs) Mueni! Mueni! You... You shot me. You... You... You any? You saved my life, and you've killed the man who called himself your master. Byron, Byron, oh, he's dead. Oh, Tarzan, oh, Tarzan, did you have to kill him? I didn't kill him, but surely you aren't sorry to see him dead. Oh, I loved him. No matter what he was or what he did, I loved him. I told you when we met this morning, I was only trying to regain his love. Oh, no, I'm a fool. You didn't kill him. Then who... You ain't he. You ain't he. Why? Ta-ta-zen. First friend. He spoke. You ain't he spoke. Your doctor friend once said he could learn to speak, and sometimes out of great feeling come lessons not even science can teach us. Great feeling? 
I don't think I'll ever feel anything again. Yes. Yes, you you will learn to feel and love and live once more. And Muaney will learn to speak and to make a new life. Each of you will be a whole person with no master to rule your soul. Nature intended it thus. And in the end, only the laws of nature triumph. We'll be back in just a moment to tell you about our next story of Tarzan. With courage and determination, the small group of pioneers push forward the development of new lands in the jungle wilderness. But disaster lurks behind each rock and death behind each tree, for these pioneers are opposed by a powerful jungle ruler, one who is referred to as the Lord of the Jungle. In our next story, Tarzan's Mistake. Tarzan, a transcribed creation of the famous Edgar Rice Burroughs, is produced by Walter White, Jr., prepared for radio by Bud Lesser, with original music by Albert Glasser. This is a Commodore production. of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. Blue Coal presents The Shadow, the mystery man who strikes terror in the very hearts of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Today, The Death Triangle. Ladies and gentlemen, the shadow will be with you in just a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to remind you of a well-known fact. Coal colored blue means better heat at less cost. For when you buy blue coal, you're getting the cream of all Pennsylvania anthracite. The harmless blue coloring with which blue coal is trademarked is your guarantee of clean, even, safe, dependable heat all winter long. Such heat ensures the health of your entire household. So when you order coal... Specify Blue Coal. Ask for it by name. Phone your order to your nearest Blue Coal dealer tomorrow. On this day, December 22nd, 1913, by order of the authority of Devil's Island, you, Pierre Martin are hereby sentenced to 100 days in confinement solitaire and a hundred lashes in the presence of the assembled prisoners as a warning to all who would attempt to escape. Let the punishment begin. I will find the devil who betrayed me. One. I will learn his name. Two. I will kill him. Three. I will find him. I will kill him. Four. I will kill him. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program of organ music to bring you a special news flash from our affiliated press service. New York, December 12, 1937. The shadow has been found. Dr. James Evans, world-famous child surgeon, told reporters this afternoon that a wounded man who claimed to be the shadow forced his way into Dr. Evans' private clinic and at the point of a gun forced him to remove a bullet. 
The wounded man then revealed that he was none other than that mysterious character who has waged a one-man war against crime, the Shadow. Before Dr. Evans could report the case to the police, however, the Shadow mysteriously disappeared. The famous surgeon believes the Shadow has little chance of surviving his wound. Our organ recital now continues. Hello? Dr. Evans speaking. <laughs> Dr. Evans, the man you claim to have operated upon was a fake. The real shadow has not been wounded. The shadow? You are the shadow? Yes, Dr. Evans. You don't seem surprised. I'm not. I've been hoping you'd get in touch with me. That statement I issued was false. False? Come now, Dr. Evans. A man of your high standing in the medical world does not issue false statements without very grave reasons. There was a very grave reason. I need your help. An old acquaintance of mine, Raymond Dubril, the financier, has received a death threat. Have him notify the police. No, he refuses to do that. Then let him take the consequences. Unless... Dr. Evans... Have you also received a death threat? Yes, I have. Before I made this call, I investigated your past, Dr. Evans. My past is a matter of public knowledge. You were once a political prisoner on Devil's Island. You escaped 20 years ago with three other men. Raymond Dubril, the banker, and Pierre Martin, the concert pianist. Yes, but our convictions were reversed by a high court a year after we escaped. I know it was proved that you three were innocent. But what about the fourth man who escaped with you? A murderer. Jacques Cobay. He was caught and sent back to Devil's Island. After the escape, one of you betrayed him to the police. I don't believe that. Why else should he mark you for death? Then you know Cobay escaped from Devil's Island a second time six months ago? Yes, Dr. Evans. Then you're interested. You'll help? Yes, I will help. But only because your life is in danger, Dr. The world can ill afford to lose the skill and genius that has saved the lives of countless children. You overestimate my importance, Shadow. But will you help? Yes. When and where does Covey's warning say he will strike first? At Dubriel's Long Island Estate tonight. How do you know this warning came from Covey? Dubriel received a miniature music box in the shape of a coffin in the mail this morning. A musical coffin? Yes. And when the lid of the coffin is raised, the music box plays a tune. A tune Dubriel, Martin, Cobay, and myself whistled as a danger signal when we were planning our escape from Devil's Island. Where is Dubriel, Dr. Evans? At his Long Island estate. Martin is staying with him, and I am driving out there to spend the night. I had hoped you'd come and help. I will help you, Dr. Evans. Tell Dubriel and Martin that the shadow will be there tonight. Miss Lane. Is Mr. Creston at home? Uh, no, Miss Lane, he's not. You know where I can reach him? Well, he may be at his club. No, I've tried there. Uh, his office? Yes, everywhere. Nobody's seen him all day. Oh, is there anything I can do? Uh, be sure and stay here in case he comes home. I'll call you on the phone later. Uh, yes, miss. I've got to find him. I've got to. I've just got to. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Evans knows more than he told the newspapers. His office said he might be at home. Number 33. Yes, this is it. Oh, Lamont, I knew they'd shoot you someday. Yes, miss? Is Dr. Evans here? I must see him. I beg your pardon, miss, but are you another reporter? Yes, and I must see Dr. Evans. It's important. It's a matter of life or death. I'm sorry, miss, but Dr. Evans has nothing to say to the press. He's not at home. But I must see him. I must find him. I'm sorry. That car. That's Dr. Evans' car. Yes, miss. Where's he going? I'm not at liberty to say, miss. Never mind. I'll find out myself. Taxi. Taxi. Okay, miss. Where 
there, too. Follow that big black limousine, the one with the green cross on the license plate. That's well, a doctor's car, miss. I may have to break a lot of traffic laws if it goes through red lights. Never mind, I'll pay the fine. Don't lose sight of that car for a minute. Okay, lady, but this is going to be one fast ride. Down. That car's turning in at that estate. What do you want me to do? Go through the gates after? No, no. Stop here. Okay. Here's five dollars. Hey, thanks, man. I wonder if this is just a wild goose chase. Lamont couldn't be way out here. Not if he's wounded, dying. That car. It sounded like... Oh, but it couldn't be. It is. It's... It's Lamont. Lamont. Margot? Margot, what, what in heaven's name are you doing here? Oh, Lamont, then it wasn't true. You weren't shot. Dr. Evans didn't operate on you. Oh, no, so you heard that news flash, too. The papers are full of it. I tried to find you out the office at home, at your club, everywhere. I'm sorry, Margot. I should have known you'd worry, but I've had a very busy afternoon. Uh, how did you get here? I followed Dr. Evans' car. He just drove through those gates. What's happening, Lamont? Are you trying to find out why he said he operated on the shadow? Is, is someone impersonating you? No, uh, Dr. Evans did that, knowing I'd get in touch with him. He needs my help in a very special manner. But why? Is someone after him, threatening him? Yes, also the owner of this estate, the banker Dubril and Martin, the concert pianist. And you're going to help them? I'm interested in helping Evans. He's a great doctor and a great humanitarian. His life is in danger. Lamont, now that I'm here, is there anything I can do? Yes, Margot, wait in my car. Keep your eye on the house. If you see a light go on and off twice in one of the windows, drive to the nearest payphone and notify the state police to come to the Debril estate. I'll watch for the signal. Fine. I suppose there's no use my asking you to be careful. No, Margot, but uh, I'll try. I'll try to avoid really putting Dr. Evans to the trouble of removing a bullet from the shadow. <laughs> Stop pounding on the table and cursing Covey. Oh, that's all very well for you to say, Evans. Your turn hasn't come, but it will. If we three sitting here, you or me or Martin, don't get Covey when he comes here tonight, you will be the next on his list. You or Martin. Oh, don't concern yourself about my fate, Dubril. I am not afraid of Covey. Oh, you'll change your mind if he manages to kill me, Martin. <laughs> I wonder what it's like to die. What do you think, Dubril? Or do you ever think of anything but your fat stomach and your money? I, you... Gentlemen, this is no time to argue. I have something more important to tell you. What is it, Evans? I hear you had quite an experience today. Operated on this man who calls himself the Shadow. Yes. That's what I want to talk to you about. Ah, there's a man, Dubril, the Shadow. He might save you from Covey. Ah, uh, what could he do? I've had the best private detectives in the country trying to find some trace of Covey ever since he escaped from Devil's Island again six months ago. By the way, Dubril, I've always wondered who tipped off the police when Covey was hiding after he helped us escape 20 years ago. Covey was a murderer. We were innocent men. And also, who betrayed me, Dubril, the time I tried to escape alone the first time? Matt Tan, Dubril, now listen to me. A moment ago, we were talking about the shadow. Well, he isn't dying. I didn't operate on him. I announced that, hoping the real Shadow would get in touch with me. And did he? Yes. And he's coming here tonight to help us. I've always been curious to see this Shadow. You won't see him. No man has ever seen him, but he'll be here. Oh, Evans, for a man of intelligence, you're talking like a fool. The age of ghosts and mystic presences is... You're hard. wrong, Jabril, you're wrong. Because I am a doctor, I can readily accept the fact that the Shadow is a master of the powers of mental suggestion, of mass hypnosis. Recent experiments have proven conclusively that... Ah, rubbish. <laughs> Allow me to convince him, Dr. Evans. Uh, wh what was that? Who spoke then? The shadow, Dubril. You do not accept the theory of my power of invisibility. But perhaps you will accept the fact. For I am here. Sit down, Dubril. You look rather pale. If I am to help you... You will all sit down. Sit at that table there. I understand there is little time to lose. I must know the whole story. The truth. If I am to help you. Do as the shadow says. Sit there, Matta. And you, there, Dubril. Well, why don't you talk back, Dubril? Be quiet, Matta. Dr. Evans, I will help you if I can. But there is one gap in the chain of events leading up to this moment. 
I'll tell you anything I know, Shadow. Then tell me this. When and under what circumstance did Covey first threaten your lives? It was the last day we spent in the open boat in which we escaped from Devil's Island, 20 years ago. Storms had blown us off our course. Our food was gone. Our water was exhausted. Covey, the only one who knew how to navigate, was... Well, he was slowly dying from hunger and thirst. I can still remember his cry. Water! Water! Oh, be quiet, Covey. There is no water. The cask is empty. You lying, Dubril. All of you. You've been drinking my share. Give me that bucket. Give me a drink of that water. Don't let it matter. Don't let it matter. Salt water will kill it. What does it matter, Dr. Evans? Seventeen days in this open boat. Nights of storm and days of blazing heat. Water. Water. I'm dying, I tell you. Dying. You're not giving me my share. You're stealing my water. Where will you be if I die? I'm the only one that knows navigation. Be patient, Kobe. It may rain tonight. Oh, we might as well be back on Devil's Island. At least there was bread and water there. Bread. Bread. A crust. Just a crust of bread and water. Water. There's no bread, Kobe. The last crust went three days ago. You're cheating me. Killing me. You only brought me along to steer the boat. Now you're starving me to death. You don't want me to live. But I will live. I'll get you for this. I'll live to kill every one of you for this. You, Dupril. You, Martin. You, Evans. Oh, shut him up, Evans. You're a doctor. You know what to do. Look. Martin, Dupril, look. Figo. What does it matter if we have no guns? I know, but don't you see? The gulls never go far from land or a ship. Oh, sure, you're right, Evans. Look. Look to the west. It's land. Land at last. All right. There, to the southwest. You can see the sun of the mountains. We're saved. Free at last. Come back, come back. Sit up, sit up. Look, look. We've sighted land. There'll be food and water plenty for everybody. You tried to kill me. Starve me to death. But I'm going to live. I'm going to live until the last one of you is dead. 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 Yes, we threatened all three of us. And so you see, that's how it all began. And now Covey is free and out to get us, Shadow. But what makes you so sure... It is Covey. Well, it couldn't be anyone else. It's Covey, all right. He said to Bril, that thing on the table. That oblong box? Yes, Shadow. Notice its shape. It's a miniature coffin, beautifully carved. Covey was a woodcarver. He was always handy with a knife. But still, it does not follow that he was the one. Except for one thing, Shadow. When the lid of the coffin is raised, it's a music box. And that tune it's playing was a warning signal we used while planning our escape from Devil's Island. Remember, only the four of us knew it. Dubril, Covey, Evans, and myself. Oh, stop it, Evans. Stop that cursed thing. Stop it, I tell you. I can't stand it. <laughs> so you have a conscience, eh, Dubril? That danger refrain recalls the past, doesn't it? Stop talking about it. It looks as though Covey meant business, doesn't it? Don't sit there conniving over me. You forget your turn, maybe next, maybe tonight even. I am not forgetting anything, Dubril. You'd better study yourself, Dubril. I'll get you a drink. Oh, never mind. Here's the decanter. I'll pour it myself. Oh, that tune! Where is it coming from? I smashed the coffin. Good heavens, Dubril! It's the decanter in your hands. Oh, someone, someone changed the decanter. Covey, he did it. He's here. He's been in his house tonight. You will where he go. To my room. I don't trust anybody. I'll be safe there behind locked doors. Alone. And if Covey comes, I'll be ready for wait, him. Wait, wait. Let him go, Dr. Evans. But he shouldn't be left alone. Covey may carry out his threat. Are you sure it is, Covey? What do you mean? It must be. It couldn't be anyone else. The coffin, the decanters are his warning. I know. But you said the four of you knew the signal. Are you sure it isn't one of you? <laughs> of course not. I thought you said the shadow was here to help us. I am. But I am content to let events lead themselves to a logical conclusion. You mean you won't use your power to save us from him? I shall use my power at the moment it is required, Dr. Evans. Right now, for instance. Look on the table. Huh? There's a note where the decanter was standing. Good heavens. Covey has been here. Listen to this, matter. You are the first. And you will die tonight, Raymond Dubril. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, the shadow will return in a moment. There are thousands of families living around snowbound Buffalo today who are as snug as a bug in a rug thanks to blue coal. You have read how the whole city of Buffalo has been literally snowed in. In that entire area, business practically came to a standstill for several days. But those families who laid in their supply of blue coal kept comfortable. The icy, biting winter blowing outdoors made no difference to them. These storms are reported to be coming eastward, so take a tip and get ready. Put in a supply of blue coal tomorrow. It is the most economical fuel that you can use. Furnaces, parlor stoves, and cooking ranges in New England were designed to use anthracite. And blue coal is America's finest anthracite. Blue coal is mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company and is especially prepared for home use. It is available in all domestic sizes, egg, stove, chestnut, and pea. Every carload of blue coal is laboratory tested for purity and sizing before shipment from the mine. Blue coal burns steadily and evenly, sending a full supply of heat to the living quarters of your home, even in the most severe weather. Get set for winter tomorrow by ordering blue coal. You will find the name of your nearest blue coal dealer in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Dubril, wake up. I have come for you. <laughs> so you've come, Covey. Oh, you poor deluded fool. Do you think I'd let you kill me in my sleep? I've been awake, waiting here in the dark for you to come. <laughs> a little light, huh? <laughs> so you've grown a beard since I saw you last, Covey. And your hair is gray. That gun in your hand won't save you, Dubril. If I die, I will take you with me. Listen, Covey. I didn't steal your food in the open boat. I swear it. No? You also betrayed me to the police. You told them where to find me. And I am not the only one you betrayed, am I, Dubril? You betrayed Martin the time he tried to escape alone, didn't you, Dubril? Yes, yes, but what do you care, Corvée? He wouldn't take me with him. But I did not betray you. Have you paid Martin for those hundred lashes and those hundred days of bread and water he got because you betrayed him? Oh, he doesn't know. He will never know it was I. Dubril, you remember how we passed the long days in that open boat... Throwing knives. Don't raise that knife, Covey. We got so good, we seldom missed. I'll shoot if you move. But Martin was the best. You may shoot me, Dubril, but my knife won't miss. Oh, wait. Wait a minute, Covey. I will make a deal with you. Listen, Covey. You are out to get Evans and Martin, too. If you throw that knife, I'll shoot you and you will never get them. Oh, you would help me kill Evans. I know he's here in the house. Yes, 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 sir. I hate Evans and Martin, too. I will help you get them. <laughs> so... You would betray Dr. Evans to save yourself, to Dubril. The shadow. Covey, don't be afraid. He's only a man. By some trick, he can make himself invisible, but he's flesh and blood. Quick, lock the door. We'll deal with him first. He won't get out. Now, now, shadow. What can you do to stop us? Speak up. I dare you to speak. Listen where his voice comes from, Dubril. Then shoot quickly. No, no, no. The shot would bring Evans and Martin. Throw your knife, Covey. Make him speak. I won't miss... Speak up, Shadow. We will find you anyway. You can't get out. I am here in the corner. In the far corner. Throw your knife, Covey. I heard it. (laughs) You missed. But he was there. No. Only my voice was there. Ventriloquism. He's there in front of you, Dubril. Shoot, shoot. Yes, yes, I will shoot now. Yes, I will shoot. But not the shadow. He came here to help us catch you, Kobe. And he has your knife. It's gone. Now, Kobe, you are helpless. And now I'll deal with you. Oh, you treacherous snake. You fool. You think I carry only one knife? This one is for you. Oh, you... Damn it. But uh, I take you with me, Corvée! Dubril! Dubril! Dubril, hold the door! Dubril! 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 is dead, Dr. Evans. Dead? Corvée's kept his word. Where is he? Look there, on the floor by the window. Corvée? That Cohen? Dubril tried to save his life by promising to help that man kill you. Dubril? Dubril offered, offered to help Cohen kill me? Look closely, Dr. Evans. Remove the gray wig and the false beard. Wig? 
Yes. It's Martin. Yes. Martin, disguised as Covey. He's still alive, breathing. Get away from me, Evans. Don't touch me. I hit you. I hit you both. Why did you do this, Pierre? Why? I hated you, Breer, because he betrayed me on Devil's Island. I hated you, Evans, because you have got the things that I always wanted. Success, fame, glory. It was I sent the musical coffin. The warning note. I knew you'd think it was Kobe. I've got you, Breer, but Kobe will get you, Evans. He's after you. He will get you. He will kill you. He will... Mata, Mata! Stop breathing. He's dead. Yes, Dr. Evans. He is dead. You are quite safe now. You forget Kobe. No, Dr. Evans. I knew, even when I phoned you today, that it was not Kobe who sent the musical coffin. What? I knew it was not Kobe. It had to be Martin or Dubriel. Why didn't you stop them? Martin and Dubriel were both criminals plotting to kill you. If I'd stopped them, your life would have been in danger as long as they lived. Hating you always for having attained the things that life denied them. But you forget, Shadow. Kobe may find me. Succeed where Martin fails. Never. I learned the whole history of all of you before I saw you. Yes? Everything, Dr. Evans. Your escape from Devil's Island after Dubriel's betrayal of Martin that resulted in the hundred lashes and his resolve for vengeance. And from the authorities at Devil's Island, I learned the truth about Covey's last escape. Yes, I see now. I see now why he hated us. But what about Covey? You are safe now, Dr. Evans. Safe from Covey. The chain of logic is complete. Three months ago, a bleached skeleton was found on a deserted beach at Trinidad. It has just been identified as the body of Covey. Before we tell you of the Shadow's next exciting adventure, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal's famous heating expert. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barclay. Good evening, friends. While you're doing your Christmas shopping, why not get a gift for your own home? Something will not only make it a cheerier, happier place in which to live, but also make it easier to run. To my mind, the perfect gift for any home is a blue coal heat regulator. This marvelous thermostat provides the last word in comfort. For example, there's no running up and down stairs to open and close dampers. The blue coal thermostat does that tiresome job automatically. Keep your home at just the temperature you want... From morning till night. It can be attached to any kind of heating equipment. Steam, hot air, hot water, even a parlor heater. And it'll give you more uniform heat, more economical heat than you can get with the most expensive oil burner. In fact, this blue coal heat regulator will completely modernize your present heating equipment. And yet it costs only $18.95 plus a small installation charge. You'll be amazed at the amount of fuel it saves you. So this Christmas... Give your family the gift of a lifetime, a blue coal heat regulator. Your nearest blue coal dealer will be glad to give you complete information regarding it. Phone him tomorrow. Thank you, Ken Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Barclay. And friends, take Mr. Barclay's good advice. Make this Christmas a memorable one by having a blue coal heat regulator installed in your home. You'll save it small cost time and time again in fuel consumption. And you'll make your home a happier, healthier place in which to live. So don't wait. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. The story you have just heard is copyrighted by the Shadow Magazine. The characters in this story are entirely fictitious, and his similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. And at this time, may we remind you to mail your Christmas presents and cards early to secure delivery before December 24th. There will be no post office service on December 25th. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> the Slide, a 
science fiction serial in seven parts by Victor Pemberton, with Morris Denham and Roger Delgado. The slide, episode seven, Out of the Darkness. The lost people of Redlow, Newtown, are found hiding in the darkness of the sewer tunnels beneath the deserted streets. In the main square above, Inspector Baxter waits anxiously for Dr. Richards and Professor Lippert. Any sign on them? No, sir, not yet. Just the two of them, you said. Lippert and the doctor, is that right? Yes, sir. I've been listening for the last two hours, but I haven't heard a thing. Sounds dead down there. Trouble is, these sewers stretch for miles. Mm. Okay, Sarge. We'll give them another ten minutes or so. Then we better go and get some kip. If yeah. you want to risk our own necks, let them. I've had enough wondering about those tunnels down there. Anyway, uh, it'll be sun up in a few minutes. I wish he'd pack that up. Sounds like a funeral dirge. We all have our own way of showing feelings, Sarge. The vicar's been in that church for 15 years. I reckon he's got the right to ring his bell if he wants. I'm not feeling it's going to save this town, not now. Look at the place. Never think it was Tuesday morning, would you? <laughs> Market day. More like a battlefield. I'll build again. If they get the chance. Well, they got to. They just have. Anyway, I'd sooner listen to his bell than hang on here in the silence. I think it's that that scares me more than anything else. Silence. I'd give anything to hear the birds sing away in those trees again. Inspector! They're here! Well, quick, give them the hat. Come on, let's see. 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 Let's Fresh air. Oh, thank You've been down there for hours. <sighs> we were just about to give you up. It takes all our time to find a way out. By tonight, those tunnels are going to be choked with mud. What about Miss Marshall, Doc? Any signs? Yes. She's down there. What? There's no way to get her out. She was cut off from us. We couldn't take the risk. I could have reached her. Oh, you tried to get any of those poor devils down there. The, the mud will get you just like so them. We just leave them all down there. Old and young alike to rot away until that stuff's ready for them. Is your conscience big enough to take that responsibility, Professor? Because mine isn't. Ken, we have no alternative. The only way we can help them now is to find some way to break through this influence or whatever it is that the mud has over them. You say them? Have you any idea how many? Impossible to tell. Thirty, forty, maybe, even more. The sewers are crawling with them. They crouch in corners, hiding from us, guarded by their jailer, lost, dazed. And... Oh, I felt so helpless, knowing they were there and not being able to do a thing for them. Well, I tell you this much, Professor. Somebody's got to, that's for sure. We've done all we can. Robert? Mm. Robert, wake up. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, old boy. Must have dropped off for a few minutes. An hour and a half to be exact. It's 7.30. Oh, is it really? Oh, well, when you get to my age, you need your rest. <laughs> Any luck yet? No. The mud sample in the tank's been on the move most of the night. The only interesting thing that seems to have happened is the, the rock salt particles have disappeared from the side of the tank, you see? Yes. Look at the wretched stuff. It's much bigger than it was last night. Well, at least three or four times, I'd say. You know, we'll have to get rid of it soon. It's too dangerous to keep in here for much longer. You know, that bubbling really is like volcanic lava, isn't it? Mm. Reminds me of some of those eruptions I saw in New Zealand. Would you like to blow out the lamp, Robert? Yes, certainly. I'll raise the blinds. You know, we could do with some fresh air in here. I know. This light's a strain on the eyes. Oh, it's a beautiful day. There's hardly a cloud in the sky. You know, if someone had told me they had such sunlit days in England, I would never have believed them. <laughs> Better? Much better. Ah, and let's hope the heavens are with us today. If they could just send us some wind, a little breeze. Mm. Everything is so still, so lifeless, so unreal. Mm. We could be a boat in the middle of an ocean. Judith, quick! What is it? Look at the mud sample. Look! Let, let me... Robert! Absolutely incredible. I was watching it. I watched it transform in front of my very eyes. But it, it's solid again. It's completely solid. Of course, Robert. Of course! Inspector. Inspector Baxter. Mrs. Deverell, what are you doing here? That town's out of bounds to all civilian personnel. Inspector, you've got to find my husband. Mrs. Deverell, take a look around you, will you please? There are 1,500 blokes trying to clear this stuff from the streets. I'm warning you. He may be dangerous. Dangerous? In his present condition, he's capable of doing anything. Who isn't? Inspector. 
He tried to kill me. He what? He doesn't know what he's doing. Don't you see, we can't hold him responsible for his actions. We've got to try and reach him before he does anything dangerous. When did this happen, please? Last night. Just before 11. Then he ran out of the house. No idea where he was heading. None at all, but he took his car. He was no killer. He'd never want to harm me. There's something inside him that's pushing him to the borders of insanity. Some evil force that's, that's taken him over completely. Inspector, I beg you to get him back before it's too late. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. You have to turn around. The road's blocked from now on. Get that thing out of my way. I'm going into Redlow. I'm very sorry, sir. The town's out of bounds to all civilian personnel until further notice. If you want permission to... Oh, what's the matter with you? What are you looking at? Your, your face, sir. You all right? I am perfectly all right now. Will you get out of my way? Well, it's scratched, sir. You, you, you're bleeding. Oh, let me get you to a doctor. I don't need a doctor. I don't need anyone. I've got to get into that town, and I've got to get in quickly. They need me. Don't you understand that? They need me. Turn your car around, please, sir. Damn it, man. Don't you know who I am? No, sir, I do not. My orders is that no one passes this barrier without permission from my commanding officer. Oh. It's not my business to know who you are, yes. sir. So you'll be saving yourself a lot of time and trouble if you just turn right around and go back where you come from. Uh. And if you take my tip, sir, you see a doctor as soon as you can, and them scratches look as though they need it. Uh, hey, what uh, the heck are you doing? Now, are you going to get out of my way? Get gun down. Are you mad? Uh, <laughs> the sun, my friends, the sun... Don't you see? The answer has been up there in the sky all the time. At last we know the real enemy of the mud. So what you're saying, Professor, is that during daylight, the mud is forming some sort of hard crust to protect itself from the heat of the sun. No, no, Miss Griffiths. Not the heat. That's where we've been following the wrong course. The reason our own generated heat test failed. Here, let me show you what I mean on the blackboard. The light... The rays of the sun itself. Oh, yes, but what does it all mean? It means that somewhere in the solar system there's a filament of light capable of penetrating the mud's pores. Yes, but only when those pores are open, when they are breathing. And that's during the night. Precisely. That's the only time it is safe to shed its protective crust. Now, all through the night, this laboratory has been in darkness, except for one small oil lamp. We watch the organic movement in this small mud sample multiply beyond recognition. But... Immediately I came over to this window and raised the blinds. That organic life came to a halt in front of our very eyes. The sun we should have realized before. So what you're suggesting, Joseph, is it some kind of battle between the mud and the sun? Yes. But why? Well, throughout the history of mankind, there have always been people who prayed to the sun as a kind of god, the creator of heaven and earth. You only have to look at something like the Inca civilization, the worship of the sun god. The sun is the creator. But I don't see what this has got to do with the mud. Look, if we are to believe that the mud is a living thing, capable of generating its own influence on human life, then we must also believe that if the mud is to claim the earth for itself, it must first destroy everything on the earth created by the sun. Nature, my friends, has turned this into a psychological warfare. Dr. Richards, you've had a chance to see those people hiding down the sewers. What do you think the effects are likely to be? I don't think there's any doubt. The mud intends to absorb the human mind. Take it into its confidence by means of hypnotic transference, and then eliminate it, I suppose. Do you mean to tell me that out of all the scientific knowledge man has acquired, he can't come up with anything to prevent this extermination? There is something, hmm? but it may not work. Oh, for heaven's sake, man, we've got to try. What is it? The, the mud is like a giant octopus. Its head, the nerve center, is somewhere beneath the surface of the earth. We must find a way to burn through the tentacles, the thousands of little brain cells that are causing this multiplication. Yes, but how? Strike at a time when it is unable to protect itself, when the pores are wide open. During the night. As soon as the sun sets. Yes, but what do we strike with? We can't build a sun in the middle of the night. We don't have to build a sun, Robert. Look, look at the diagram on the board again. Now tell me. 
which of the spectrums in the solar system would you say is the most likely to penetrate into the mud's pores? Couldn't be ultraviolet, especially if there were any cloud around. Uh, anyway, it's not nearly deep enough. Uh, what about infrared? Yes, Doctor? Well, that's about the deepest ray there is. Now, if you could harness enough... Yes, but how? Well, there's a pretty strong infrared filament in xenon discharge lamps. Ah. They use them in most photographic or film studios. If you could get your hands on some of those... Oh, you'd need hundreds of the things to cover the entire town. No, no. We could take it in sections. If the first experiment works, we can repeat it. Miss Griffiths, what can you do for us? How many would you need, uh, these lamps? Well, to start with, I should say, 20. Hmm. We could line the edge of Holly Mill Lane, but they must be installed by sunset this evening. Don't worry. You'll have them. I, I warn you, they're pretty powerful, these lamps. I should think they'll light up the whole sky. Yes, as long as that is all they do, Doctor, I shan't worry. What do you mean? I don't have to remind you what happened the last time we used generated heat. Even the most minute particle of mud expanded beyond all proportions. If this should happen again, the dangers would be greater than we dare imagine. You mean the whole thing may multiply? Quicker than ever before. There isn't just one. There are thousands of living organisms lying out there in that mud. This experiment may only succeed in increasing them. Increasing them? But you're a scientist. Don't you know? Miss Griffiths, I'm afraid I do not. Unfortunately, there are times when even a scientist just does not know. Harry not so good. Anyway, we've got a description. Deverell. Yes, it's him all right. His car smashed through that barrier like a bulldozer. I reckon you were right after all. He's trying to make it to those sewers. Ah, uh, uh, it's all right now, Corporal, old son. You just lie still. You're going to be all right. I have to get him before he gets there. He's going to them. Who's he going to, son? Who? Um, he's... Going to Try and remember who it was. <laughs> better get him to hospital. He's lost quite a lot of blood. What was this he said about Deverell's face? Scratch marks all over. And there were some dead birds and things on the back seat of his car. We'll put out a general alarm to pick up Deverell, dead or alive. Dead or... Inspector, we can't do that. We don't have the authority to shoot to kill... You know that. Dead or alive, Sergeant. And that's an order. Murder. It's cold-blooded murder to fire at innocent people like that. They are not firing at them. They are firing above their heads to keep them away from those sewers. Once they got down there, we'd never see them again. But they're wandering around like lost souls. Can't somebody do something? Get them out? The only thing we can do is to keep them away from the mud. In their present state of hypnotic influence, if we try to touch one of them, there's no knowing what the shock might do. We dare not take the risk. It's all like a bad dream. You know, you're not helping yourself or anyone by staying here, Mrs. Devil. They'll do that to him, won't they? Shoot him down. That's nonsense and you know it. Nobody's going to shoot your husband. It's our help he needs. Oh, it's all right. It won't make any difference to me. In fact, after seeing him the way he was last night, maybe it would be a good thing. I don't believe you. Don't you? I don't believe you really hate him as much as you pretend. You can't shut him out of your life as easily as that. You can't shut out the world. I don't need you to tell me that, Professor. But for one moment, early this morning, I thought I had. I was up there on the hill overlooking the town. Oh, I know everything seemed to look exactly the same, even though I knew it wasn't. But, but there was a moment. One brief moment. When the world be became a blur. It didn't exist anymore. People, places, things. And I was happy. Very happy. Alone in a vast wilderness. But soon I focused again. And found it quite a shock to see I wasn't alone after all. The world was still there. But I... I wish it wasn't. Joseph! Joseph! The RAF are sending in three lorries from Maidstone. They're coming through now. With the equipment? Enough lamps to cover the whole of Holly Mill Lane. Good. The electricians say they must have at least 45 minutes to synchronize the entire circuit from Maidstone. Now, what time is it now? Exactly 5.30. The sun goes down at 6.38. Can we make it? 68 minutes. Hmm. Gentlemen, those lamps go on at sunset or the battle is lost.
What's up, soldier? Noises. What sort of noises? Down there, the, the sewers. I don't know what those kinks are up to, but it, it's peculiar, like they're, they're, they're shuffling about or something. Wh- whispering. Whispering? Yeah, it gave me a funny feeling, so, sort of unsettled. I've, I had to put the lid back on. Teach you to be nosy. Well, it's not my idea of fun, Sarge. I can tell you, sitting here alone in a back street, God in a hole in the middle of the road, waiting... Waiting for something to happen? Nothing's going to happen, at least not for another quarter of an hour or so. Once they get those lights on, then you could look for a few sparks. I... What? There it is again. What? Quick! Give me a hammer to lid! Now, listen. For heaven's sake, get someone! Please! Devereaux, what's the matter? Are these lights going to kill the people down in the sewers? Uh, Mrs. Devereaux. Tell me, I want to know. I don't know. I only wish I did. But how? In heaven's name, how? Well, Gomez seems to think that if the light does penetrate the mud's brain cells, it might do the same to the human mind. It's a chance we've got to take. And you mean to tell me that you, a doctor, are going to let them do it? Let them kill off all those defenseless people? We have no alternative, Mrs. Devereaux. And anyway, we don't know this is going to happen, not until the actual moment the lamps are turned on. Look, my own fiance Janet, is down there. Do you think I'd, I wouldn't put a stop to this if I thought anything would happen? They say his face was scratched from top to bottom. Why, Doctor, why? What's happened to your husband, Mrs. Devil? Is a tragic breakdown of resistance. Oh, he's a strong-willed man. But that's why one side of his brain is in direct conflict with the other. Like, like the meeting of two parts of a schizophrenic. Oh. One hand refuses to do what the other one wants it to. And unless we can stop it, the part of his mind controlled by the mud intends to destroy the other part. It's down there, somewhere, I know it. And all those other people who didn't ask for this. But if we want them back again, Mrs. Deverell, we have to kill that mud. You know that. Three minutes to count down. Stand well back, please. Only three minutes to count down. What's happening, sir? Can't see a thing. It's so dark down there. I've got some matches. No, no, no. If they see a light, they'll probably scarper. Can't take any chances now. How long's this been going on? About half an hour, you said. That... Hello? What? He's gone. Well, who's gone? That soldier. He was here on guard duty. I hope he's not... Now, I come to think of it, he was acting a bit funny himself. Any minute now, that sky's going to be lit up like a bomb. How the hell they know what they're doing? Reminds you of the blitz, don't it? Shh. What is it? There's somebody there. Quick, line your stomach and don't say a word. They're coming out. Look at them. The whole lot, Inspector. We've got to do something. We've got to get hold of them. See where you are. Once they're out, they're out for good. Something's making them move out of there. But their faces. Look at their faces. Where are they going, Inspector? Where are they going? Joseph, there are small cracks appearing in the surface of the road in the main square. The engineers have just told me. So we were right, eh? The middle of the circle. All five sides are going to meet. But what does that mean? It means, Miss Griffiths, that if we miss our chance tonight, all five banks of mud are going to become one. By morning, the whole town will be swamped. It'll give way like matchwood. But will we have time to stop the other overflows? Once we know the infrared can reach the nerve center of its brain, the growth will stop. But if it continues to move, even with the flood of light on it, then look out... Please, you've got to stop those lights. You've got to. And now, what if he turns them on? Every one of those people down in the sewers are going to die. Mrs. Deverell, you are hysterical. Please get out of the way. If you kill the mud, you kill all those poor people with it. Professor, is this true? Of course it's true. Go on, tell them. Tell them what a murderer you are. Professor Gomez, 
I, I didn't know about this. Perhaps we'd better postpone the whole thing. You're too late. Look. The sun's almost gone. <laughs> and now, all faces, all thoughts are one as we turn our eyes towards that great ball of fire slipping majestically behind the hillside above us. The moment is near. Figures turn to silhouettes as the deep red glow becomes twilight. The sun is gone. And now, the silence. Wait a minute. Something's happening out there. Yes, to the right of your picture, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has run out. He's in the middle of the manoeuvre. Damn fool devil, what's he doing out there? Devil in the mud is going to change any moment. Get out of there. Don't touch near me. Don't touch me. You won't be able to hurt me anymore. None of you. Mad. The poor devil's gone completely mad. Look at his face. Somebody get him out of there. Keep away from the mud. There's nothing we can do. Forty seconds. I just... Devil. Now listen to me. You are in great danger. The mud wants to kill you. No longer do we have to look to the sun. At last, we are being given the chance to destroy the evil created by man. TBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the future. Because the story you're about to hear is a tale of mystery, crime, and adventure in a world 60 years older than our own. Whether that world is 60 years wiser is a question you'll have to answer for yourself. But we want to warn you right now that you might not like our futuristic hero very much. You may even dislike him a great deal. For after all, he is a criminal. A swindler, a con man, a fugitive, and uh, perhaps something even worse. All we ask is that you don't judge him until the last sound is heard. Even if it turns out to be this sound. You'll hit Mrs. Sorensen. That's right, everybody. You'll hurt your friend, Mrs. Sorensen. And if you don't let me out of this place, I'll hurt her myself. She's an old woman. Yes? And I haven't killed an old woman for days. I'm feeling the urge right now. So let me out. Our mystery drama, The Night We Died, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Bob Reddick and Joan Shea. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It's the year of our Lord, 2043. It's a vastly different world in many respects. In others, particularly in respect to human nature, it's a world very much like the one we know. We think you'll recognize the kind of human... Toby Kane is, a man with an ugly past and an uncertain future. But there were two things you could predict about the future of Toby Kane. One was that he wouldn't be called Toby Kane for very long. Two, that there would be trouble ahead. Yes? Harry, Sam. How the heck are you, Harry? It's not Harry. You know my name is Toby Kane. That's the name you called me at the hotel, right? <laughs> sure, that's right. Oh, you make it tough on a guy keeping up with you, Harry. I mean, Toby. I'd like to know how you kept up with me, Sam. How did you know I'd left Callisto? Who told you my new name? Mutual friends, Toby. Everybody knows that you gave Muffet the slip again. <laughs> that cop's going to get awful sick of chasing you. He won't be chasing me anymore. Harry Rentlow is dead. He committed suicide on Callisto. <laughs> sure, I get the idea. Listen, Toby, uh, 
You must be pretty strapped by now. Could you use some high financing? You offering me a loan, Sam? Heck no. I'm offering you a project. I could use some experienced help. Can I see you at the hotel tonight? All right. Meet me in the Neptune Lounge. Oh, that's great, Harry. Look forward to it. Uh, the name is Toby. Toby Kane. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have known you, pal. That surgeon you use. Hey, tell me something. How many face changes have you had? I don't remember. Three, four. The face of yours must be pretty tired by now. Get to the point, Sam. What's the project? Well, it's a phony stock deal. The old classic asteroid mines. You know. Sure, I know. I practically invented it. Who's the fish? A rich widow named Sorensen. Her husband was a major killed during the moon revolt. He left her some 500,000 credits when he died. She was looking for a safe investment with a counter-inflationary return. In other words, the old dame was looking for a killing. Greedy people in this world, Toby. What went wrong? Some crook came along and killed the deal. What crook? Some phony medium. Old Lady Sorensen's a great believer in the spirit world. And this madam, what's her name, told her that her husband didn't approve of the investment. I don't even know who she is. I've spent three months cultivating this deal, and now it's frozen. Maybe this medium has her own plans for Sorensen's credits. Maybe you could arrange a split. How? And I don't even know her name. Well, there are ways to find out. Give me Mrs. Sorensen's full name and address. Come on in, Toby. Hey, Vanessa, he's here. Hell. Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Kane. Hello. Sam tells me you've come up with a solution to our problem. Vanessa knows the whole scam, so you can trust her all the way. I didn't say I had the complete solution. What I have is the name of the medium. How'd you get it, Toby? Oh, it was easy. Mrs. Sorensen was a rich widow, right? Rich widows have their habits, like taking a Mars cruise, for instance. I called Mrs. Sorensen and spoke to her maid. Said I was from the White Line Cruise Company and wanted to clear up our records on her Mars trip. Sure enough, she took the trip in 32. But how did that help you? The next thing I did was write Mrs. Sorensen a letter. I've got a copy right here. Dear Mrs. Sorensen, I doubt that you'll recall me since ten long years have gone by since our late meeting. But I still recall with pleasure our delightful chats aboard the Mars cruise, particularly concerning our mutual interest in the spirit world. Oh, wait a minute, Joe. Now, let me finish, let me finish. When we became acquainted on the voyage, perhaps I mentioned my dear wife. I am saddened to report that she passed on to the great beyond a few months ago, leaving a great void in my heart. However, recognizing the eternal nature of the spirit, I am not completely desolated. My one problem now is to locate a trustworthy medium who can bring my dear Agnes back to me. You mean she actually replied to that? <laughs> she thought she did remember me. And she gave me the name of the lady who's querying the stock deal. It's Olivia Nemo, South Court Street, New York City. Oh, terrific. I'll go see this pony and make a deal. I've been to see her, Sam. Well, well what did she say? Will she make a deal? No. Mrs. Nemo's not a very cooperative type. I suspect she has her own ideas about Mrs. Sorensen's investments. That's why she's spending so much time gaining her trust. Well, what do we do now? Well, I think it's simple enough. We offer the lady more than Mrs. Nemo is offering. Like uh, what? Well, for one thing, I know that the lady doesn't attempt to bring back any image of Mrs. Sorensen's late husband. Oh, well, Mrs. Sorensen wouldn't be fooled by some phony ectoplasm stuff. But what if Mrs. Sorensen actually saw her dead husband? Saw him just the way he looked when he was alive? But yet, obviously now part of a heavenly community. Well, what are you getting at, Mr. Kane? Well, I've written one more letter to Mrs. Sorensen from the same old ship companion. A dear Mrs. Sorensen. Thank you so much for recommending your friend, Mrs. Nemo. However, since writing you, I discovered the most remarkable medium I've encountered in all my 70 years. A man named Shan Kazar, who has produced the beloved image of my wife, Agnes, right before my eyes. The living image, moving, talking, smiling, expressing her serenity and joy in the hereafter. Oh, for heaven's sake. But who is this Shan Kazar? Well, can't you guess, Vanessa? It's me. Morning, George. Can't tell you how good it is to see you. That's good to see you too, Phil. I'll tell you one thing, George. 
Those plastic surgeons did one heck of a job. You look great. As you know, that fire bullet didn't just burn off my features. It did a pretty good job on my mind. I couldn't tell them what I used to look like because I didn't know. Sure, I remember, but what the heck? Here you are, and here I am. Well, some other things are different, Phil. You stayed in the Army. Hey, I see I have to call you Colonel now. Tell me what I can do for you. If it's possible, I'll do it. You know that. Well, it's a kind of unusual request, Phil. It's about those holographic image identifications they made during the moon revolt. The HID? Sure, I remember. The Rebs were doing such a great job of infiltration, the security insisted on three-dimensional projection holographs of every officer. They're pretty spooky, aren't they? You could swear the person was in the same room with you. Are they still on file? Sure. Someplace. Why? Because there's one that I want to borrow. The holograph of a major named John Sorensen of the 1st Moon Division. Well, I don't know. The Moon Revolt was five years ago. Records are all in the Pentagon vaults. But you can do it, can't you? Well, I do have a good buddy in personnel. All right, I'll do my best. So you're a moon revolt veteran, Mr. Kane. I don't think I've met one of those in years. Well, not many moon veterans like to admit it. It wasn't the most glorious action in military history. Sam told me you were very badly wounded. Yes. My face. Oh, how awful. Well, maybe not. For all I know, the surgeons gave me a lot better face than I had originally. You really don't remember. I remember very little before that fire bullet hit. Oh, it was dreadful. I mean, the whole the whole war was just sickening. The moon colonists got the nutty idea that they ought to be an independent nation. Didn't they realize that they'd never had a chance? It took two years just the same. Two very bloody years. Oh. I still remember hearing about... Well, about that horrible night. The mass suicide. Mm. It was only a few days after the surrender. All the leaders of the revolt, I guess they decided they'd rather die than face trial. All those bodies piled up in the crater Aristarchus. Oh, it gives me the shivers to think about it. Have you ever seen his statue? Who? The man they call Arrigo, the leader of the revolt. There's a statue of him at the base of the crater. The only reminder left of what happened there. Well, it's funny, isn't it? When the revolt was happening, everybody hated that man, Arrigo. But now, now I suppose we all think of him as some kind of hero. All martyrs become heroes, I guess. But when they sent me to the moon, all I cared about was getting off alive. And now? Now, what do you care about, Toby? Staying alive, the best way I know how. And if that means fleecing a rich old widow, here's to the fleecing. I hope you know what you're doing, Toby. My name is Shan Kazar. Yeah, but your name might turn into a number if this HID thing doesn't work. It does work, Sam. It's unbelievable. Oh, Mrs. Sorensen is here. All right, get behind the curtain, Sam. Pull the switch when I give the signal. Remember now, the key word is light. Come in, Mrs. Sorensen. I hope I'm not late. Oh, no. No, no, you're just in time. Uh, Mrs. Sorensen, let me introduce you to Shan Kazar. I am delighted to meet you, madam. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Kazar. If you can really bring poor John back to Earth, even for a moment. Mrs. Sorensen, I promise that you will not be disappointed. The spirits are present. I can see something, something glowing in the darkness. It's a light. A light from the other world. Can you see it, Mrs. Sorensen? Oh, yes, I see something. Someone! Oh, dear God, it's heaven, it's him. It's my husband. Edith. Edith, my darling. Oh, John. It's really you. Edith, my sweet. I am well and happy. I have found peace here. What is it like, John? Where are you? Oh, 
Please tell me. Do not ask me such questions, Edith. You must guard your health and your finances. You must take care of the money I left you. Yes. Yes, I will. You must invest it, Edith. Invest it wisely. But how, John? You told Madame Nemo. No. Do not believe that woman. She is an imposter, Edith. This is the first moment I have spoken to you from the other side. But what about the money? Should I invest it in those asteroid shares? Yes, my precious wife. I have had a glimpse of tomorrow. You will be wealthy. You will continue to have the earthly comforts I wish for you until the hour of our reunion. John, you're beginning to fade. I must go now, Edith. I must return. Wait. One more moment. He is going, Mrs. Sorensen. Back to beyond the curtain. Oh, it was marvelous, Toby. You absolutely gave me the creeps. I've really got to give you credit. You're still a Best in the business. Yeah, let's wait for the payoff, Sam. Let's get that money in our hands before we congratulate each other. Do you want me to get that? No, I'll take it. Hello? Toby, it's Phil Digby. Yes, Phil, how are you? Listen, Toby, about that HID projection. It really did the trick. You don't know how much you helped, Mr. Sorensen. I just don't know what went wrong. My friend in the Pentagon goofed. Goofed? What are you talking about? A holograph reel. It was the wrong one. It was a Major Warrenberg of the 6th Infantry. He isn't even dead. He's retired up in Nova Scotia. Toby, you there? Uh, yeah, yeah, Phil, I'm here. And, uh, don't worry about it. The old lady's eyesight wasn't that good. I guess the uniform was enough. Wow, that's a relief. Then you don't want the right reel. No, 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 that's okay. It's all over now. And thank you again, Phil. What is it, Toby? Is something wrong? Oh, I don't know. But that wasn't Major Sorensen the old lady saw. And I don't think her eyes were that bad. She knew I wasn't Oriental even with his makeup on. What I'd like to know is... Who's playing tricks on who? <laughs> Toby Kane is a man who is used to having things go the way he planned. But suddenly, a victim of a swindle has done something unexpected. Mrs. Sorensen has been fooled too easily. And Toby Kane has learned that nothing comes that easy. Not even in the world of 2043. We'll return to that world with Act Two shortly. Toby Kane, con man, has a disturbing riddle to solve. Why did Mrs. John Sorensen react so quickly to the ghost of a man who was clearly not her husband? Toby brooded about it for the next 24 hours. But then something happened that gave him something else to think about. A familiar visitor came to his door. Mr. Kane? Uh... Yes, who... Uh... My name is Moffat, Mr. Kane. I'm with the Interplanetary Police. May I come in? Um, would you mind telling me your business? I'll tell you inside, if I may. Truth is, Mr. Kane, I'm here to do you a favor. What kind of favor? How long have you known Mr. Sam Thumbs? Sam? Oh, uh, about a month. I met him at a party. Mm-hmm, that's what I thought. Why, what's the trouble? Mr. Kane, I'll be candid with you. We ran a fast check on Mr. Thumb's associates. We uh, couldn't find you among them. So we figured you were a recent acquaintance and possibly his next victim. Victim? Of what? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that Sam Thumbs is a confidence man. He's been indicted for grand larceny some four times in his career. He's never been sent to jail because his victims were too involved in his schemes to testify against him. 
But he's still a criminal. And he may be out to defraud you. Well, I, uh, I certainly appreciate this warning, Sergeant. Captain. My title is Captain Moffat. Well, I promise you that I'll be very careful. Yes, very careful. From now on. Yes? Oh, uh, Mrs. Sorensen, I'm the one who called this morning. Oh, yes. You said your name was... What again? King. Toby King. Uh. However, my name was George Spanner when I served with your late husband in the First Moon Division. Yes. Oh, won't you come in? Very good of you to see me, Mrs. Sorensen. Um, oh, I see you have a portrait of your husband. Yes. He's certainly a fine-looking man. Mr. Spanner, or Kane, or whatever you call yourself, uh, would you kindly tell me why you wish to see me? Well, as I said, your husband and I were in the same hospital together. That simply is not true. Pardon? My husband was killed at the Battle of Pluto Crater. He was never brought to any hospital. He died instantly. Now, just what is it you want? All right, Mrs. Johnson. I'll put my cards on the table. I understand that you're interested in purchasing stock in the Saturnian Asteroid Company. And that you've been talking to a man named Sam Fouts. Why should that be any business of yours? Because I believe I can save you a great deal of money. I know certain things about Mr. Fouts. And about this asteroid mining project. I'm sorry, Mr. Kane, but I am not interested in what you have to say. But you can give me a chance. Yes. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm giving you one chance to leave this place before I call the police. Sam, something is wrong here. Very wrong. Now tell me again. How did you get the lead... An old lady Sorensen. It was Vanessa. Vanessa? So what? Well, didn't it ever occur to you that Vanessa might have been part of a police trap? Did you ever stop to think she might have been working for my old friend Moffat? Moffat's on Callisto. He's on Earth here. A few hours ago, he was in my hotel room trying to protect me from you. Oh, Vanessa's okay, Toby. I swear it. Listen, it was her idea to get you into the act. What did you say? It's true. Vanessa was the one who told me that you were available. Oh, you fool. Don't you see what that means? How could Vanessa know so much about me unless the cops told her? Toby, I just don't understand why you're so upset when everything is going just the way we planned. The way who planned, Vanessa? Tell me how you knew about my escape from Callisto. Oh, this is ridiculous. I didn't even know you were George Spanner or Harry, whatever you called yourself. It was Sam who found out you were back on Earth. That's not what he says. Toby, the only reason I stayed interested in Sam was because he was your friend. Because I wanted to get close to you. This close. <laughs> oh! Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. These long fingernails of mine, they scratched your neck. Now you can scratch your memory. You can tell me if you know a cop named Captain Moffat. Don't do this, Toby. Be nice to me the way I want to be nice to you. Kiss me, Toby. Toby, aren't you feeling well? I feel dizzy all of a sudden. Oh, poor darling. Come, Sit down. My neck is burning. Oh, these awful cat claws of mine. I really should cut them down, shouldn't I? I... I can't see straight anymore. Oh. You... You did something to me. Stuck a pin in my neck. Toby, sit here. Don't fall and hurt yourself. I'm drugged. You've drugged me with something. I can't see. Can't stand... Oh. Luckily for you, 
Must have been a powerful drug they used. Not enough to kill, however. My only regret is that we didn't catch them in the act. What are you talking about? I've been keeping a tail on Thumbs and his girlfriend for the past week. His girl? You mean Vanessa isn't working for you? Uh-huh. Those two are in business for themselves, Mr. Kane. Or, uh, should I say Mr. Murchis? Or Mr. Snapper? <laughs> you pick the name, my friend. You have plenty of them. The name is Kane. Toby Kane. <laughs> it's funny, you know. I've been chasing you for five years. From Earth to Saturn to Callisto. And then I catch you by helping you get out of a jam. <laughs> Life's a little irony. You've made a mistake, Captain. Oh, forget it, Kane. We've already run you through a computer ID. We know who you are. Now, uh, if you uh, help me, I'll help you. I'll guarantee you full amnesty for any past offense. I'll promise you immunity for any crime you've committed. And that's a long, long list. What's the catch? Just what you might expect. The assignment I'd want you to handle is uh, difficult, dangerous. Do you, uh, you know why you were drugged, Cain? Because you must have found out too much about them. You, you must have stumbled onto something they want very much to conceal. What's that? Their real identities. Not Sam. He, he's exactly what he seems to be. A hopelessly inept con man. Hardly worth the paperwork it would take to arrest him. But the other, Vanessa and Mrs. Sorensen. Mrs. Sorensen? What does she have to do with this? Well, they're members of the most dangerous, subversive group on Earth. We have good reason to think they and their friends are ready to commit treason. Treason? Against who? Against the entire world. Against the planet Earth. Why, you're crazy. Are you saying those two women are plotting another moon revolt? Oh, not alone, I assure you. There may be hundreds or even thousands of others ready to repeat the same madness of five years ago. We think that both of these women are related to the men that we thought had died in the crater Aristarchus. Thought they died? Their graves are there. Yes. But we're beginning to doubt the identities of the men buried in those graves. Now, we've begun to suspect that the Earth forces were victimized by a hoax. A con game, if you like. You mean they're still alive? Arigo and the others? No, we don't know how many. Maybe only a handful. But I want you to continue to play the game you've always played. But this time, on our side of the law. What game? Well, I want you to continue to be a cheat, a swindler, a liar, a pretender. Only, I want you to victimize a very special group of suckers. A group we've observed closely for the past year. Now, we, we know their habits. We know their meeting place. We know everything. Except their plans for the moon. Now, that's what I want you to find out. Now, why should I be successful? Because you're going to have another face change, Kane. An official one this time. Uh, here, we want you to look like the man in this photograph. My God. That's right. It's the man they call... Arrigo. Uh huh. Here's the printout. Now you take these, Kane. They contain every available fact in the life of Arrigo. Ten biographers couldn't have collected so much data if they'd conducted ten years' worth of research apiece. Well, it's still not going to work. Even if I learn every single fact there is to know. There'll be other facts that could trip me up. Yes, we uh, recognize that possibility. It won't be enough to have Arrigo's face, even his voice, and memory, and manner. There are certain things about people, things that, that can't deceive those who are close to them. Yes, but they'll want to believe, Kane. Don't you see? These people have been waiting for Arrigo as if he was some kind of messiah come to rescue them from oppression. Oh, They'll welcome you without suspicion. A million things can go wrong. Yes. And then you're a dead man. Well, it's the gamble you'll have to take or reject. The alternative, of course, is jail. Yes. A prison asteroid, Kane. You live out the rest of your life on a barren rock in space. And if I do this thing, amnesty? That's correct. What a shame. And I was just getting to like this face. There's an old...
old saying that one must set a thief to catch a thief. But does it really apply here? Can a swindler, a con man, and a criminal have enough brains and heart to overcome a group of dangerous insurgents? Can Toby Kane walk into their midst and learn their most important secrets? Or will he die in the attempt? We'll find out shortly in Act Three. It was three months before Captain Moffat of the Interplanetary Police was able to put his plan into action. The actual face change took only a week. The recuperation took two weeks. But the rest of the time was spent in educating Toby Kane to talk, think, and feel like the rebel called Arigo. Finally, they knew there was nothing further they could do but send Arigo on his mission, beginning with the first name on top of the list of suspected sympathizers. Come in, Mr. Duncan. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you, Doctor. Well, shall we get right down to it? I always believe that... Something wrong, Doctor? Ah... Uh... No, 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 it's nothing. It's, uh, it's just that for a moment you looked uh, rather familiar, like uh, someone I knew a very long time ago. I see. Can I, uh, can I take this chair? Oh, yes, 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 please. Uh, yes, we'll just talk informally at first. Uh, you can tell me what your problem is, and I'll tell you whether or not I believe that psychotherapy can be helpful. Well, I'm not sure I can describe the problem. I've been having fits of depression lately. I've been having strange dreams every night. Yes, can you describe one of these dreams? Well, last night, for instance. I dreamed that I was walking in outer space, surrounded by stars and meteors. I was just alone. Well? But then I looked below me and saw a soft, glowing object. It looked warm and friendly and inviting. Once I had been afraid of it. Once I had thought of it as being cold and airless and alien. But now, I knew it was home. And what was this object? It was the moon. And it was mine. Who are you? Does this dream mean anything to you, Doctor? If it doesn't, then I think we're wasting each other's time. Who are you? I'm a ghost, Doctor. A ghost from Aristarchus. But a very solid ghost. Here, take my hand. Arigo. Arigo! Yes, Doctor, Arigo. I've been a long time getting back. But we were so sure that you were killed. I survived. Now I'm here. And now I'm ready to help. I've heard that there are plans. Dr. Sullivan. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There are good plans. This time we won't make the same mistakes. We're going to be ready before we strike. And when will that be? Well, the date hasn't been set. There's been too much disagreement among the members of the Central Committee. But now, maybe now, with a new leader among us. How, Doctor? How will it begin? Well, in the only way left to us, Arrigo, we won't begin on the moon, but on Earth. Earth? <laughs> we're, we're beginning right here. Preparing our weapons right in the camp of the enemy. What weapons do you have? Moon to earth missiles with atomic warheads. The weapons we should have had before the revolt. The only weapon that will give us the iron fist we need to make our voices heard. By the time we're ready to declare the moon a sovereign power, we'll be pointing the warheads at the continents of Earth. <laughs> We won't fire them if our demands are met. And if not? Then we'll make sure that Earth never forgets the price of tyranny. But how can you build these missiles? Where? Well, I'll, I'll show you, Arrigo. How strange, Doctor. So much noise in a hospital. <laughs> well, this is a very unusual hospital, Arrigo. Populated by a very... Unusual breed of lunatics. Lunatics? Yes. The idea came to us five years ago. What would be a better 
hiding place for our activities than a mental home. <laughs> so we built this hospital and filled its rooms and wards only with patients marked by that special madness of the moon children. It was a brilliant idea. Well, what you see here is only the tip of the iceberg. That noise you hear comes from below, from an underground missile factory. We'll go on a tour of inspection later. But right now, we have a meeting to attend. Then we were expected. I've alerted all the members of the Central Committee. They're in the main conference room. I... I don't have to tell you that this is a great moment for all of us. Please come this way. Hey, ladies and gentlemen... Arrigo! 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 Arrigo. You fools! This is not Arrigo! This is not my son! No, wait, wait, you! You must give him a chance! You think I wouldn't know my own son? This man is an imposter! An impersonator! You've been duped by a police spy, Selwyn. But I've talked to him. I've asked him questions that no one but Arrigo himself could answer. Well, you must remember it's been years since you've seen him, Mrs. Sorensen. Mrs. Sorensen? So that's what you're calling yourself now, Mother, huh? Whatever happened to the name, uh, Mrs. Lincoln? You think you're very clever, don't you? I remember how you picked that name. Out of an old history book. Where did you get Sorensen from, Mother? You think you can convince me, don't you? But you're wrong, the imposter. You really are my son. Sing it. Sing the song we used to sing together when you were a little boy. I, uh, I don't think I can remember it. My son would never forget that song. Well, it's been so many years. Arrigo would never forget. But Arrigo is dead. And you must die, too. Now, wait, wait. Listen to me. Mother, if you'll just look at me more closely. Like this. <laughs> look, look out. He's got her. Stop. Don't shoot. You'll hit Mrs. Sorensen. That's right, everybody. You'll hurt your friend, Mrs. Sorensen. And if you don't let me out of this place, I'll hurt her myself. She, she's an old woman. Yes, and I haven't killed an old woman for days. I'm feeling the urge right now. So let me out. This is marvelous, Kane. Absolutely marvelous. With this information, you can wipe out this nest of rebels in six hours. They were so anxious to believe that Arrigo had returned that they forgot to be cautious. Well, you've done a magnificent job, Kane. A magnificent job for us and for the entire world. I don't want any medals, Captain. I just want that freedom you promised me. Well, uh, a medal would be a lot easier. What was that? Freedom is the only thing I can't grant you, Kane. Now, I know I made you promises. What are you talking about? What's that gun for? I wish things could be different, Kane. You've accomplished something that I could never have done by myself. You saved thousands, perhaps millions of lives. But that doesn't blind me to the fact that you're a criminal. A dangerous criminal who can't be turned loose in society. But I can't believe this after you see The only oath I've ever taken sacred is the oath of my office. And you're not sending me to any prison asteroid, Moffat. You'll have to kill me. I'm a policeman, Kane, not an executioner. But I can be both if you force me. Well, then you'll have to be both. Don't spread it out. Are you all right? Have you been hit? My leg. Stay where you are. I'll get a doctor. Vanessa, you killed him. You killed Moffat. To save you. And to save us. Well, then you're one of them, too. The moon rebel. Mrs. Sorensen told me what happened. I thought you might return here, that you would never meet Moffat on his home ground. Well, then why don't you kill me, too? I know as much as Moffat does. Please try to understand. They didn't know who you were at the hospital. They didn't know you were Toby Kane. Toby Kane? That doesn't make any sense. Mrs. Sorensen didn't know you were Kane. That's why she accused you of being an imposter. I don't understand. Listen. And listen hard. I was the one who got Sam Thomas to send for you. I drugged you because we planned to kidnap you, to take you to the hospital where we hoped to restore your memory, to help you recall the past. They tried that at the Army Hospital. Yes, we know. 
Your memory was destroyed the night we died in the crater Aristarchus. Most of us escaped, but you were brought down by a fire bullet. You were wearing an Earth uniform so that you were mistaken for one of them and brought to a hospital on Earth. We didn't know the true facts then. We thought you'd been killed. But after the war, we found records. Records that made us believe that you were alive, Arrigo. Truly alive. Arrigo? Yes. You're Arrigo. The face you wear is your own face. (laughs) What an ironic joke on Captain Muffet. He gave you back the face you were born with. And Mrs. Sorensen? Your mother. She did believe you were an imposter because she knew that her son was wearing the face of Toby Kane. She never expected to see a regal with his own face. I can't believe it. I, I, I don't remember anything before the hospital. They had me convinced that I was an earth soldier. I never knew why I hated the fact so much. You will remember. We need you to remember. We need you to lead us. And I need you to love me. Look at me, Toby Kane, Arrigo. I am your wife. Here it is, Colonel. A recorded message from the moon base. Put it on the screen, you idiot. Let's hear what this madman has to say. Yes, sir. I can't understand it. A whole garrison of moon troops surrendering without firing a shot. And now this, 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 this lunatic with his demands. Already, Colonel. Well, play it, play it. My name is Arrigo. It is him. My name is Arrigo. And I am spokesman for the provisional government of Luna. The moon is no longer a satellite of Earth. From this day forward, the moon is an independent world with full sovereign powers to choose its own leaders and determine its own future. We are prepared to defend this independence with our lives. Because we are the children of the moon. And the moon is ours. And so the children of the moon, the lunatics whose first revolt failed, have once again asserted their right to independence. Will it succeed this time? Have they prepared themselves enough to convince the powers of Earth to let them find their own destiny? The answer to that question is in another story and another time. I'll be back shortly. Will it ever really happen? Now that man has walked on the moon, will the next step be colonization? Will the moon become a new homeland where men will live in an artificial atmosphere eclipsed by the great green globe of Earth and yet become strangely devoted to the cold and rocky world they call home? Stranger things have happened. Our cast included Bob Reddick, Joan Shea, William Griffiths, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why are you doing this to me? My thoughts guided me. They found your ship. They found you. What do you want from me? No more searching. Your hands are my hands. No. Your eyes are my eyes. It's impossible. I again in the sunlight again. We live. No. We share this. Body. I survive in this body. No more darkness, no more aloneness. I survive in this body. You can't take over another person's body. I share this body. It's indecent. But this body must adjust, adjust to the heat of this planet. It's too warm. I'm, I'm so hot. We are hot. We must do something about the heat. What's wrong with me? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Shell, Theater of the Air. Shell South Africa and Shell dealers throughout the Republic take pleasure in presenting Tonight's the Night by David Blackwell. This amusing comedy of the theater has been specially adapted and produced by Michael Silver for Shell. Young fellows don't know you're born. Look at what you're putting on your face now. Touch of five and nine and a dab of rouge and you're made up. And what is wrong with that? Nothing, laddie, nothing at all. But when I was your age, I found things a little different, believe me. Tonight I'd make up as little Billy and Trilby. Tomorrow night as Svengali. The following night as Gecko. Do you believe that? Why, well, it certainly does, if you say so. But I'm jolly glad I don't have to go through the hoop like that. It takes me all my time to cope with the juvenile roles, like Cyril in Tonight's the Night. Uh, do you know, if I go on looking just the slightest bit too pale or with no highlight on the jolly old nose, I get a dozen letters to tell me so. Pardon the word, Claude, I don't know what to make of you young fellows. Suppose you had to play my part tonight. How would you get on? <laughs> my dear old Gus, could anyone in their wildest dreams imagine me, Claude Downing, in character? Why, if I went on in that get-up, they'd give me the bird in 42 different ways. Not if you were properly made up, Claude. That's the point I'm aiming at. If you took your job seriously, you'd keep experimenting with makeup until you could pass for me anywhere. Oh, heaven forbid. I, I mean to say, old boy, it isn't possible. I, I could no more look like you than you could look like me. Uh, you see what I mean? I could look like you. What? I repeat, if necessary, I could make up for your part and not a soul in the audience would be any the wiser. Oh, I say, old boy, that's pitching it a bit strong, isn't it? I, I mean to say, you pass yourself off as me. And why not, may I ask? <laughs> Without being personal, Gus, there's the question of age to begin with. Mm, I can give you a few years. A few? Well, not as many as you think. But I am prepared to admit that it wouldn't be easy. I'd need a solid hour at least. But with the aid of these magic little sticks, laddie, I could transform myself into Claude Downing and defy anyone to notice the difference. No, but I say, oh boy, it isn't just a question of makeup, you know. I mean, there's my personality. A thousand little tricks of stagecraft, a flick of the finger, a twist of the lip, a, a curl of the eyebrow. I know but... them all, laddie. You do. Everyone. I've studied you, Claude. I study everyone. It's a habit of years. And I can honestly say that there isn't one person of my acquaintance whose appearance and personality I couldn't reproduce to perfection. You mean to say you could walk into this dressing room made up as someone else and I wouldn't recognize well, you? Well, that's hardly fair, Daddy. The lights in the room might reveal certain flaws that certainly wouldn't get apparent on the stage or even in the street. You say you could deceive me in the street. Certainly. I'd be willing to bet 50 rand that you couldn't. You mean that? I certainly do. I have a chair for Giddy's Place. Yes. Coming. Look here. Let's get it straight before we go down. You're willing to bet 50 rand. I can't make you believe I'm someone else. Outside the theater, yes. Very well. I'll take that. But how are we going to decide it? Well, we'll have a time limit, of course. Um... Say we start from the close of tonight's performance and end the bet at the beginning of tomorrow night's show. Yes, that sounds fair enough. But you have to speak to me. Naturally. And if you fail to recognize me within two minutes, I win the bet. Right. And if I do recognize you? You must use a certain phrase, anything at all. I know. Tonight's the night. I'll say that. Well, very good, lady. If after I speak to you, you say tonight's the night, within two minutes, Mark, you, the 50 rand is yours. Mr. Downing, curtain's going up. Mr. Downing. Yes, coming, coming. It's a bet, then, Gus, from the end of tonight's show. But I'm afraid you'll lose your money, dear boy. You can't fool little Claude.
nice night, Mr. Turning. Quite a good house tonight, too. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. Nice age of air has gas been going on. Oh, Mr. Mann. Uh, oh, yes, he went out over half an hour ago. Uh, that's unfair. I know he's not in the finale, but he's supposed to wait for the last cut. Yes, well, you know what these old pros are, sir. Huh? Only too glad to get out on the finish. <laughs> yes. Uh, no call tomorrow. Uh, no, sir, the board's quite clear. Uh, good night, Mr. Downing. Uh, good night, old boy. Ah, by Joe. What a lovely night. It's too wasteful. I think I'll take a taxi to the Madonna. Yeah, this one. Hey, taxi! Please, car isn't guys. I say, you can't put that over on me, you know. You've got the vacant sign-up. Yes, sir. I'm a sign I am already engaged. Oh, who engaged you? A second. What name? I, I, I don't know. I have to fight here. Well, you can jolly well take me instead. How do you know this fellow going to turn up? What's it look like, anyway? I, I don't know. I have not seen him here. I am just Paul the Viper. Well, I am your new passenger. No, no, no. Get, get out, my cab. I like that. Do you know who I am? No. But if you will not get out, I will throw you out. You? What? Yes, you can't talk like that, you know. After all, you are here for the benefit of the public. My money is as good as anyone else's. My hat, it's you, Gus. Uh, what, what is that? Well, <laughs> congratulations, old boy. It's a marvelous what? makeup. Uh, but the two minutes isn't up yet, you know. I tumbled to it just in time. I do not understand. Oh, yes, you do, Gus, or you will when I've said the magic words. Tonight's the night, old boy. Tonight's the night. Now, top up 50 rand. I won. <sighs> Tonight's the night. Oh, I am very sorry, sir. I think you are the gentleman I beg you. Yeah. Oh, a marvelous piece of work, Gus, old boy. It nearly took me in. I don't mind admitting it. I will take you at once to where you wish to go, sir. I say, old boy, there's no need to keep up the joke any longer, you know. And I said tonight's the night. Gus, tonight's the night. Yeah, I heard. Oh, well, if you want to play the thing out to the bitter end, no man, it's all right with me. But don't forget, I won the bet. This is the place, sir. Eh, what place? The rendezvous, sir. Yo, now look here. Just what are you jolly well up to? I said we go to the Milan. Now, uh, two short knocks and then two long ones. That is a signal. <laughs> oh, I get it. Gaming joint, huh? <laughs> well, I don't mind a little gamble. Especially at your expense, old boy. <laughs> uh, you will knock now, please. Oh, whatever you say, Gus. But I do think it's about time you came out of character, you know. However, please yourself. Two short knocks and two long ones. Well, here it goes. Now, when the door opens, you will please repeat the words agreed on. Repeat them? Yeah. But why? This, this doesn't concern anyone else, does it? I think so. I say, you you are a gust man, aren't you? No. By Joe. What? I thought that makeup was too good. No, no you're, you're, you're not Gus. Gus is much shorter than you come to think of it. Look here, what, what are you playing at? You will soon see. Did Gus send you to pick me up? Someone is coming. Look, just what is this all about? Ah, so you have come. Well, of course I've come. I, I had no option. You know me? No. I can't say I do. Unless... Gus, it is you this time. I recognize you, you old scoundrel. You have something to say to me, ah? Huh? Something to say? Oh, yes, of course, yes. Tonight's the night. How's that? You will come inside. <laughs> Thanks, old boy. Yeah. That's a nice place you've got here. Pietro, the door. Very good, Jackson. Pietro? Oh, the uh, taxi driver, chappy. Yes. A picturesque name, huh? Do you know Gus, old boy? 
I thought he was you at first. Silly of me. You have brought the papers. Yup. Yeah. The papers? But I, I, I thought you read them already. There's not much news in them these days. All about these Russians and Americans hurtling themselves around in space. Come, let us waste no more time. The Pipers. Oh, come off it now, Gus. You're not a dear Delphi now, you know. Now, how about paying up like a gentleman? Ah, so you won't they should give you the money first, huh? Oh, well, a wager is a wager, oh boy. You shall half your money now for fear. But first, I must be satisfied that you have kept your part of the contract. Is that not so? Yeah, I've done that all right. I did say tonight's the night just as soon as I recognized you. And it was well within the two minutes in it. Come, come. I must see the papers. Surely you have understood that. <laughs> really, the way you keep talking about the papers, one would think we just opened. There won't be any more notices now, old boy. We, we've been running for three months. Oh, you think you can fool me, huh? <laughs> I'm jolly certain you can't fool me anymore. And what's more, I've proved it. I give you one more chance. The pipers? I must have the pipers now. I don't know what you're talking about, old man. Pietro, there, that's up. Seize him! Did I say? Hold him fast, Pietro. I want to go to his focus. I say, you're not Gus. Mine. You what? I thought you were a friend of mine. That's been a dreadful mistake. Excuse me. I'd like to leave at once. That will not be possible. Yeah, leave my pockets alone. What are you trying to do, Rob me? Pietro. You have made the mistake. This is not our man. What? Uh, but, but he used the code words we agree on, Excellence. He say, when playing, tonight's the night. I'm telling you, he is not the man we want. Well, of course I'm not. Now, look here. Just let me go, and I'll say nothing further about this. I'll forget it ever happened. He will forget all right. Take him downstairs to the cellar. We will make sure he will forget. Come on, my friend. Stop. Stop you, you mean. Why are I say, I say, let me out of here. Let me out at once, do you hear? You can't do this sort of thing, you know. It is absolutely impossible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, what was that? Oh, somebody touched my foot. Oh, it must have been a rat. Get out, you brute. Oh, this is too much. Let me out of here. I insist on being released immediately. Open up there. This is Claude Downing, do you hear? Claude Downing. In person. Oh, oh dear. What am I going to do? What, what about tomorrow night's show? Oh, they'll put my understudy on the norm and somebody couldn't do the part justice. Let me out. Let me out at once. Outside. Huh? Is someone in there? Yes, on the other side of the door. Well, well, let me out, will you, like a good girl? It, it, it's simply beastly in the cellar. Oh, did you say you was? I'm Claude Downing. The actor? Why, yes, of course. There's only one Claude Downing that I know of. Look, oh, can't you open the door? No, he's got a padlock on it. Oh, drat. Well, well, now, look here, my dear. Go, go out and tell someone what's happened. Go, go and find a policeman. Tell him these lunatics have got me locked up in a coal cellar. I can't. You can't, why not? The place is locked up and there's a geezer what's on duty all the time. I say... Yes? Well, I suppose you are Claude Downey. The Claude Downing, I mean. Well, of course I am, yes. Have you seen me on the stage? Oh, yes, ever so often. I thought it was just leveling tonight's the night. I say, did you really? But you sound a little... Uh, Different now. Yes, well, dash it all. Who wouldn't? I mean, I, I've been hurled down here into this beastly coal cellar without any reason at all, as far as I can see. It's dark and cold with the filthy rats running about. Oh, and... what a shame. But what, what sort of place is this, anyway? And, 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 who are you? I'm Lizzie. Lizzie? Yes, Lizzie Brown. I work in the kitchen. Oh, I see. Tell me, who are the people you work for? Oh, I don't know. I couldn't tell you, honest. But you must know who you work for. I mean, I, I demand to know who they are. I couldn't tell you. You see, I'm just sort of attached to the house. Attached to the house? I, I, I mean, the house? You, you mean you're, you're fond of it? No, but the people what had it before went and leased it to these foreigners, and I goes with the house, see? And what are their names? You must surely know that. Well, the head gent calls himself Rodotsky. Uh, he's Hungarian, I think. I think so, too. 
And it strikes me there's something very odd going on here. In fact, Lizzie, dear girl, I believe your employer is a spy or something. Good heavens! Well, that's what it looks like to me. Oh, couldn't you possibly go out and get a policeman? Not till morning. Oh, dear. I, I can't stay here all night. My, my nerves are already in a frightful condition. Oh, couldn't you pick the lock or something like that? What lock? Well, the padlock on this door, of course. Oh, no, I dare say you couldn't. It takes a cracksman or something like that. Tell you what, Mr. Downey. Yes? I mean, I mean, yes? There's a bunch of keys hanging under the kitchen sink. Oh, well? One of them just might fit this padlock. By Jove, Lizzie, you really think so? Well, most of these padlocks are pretty simple. And anyway, I think this one in the door belongs to the house. They don't bring it with them. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yes, if the padlock belongs to the house, the, the, the house, it, well, one of the keys is pretty sure to fit it. Well, it's worth trying, don't you think? I certainly do, Lizzie. And if you get me out of this cellar, you shall have a front seat in the stalls as often as you wish. Oh, do you mean me? On my word of honour, as a gentleman and as an actor. Blimey, stalls and all. Yes, yeah, so hurry like a good girl, Lizzie, and get that bunch of keys. Oh, oh, oh there's another rat. Go quickly, quickly, Lizzie, before I faint. I'll never forget you for this, Lizzie. Oh, I do nothing, really. Don't you? Aye, oh, Joe, if you get out of here, you'll not only be performing a great service to the theatre, but to the entire scene of Western culture. Western what? Yes, what's more, if I get out of here, I may be able to frustrate a diabolical plot to, to disrupt the North Atlantic Treaty or something equally important. Oh, fancy that. Of course, I, I, I don't really know. I, I'm only smiling, but... I, I don't think those birds are up to any good. Got it! Yes, you, you unlocked it. You, you mean I'm... I'm... Yes, I just a moment. Oh, Lizzie, you're an angel. I can't see you, but I, I'm going to kiss you. There. Oh, blimey. I've been kissed by Claude Downey. In person, my dear. And now, we'll creep upstairs and see what's going on. Now, quietly. Anyway, now. Can't see a soul. Oh, that big guard piece is generally sneaking about the night. Pietro? Oh, I don't know his name. Uh, Pietro drives a taxi, weighs about 250 pounds, so I pray we don't meet him. What are you going to do? Make for the front door. Which, which way is it? I, I, I can't see a thing. To the right. Right. All right, uh, follow me. Who is that? Shh. That's him. Is there someone? Right. I put on lights. Blimey. Now, before it. So, it is you, my friend. Now, look here. How did you get out of the cellar? I let him out, if you must know. I don't know about your own business, Hank. I wouldn't let a fellow countryman of mine be hurt by a bunch of dirty foreigners. Ah, Joe, Lizzie, that line would bring the house down if it were in a play. I think you both go back to the cellar now. You keep your dirty hands off of me. Now, look here, old chap. No rough stuff, do you hear? This is a civilised country, after all. Come on, Ziggy. Stand back, you cad, or I wouldn't be responsible. I fix you. Lizzie, the door. Run for it. No, you don't. Leave the girl alone. You can't go on, Lizzie. How did he get out of him? Help! 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 Help!
Holy shit. Are you all right? Yes, Lizzie. Yes. Hello, dear. I, I can't go on tomorrow night. He, he, my lip. He's damaged my lip. You'll be comfortable here. I still don't know what exactly happened, Mr. Downey. What happened? Well, it's really perfectly simple, my dear. Those people were foreign agents of some kind. They were evidently expecting another agent whom they didn't know. So the arrangements were that he should be picked up outside the Adelphi Theatre by Pietro and would mention a password. The phrase was, two nights the night. But why? Well, it was a perfectly natural sentence to choose when you consider this fellow was to be picked up outside the Adelphi where tonight's the night is running. Oh. Yeah, probably he was told to attend the performance just to throw off suspicion and that Pietro would be waiting for him after the show finished. How did you come into all this? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Either the right man didn't turn up at all, or else he was running late. Anyway, I was looking for a taxi to take me to Milano's, and I happened to pick on Pietro. But you wouldn't know the password. Well, it just so happened that I did use the password at the critical moment. And as soon as I said, tonight's the night, Pietro thought I was the person he was waiting for. But why did you go into the house? Well, Lizzie, let us say it was a case of mistaken identity. We, we won't get into that now. Uh, you'd better clear off to bed. Yeah, I'm almost on the point of collapse. Oh, it was nice of you to find me this room, Mr. Downey. <laughs> ah, Joe, my dear, after the way you helped me, it was the very least I could do. Now, believe me, Mrs. Hicks is a motherly old soul. She looked after me pretty well, and she's promised to treat you as though you're my own sister. Oh, I'm ever so much obliged to you. And I'm ever so much obliged to you, Lizzie. I'll never forget what you did for me tonight. I say, would, would you like a job at the theatre? You mean it? Well, certainly. I mean, there's sure to be a front of house job I could wangle for you. Yes, anyway, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Good night, my dear. And uh, thanks for everything. Good night, Mr. Downing. Uh, I, uh, I suppose uh, you, you wouldn't... Uh, uh, wouldn't what, my dear? Well, uh, kiss me... Like you did before. <laughs> I <I'm> dizzy. <laughs> I'd love to. There you are. A chaste salute. How's that? Oh, oh, oh you're wonderful. Yes, yes, I'm not bad. Oh, dear, I, I don't feel very wonderful at the moment. Just, just look at my eyes. Oh, won't you be able to go on tomorrow? <laughs> I'm a trooper, Lizzie. I shall do my best. The show must go on, you know. Besides, my understudy is an awful little twerp. Come in. Mr. Downing. Blimey, a policeman. Yes, hi, Mr. Downing. I'm afraid you'll have to come along with me, sir. Oh, what for? There's some things being stolen from the Adelphi Theatre, and you were seen getting away with them. What? <laughs> You're crazy, old boy. I'm I'm Claude Downey. I don't care who you are. You've got to come along with me. But this is preposterous. I know him. Eh, no. This here gentleman, he ain't no copper at all. He's the no. geezer what takes the part of the count in your show. You... Yes. Well, of course. You didn't recognize me. No, no, but Lizzie did. And that just shows what a rotten makeup artist you are. Tonight's the night, old boy, and you can give that 50 rand to Lizzie. She's jolly well earned it. Oh, Mr. Downey, Lord, I, I think I'm going to fight. <laughs> And so ends Tonight's the Night by David Blackwell, with Stuart Brown as Gus and the Hungarian Carl, Rex Garner as Claude, Annabel Linda as Lizzie, and Bill Brewer as the taxi driver. Tonight's the Night was adapted and produced by Michael...